The story begins with the death of a country's king due to unknown reasons. When he wakes up, he realizes that he has been reincarnated in a new world as a baby. His mother's name is Alice, a kind-hearted and gentle person, and his father is Reynolds, a dependable and charismatic man despite the occasional childishness. They named him Arthur, or Art for short. Despite being born into a loving family, he finds his new life as a baby very difficult. Art realizes that this new world is set in a much earlier time period. Art still has memories from his past life, so despite his young age, he still has the mental faculties of an adult. He quickly realizes that he must learn everything about his new world as knowledge is power. During one of his father's occasional bouts of childishness, he ends up getting injured when his father started tossing and turning him around. His mother is able to instantly heal him using magic, making Art realize that there is more to this new world than he initially thought. In his previous life, Art was a great king who led armies and fought warriors from all over the world. But in his new life, his proudest moment comes when he learns how to crawl. Using this new ability, he sneaks out of the room every night after his mother puts him to bed. He crawls to the library using his tiny body to research more about this world. He learns that the continent he was born in is comprised of three kingdoms. There is Elenoir, the kingdom in the deep forest where elves live. Darv, the underground dwarf kingdom, and Safin, the human kingdom, and also the most populated one. Art discovers that this world also has a monarch system, but the kingship is passed down rather than earned like in his previous world. This world is also very undeveloped compared to his previous one, but this is due to magic. He is familiar with Ki, which was used in his previous world to strengthen one's body and weapons. This world has a similar force called mana, unlike Ki which was present inside a person's body, mana exists everywhere in the surroundings. Mana is also very rare, as only 1 in 100 people possess it. It can be used in many ways, but the two most common are augmenting and conjuring. Augmenting is used to enhance one's body to have greater strength, defense, and agility, but this limits the range of the user. Conjuring, on the other hand, is used to emit mana to the outside world. But to do so, a caster will have to gather mana from the surrounding along from within their core. Alice is from a class called Deviant. They are a rare type of mage who can use restorative mana. According to the books from the library, a child manifests their mana core around early adolescence to their late teens. Art realizes that this sounds strangely familiar to a key center. In his previous life, children were taught to form their key centers by meditating and gathering the scattered fragments around their bodies. Art realizes that he can do the same to form his monocore. But before he can get started, he is found by his mother, who has been looking for him since he sneaked out. It has been over a year since he was born into this new world. He has started walking. He is adored by his parents, especially his mother who has begun writing down their everyday life in a journal. Ray has even started giving him private sword lessons, but he is quickly stopped by Alice. She has noticed Art's fascination with the Merchant's Guild. So the dotting mother takes him there every day to watch the adventurers perform magic. With Ray being his father, she is sure that her son will have an interest in becoming an adventurer himself. She can't help but worry and hopes that her son is better than every other enthusiastic teen who wants to be a famous adventurer. She has also noticed her son's habit of sneaking into the library every night. Two years have passed now since Art first made his difficult journey to the library. He continues his journey to learn more about this world. He observes his father as he practices his magic. After chanting a spell for almost three minutes, the rocks around him begin floating. Art's curiosity grows as he wonders what kind of a spell it is. To his disappointment, flinging the rocks a small distance is all that his father manages to do. But that is to be expected as Ray is an augmenter. They don't use flashy moves, but instead use their magic to enhance their physical strength. After watching his father practice, he tries to go back to the library. Despite his adult mind, he is still a child, as even the short distance between the chair and the floor seems to scare him. As he struggles to get down using his small body, Alice mistakes his efforts as him being sleepy. She tries to take him to his bedroom to put him down for a nap, but Art insists on going to the library. Despite Alice's refusal, he has learned how to get what he wants. Using his innocent, cute face, he begs his mother to take him to the library. Unable to resist the power of his cute face, she gives in and agrees to take him to the library. Despite the embarrassment, Art knows that a warrior must use every weapon in their arsenal. As he continues his study, Alice hears a loud noise from outside. She instantly knows it's one of Ray's antics. 
As she goes outside to check, Art once again starts his meditation to form a monochore. He has been doing this for the last two years in secret, slowly moving the tens of thousands of fragments throughout his body to form a single core. He now understands why it would take until adolescence to form the core naturally. Outside, Alice finds the source of the sound. It seems that Ray has knocked down another tree while practicing. Just as Art moves the final piece inside his body, the two parents see a huge blast inside their house. Ray instantly grabs Alice and uses his body to protect her from the blast. Fearing for the life of his son, Ray quickly dashes inside the wrecked house to look for Art. What he witnesses leaves him shocked. Instead of being injured, Art is perfectly fine while floating in the air in a meditative state. His parents realize that it can only mean one thing, that Art has finally manifested his manacor. Art couldn't be happier as his two years of hard work finally paid off, but it seems that he didn't realize all the damage he caused during his meditation. Another year goes by after he formed his monocore. While his mother teaches him how to read and write, Art has learned the basics of mana manipulation and augmentation from his father. Since his body was still too small for fighting, he only did basic strength training with Ray at first. Not too long after, his father decides to practice with Art using wooden swords. Ray's instructions are usually too abstract for a normal four-year-old, but Art understands and executes them without much problem. Despite being only four, he has become much stronger than Ray anticipated. Every day, Art meditates to increase his strength. In this world, one's strength is determined by the color of one's monocore. A monocore starts off black due to blood and other impurities. Over time, the core becomes purer, and thus the user gets stronger. The monocore has seven colors. Black, which is the least pure, then red, orange, yellow, silver, and finally white, which is the purest. Each stage also has three shades that go from dark to solid and finally light. The lighter the shade, the purer the core. Art's meditation is once again interrupted as he is called for dinner by Alice. At the dinner table, Ray makes a suggestion. Seeing how fast Art is growing, he believes that it's time that they get Art a proper mentor. The discussion gets heated and they finally agree to let Art decide what he wants to do. He tells them that maybe they can all move to this city. This way he won't have to be alone. His parents burst out laughing as they realize that it was such an obvious solution. With everyone now in agreement, the family decides that they will move to Xyrus to find a mentor for Art. Alice and Ray quickly start preparing for their three-week journey to Xyrus. They enlist the help of their old friends from an adventuring party called Twin Horns. With a goodnight kiss from his mother, he prepares to go to sleep as their journey starts in the morning. The Twin Horns have been in their town for a while. They were also the ones who helped rebuild the house after Art accidentally destroyed it. The party consists of two conjurers and three augmenters. Art is excited to finally move out of this small town and see the real world. In the morning, the family meets up with the adventuring party. They all make introductions with Art as they each pick him up and toss him around. Firstly, there's Adam Crinch, an augmenter who specializes in the spear. Next is a beautiful woman named Angela Rose. She is a conjurer who uses wind magic. Following her is the gentle giant of the group named Durden Walker. He is also a conjurer who specializes in earth magic. He gently puts Art down. Art gets the same vibe as a big gentle dog from him. Next is a mysterious pale looking girl. From her looks, one would assume that she is an assassin. She is Jasmine Flamesworth, an augmenter who uses dual daggers. She is not the talkative one and keeps to herself. Finally, there is Helen Shard, an elf who uses magic archery. She is probably the nicest and most well-behaved in the group. Now that they have made their acquaintances, they start loading up their carriages in preparation to leave. They travel on two carriages being pulled by giant lizards. Their journey to Xyrus has finally begun. On their journey, they encounter monsters, which the party easily takes care of. The long journey really seems to be slowly wearing down Art. During the nighttime at the campfire, Helen tries to make small talk with him to cheer him up. She asks him if he really did have an awakening only a year ago. Adam, who is also bored, has been listening in on their conversation. Since Ray had been bragging about his son the entire journey, he decides to see for himself how strong Art really is. After getting Ray's approval, Adam grabs Art and goes to have a sparring session with him. With everyone watching, Art feels like he has no other choice but to fight. After using his magic to enhance himself, Art dashes forward toward Adam holding his wooden blade. 
This obviously doesn't work against the experienced adventurer who easily parries Art's sword using his spear, but Art doesn't give up and goes in for another attack. After dodging his attack, Adam tries to counter him, but Art uses his quick speed to dodge. He tries to tackle Adam, but because of his small body, it doesn't seem to have much impact. Once again, Adam counters him with a kick, but is unable to hit him. Adam decides to fight more seriously and uses his magic to send Art flying. Just before he can continue his attack, he is stopped by Durden, who slaps him on the head. Adam is impressed by Art, so much so that he believes there is no way he hasn't received any combat training. Even Ray is surprised to see him use moves that he didn't even teach him. Art tries to brush it off by saying that he learned it by reading it from books. Even the usually quiet Jasmine wants to learn his movement techniques. Art is now the mentor of the adventuring party instead of the other way around. Several days have passed since the group started their journey toward Exiris. They stop at a lake to take a bath and relax. As their journey continues, the adventurers also continue their training with Adam, Helen, and Ray making decent progress. Jasmine was even able to learn a few techniques from Art. After the short break, the group continues their journey once again. Art notices that his mother seems to be sick, but Alice assures him that she is fine. Art also finds himself being stalked by Jasmine. After helping her learn new techniques, she wants to continue their training. Their peaceful journey comes to an abrupt stop as they are suddenly attacked by bandits. The bandits shoot the carriage with arrows. Alice tries to protect Art by shielding him. Thankfully, Angela manages to protect everyone using her wind magic. She didn't manage to save everyone as Helen is struck in her leg with an arrow. However, she doesn't let it phase her as she breaks the arrow off and prepares to shoot back. The bandits had planned an ambush and the group finds themselves completely surrounded. Their leader orders the bandits to kill everyone except for the women and children as they plan to sell them for money. Art prepares to fight as well. As he is about to take out his knife, Alice notices her son's anger and quickly hugs him. She tells him it's fine as she is here for him, making him calm down. The bandits continue their relentless attack while the twin horns along with Ray try to fight them off while protecting the carriages. Angela once again protects Alice and Art from arrows using her wind magic. Ray goes on a rampage taking out multiple bandits in quick succession. He is supported by Helen who uses her archery skills to protect him. Jasmine and Adam also go on a killing spree using powerful attacks to take out many bandits. Jasmine finds her match when she comes across one robber using a long wipe. Art is observing her fight and quickly realizes her disadvantage against her opponent's range. Suddenly, Ray is sent flying into the carriage, completely wrecking it. It seems to be the leader of the bandit as he proved to be too strong for him. Art quickly tells his mother to heal Ray. Art realizes that there is something wrong with her as she tells him she can't. He wonders why she isn't healing him. Still, she uses some of her magic to use a minor healing spell on him. Ray tells Art that as soon as the spell is done healing him, he should run away with Alice. He refuses to run, telling Ray that he can fight with them, but he pats him on his head and tells him to protect his mother and their baby, revealing that Alice is pregnant. The couple was going to surprise Art with the news when they got to Exiris. With this revelation, he agrees to run away with Alice, promising that he will protect her. Ray tells Art to get ready and informs him that the bandits have four mages on their side. Seeing Alice's healing ability, the leader orders his men to not let her get away. As soon as the healing is done, Art quickly grabs Alice's hand and tries to run away. The bandits turn their attention to the duo to stop them. Adam tells them to escape while he holds them off. One of the bandits uses his bow to try and shoot them with an arrow. Art quickly senses the danger and turns around to stop it. He uses his wooden sword to stop the arrow. Though the sword fails to stop the arrow and breaks, it manages to change the arrow's direction toward the ground, so no one gets injured. The bandit is shocked by Art. The momentary carelessness is all it takes for Helen to shoot the bandit with her own arrow, killing him. As the two continue to try and escape, Art realizes that something is off. Ray told him that the bandits have four mages, but when he counts them, he only sees three. The leader suddenly shouts an order to someone to kill the pair so they don't escape. It's the fourth mage. He uses water magic to form a big swirling water bubble and throws it at the pair. Art knows that even if he dodges it, his mother will get hit. Seeing only one way to protect her, he pushes her out of the way. He gets hit by the water magic and is pushed off of the cliff. Wanting to take the mage out with him, he throws his knife at the mage with a string attached to it. The mage tries to hold on to the edge of the cliff, but it breaks off, sending the two plummeting down. 
As they fall, Durden tries to use his earth magic to save them. He makes a giant hand using magic and tries to grab them. Art recalls his past life as a king. In this world, the king was no more than a puppet. While the council was the one that actually governed the country, managing its politics and economy. In a world riddled with problems, wars were replaced with duels and armies with kings. Art was one of these puppet kings. Tired of this life, he decided to retire. Despite being the strongest, he was still an orphan with all his loved ones gone and would do anything to be with them. In the present, he wakes up after having survived the long fall. The bandit mage, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. Art knows that if he wants to survive, he will have to become stronger. He struggles to move and grabs a piece of fruit sitting on a log beside him. He gulps it down along with his remaining water. He uses all his strength to get up. His injured body just refuses to do what he wants. After getting up, the first thing he does is retrieve his dagger, which is still stuck in the bandit's leg. When he looks up at the cliff, he is surprised at how he managed to survive. He doesn't even know how long it has been since the fall. But it doesn't matter. If he wants to survive, he must keep moving. Just as he starts walking away, he hears an eerie voice. He gets scared and quickly takes cover behind a tree. At first, he thinks that maybe the voice is coming from the dead bandit. Art takes a stick and pokes the bandit just to make sure he is dead. The voice continues speaking, telling Art that it's not coming from the corpse. He is relieved that the bandit is not alive when suddenly he hears a voice coming from the bushes. He readies to dagger to meet the potential threat, as he knows better than to trust a strange voice. He asks the voice who she is, and if she is the one who saved him. It was a false alarm as the culprit behind the sound was just a rabbit. The voice replies to Art's second question, confirming that they were the ones who saved him. As for his first question, he will have to come to their dwelling if he wants to find out. At first, he is hesitant to do what the voice is saying, but she tells him that she is the only one who can help him reunite with his family. The mention of his family floods his mind with questions. Are they alive? Did they make it to Ixyris safely? Art, desperate to see his family again, surrenders and requests the voice's assistance in finding them. Just as the voice agrees, Art's eyes turn crimson and his vision focuses on a massive boulder in the heart of the wood. With that, he starts his journey towards her dwelling. While walking, Art couldn't help but think about the voice. He wonders what kind of magic she used to rescue him and why she chose to save only him and not the bandit. While trekking through the forest, he hears the sound of a river. Having not bathed in a while, he rushes towards it and jumps into the river. As the sun begins to set, he continues his journey to the rock. Art realizes that the forest is abundant with mana, but it's unusual that there are no beasts roaming around. As night falls, he finally arrives at the rock, and the voice directs him to enter the crevice. While proceeding further, Art stumbles and falls into a cavern. As he stands up, he is petrified to see an enormous creature perched on a throne, crafted from rocks. He is so scared that he falls back again. The creature resembles a colossal suit of armor with crimson luminescent lights for its eyes and mouth. It is the source of the voice that Art has been hearing throughout his journey. The monster gets up and starts moving toward him. As the creature approaches him, Art notices a big gash in its stomach. It seems like it is injured. The monster extends its colossal hand towards Art and assists him in standing up. She also tells him that it'll take some time for her to open a dimensional rift to transport him home. So in the meantime, he can stay in the cave and eat the fruits there to nourish himself. Art expresses gratitude and proceeds to pick up the unfamiliar fruit, which looks like an oversized grape. As they consume the fruit, Art reminisces about the joyful moments when he dined with his family. As the two eat, he asks for her name and she introduces herself as Sylvia. With his initial fear of Sylvia's appearance diminishing, he feels more at ease and proceeds to ask her all the questions that have been bothering him. She tells him that this place is located between the Beast Glades and the Forest of Elshire. No one comes near because she has been warding off anyone who comes close. Art is the first person to have ever entered this place. Sylvia reveals to Art that she resides alone in the cavern as she has no one left. Additionally, she informs him that she has enemies who want something she possesses, and her wound resulted from her last battle. When Art inquires about why Sylvia saved him, she confesses that she herself doesn't know the reason, but perhaps it's because she has become lonely. As her wound starts to fester and she needs to be in good physical condition to create the portal, Sylvia bids Art goodnight and excuses herself for the evening. As the fearsome figure begins to walk away, Art couldn't help but think how lonely she looked.
Sylvia suddenly turns back and tells him that in case he was wondering his family and friends are safe. Upon hearing this, Art is overcome with emotion and starts to cry. Art and Sylvia's initial encounter was fraught with fear and uncertainty. However, as time passed, they grew closer and began spending hours chatting while she worked on the dimensional rift. Weeks turned into months, and Art began to understand what kind of a person this mysterious being is. Sylvia is the very definition of the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover. Even though she looks terrifying, she is kind and gentle. She reminds Art of his mother, who was also kind and gentle. On the other hand, his hatred for the bandits who caused him separate from his family grows stronger, and he promises himself to kill every last one of them. Sensing his animosity, Sylvia flicks him on his forehead, sending him flying. She tells Art that letting his heart be consumed by hatred will only cause harm to himself. Instead, she advises him to move on with his life and live with pride. Art is struck deeply by being lectured by a monster that looks like the epitome of evil. Sylvia's words about facing the future with a smile and learning from misfortunes resonates with him. Growing curious, she asks him how he managed to form his monocore at such an early age. He simply replies by telling her that he is a natural-born genius. With that being the case, she decides to teach him a new technique. Art is left surprised as Sylvia demonstrates her technique of gathering mana while moving. She tells him that with enough practice, he can even gather mana while fighting. However, when Art tries to do it himself, he fails to do so. Sylvia explains that monsters are born with the ability to multitask mana collection and movement, while humans typically awaken to their mana abilities later in life and struggle to do so. However, as a natural-born genius with an early mana core, Art has the potential to master this technique with practice. While Sylvia prepares the portal, Art starts practicing the new technique. Although he finds it difficult at first, he eventually manages to do it. Excited to share his progress with Sylvia, he looks over to her, but notices she has fallen over in pain as her wound worsens. Art hurries over to check on her, only to find that her bleeding has significantly worsened. He tries to flip her over, but due to her size, he is unable to do so. With the help of the new technique he recently learned, Art concentrates on gathering mana and successfully manages to turn her over. As he examines her wound, Art's heart sinks as he realizes that creating the portal had caused it to worsen significantly. He understands now that she had gone through with the risky endeavor despite the consequences, solely for his sake. Overcome with emotion, Art breaks down into tears as he weeps uncontrollably. Sylvia attempts to console him. Despite her worsening condition, she urges him not to blame himself and reminds him that their time together is limited. She expresses that she would hate for them to spend their remaining moments dwelling on the past. In an attempt to comfort Art, Sylvia reminds him that he is actually doing her a favor by helping her exit the treacherous cave more quickly. However, her words fail to stem his tears. As Sylvia's life begins to fade away, she makes the decision to reveal her true form. The dark armor that once encased her body begins to fall, revealing a magnificent white dragon in its place. Art is left shocked, but Sylvia tells him that they don't have much time. Now that she has undone her veil, they will be coming soon. With urgency in her voice, Sylvia rushes over to complete the portal and explains to Art that there are important things she must tell him before they part ways. As she speaks, she instructs him to cover the egg with the feather to conceal its aura. She then touches him, causing a strange glowing pattern to suddenly materialize on both of his arms. She assures him that all will be revealed in due time, but with time running out, she can only create a portal that will teleport him somewhere in the vicinity of his house. However, before they can depart, a strange monster suddenly enters the cave, causing it to start collapsing. He has the same dark armor that she was wearing. He addresses her as Lady Sylvia and demands her to hand something over. Before the monster can approach them any further, she uses her powers to freeze time for everyone except herself and Art, with time suspended around them. Sylvia makes a confession to Art, revealing that she intentionally prolonged the teleportation spell so that she could spend more time with him. Before they parted ways, as her life begins to slip away, she implores Art to call her grandma just this once. Fueled by grief and love for his departing friend, Art clings to Sylvia's wings and insists that they go together. However, she bids him farewell and flings him toward the portal. Just before he is teleported away, Art honors Sylvia's final wish and calls her grandma, acknowledging the bond they shared. He finds himself suddenly teleported to a forest, 
and the first thing that comes to his mind is the realization that it was likely the last time he would ever see Sylvia. With his heart heavy with grief, his mind becomes flooded with memories from the last four months that he spent with her. Despite the brevity of their time together, Sylvia had treated him as if he were her own kin. As he lies on the ground, consumed by grief, he is suddenly startled by a voice in his head. It is Sylvia's voice, unmistakably so. However, he soon realizes that it is merely a recording of Sylvia's last message for him before they parted ways. As a parting gift, Sylvia infused her will onto Art, telling him that his future development as a mage would depend on how well he uses this gift. She explains that once his mana core surpasses the white stage, he will hear from her again and she will reveal everything to him. As Sylvia bids him farewell, she addresses Art as King Grey, the name he had in his past life, which leaves him with lingering questions long after her voice fades away. He wonders how long she had known his true identity and why she had kept it a secret from him. Focusing on reuniting with his family, Art sets aside his questions and decides to climb a tree for a better view of his surroundings. From atop the tree, he quickly realizes that he's in Elshire Forest. Despite being barely able to use mono rotation, he's able to use magic for a much longer time. With this boost in power, he's able to move around the forest much faster. He jumps from one tree to another with great speed. As he moves, he suddenly hears the faint sound of a carriage rumbling through the woods. As Art approaches the carriage, his curiosity quickly turns to horror as he hears the faint but unmistakable sound of a child's cry. Drawing closer, he realizes that the carriage belongs to a group of ruthless slave traders who have kidnapped a young elf girl. Rage boils inside him as he watches the girl's desperate struggles and hears her cries for help. Despite his eagerness to get home, he needed a plan, but Art realizes that dealing with the slave traders is his best course of action right now. He realized that attacking them head-on would be a suicidal move, so he decided to follow them through the forest, utilizing his mana rotation to gather mana all the while. As they journeyed, Art remained vigilant, waiting patiently for the opportune moment when the traders would let their guard down. At long last, Art's patience paid off, and the perfect moment to strike presented itself. As the night descended, he made the decision to attack the slave traders. Using his quick thinking, he threw an acorn at one of the forest hounds, startling it and causing a commotion. Upon hearing the hound's roar, one of the slave traders goes to investigate, providing Art with the opportunity he needs. Moving swiftly, he takes out the slave trader with a mana blade, disabling him before he could raise an alarm. He takes the bandit's dagger while leaving his body to be devoured by the forest hounds. As the forest hounds continue to make noise, another slave trader becomes suspicious and comes to investigate. Upon discovering chewed up remains of his comrade, he is taken aback, but before he could react, Art swiftly sneaks up on him from behind and slashes him with his newly acquired dagger. With two of the slave traders now eliminated, Art is left with only two more to deal with. The last two slave traders sensed something amiss and became wary as they approached the carriage. One of them spotted Art and lunged at him with his sword, but Art dodged the attack and quickly countered by striking the man's legs. The last man hears the screams of his comrade and comes to help. The injured man warns his comrade, telling him to be careful as Art is a mage. It is revealed that the last man is also a mage. He gets excited about the prospect of capturing Art alive as a kid mage would get them a very high price. Art readies himself for the incoming attack, but the slave trader proves to be much faster and more agile, darting behind him in an instant. Art narrowly avoids the initial attack and retaliates by throwing a rock and then his dagger, but the man catches the dagger with ease. Once again, using his impressive speed, he suddenly appears before Art and delivers a powerful kick. The slave trader picks up the injured Art from the ground, but Art refuses to give up. With a burst of energy, Art uses fire magic to cause an explosion on the man's arm, causing it to be completely burned. Art uses this opportunity to throw his dagger at the man from behind. It goes right through his neck, instantly killing him. With others dead, he goes to finish off the last injured man. In the carriage, Art finds the elf girl with her hands and legs tied up. After untying her, Art decides to cover her eyes, not wanting her to see the gruesome scene he had left behind. He carries her a safe distance away from the carriage before opening her eyes. The girl expresses her gratitude towards him for rescuing her. But as he prepares to leave, she grabs onto his shirt with a pleading expression. He assumes that she doesn't want to be left alone, but reminds her that she is an elf and she'd be safe in the forest. However, 
She tells him that the forest beasts only fear adult elves, causing Art to reluctantly agree to help her find her way home. But to make things more difficult, she doesn't even seem to know her way home. Despite her lack of knowledge of the route, Art had already committed to helping her and thus returns to the wreckage of the carriage to gather supplies for their journey. Though he hopes that it won't be a long one, he takes warm clothes and other supplies from the carriage. Because of the mage's attack, the carriage got completely wrecked so they won't be able to use it. After releasing the forest hounds, he goes back to the elf girl. He gives her clothes that he found in the carriage, and they begin their journey to find the elves. They walk in the vague direction that the girl pointed towards. As night falls, Art sets up a tent for them to sleep in. He tells Tesha to rest while he keeps watch. He wanted to use this time to figure out this will that Sylvia left him with, but his plans are quickly interrupted. Tesha comes out of the tent and asks him to come in as well. She seems to be scared of being alone, but is unable to ask. She makes up the excuse that he will attract monsters if he sits out, and so he should keep watch while being inside. Art agrees to come in and sits beside her as she tries to go to sleep. As the sun rises, they resume their journey through the forest. Art's mind constantly wanders to his family back home, wondering if they're safe and if they're missing him. However, his thoughts are interrupted by the sharp pain emanating from his manicure, causing him to wince in agony. This pain would come unpredictably and would be almost unbearable for him. He decides not to tell Tesha as he doesn't want her to worry. Slowly, the pain started coming more and more frequently and every time he would hide it from Tesha. As more days passed, she started to recognize their surroundings, a sure sign that they're getting closer. Despite Art's efforts to strengthen himself with mana, the pain in his mana core only seems to be getting worse, and it's becoming harder to hide it from the worried elf. Their journey has slowed down due to Tesha's growing exhaustion. However, as they continue walking, Tesha spots a green mark on a nearby tree, which signifies that they are getting closer to the elven territory. Finally, they arrive at the teleportation gate. As soon as Tesha activates the gate, the pair are teleported to the elven city, which is stunningly beautiful and leaves Art speechless. Suddenly, a group of elven knights teleport in front of them, and they get down on their knees to welcome Tesha, addressing her as the royal princess. Art is left stunned as he realizes that he has just rescued a princess. Shortly after, Tesha's concerned parents, the king and queen of Eleanor, arrive to reunite with their daughter. They are accompanied by Tesha's grandfather, Virian Aerolith. It's a name noted in every history book. He is the former king of Eleanor and the man who led the last war against the humans of the Sapin Kingdom. With a little push from Art, Tesha rushes over to embrace her parents. As thanks for saving your daughter, the king invites Art to their home. They also want to know what happened to their daughter. Despite his gentle tone, Art could tell from his eyes that it was not a request, but an order. As they arrive at their home, he is awestruck to see the huge castle. Tesha orders the maids to take Art to his room and clean him up. Art tells her that he would first like to explain what happened to the king first. He sits at a long table with the royal family, along with their guard. Art formally introduces himself to the king and queen in the most respectful way possible. He begins the story of their journey. He tells them that he ended up in the forest after getting separated from his parents due to a bandit attack. He cleverly leaves out the part about Sylvia. When he eventually gets to the part about Tesha getting kidnapped by the slave traders, the king becomes furious. He slams his fist on the table, saying he should have known it was humans. Art humbly reminds the king that slave trading is a profession and not a race. This leaves the guards furious, and they all point their swords at him. Virian gestures to the guards to put down their weapons and asks Art how he managed to rescue her, despite being a child. Art tells him that he is a mage, and so he was able to eliminate the slave traders and rescue Tesha. The guards once again get angry and accuse him of lying. Art tells them that whether they believe him or not, the fact is that the princess has returned home safely, and now his only wish is to return to his family in the kingdom of Sapini. Art expresses to the king that his only desire is to return home to his family. Now that the princess has returned safely, Tesha becomes anxious at the possibility of losing her new friends so soon. After discussing their options, the king and queen decide to reward Art for his bravery in saving their daughter. However, the teleportation gate that leads to the human kingdom only opens during the summit conference, which occurs once every seven years. So instead, the king offers to send a group of guards with Art to escort him safely to his house. While the escort is prepared, the king offers to let him stay in the palace. He is given a comfortable room in the palace.
but while taking a shower, he experiences another bout of pain from his manicure. He sits on the couch, holding the egg as a way to comfort himself. He starts to wonder how nice it would have been if Sylvia was here to help him. As he is lost in thought, he hears a knock at the door. Just as he opens the door, Tesha headbutts him without a warning. She is upset as Art is going to leave soon. He is the first friend she has ever had. Moved by her sentiment, he comforts her by putting his arm around her and suggests they explore the castle together. Tesha leads Art on a delightful tour of her cherished spots in the castle and they finally reach the garden brimming with shimmering globbies. Excitedly, Tesha picks up one of the delicate creatures and offers it to Art to hold. Just as they're admiring the beauty of the garden, Art senses an object hurtling toward them. Reacting quickly, he pulls Tesha close and intercepts the flying object, which turns out to be a knife. He goes on the offensive and confronts the attacker, only to realize that it's Virian. He gets angry and yells at him, questioning how he could try to harm his own granddaughter. Virian then reveals that the knife was just a toy, leaving Art feeling embarrassed about his reaction. He is impressed by Art's quick reaction and instincts, but adds that his mana usage is mediocre at best. This leaves Art questioning the purpose of his visit. To further evaluate his abilities, Virian tosses him a wooden sword, eager to assess his combat skills. Art picks up the wooden sword and prepares to face off against Virian. He charges forward, but unfortunately his strike only hit Virian's coat as he uses his incredible speed to dodge the attack and appear behind Art. Virian attempts to deliver a karate chop to Art's neck, hoping to render him unconscious. However, Art's quick reflexes allow him to block the attack just in the nick of time. Virian doesn't stop there, following up his failed karate chop with a punch that forces Art to jump in the air to dodge. Seizing the opportunity, he lands a hit on Art. However, Art refuses to give up and quickly launches another attack. Despite using mana to enhance his movements, he struggles to keep up with Virian's incredible speed and agility. As before, Virian swiftly appears behind Art, causing him to dodge once again. However, this time he uses a sweep kick, throwing Art off balance and causing him to drop his sword. In a moment of impressive maneuvering, Art manages to grab the sword mid-air and scratch Virian's forehead with it just before he's knocked away. Despite Virian ultimately winning the fight, he's impressed that Art managed to land a hit. To everyone's surprise, he offers to take Art as his disciple. He also adds that he can teach him skills that no human mage in Sapine could ever offer. Initially, Art is hesitant and declines the offer, determined to find his family, instead of staying to train. However, Virian captures his attention when he reveals that there's a way for Art to communicate with his parents, and inform them that he's safe. Before continuing their conversation, Virian requests one of the maids to escort Tesha away. Art is surprised when Virian reveals that he's aware of Art's bouts of pain stemming from his monocore. As he put his coat back on, he asks Art if he's familiar with the concept of a beast will. Even though Art has no idea what he's referring to, he immediately recalls the memory of Sylvia touching him. Virian goes on to explain that when a mana beast reaches a rank of A or higher, it gains the ability to pass on its will to another individual. While he doesn't inquire as to how Art acquired his beast will, he does mention that it's currently causing more harm than good. Art asks if Virian also possesses a beast will, as he knows so much about it. Virian reveals that he is a beast tamer. It is a title one obtains when they completely conquer the beast will inside them. Although Art is eager to see his family, Virian warns him that leaving now could be very dangerous. If Art doesn't learn to control the power within his monocore soon, it could ravage him from the inside. The next morning, Tesha arrives early to wake him up, as she had been informed that he would be staying for a while, so she came to confirm with him. Art tells her that they will know for sure after the trip today. As the carriage is being prepared for their trip, the king and queen try to argue with Virian on the matter of letting Art stay. Even though he saved Tesha, it is inappropriate for a human to stay within the kingdom. It goes against all their traditions. Virian tells them that he has taken a liking to Art and Tesha also wants him to stay. The king tries to continue the argument, but Virian puts an end to it by stating that he will personally mentor Art, so they should let everyone know not to cause him any trouble. The group starts their journey as Art arrives at the carriage. Virian, Art, and Tesha set off to meet Virian's friend, who can assist Art in speaking with his parents. While on the journey, Tesha falls asleep in the carriage. Virian takes this opportunity to explain to Art that Tesha, being a princess, had to grow up in solitude without any companion. 
He adds that she has been hurt too many times by both adults and even children pretending to be her friends. As a result, she built a wall around herself. However, since Art arrived, Tesha has been smiling more frequently, which Virian appreciates and thanks him for. Finally, the group arrives at a weird-looking house in the heart of the forest. Virian starts banging on the door, calling for the old witch to come out. When she comes out, we see that the word witch does describe her quite accurately. He introduces her as Rena Darkassen, an old friend of his. She is a deviant who can help Art talk to his parents. Rena prepares a large bowl filled with water. As she uses her magic, she instructs him to imagine a mental picture of his parents while gazing at the water's surface. She tells him that once he can see his parents' image in the reflection, he will be able to communicate with them. Art creates a vivid mental picture of his mother and father, and to his amazement, their image begins to emerge slowly in the water. Art's parents were extremely saddened by his alleged demise, and their sorrow was evident in their appearance. While preparing dinner on a typical day, they're astounded to hear Art's voice resonating in their minds, leaving them in shock. He tells them how he managed to survive the fall and is staying in the elven kingdom. All the while, his parents can't help but recall the awful memories of when they lost their son. After the fall, Ray searched everywhere, but only found the dead bandit. Alina was so overwhelmed with grief from losing her son that she even attempted suicide. After searching for so long, the couple eventually comes to the conclusion that Art must have died. They eventually go to Ixyris, where they go to a wealthy friend of Ray's. He offers him a new job as the head of security, and the couple starts a new life there. In the present, upon hearing their son's voice, the couple cannot help but burst into tears while embracing each other, as they are overwhelmed with emotions. Even Art can't hold back his tears as he watches them in the water's reflection. Now, more determined than ever to get back, he tells Virian that he is ready to start their training as he wants to get back as soon as possible. When they return to the castle, Art is stopped by the king as he tries to enter. Both the king and the queen apologize to him for what they said earlier. The king welcomes him to the castle and thanks him for saving his daughter. They are interrupted by Tesha, who wants to show Art around the city as a form of apology. Art waits patiently for Tesha at the steps of the castle. When she finally arrives, they set off to explore the city. During their stroll, Art bumps into a noble elf. He is one of those elves who believe Art doesn't belong in their city, despite Virian saying otherwise. Ferith Ivsaur comes off as the annoying side character that one reads about in every novel. While introducing himself to Tesha, he doesn't even bother to pay attention to Art. Art mocks him by pretending to mistake his name for a Pokemon and sarcastically introduces himself as well. This anger, Ferith and he challenges Art to a duel, staking the honor of his house. He asks him what he will do telling him that his decision will reflect upon his mentor. Before Art can reply, he decides to take his silence as an acceptance. Tesha is forced to officiate the duel. As the prideful noble confidently moves toward Art, he fails to realize the strength of his opponent. Before he can finish his cliché lines about his genius, Art quickly dashes toward him and takes him out with a single punch, leaving even himself surprised by the weakness of the noble after all that talk. Tesha grabs him and they continue their tour, relishing the moment as Art's training is scheduled to start the next day, and they might not have the chance to do this again. She asks him if he is nervous, but Art tells her he is excited, not only for the training, but also for seeing his parents. Having come a long way, he is eager to see what the future holds for him. Art and Tesha have become even closer friends while training together under Virian for three years. During their training, they learn that there are four basic elements, water, earth, fire, and air, and each has a higher form, namely ice, gravity, lightning, and sound, respectively. These higher forms can only be controlled by a mage who has mastered its basic element. Each race has its own elemental affinities, with the dwarves excelling in manipulating earth and fire, and some of them possessing such mastery over these elements that they are capable of conjuring and manipulating magma. On the other hand, elves are limited to water, wind, and earth elements but they have a much higher affinity for them than humans. In rare cases, elves can produce a special deviant that can control plants. However, elves aren't able to produce mages that can control the higher forms. Humans have the ability to control all four basic elements and are capable of producing deviants in any of those elements. They can even produce anomalies that can't be categorized into the basic elements like healers and emitters. There exists a delicate balance of power between all these races. 
This is the explanation that Art gives Virian as part of his lesson. As part of the process called assimilation, Virian is preparing Art's body to pass on his beast will. Meanwhile, Tesha is undergoing rigorous physical training every day to develop her skills. For an elf, it is not usual to awaken at an age of 10, unlike humans who typically awaken during their preteen years. However, her awakening occurred at the tender age of 9, and since then, she has been honing her conjuring abilities under a mentor while simultaneously engaging in combat training with Virion. She is tired of getting beaten up all day, so she asks Virion to let Art do physical training as well. He explains to her that during the past three years, Art has been basically fusing his bones, muscles, and organs with his mana. He assures her that despite not doing physical training, he will become much stronger and more resilient. After three years of training, the time has finally come for Virian to stabilize Art's mana core. This means that he will become a beast tamer like him. He puts his hand on Art's chest. Virian explains that he is going to insert a large amount of his mana into Art's mana core. As soon as he starts the process, Art feels immense pain throughout his body. The pain is followed by an explosion of mana which sends Virian and Tesha flying. Virian is shocked as this has never happened before. He asks Art what kind of a beast gave him its will for there to be such a powerful reaction. Virian is left completely awestruck as Art tells him it was a dragon. Art passes out soon after when he regains consciousness. He finds Virian by his side and expresses his gratitude for their reliability in keeping his beast will a secret. Virian reminds him that the time for his departure is close, with only four months left. Art is surprised as he thought the summit conference was still two years away. Virian tells him that an interracial tournament is being held for the youths, and so the portal to Exira City will open. He is both happy and worried at the same time as he knows that he will have to break this news to Tesha. Virian tells him that now that the assimilation process is complete, they will train even harder for the last four months. Before leaving, Virian also tells him that he will break the news to Tesha. As Art sits in his room alone, he hears a cracking sound. It is the egg that Sylvia left him with and it is about to hatch. From within the egg, a baby dragon emerges revealing itself to be a small, adorable creature with jet-black scales, minuscule wings, and barely visible teeth. Overwhelmed by the cuteness of the dragon, Art picks it up, but to his surprise, the little dragon bites him on his arm, leaving behind a distinctive burn mark from its fiery breath. As Art tries to communicate with the baby dragon, he hears a voice in his mind. It appears that the dragon has formed a telepathic bond with him as she thinks of him as her mother. Deeply touched by this, Art decides to name the dragon Sylvie's in honor of its real mother. Art is taken aback as he senses a surge of excitement emanating from Sylvie at the sound of her newly given name, making him realize that his connection with the baby dragon goes beyond mere telepathy. Overcome with exhaustion, he falls asleep on his bed with Sylvie by his side. He is woken up by an excited Tesha as she discovers the cute baby dragon. He explains everything to her from how she hatched to his mental connection with her. They take Sylvie to Virian when they go for their usual training lesson. He is completely stunned when he sees a dragon casually sitting on Art's head. Art tells Virian about Sylvie's unusual hatching, and Virian explains that creatures like her typically only hatch in the presence of their own kind. Art realizes that activating Sylvia's will may have caused Sylvie to hatch. Virian suggests he should simply claim that Sylvie is a rare creature when he returns, as many people are not familiar with mana beasts. With Art now fully awakened, Virian suggests that they begin training to enhance his mana core. He emphasizes that the most effective way to strengthen both the mana core and the beast will is through constant combat. Art feels a rush of excitement at the prospect of sparring with Virian once again. His excitement quickly turns into shock as Virian finally decides to reveal his own beast will. A black shadow shaped as a panther surrounds him completely. As the shadow clears up, Art sees a black figure with yellow eyes and razor-sharp claws. It's Virian who has activated his beast will. Beast tamers possess a rare gift, as they are among the few mages who have the ability to tap into the innate powers inherited from a mana beast. This initial stage, commonly referred to as the acquire phase, enables the mage to draw upon the strength and agility of the mana beast, imbuing themselves with heightened speed and physical prowess. Upon entering the second phase, known as the Integrate phase, a Beast Tamer gains the ability to fully harness the distinctive powers of their mana beast. 
Virion, having dedicated decades to mastering this stage, can now skillfully wield the deadly prowess of a Shadow Panther to his advantage. Virion tells Art to get ready, warning him that he is going to sneak up behind him. Art is confident that it won't happen as he is now ready because of the warning. He keeps his eyes firmly on Virion, but in the blink of an eye, Virion completely disappears. A moment later, Art feels a dark, shadowy hand on his shoulder. He quickly turns around to attack, but once again Virion disappears from his sight and comes up behind him. Realizing the strength of his foe, Art decides to surrender as he knows he can't win if he can't even follow his movement. As Virion reverts back to his original form, he reveals to Art that while the Integrate phase grants him immense power, it comes at a cost. The exertion of the transformation drains him considerably, despite his years of training. Art realizes that it wasn't just his speed. He couldn't feel Virion's presence at all. Virion explains that Shadow Panthers possess the innate ability to manipulate the wind and sound around them, rendering themselves entirely undetectable. Having completed the demonstration, they resume their training. Days quickly passed as Art got immersed in his training. Through Virion's guidance and his own insight, he succeeded in unlocking the initial stage of his Beast Will. Virion also taught him how to hide his Beast Will when around other mages. Art spent most of his time either strengthening his Mana Core or studying the Dragon Will. And when he wasn't doing either, he was constantly sparring with Virion. Despite his busy training schedule, Art made sure to carve out time to enjoy his youth with Tesha, just as Sylvia had hoped he would. However, as the day of his departure drew near, he found it increasingly difficult to deliver the news to Tessia, whom he had spent countless days with over the past few years. Prior to his departure, Art carefully wrapped the feather around Sylvie's mark, allowing it to be concealed more easily. He would be leaving for the interracial tournament in a carriage alongside his fellow competitors. As a farewell gift, Virian presents Art with a compass bearing the crest of House Aerolith. Art hugs Tessia while saying goodbye. He tells her that he will miss her and promises to meet again. When he boards the carriage, he is surprised to find Faerith sitting there. It seems he is one of the participants. Before Faerith can start ranting about how he was beaten unfairly, Art grabs his hand and apologizes for what happened. Faerith is accompanied by two of his friends who are also from noble houses. After a long journey, they finally arrive at the floating city of Cyrus. Without hesitation, Art made his way directly to where his parents were staying. As he stood nervously outside the door, he couldn't help but feel a wave of memories wash over him, reflecting on his journey from the moment he became separated to the present. Despite his anxiety, he summons the courage to knock on the door and waits anxiously for a response. He hears the sound of a young girl's voice approaching. When the door opens, Art respectfully introduced himself to the maid, but his attention is quickly diverted when he saw the person he had been longing to see for so long. It was Alina, who had come to check up on her daughter, Eleanor. As Alina's gaze meets Art's, she is shocked to her core, and she drops the food she is carrying to feed Eleanor. Art can't hold back his tears as he meets his sister for the first time in his life. Alina quickly rushes over and embraces Art. When Ray hears what is going on, he too comes rushing over from all the way from the garden. He too hugs Art and Alina as the family of four all embrace each other tightly with tears of joy streaming down their faces. After things settle down, Alina begins to ask Art all the typical questions that a worried mother would, such as how he has gotten so thin and how his voice has changed. As she does so, she calls out to Eleanor to come meet her older brother. She climbs down from the couch and makes her way to Art. He gets down on his knees and introduces himself to his sister. The two parents couldn't be happier watching their kids bond. After the initial questions, Art begins to explain everything to his family. Although he trusts them completely, he chooses to leave out the part about Sylvia and his beast Will, instead telling them that he found Sylvie in a beast's den. He explains that her mother was dying from an injury, and he couldn't save her, so he decided to adopt the little creature and raise her. He feels guilty about keeping secrets from his family, but he believes it's necessary to protect them until he becomes strong enough. Ray, being his usual self, asks him how strong he has become. He tells Art that he has been working as an instructor for the guards at the Helsty Auction House. Curious about Ray's progress, Art asks about the current stage of Ray's mana core. He boasts about his monocore having reached the dark orange. He is left dumbfounded when Art reveals that his monocore is at the light red stage, which is just one stage behind Ray. Upon hearing the news of Ray's son's return, Vincent and his family rush over to greet him and his family. They had been taking care of Art's family while he was gone. 
Ray introduces Art to Vincent and his wife, Tabitha, and Art respectfully greets them with a deep bow. Vincent expresses surprise at his respectful behavior, even questioning if he is truly Ray's son. Tabitha warmly welcomes Art to their home and introduces him to their young daughter, Lilia. Like Tesha, Lilia instantly falls in love with Sylvie upon meeting her. After the introduction, everyone moves out to the yard to witness the sparring match between Ray and Art. As they wait for the match to start, Alina tells Tabitha that Art is a mage with a light red mana core. But Vincent is in disbelief, finding it hard to accept that an eight-year-old could possess such abilities, as even the genius students at the Exiris Academy are only at the dark red stage, and they are 11 or 12. As the duo kicks off their match, Art charges toward Ray with incredible speed. He attempts to punch him, but Ray skillfully blocks the attack. Ray grabs Art's arm, intending to toss him, but Art counters and flips him instead. Despite being thrown, he expertly maneuvers his footwork to avoid falling. With the fight reset, Ray shifts gears and advances to the next stage. He conjures his magical powers and bursts into flames, covering his entire body. When a child is born, their affinities and strengths are already set. Usually, parents consult professionals to learn what route to push their newborn mage towards. For conjurers, it is plainly obvious what their affinities are. But for augmenters, it's much more subtle until they cross a certain threshold and are able to manifest elements. For Ray, who has been fighting and training from an early age, it took him until the orange stage to turn his explosive mana into an actual fire. In Art's previous life, affinities weren't decided at birth, but it was a path that one chose to follow. This meant that they weren't restricted. Following Ray's lead, Art decides to manifest his own element, which is lightning. As the fight begins, both utilize the strengths of their particular elements. Art uses the speed he gains from his lightning element while Ray tries to counter using the explosive power of the fire element. The fight quickly ramps up as both elements clash causing a massive explosion. As the fight continues, Art finds himself on the back foot as Ray slowly overwhelms him with a barrage of punches. Art uses his amazing speed to dodge the punches and tries to counter with an uppercut. Ray also prepares to attack with a kick. However, just before their attacks connect, both fighters stop. Both Art and Ray recognize that the fight has reached its end. While training with Virion, Art discovered Lightning to be his most successful deviant affinity, as he struggled with the instability of his ice magic and had yet to train with sound and gravity. Nonetheless, he enjoyed boasting about his Lightning abilities to his parents. Vincent is left in awe after witnessing Art's remarkable talent, and even Tabitha concedes to his extraordinary abilities. At lunch, the Helsty family is shocked to find out that Art awakened at the age of three. Vincent even suggests enrolling Art in the Exiris Academy. It is the most prestigious magic institution in the entire continent. Tabitha agrees with her husband and even offers to sponsor Art so he can study free of cost. Alice, however, tries to politely refuse the generous offer, citing the family's already abundant support. She adds that Art is still only eight and the Academy may not even consider him. Nevertheless, Vincent reassures her that it would not pose an issue as he had conducted business with the Academy director before and can vouch for Art. Before Vincent can elaborate further, Art interjects and expresses his desire to spend some time with his family before contemplating parting ways again to attend the Academy. As Art makes a sudden exit from the dining table, Lilia takes notice of his unusual behavior and decides to follow him. She follows him to the hallway and offers to take him to a great place she knows and takes him to the servant quarters, where the maids and servants are already present, and they all seem delighted to see Lilia. One of the older maids, Maria, even gives Lilia a plate of food, suggesting that it's a regular occurrence where Lilia sneaks away to Maria's quarters to indulge in food without her mother's knowledge. One of the maids confides in Art that Lilia often seeks refuge here when she's feeling stressed. The maid goes on to explain that despite neither Vincent nor Tabitha being mages, they have high expectations for Lilia to awaken as one, which causes her constant anxiety about potentially disappointing them. Art begins to understand the situation. As night falls, Alice and Ray come to bid Art goodnight and inform him that they plan to go shopping together the following day to make up for lost time and strengthen their bond. Art is woken up early by Sylvie. He is visited by Eleanor, who has come to wake him up so they can go shopping. After the morning breakfast, Art heads out accompanied by Alice, Eleanor, Tabitha, and Lilia for shopping as well as to explore the city. The first shop that catches Art's attention is a shop full of mysterious orbs. Tabitha explains that they are called Beast Cores. They are expensive orbs extracted from mana beasts that can be used to enhance one's power, 
with the possibility of acquiring a beast will from them. However, they are very expensive, with some costing hundreds or even thousands of gold. Tabitha offers to show Art the Helstia auction house, which often receives many beast cores. Their conversation is interrupted by Lilia. She is eager to take Art to a certain shop. To his horror, it turns out to be a barber shop. Art is reluctant, but eventually gets a new hairstyle with the help of Alice and the rest of the group. Afterward, they continue their shopping tour. While walking through the market, Art spots a group of teenagers in uniforms causing a commotion. Lilia informs him that they are students of Exiris Academy, which is a status symbol and they are treated like royalty by the common folk. As they continue with their day, they are oblivious to the fact that they are being followed. The stalker appears to have set their sights on Sylvie. Upon their return, Art is taken aback to find Cynthia Goodsky, the director of Exiris Academy, waiting for him as an unexpected guest. The Academy's reputation precedes itself, as it is considered the most prestigious institution for mages who possess both talent and the right background. Anyone who has made an impact in the world has had ties with the Exiris Academy. This is the kind of fame the Academy had standing tall above all the other countless academies of its kind throughout the continent. And on top of this is the Academy's very own director, Cynthia Goodsky. Despite the palpable tension in the room, Art remains oblivious to the importance of the person standing before him. As Cynthia greets him and extends her hand in friendship, when Art tries to do the same, he is quickly made to bow by Alice as she apologizes to Cynthia for her son's rudeness. Cynthia is quick to forgive Art expressing her gratitude for Vincent's contributions to the school. Vincent and Tabitha escort her to the courtyard for a demonstration of Art's talents, treating her with utmost deference and respect. As they walk towards the courtyard, Alice drags Art around, but his only concern seems to be his missed dinner. Cynthia takes notice of Sylvie and assumes she is Ray's contracted beast, but Art corrects her by saying she is his bond. Art tells her the story of finding Sylvie in a beast's den. Cynthia is surprised as she has never seen a man a beast like Sylvie before. When they arrive at the courtyard, Cynthia notices Art's calm demeanor and starts to wonder if it's his arrogance or confidence, but he is simply focused on his dinner. During his training with Varian, Art mastered the elements of fire and water magic first, followed by wind and earth. For the demonstration, he chooses to use his weaker elements of wind and earth. He starts the fight by using earth magic, which surprises his family. Art destroys the ground around him and kicks a rock in the air, sending it flying towards Cynthia. She is able to easily counter it by creating a swirling wall using her wind magic. Art uses a combination of earth and wind magic to launch himself toward her. Using his own wind magic, he breaks to throw the swirling wall and tries to punch her. However, a small flick of the wrist is all it takes for her to produce a powerful gust of wind, sending him flying backward. Keeping his training in mind, he uses wind magic to orient himself and uses earth magic to suspend a stone in the air to land. The fight continues to intensify. Art dashes in for another attack, but is once again blown away by Cynthia's wind magic. On an ending note, Cynthia decides to try to attack herself. She casts a spell, sending four raging tornadoes toward him. Art conjures up his own wind magic to counter, creating winds in the opposite direction to deflect the tornadoes. She is impressed by Art's performance. Despite his overconfidence, she admires his magical and combat prowess. However, she decides to give him one more test, calling it an extra credit. She uses sound magic to send loud, screeching noises toward Art. Despite the agony, Art manages to stay conscious and passes the test. Cynthia shares the good news with Ray, expressing her admiration for Art's use of wind and earth magic and her temptation to teach him herself. However, when Ray asks about Art's use of earth and wind magic, Vincent reveals that he called Cynthia because he believed Art could use fire and lightning magic. Art shocks everyone by revealing that he can use all four elements, causing Cynthia to lose her balance and needs Ray's assistance to stand. Art apologizes to his family for keeping his strength a secret and Cynthia senses that something is bothering him, prompting her to take action. She puts up a barrier around herself and Art so no one can listen in on their conversation. Now able to speak his mind, Art tells her that he revealed his strength because he needs two things, power and influence. If she can keep his family safe, he will not only attend the Exiris Academy, but also consider her his benefactor. He tells her that he wants to live his life to the fullest for now, so in three years' time he will join the Academy. Until then, he wants to be an adventurer. As Art reveals his desire to go adventuring, his family reacts as expected. Alice, having been an adventurer herself, 
is filled with worry and adamant about not letting her son face the same dangers she did. Especially after the fact that he was gone for so many years, Ray tries to calm her down and suggests that they hear Art out. However, Alice's anger is redirected towards Ray, and she breaks down in tears, remembering the struggles they endured to get to where they are now. Art reaches out and takes his sobbing mother's hand. He tells her that he wants to spend more time with her, but he also wants to experience all that he has missed out on due to his training in the Elven Kingdom. To convince her, he proposes that he can have a supervisor with him during adventuring. Ray jumps in and starts considering potential candidates for this task, earning Alice's wrath for even suggesting the idea of letting their son leave. After a lengthy discussion, they come up with a compromise. Alice gives Art her consent, but with three conditions. First, he must wait until his birthday in three months. Second, he must have a guard with him at all times. And lastly, he must visit home at least once every two months. Ray suggests that the twin horns, who are supposed to be coming soon for an expedition, would be the perfect candidates to be Art's guard. Even Alice is surprised by Ray's sudden genius. Art, on the other hand, can't wait to reunite with the twin horns after so long. While they wait for their arrival, Art decides to have a meeting with Vincent. Vincent is taken aback by the strong presence that Art gives off. He feels more nervous talking to this eight-year-old than when he did during his meeting with the King of Sepin. Art tells him that the reason for this meeting is that he wants Vincent to acquire a few items for him. Those being a protective cloak, a sword his size, and a mask capable of altering the wearer's voice. Art puts forward an intriguing proposal as compensation. He has discovered a method to hasten a person's awakening. He was going to help his sister, Eleanor, with it. So he offers to use it on Lilia as well so she can become a mage and attend Osiris Academy. In his previous life, Art was a weak boy who lost the most important person in his life due to his weakness. In his current life, his goal is to become strong not to seek revenge, but to protect his loved ones. As Art is lost in his thoughts about his plan to help Lilia awaken, his mother returns home from shopping with Lilia and Tabitha, interrupting his chain of thoughts. Upon hearing about Art's plan, Alice and Tabitha become angry, assuming it to be some sort of a joke. However, Art reassures them that he is serious about his plan. With both Lilia and Eleanor present, Art decides to try out his new method. To sense mana, Art teaches them a special breathing technique, which involves slow and deep breaths. The next step is to locate the core fragments in their bodies. Eleanor seems to have an easier time with this step than Lilia. To help them visualize the particles even better, Art pumps some of his mana into their bodies. Once they can see the small particles, he instructs them to focus their thoughts and bind the particles together. Despite his exhaustion from using this method, Art persists, but eventually stops. The anxious parents approach Art, inquiring if Lilia can truly become a mage. Art gives them the good news that although it may take a few years, Lilia should have no issues becoming a mage. Tabitha expresses her joy by embracing Art and breaking into tears. Following this event, Art's life falls into a comfortable routine for the next few months. Every morning, he helps Lilia and Eleanor with their awakening and then focuses on his own training. Two months pass by in the blink of an eye. The time has finally arrived for the arrival of twin horns. Art waits impatiently at the door, anxious to meet them. As soon as the door knocks, he dashes over to answer. As the door opens, Angela rushes in and quickly hugs him, almost smothering him with her love. As soon as their eyes meet, Durden breaks down into tears as he recalls the memories of the time when he failed to save Art as he fell down the cliff. The next two to enter the house are Helen and Adam. Both of them are also extremely happy to see him. However, the most surprising reaction comes from Jasmine as she comes running in and hugs Art. He starts sobbing uncontrollably while apologizing to him. After things settle down, everyone starts getting ready for the event at the Helsty auction house. While they get dressed, Ray tells Vincent how surprised he is by his son's growth. He mentions the pressure he feels emanating from him every time they spar. It's the pressure similar to facing someone who has fought countless battles. There are even times during their fights when Art trips up as if he is not used to his own body. He starts wondering why this is. However, Vincent dismisses it as early puberty. The whole group including the twin horns dress up in fancy black clothing to attend the event. As they leave, Vincent once again thanks Art for what he is doing for Lilia. The group arrives at the auction house in carriages driven by giant lizards, and they are greeted by two servants upon opening the carriage door. Art is taken aback by the grandeur of the auction house, which resembles a colossal castle. 
The event is the 10th anniversary of the Helstia Auction House, an occasion that has aroused the excitement of nobles and adventurers alike, as it is a rare opportunity to acquire priceless artifacts kept locked away for this very event. Raid assumes the role of head of security, and Art feels a sense of pride towards his father. The twin horns also depart to assist Ray, while Alice, Tabitha, Lilia, Eleanor, and Art enter the auction house to take their seats. Despite having been a king in his past life, Art is impressed by the interior of the auction house. They proceed to the private viewing room that has been reserved for them, which offers a clear view of all the guests entering the auction house. The chief guests for the event, the king and queen of Sapin, along with their family, eventually arrive. The king's presence at the event highlights its significance. The group pays their respects by kneeling and introducing themselves to the royal family. The king notices Sylvia, Art's bonded mana beast, and inquires about her. The court's wizard suddenly lets out a surprise scream from the back of the room, having apparently realized Sylvia's true nature. However, the king intervenes and prevents him from further investigating, reminding him that it is neither the time nor the place to study someone's pet. After the wizard apologizes, everyone prepares to take their seats as the event is about to commence. Nevertheless, Art detects something strange about the wizard. The auction is about to commence, and the host stirs up the audience's excitement by promising them rare and valuable items. The adventurers express their enthusiasm with boisterous cheers, while the nobles maintain their dignified demeanor. Before the auction can begin, the host and the crowd pay homage to the king and queen with a deep bow. They also acknowledge the man responsible for organizing the event, Vincent, by giving him a round of applause. With the formalities concluded, the auction gets underway. As Art observes the scene, he is momentarily reminded of his past life as a king, but he dismisses these thoughts to enjoy the occasion. While scanning the room, he notices his mother and Tabitha conversing with the queen. He also observes that the queen is carrying a wand, which leads him to deduce that she must be a conjurer. However, he cannot detect her mana, which could indicate that she is either carrying an artifact to conceal it or possesses a high enough level to elude his senses. The auctioneer then presents a sword for bidding, and Vincent seizes the opportunity to ask Art if he wishes for him to acquire it. Since he is the proprietor, price is not a concern. The sword, crafted by a master smith who is also a fire artificer, is a short sword with a thunder-hot core in its handle, allowing the user to generate electricity around the blade's edge, inflicting greater damage. Bidding for the sword starts at 50 gold coins, and the crowd eagerly places their bids in hopes of obtaining it. Art cannot help but notice the excessive price of the sword, which is worth more than a modest house in Exiris. In his hometown of Ashbur, a handful of copper coins can sustain an average family comfortably for a considerable time, while the opening bid for the sword can feed a family in Ashbur for 250 years. Politely declining Vincent's offer, Art explains that he seeks something less distinctive. Vincent understands Art's preferences, knowing him well. Why settle for a few sparks when one can wield lightning itself? Vincent assures Art that he has already acquired all the items that he requested, except for a sword, and advises him to notify him if he finds something he likes during the auction. The auction proceeds with a myriad of exquisite items on display, including weapons, armor, and beast cores. Even the king bids on an A-class beast core, which will reveal if it contains a beast will once the recipient absorbs it. Engrossed in the auction, Art fails to notice Sylvie's absence until he finds her conversing with the court mage. Rushing over to her, he calls her away. Before leaving, the court mage warns Art that a commoner has no right to own a special beast and threatens to ensure that Sylvie belongs to him. The mage's insolent remark infuriates Art, prompting him to lose control and unleash his rage in the form of bloodlust toward the mage. A few moments prior to the incident involving Art, Vincent had been discussing the newly acquired beast core with the king. Suddenly, an intense wave of bloodlust swept over them, causing Vincent to drop to his knees in terror. The queen and guards immediately sprang into action, ready to confront the unknown threat, while the king drew his sword to protect his family. The twin horns and Ray, even from outside, could sense the disturbance and rushed to the scene. Everyone in the room was left stunned and bewildered by the sudden turn of events caused by Art's loss of control. Art himself was worried that he may have exposed his true powers, but his fears were quelled by the news that an unrelated intruder had been apprehended, thus saving him from exposure. The auction proceeded as usual, and the final item presented was an infant world lion, leaving the audience in awe. World lions are rare and possess the ability to develop into B-class or even A-class mana beasts with proper care and nurturing, 
offering the owner a chance to become a legendary beast tamer by acquiring its beast will. The bid starts off at 500 gold, but it doesn't take much time for the price to reach all the way up to 800 gold. However, the bid is won by the king with a staggering price of 1,000 gold, which is double the original price. The crowd is left disappointed as they dare not challenge the king with their bid. Vincent congratulates the king and asks him if he wishes to raise the beast himself, but the king tells him that he plans on gifting it to his son, Curtis. Upon hearing this, Curtis gets up from his chair and respectfully thanks his father for the honor. With the end of the auction, everyone prepares to leave to get the items that the king bought. However, they are stopped by the court mage as he wishes to make a request. He whispers to the king about his wish to get Sylvie from Art. Even though Art couldn't hear what they were saying, he knows something is off. They make their way to the storage where the king gets his items. Vincent also presents Art with the items he had requested. The bad feeling that Art had comes true as the king calls Re over. The king introduces the court mage, Sebastian, to the group, telling them about all the great services he has provided to the royal family. He explains that Sebastian has taken a liking to Art's bond, and it would be a great service to the kingdom if he can get Sylvie. As Ray knows the importance of Sylvie to Art, he apologizes to the king and explains that he cannot speak on Art's behalf since he had no part in acquiring Sylvie. It is up to Art to make the decision. Alice becomes worried because she knows her son well enough to understand that he would never want to part with Sylvie, but at the same time, they cannot refuse the king's request. The king approaches Art, and instead of lowering his head, Art meets his gaze with defiance. The king respectfully makes the request to Art once again and promises to present him with a great sword that suits a young aspiring knight as he heard Art's conversation with Vincent. Before responding, Art takes a deep breath to calm himself so he doesn't say anything inappropriate. Then he bows deeply and respectfully towards the king and refuses the offer, stating that nothing can replace Sylvie. Sebastian gets angry with Art's defiance, but the king orders him to stop. The king then proposes a trade, offering the world lion cub he just acquired for his bond, thinking it would be a better offer for Art since he does not know Sylvie's true nature. However, Art declines once again. The tension in the room grows as tempers begin to flare up. No one would dare to deny the king's request even once, much less twice. The king starts losing his patience and orders him once again to give up his bond, despite it being a request. Everyone in the room can tell from the tone that it's more of an order. Art calms his anger once again before responding, asking the king how much he would be willing to sell his own children for. He explains that the king doesn't understand the weight of his request, so he hopes to clarify it with this question. This statement leaves everyone, including the king's own family, shocked. With a gesture from Sebastian, the charges at Art to punish him for his insolence. The guard swings his sword with every intention of slicing him in half. However, Art swiftly dodges the attack encounters by throwing a powerful uppercut, knocking him out with one attack. Sebastian, however, chooses to continue the assault and tries to cast a spell in Art's direction. Art uses the same spell that Sylvie used and freezes time for everyone except himself and Sebastian. Using this opportunity, Art lets out all his anger and attacks Sebastian. In the blink of an eye, he appears before him and breaks his leg. Desperate and in pain, he calls out to the guards to help him, not realizing that Art has frozen time for everyone. Sebastian is left terrified as he realizes that he is on his own with this child mage, whom he believed to be a mere kid, but in reality is a true monster. From everyone else's point of view, Art seemingly counters the guard's attack, but suddenly collapses without any apparent cause. Sebastian, on the other hand, appears with a broken leg. The queen immediately orders her men to locate an emitter to heal Sebastian's injury, while Alice and Ree watch heartbroken as their son undergoes suffering once again. Art wakes up in his bed, unable to recall what happened after using the static void to freeze time. Thanks to Sylvia's will, he has acquired the ability to use all her techniques, making him a formidable opponent. However, despite his many years of training, he is still only able to use it for a few seconds, and that too with a harsh backlash. This time he used it for too long, and thus the reason for his loss of consciousness. He is visited by Alice and Sylvie in his room. She is relieved to see her son. She explains that the doctor told them that he most likely lost consciousness from the shock. This leaves Art relieved as he wouldn't have to explain everything to her, but he is also very sad about making her worry again. Due to the panic that was caused by the guard's attack, the king decided to end things by excusing himself. Alice tells him that Ray is talking to the king's representative as they speak about everything that happened. Art assures Alice that he is fine now and goes downstairs to check out the situation. 
it seems that the king's representative is trying to end the matter by compensating them with money. However, this leaves Ray angered as he believes that his son's life is more important and can't be compensated with money. Art, on the other hand, tries to smooth things out and apologies to the man for his behavior. He accepts the gold and ends the matter there. Da, he asks about Sebastian's condition, still concerned about any potential exposure. The man explains that Sebastian claimed Art was responsible for his injury, but the lingering mana on Art's staff indicates that his spell ricocheted off the guard and hit Sebastian instead. He is relieved and amused by the ironic turn of events. With the situation resolved, the man departs and Ray gives him the bag of gold, which he had originally intended for Art's use as an adventurer. Art thanks Ray and stores the money safely before examining the items he obtained from Vincent. He is pleased to find everything, including the mask, which he can use to conceal his identity and perhaps let loose a bit. With Art's birthday coming soon, Ray holds a meeting with the Twin Horns to see if they want to volunteer to be Art's supervisor. He tells them that he is hoping Helen or Durden would be up to the task. He even offers to compensate them for their trouble. However, Durden reassures him that they are like family and he would love to accompany Art and watch him grow. Helen feels the same way. However, their conservation is interrupted by a surprising development as Jasmine volunteers to do it. Jasmine is the type of adventurer who hates escorting missions the most, so it comes as a surprise to everyone. However, when one thinks about it, she is most suited for this task. Durden specializes in defensive AoE spells, which are more suited for a large party rather than an individual and Helen's skills aren't good at protecting anyone. Alice once again asks her if she is really sure, but Jasmine assures her that she is fine with it. Even Adam agrees with her. Jasmine is the only augmenter among the twin horns with an elemental affinity. She is also past the light orange stage. With her wind attribute, she is the most suited for this. She too seems most happy to accompany Art as they have become close friends. When Art returns home with his parents, he is surprised to see Lilia meditating on her own. Art is happy as this way she will be able to awaken quickly without his help. If Ellie also starts meditating on her own, she can awaken at around the age of seven or eight. But it may be for the better as awakening too early may draw unnecessary attention. Now that he has a supervisor, Art and Ray decide to head to the auction house to get the final item that he needs, a sword. This is the first time he meets Vincent and Tabitha after the incident with the king. After answering their questions about his health, they head to storage to pick up a sword for Art. The storage is a giant warehouse with all kinds of weapons and other items, ranging from armor to bows and many different types of swords. Art gets excited, but his excitement quickly turns to disappointment. Despite the huge amount of swords, there doesn't seem to be anything he wants. Many of the swords are two-handed or large one-handed swords. His search for a dependable sword that he can use with his small body bore little fruit. While searching, he hears a rustling sound. It's Sylvia as she struggles to drag something from under a pile of boxes. It looks like a black stick. However, upon inspection, Art realizes that it's a sword in a sheath. He tries to pull it out, but it seems to be stuck. He even imbues it with mana, but try as he might, the sword doesn't budge. Art suddenly has an epiphany. After he removes Sylvia's feather from the mark on his arm, the sword finally comes out. It's a blue translucent sword as if it were made out of light. Art couldn't help but think how beautiful the sword was, too much to be considered a weapon. However, there is still one problem. Art realizes that it is too heavy for him to use effectively with the sheath as well. He tries it on a wooden barrel, but it doesn't cut through completely. While examining the blade, he discovers an engraving that reads Don's Ballad WK4, possibly indicating the sword's creator. Suddenly, he feels a sharp pain in his hand, and the sword lights up with electricity, drawing some of his blood and absorbing it. Art is shocked to see that the blade has shrunk to match his size. He tests the sword on the wooden barrel once again, and this time he is able to slice through it cleanly. Although it is rare, there have been cases of master artificers making weapons that bond with a single user, allowing for better manipulation of mana. However, there are no such cases for a sword. Art is called on by Ray, telling him to hurry up as they are getting late. Art decides not to tell them about his new weapon and picks out a random sword as a substitute. Ray decides to give the sword a try. Although he finds the balance to be a little off, he comes to the conclusion that it may be good enough for Art due to his small size. However, Ray grows curious when he sees the strange stick dangling from his waist. Art makes up the excuse that he found it and thought it may be a good practice tool. One of the workers at the auction house tells them that a senile old man threw it at one of their merchants, mumbling about how no one is worthy of it. 
Despite multiple inspections, they haven't found anything special about it, and so she tells them that it's just a sturdy, hard cane. Art uses a cute face and asks Vincent if he can have it, even calling him Uncle Vincent. Just like Alice, he is unable to resist and agrees to give him the stick. Art's birthday has finally arrived, and his family and the twin horns throw him a grand party. Vincent prepares a loudish feast for everyone, and they all have a great time, enjoying the celebration as a family. After the feast, they move on to the gift-giving ceremony. Alice and Ray are the first to present their gift. They give Art a leather glove adorned with three gems. Alice explains that Ray hunted and skinned the leather from a spiked aurochs, and the gems are imbued with her minor healing spells. This can help him stay safe during missions. Art hugs them and expresses his gratitude for the thoughtful present. Then it's Vincent's turn. He kneels down and presents Art with a pair of two rings. He quickly gets a slap on the head for his failed attempt at humor. However, he still presents the gift while Tabitha explains that it's a gift for the whole family. Art can wear one of the rings, and the other is for Alice. As long as he has it on, it will alert Alice if his mana level drops to a dangerous level. Alice quickly hugs Tabitha, thanking her for the gift. However, Art realizes that it could be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it could ease his family's worries, but on the other hand, it might make them anxious waiting for the ring to go off. The twin horns are the last to give Art a gift, a transmission scroll that can be used to communicate with someone once. Adam explains that the user can record a message for anyone they want, and the receiver can reply with a message as well. The following day marks the beginning of Art's career as an adventurer. Alice hugs him and urges him to stay safe. Regardless of how wealthy or influential he becomes, her only desire for her son is his safe return. As night falls, the twin horns bid their farewells and leave the mansion. As Art prepares for bed, he reminds himself that he must become stronger to protect his family. The next day, Art prepares himself with all the items that he got from Vincent. After a long goodbye to his family, promising them that he would be safe, he steps outside and finds Jasmine waiting for him in a carriage. As they make their way to the Adventurer's Guild to register Art, Jasmine notices Sylvie's altered appearance without her horns. Art explains her ability to change her form, making her look like a black lizard that draws less attention. They head to the reception desk. Before Art could start speaking, Jasmine stops him and instead tells the receptionist that she would like to sponsor him for a rank examination. The receptionist starts to get a little nervous and personally escorts the pair to the examination room. They start getting the attention of all the other adventurers in the room due to their special treatment. The pair arrive at the guild master's room. The receptionist tells him that an A-class adventurer has requested Art to be taken in for a rank examination. The guild master tells the receptionist to stand outside. He asks Jasmine how she has been these days while addressing her as Miss Flamesworth. He also mentions having met her father not too long ago. Art notices a subtle change in her mood at the mention of her father. The guild master introduces himself to Art. He tells him that his name is Caspian Bladeheart. He is in charge of this branch of the Adventurer's Guild. Normally, there is an application to be filled out along with an inspection of one's mana core, but since Art is being sponsored by Jasmine, Caspian decides to skip these steps and go directly to the practical exam. Art notices that the Flamesworth name is being spoken with quite a bit of respect, leading him to suspect that maybe Jasmine comes from a high-ranking family. Caspian mentions that names aren't mandatory to become an adventurer, however, since he has close relations with Jasmine, he would like to know a way to address him. While inspecting his mask the night before, Art noticed that the blue mark on his mask resembles a half note on a music sheet, so he decides to name himself after that and tells Caspian that he can call him Note. As they shake hands, Art can instantly tell that Caspian is very strong. With the introductions complete, Caspian instructs the receptionist waiting outside to take them to the examination hall. As they arrive, the sounds of screams and clashing weapons greet them. It's clear that the rank examination is already underway. An augmenter and an examiner are engaged in combat using a long polearm. Art watches the fight closely, analyzing every move. However, the examinee doesn't appear to be very strong. Despite launching numerous attacks, the examiner easily dodges them and defeats him with a single strike. Once the fight ends, the examiner delivers a lengthy assessment of their battle. Despite his lackluster performance, the examiner notes that Art has an affinity for fire. As a result, the examiner awards him a ranking of D. Up next is Diane Whitehall. Despite her beauty, she is a clumsy girl. After making her way to the battlefield, she introduces herself to the examiner as an 18-year-old conjurer. Her mana core is in a solid orange state. 
Her specialty is water magic. The examiner instructs her that there are medical staff and an emitter present on site so she doesn't have to worry about anything. Art watches on from the stands. Once a conjurer reaches the orange stage, it becomes apparent where their specialty lays. Rather than focusing on all four elements, it's much more efficient to specialize in one particular element. Art heard from another adventurer that if a conjurer claims dual specialization or up, they are given a more difficult test to more accurately test their abilities. As the exam starts, Diane quickly casts a defensive spell to protect herself with a bubble of water. Jasmine explains that conjurers lack proficiency in reinforcing their bodies with mana, so they are trained to set up defensive measures immediately. The examiner retaliates with her own water magic, creating a layer of muddy water around Diane to block her vision. However, Diane bursts her water bubble to clear the muddy water and sends a powerful stream of water at the examiner, who easily dodges it. Quick to react, Diane turns the stream into a fog, but this move backfires as the examiner suddenly appears behind her and bops her on the head with her staff, signaling the end of the battle. Despite her loss, the examiner praises Diane's good mana control and casting speed, awarding her a C rank. The next participant is Elijah Knight. However, something unusual happens. Instead of calling the adventurer for the exam, the examiners have a meeting among themselves and announce that due to their status, they have been assigned the rank of B-rank adventurer. Art's eyes meet the adventurers. Despite his supposed status, the adventurer looks like a normal boy with nothing exceptional. The exam continues as the next participant is called. It's Lucas Wykes, an arrogant young boy with an affinity for fire. Even Art is surprised to find out that he is 11 years old with a light orange mana core. As soon as the fight begins, Lucas creates a raging fire vortex which slowly morphs into a flame guardian. The rest of the examiners are impressed by the young talent. Lucas uses the flame guardian to attack, however, the examiner uses her earth magic to encase it in a tomb. Art realizes the reasoning behind this move. Due to the lack of oxygen, the flame guardian will naturally be extinguished in due time. However, it turns out to be a distraction as Lucas quickly fires off another spell which creates small balls of fire all around the examiner. Lucas makes the fireballs explode but the examiner swiftly dodges the explosion's encounters by creating a hand made of mud using earth magic. Lucas tries to jump away but the hand manages to grab his leg from he is able to do so. Lucas releases the rest of the fireballs but the examiner forms a protective barrier around both of them to avoid the attack. Having used up all his attacks, the battle ends with a victory for the examiner. She praises Lucas for his high mana pool and his use of high tier fire affinity. However, she is interrupted by a frustrated Lucas as he tries to once again attack. One of the other examiners is forced to step in to stop the attack. Despite his rude attitude, the examiner awards him with a B rank due to his incredible potential. However, this is not good enough for Lucas as he leaves frustrated for not having been awarded A rank. Finally, it's Art's turn as the announcer calls note for the exam. Art approaches the battlefield, pondering how best to approach the exam. As soon as he steps onto the field, the examiner feels immense pressure emanating from him. However, before the fight can begin, Caspian interrupts them, ordering the examiner to stand down so he can personally conduct Art's exam. The examiner is surprised and protests that it's unnecessary for a double A class to test an examinee. But Caspian explains that he is doing it out of his close ties with Jasmine, Art's sponsor. The two mages face each other, prepared to start their fight. Art and Caspian stood facing each other, ready to begin their match. Caspian was the leader of one of the biggest guild halls in Sapin and a double A class adventurer. Art could feel the bloodlust emanating from him, and he knew that Caspian was not going to take it easy on him. A surge of excitement courses through him despite the circumstances. As soon as the match begins, Caspian immediately launches an attack on Art. Without wasting any time, Art barely manages to defend against the assault, then he tries to counterattack. Yet in an instant, Caspian utilizes his incredible speed to maneuver behind him, but he evades the attack once more by leaping closer to him. Art then uses his momentum to slash at him. Although Caspian narrowly evades the attack just in time, he realizes that this match will be far more challenging than he had anticipated. The intense fight continues, with both fighters exchanging blows. However, it becomes increasingly apparent that Art is at a significant disadvantage. His muscles are underdeveloped, and his height falls short of what he was accustomed to in his previous life. Even though his body is tougher from assimilating Sylvia's dragon will, he still pales in comparison to a seasoned fighter whose body is enhanced with mana. 
Caspian decides to engage with greater seriousness after witnessing Art's extraordinary combat abilities. Caspian enchants his blade with wind magic and launches high-speed air bullets toward Art. He manages to narrowly dodge them, yet he quickly realizes that closing the distance is crucial if he wants any chance of victory. With each agile dodge, he gradually closes in. Finally, when he reaches within striking range, he infuses his blade with fire magic and launches an attack. Caspian employs his wind magic to block the assault that results in a clash of conflicting magical attributes being dispersed throughout the arena. Ordinarily, the outcome of this battle would have been apparent from the start. Caspian, a double A-class adventurer capable of employing coveted long-range spells, should have held the advantage. Yet confronted with Art's extraordinary magical prowess, an undeniable sense of unease begins to creep upon him. Frustration consumes him as he finds himself pushed to the brink, prompting him to unleash an unrestrained, devastating magical attack against Art. Without hesitation, he follows it up with another swift wind bullet, denying Art a chance to regain his footing. Acting swiftly, Art employs his fire magic to propel himself into the air in an attempt to gain an advantageous position. However, he makes a critical error upon landing and unintentionally draws too close to Caspian. Seizing the opportunity, Caspian launches yet another wind bullet. Just as the match appears to reach its conclusion, Art stumbles backward, avoiding the wind bullet by sheer chance. Being cornered and desperate, he decides to reveal more of his hidden abilities. He uses fire magic on his feet to propel himself forward at remarkable speed toward his opponent. Caught off guard, Caspian fails to react to this sudden burst of velocity. Art successfully seizes Caspian's arm, seemingly tipping the scales in his favor. However, unwilling to accept defeat, he unleashes a powerful surge of wind magic in one last effort, sending Art flying backward. As Art faces his opponent head-on, he realizes that this is no longer a mere examination, as Caspian is now fighting to preserve his honor as a double-A-class adventurer. Even Jasmine grows concerned and readies her weapons, prepared to intervene if the match spirals further out of control. Art decides it is time to unleash his lightning magic to confront Caspian. There are two schools of lightning magic, external and internal. While it is normally taught that internal is not as powerful as external, as it is too hard for mages to learn for a relatively small increase in power. However, Art disagrees. With his enhanced speed and reflexes, he can dodge any attack Caspian throws at him. Just as Art is about to launch an attack with new enhanced speed, the match abruptly halts as Caspian suddenly refrains from using his mana. He sheaths his sword and apologizes to Art for getting carried away. He realizes that Art made a great effort to hide his true abilities right up till the end, and assumes that the reason is that he wants to be placed at a lower rank. Hence, honoring Art's wish, he places him in B rank. The crowd is left stunned by the amazing match they just witnessed. Even Lucas and Elijah are left shocked by Art's amazing skills. Caspian leaves the arena in frustration for not being able to win against someone he assumed was weaker than him. The examiner makes the announcement that the exam is over, and all adventurers can go to the reception desk to get their adventurer's card. With that, everyone starts to leave the arena. Back in his office, Caspian still can't help but think about his match with Art. His chain of thought is interrupted as the two other examiners suddenly burst in demanding an explanation for everything that happened. After today's exam, they have three B-rank adventurers, which is more than the last four months combined. Not to mention that all of them are kids. On top of all that, Lucas has a light orange core at only 11 years old, which is damn near unhuman. He calms them down and explains that after the interracial tournament six months ago, the ban on elves and dwarves becoming adventurers under Sapin has been lifted. Today's exam included some of the representative examinees. Starting with Lucas Wikes, a half-elf residing in Sapin, his information remains classified and is inaccessible to the guild. Caspian surmises that Lucas might be an elf slave, considering the infamous reputation of House Wikes for employing unscrupulous methods in their pursuit of breeding exceptional mages. Despite his elven lineage, Lucas displays exceptional proficiency in fire magic. Awakening at an unusually early age of eight, even by elven standards, he was compelled to become an adventurer to enhance his abilities through real combat. Moving on to Elijah Knight, his origins remain shrouded in mystery, but Caspian assumes he was raised among the dwarves from an early age. As he is the representative of the Dark Kingdom, he gained placement in the B rank without undergoing an exam due to the endorsement of a reliable source. However, even Caspian ponders the extent of Elijah's abilities, harboring curiosity regarding his true potential. 
Regarding the masked augmenter, Caspian remains oblivious as he lacks any knowledge or understanding of their identity. The mention of note incites fear in one of the examiners, evoking memories of their encounter with Art earlier. Although Caspian knows Art does not hail from any noble lineage, he was intrigued by the person Jasmine Flamesworth chose to sponsor. Thus, the reason he conducted the examination personally, the Flamesworth House has gained renown for producing powerful fire attribute mages. He instructs the examiners to keep the information confidential. Caspian recalls his encounter with Art once more. He discerns that while Art's magic proves effective, it is his formidable sword that truly sets him apart as an adversary. With elves and dwarves now capable of becoming adventurers, he feels excited about this new era of adventuring. In the kingdom of Eleanor, Tessia reminisces about her time with Art. Occasionally using Rinya's crystal ball to check on his well-being, she still yearns for her friend's presence. To her delight, Gurion informs her that she can attend the same school as Art if she desires. He reveals that her parents, the King and Queen of Eleanor, have been negotiating with the humans to allow elves and dwarves to study at Xyrus Academy. Since Art will be attending the Academy in three years, Tessie will be his senior by the time he enrolls. Her father encourages her to train diligently, as it marks the dawn of a new generation of mages. Back in the Adventurer's Guild, Art waits patiently to get his new Adventurer's card. He recalls his match with Caspian and how fun it was. He asks Jasmine if she is close to Caspian. She tells that her father has deep connections within the Adventurer's Guild and Caspian is one of them. Their conversation is interrupted by a call from the receptionist for note. After making his way to the reception desk, Art receives his adventurer's card. Finally, he has become an adventurer. He can now live a life as note, free from the ties that held him back as Arthur Lewin. However, he realizes that he has spent too much time learning this new world's magic system, and because of this, he has neglected his training in the very thing he was best at. In his past life, Art utilized his meager chi pool to refine the simplest techniques, and that is how he became so strong. However, those limitations don't exist in this world. He wonders if he should continue his pursuit of magic or if he should train his sword skill. He asks Jasmine whether they should take a quest or the bulletin board, but she tells him that with his skills, it would be a waste of time to do that. So, she suggests something different. The two of them decide to use the city's teleportation gate to travel to the Beast Glades to begin their new phase of training. It's a beautiful forest surrounded by huge mountains, as they reach the base of the majestic mountains, Art and Sylvie continue their trek in a well-explored region utilized by lower-ranked adventurers for training and questing. Suddenly, Sylvie catches sight of a mana beast and eagerly chases. Art decides not to pursue her, allowing her to revel in the pursuit. Confident in their telepathic connection, he knows he can still communicate with her and ensure her safety. Jasmine informs him that within the beast glades, where mana levels are notably denser, their telepathic link will extend much farther than usual. Empowered by this knowledge, the two adventurers press onward on their journey. Art can't help but feel a sense of pride and protectiveness towards Sylvie, akin to a parent witnessing their child venture off to school for the first time. With a heartfelt message urging Sylvie to remain safe, he focuses his attention on commencing his training alongside Jasmine. They reach their first campsite by sunset. Art feels completely exhausted from having to keep up with Jasmine. Throughout the journey, he was barely able to keep up with her despite using his man rotation. At nighttime, while they are sitting around the campfire, he asks her why she became an adventurer. Judging from the change in her expression, he instantly realizes he has touched upon a sire spot. Nevertheless, she replies by telling him that she wanted to get away from her family. The Flamesworth House was a major contributor to the war against the elves. They have produced many powerful mages. Their lineage in the fire element is second to none. The Flamesworth House takes great pride in this as the fire element is considered to be the strongest. Naturally, when Jasmine was awakened earlier than all her siblings, her parents placed high expectations on her. However, when she showed an aptitude for the wind attribute instead of the fire attribute, her family regarded her as lesser. Art gets angry on her behalf and starts yelling about how no attribute is inherently better than the other. This makes Jasmine burst out laughing, seeing him rambling and losing his composure for the first time. She reassures him that she is fine with it. Whether it's Augmenter versus Conjurer or one element over the other, humans are always looking for a way to feel superior. It's just in their nature, and she has come to accept that. Even while laughing and smiling, this is the first time Art has seen her vulnerable. On the following day, Art eagerly commences his training session with Jasmine. 
As a preliminary step before embarking on any quests, they engage in a friendly sparing match. This allows Jasmine to assess Art's physical limitations and capabilities before venturing into dungeon runs. She advises him to restrain his mana usage, permitting him to solely employ it to dampen the impact of his strikes. Just as Art reaches for his sword, she interjects, halting him in his tracks. She reveals that she has been aware of his concealed second sword all along. As Art unveils the translucent blade, she finds herself momentarily taken aback. With the stage set, the spar commences and Art swiftly charges toward her, aiming to launch an attack. Effortlessly, Jasmine evades his assault and endeavors to counterattack. He feels somewhat awkward without his magical abilities and barely manages to parry her strike with his sword. In this duel, Art's apprehensions are validated. He realizes that his relentless focus on mastering magic had caused him to neglect his swordsmanship, a skill in which he excelled prior to his arrival in this new world. His prowess in magic has become a crutch that he leans too heavily on. It had masked his shortcoming all this while but now he finally realizes his mistake. Without his magic, he has no choice but to give up or lose the match. Jasmine tells him that his physique is lacking and his movement is awkward however, he is able to make up for it with his good technique. Nevertheless, she reassures him that he will naturally get stronger once he reaches his teens. However, that's too late for Art. He makes a rough estimate that he must be around seven years ahead in mana manipulation, so he will solely focus on sword fighting to improve his skills. He makes the bold claim that all he needs is two years and he will master the art of swordsmanship. End of season one. Two years had elapsed since then. According to the rumors going around of a masked master swordsman who also uses magic, there have even been stories about him clearing a dungeon all by himself, without using any magic. Not even a B-ranked Augmenter can accomplish this feat, let alone an unknown adventurer without using magic. One adventurer named Termin refuses to believe the rumors. His partner even suggests that he must be getting help from Jasmine as he is traveling with her. Drunk and overconfident, he even boldly declares that he can beat this masked swordsman any day. There have been rumors that the masked swordsman was given a B-rank straight out of the rank exam and has now moved up to an A-rank. This would mean that the masked swordsman became A rank in just two years, another feat that seems impossible. The tavern door suddenly opens, and everyone is left stunned when they see the person who enters. It's none other than the famous masked adventurer himself. Believing himself to be stronger, Termin takes out his sword to challenge Art. Although his partner tries to stop him, he goes up to him and tries to intimidate him. Art tries to ignore him, but he uses his wind magic to attack him from behind. There is a big explosion of wind, but when the dust clears, Termin is surprised to see that Art dodged his attack without much effort. Frustrated by his failed attempt, he imbues his sword with wind magic and once again tries to attack. Art swiftly dodges all the attacks and with one clean slice, he cuts off all of the fingers of the adventurer. Everyone else can feel the intense pressure from Art, and no one dares attack him to rescue Termin. Art decides not to continue the fight. He goes to the reception desk to get what he originally came for, a sack of rations. When he leaves the tavern, he finds Jasmine waiting for him with their horses. She is surprised to see blood on Art's mask. He takes off his mask and reassures her that there was no permanent damage done. They ride their horses to their next destination. Art has continued to write to his parents daily. A lot has changed over the past two years. After diligently meditating every day, Lilia finally managed to awaken as a mage. Now she can attend Exiris Academy. She will be Art's senior by the time he joins. He has also managed to reach the light orange stage. Jasmine helps him every day with conditioning and teaches him everything she knows about wind magic. On the other hand, Art teaches her better blade techniques. There are only a few weeks left until he starts school at the Exiris Academy. He ends the letter with a promise to see them soon. Art entrusts the scroll with the horse, knowing that these well-trained creatures instinctively return to the stable master when left alone, ensuring their safety from potential monster encounters. Meanwhile, Sylvie dedicates herself to intensive training in the treacherous beast glades. Her growth is evident as she has gained the ability to transmit more intricate messages, yet she remains resolute in her decision not to join Art and Jasmine just yet, expressing her desire to return once she feels adequately prepared. Although Art ponders the true meaning behind Sylvie's words, Jasmine offers reassurance, suggesting that Sylvie simply desires to enhance her strength before they embark on their academic journey together. As they reach the entrance of a foreboding dungeon, they rendezvous with another adventuring party. 
Art is taken back to discover the presence of Lucas Wykes standing among their ranks. A confident adventurer steps forward and introduces himself to the pair as Reginald Bastion, an esteemed A-class augmenter whose expertise lies in earth magic. He proudly declares his current standing at the solid yellow stage of proficiency. Additionally, he introduces Lucas, although Art is already acquainted with him from their prior encounters. Having dedicated two years to their training, Lucas has impressively progressed to the dark yellow stage of his own magical journey. Among the adventuring party, they encounter Creole Masser, a formidable water attribute augmenter who assumes the role of their stalwart tank. Art's surprise grows as he recognizes yet another familiar face, Elijah Knight, who has progressed to the dark orange stage of his magical journey with his expertise in earth magic. Serving as the group's dedicated healer is Oliver Hembat, an A-class mage adept in mission magic. He possesses a dark yellow core. Completing the ensemble is Samantha Tempest, the sole female member, an accomplished dark yellow conjurer who specializes in water magic. Samantha's fascination is palpable as she finally comes face to face with the renowned masked swordsman. Leading the party with an aura of authority is Brawl Landon, adorned in resplendent plate armor reminiscent of a knight. As an esteemed double A-class augmenter, he wields a light yellow core and boasts mastery in the art of fire magic. He tells the pair that he will be leading the party for the mission. Jasmine and Art also decide to introduce themselves to the group. Jasmine has now reached the double A-class and her core is at the light yellow stage, same as Brawled. Art also introduces himself to the group. He tells them his specialty is fire magic. This surprises Samantha as according to the rumors, the masked swordsman doesn't have any elemental affinities. Art corrects her and tells her that he just hasn't been using magic because of personal reasons. Since both Art and Jasmine are still wearing their bags, Rald assumes that they don't have any dimension rings. So Elijah offers to store their belongings in his ring. As soon as he brings his hand close to their bags, they get sucked in like a vacuum. Art is a bit surprised to see Elijah carrying a dimension ring. This is because they are very expensive. The technology used for the rings was left behind by ancient mages who built the floating city of Cyrus. Even one with not a lot of storage space can go for thousands of gold. With the preparations complete, the party finally heads into the dungeon. The party follows Brawl's lead as they approach the first level of the dungeon. However, they are surprised to see that it's completely empty with not a single monster in sight. They continue walking towards the door to the second floor when suddenly they see a rock falling from the ceiling. They are left horrified when they look up to see the source. The ceiling is covered by bat-like monsters called bat runners. Brawled quickly orders everyone to get into formation. The party finds themselves surrounded. However, despite their numbers, bat runners are weak low-level monsters, so the party is able to hold them off whenever they attack. Brawled orders everyone to conserve their mana for the deeper level. Lucas completely disregards this order and uses a high-level fire spell called Fire Cyclone. A huge fire vortex envelops the party and takes out all the bat runners in one hit. The leader gets angry with Lucas for disobeying his orders. However, he doesn't care and tells him that it doesn't matter since he killed all the monsters. The party starts heading towards the next level when Art notices something strange. The dungeon is known for its mysterious undead inhabitants. Living up to its name, the bat runners begin to reanimate. The adventurers who come in are left to fight endless hordes of undead monsters, and thus the dungeon was named the Dire Tomb. The party manages to get away by quickly running towards the door to the next level and sealing it behind them using earth magic. They reach the spot where Brawled found the hidden entrance the last time he came to this dungeon. To get to the next level, they must scale a wall. Elijah uses his earth magic to make handholds for everyone, making it much easier to climb. They reach the entrance to the next level. This is the furthest point Brawled got to before deciding to go back and return with a team. He speculates that the artifact responsible for reanimating the bat runners could be there. With that in mind, the party heads to the next level. As the group delves deeper into the dungeon, the temperature rises noticeably. Suddenly, Samantha is ambushed by a sharp spike, but Art swiftly intercepts and saves her by deflecting it with his sword. The revelation of traps in the dungeon surprises everyone, as Brawled recalls no traps during his previous visit. Upon examining the spike, Art realizes it was not a trap, but an attack from a mana beast. The group becomes more vigilant as they press onward toward the next level. Upon reaching the entrance, Brawled and Art sense that something is amiss, not just the scorching heat, but an overwhelming pressure indicative of a formidable monster. As they traverse the level, the ground trembles and a colossal worm-like creature emerges before the party. 
Acting swiftly, Creole employs water magic to create a protective barrier around the group. It becomes evident that this monstrous worm was not present during Browd's initial exploration of the dungeon. However, it doesn't make sense for a new mana beast to suddenly appear in the dungeon like this. Their immediate concern, however, is to deal with the monster. The group prepares themselves for the monster's attack. They are surprised to see that the monster doesn't attack them and burrows into the ground again. Oliver starts to lose his patience and suggests moving forward to get the artifact since the monster is no longer here. Despite the order to get back in formation, Oliver starts walking to the level's exit. When the party starts to follow him, Art notices cracks being formed in the ground. He quickly yells at Lucas to cast his heatwave barrier and grabs Brawl to get him close to the rest of the group. Lucas instinctively follows Art's order and casts a barrier. However, the barrier doesn't reach Oliver as he is too far. Before Art could tell him to cast a barrier for himself, the ground erupts like a volcano, covering him in flames. Because of the barrier's protection, the rest of the party manages to stay unharmed. When the flames finally clear up, the group is left horrified to witness what is left of him. Oliver is left completely burned with the only remaining part of his body being his skeleton. A sense of terror grips the party as they witness the horrific spectacle before them. Despite the fear, Art remains composed and quickly seizes the opportunity. He retrieves the magic crystal from Oliver's wand and hands it to Samantha, urging her to replace her current crystal with the more potent one. With unanimous agreement, the party hastens its retreat as another eruption looms. They sprint towards the exit, but their path is abruptly blocked by the reappearance of the colossal worm. Reacting swiftly, Creole erects a protective barrier to shield everyone from the creature's onslaught. Following Brawl's command, Samantha and Elijah unleash their spells in an attempt to stun the monster. However, their magical assaults prove ineffective against its impervious body. Brawl then directs Jasmine and Reginald to join him in a coordinated attack against the creature. They unleash their immensely powerful techniques, Jasmine and Brawl engage the worm, striding to keep it occupied, while Reginald seizes the opportunity to deliver a crushing blow with his hammer. Watching the scene unfold, Lucas can't help but feel scared for the first time in his life. Art also joins in on the attack. He imbues his sword with fire magic and leaps up to get close to the monster's head. As soon as he is close enough, he uses a powerful slash to slice off the monster's fangs. He signals to Jasmine and she uses this opportunity to land a powerful attack on the monster using her wind magic. It works and she is able to deal a lot of damage, forcing the worm to retreat. The party begins to relax thinking they have defeated the monster. However, soon after the ground begins rumbling again, Art realizes that the worm wasn't trying to kill them, instead it was trying to buy time for the next eruption to occur. Everyone acts quickly to form barriers around themselves and their teammates. However, Art notices that Lucas isn't acting and has dropped his weapon. Without his staff, he can't form the barrier. This also results in Samantha being left undefended as there is no one left to form a barrier around her. Brawl acts quickly to rush over toward her to protect her. Art too rushes over to Lucas to save him using his fire magic. The eruption occurs and everyone manages to survive despite all the problems. A wave of horror washes over the party as they behold Brawled. He lost his entire arm when he protected her from the eruption. In order to prevent Brawled's injury from worsening, the party swiftly tends to his wound. Reginald assists by holding him down, while Art employs his fire magic to cauterize the severed limb. Once the immediate treatment is complete, Samantha takes over using her water magic to continue caring for his injury, allowing the rest of the party to relax momentarily. Amidst the gravity of the situation, Creole attempts to uplift Art's spirits by offering him a sandwich, revealing it to be a recipe crafted by his fiancée. Grateful for the gesture, Art expresses his thanks and asks Creole to convey his appreciation to his fiancée for the delicious meal, brightening Creole's mood. However, their conversation is abruptly interrupted by a heated argument erupting between Lucas and Brawled. Lucas blames Brawled for being an ineffective leader, criticizing the loss of their healer. Brawled's anger flares, shouting back at him for carelessly dropping his weapon, resulting in him having to shield Samantha and suffering the loss of his arm. Forced to intervene, Art steps in and halts the escalating conflict. Lucas attempts to belittle Art, highlighting his lower status as an orange stage augmenter. Unfazed by the provocation, Art firmly asserts that he doesn't care about Lucas' stage, emphasizing that his current liability outweighs any perceived superiority. Unable to muster a response, Lucas seats with anger and departs. Art then turns his attention to Brawled, 
presenting him with the pivotal decision of whether he wants to continue or not as the injuries sustained by the rest of the party are less severe. Brawled resolves to press on, acknowledging that this dungeon raid may be his final one. Despite concern from Samantha, he reassures her of his capabilities as a double A-class adventurer, emphasizing that his combat prowess remains intact even with one arm. However, he suggests that Art should take the lead going forward, recognizing his composure and level-headedness during the previous encounters. Art accepts the responsibility and addresses the group, announcing an hour of rest before resuming their journey. Eventually, the party reaches the entrance to the next level, where Brawl once again observes changes since his previous visit to the dungeon. They discover the entrance obstructed by an imposing wall. Despite Reginald's attempts to break it with his hammer, and even utilizing his earth magic to augment the strike, their efforts prove futile. Jasmine intervenes, employing her wind magic to generate additional force behind the hammer's swing. With combined strength, they succeed in demolishing the wall, revealing the entrance to the next level. A beautiful, lush forest awaits them on the next level. In the absence of supporting pillars, Art ponders how the forest hasn't collapsed, raising his concern. Although Creel suggests taking a break, Art's intuition warns him against it, prompting him to insist on maintaining a vigilant stance. While exploring the forest, Art remains plagued by an unsettling sensation. Suddenly, Jasmine and Creole both spot figures emerging from the mist, an enigmatic man in a suit and Creole's fiancée, Clara. Overwhelmed with emotion, Creole impulsively rushes toward the hallucination. Art tries to intervene, but Creole vanishes into the fog before he can reach him. Realizing that the fog is inducing illusions, Jasmine alerts the group, urging them to stay together and resist being deceived. Samantha swiftly creates a protective barrier, prepared for any potential attacks. In the midst of the chaos, she expresses curiosity about Clara. Reginald discloses that she was Creole's fiancé, though her presence here defies all logic since she perished in a previous dungeon expedition. The party's tensions escalate as Lucas vents his frustration, directing his anger towards Reginald and Brawled, questioning their abilities despite their experience as seasoned adventurers. Jasmine also seems shaken. When Art inquires, she tells him that she too saw someone in the fog. It was her father calling her with her arms spread out. She starts remembering the terrible memories of her childhood, but Art calms her down and assures her that everything will be okay. He asks her if she can clear the fog with her wind magic. Although she doesn't have a spell powerful enough to do so, she can however clear a path to find Creole. She uses a spell called Banshee's Howl to clear the fog in front of them. The party is left shocked to see that they are surrounded by vines. Art quickly signals Lucas to use his magic to burn them. He uses a powerful fire spell to try and burn the vines. However, it doesn't have much effect, and the vines continue making their way towards them. Art orders Reginald to protect the conjurers while Jasmine and Brawled help him to break through the vines. The three of them use powerful attacks to cut through, however, the vines keep regenerating. Art notices that the vines have moisture in them, and maybe that's why they aren't burning. He tests his theory out by slashing the vines with his sword without imbuing it with fire magic. It works and the vines are unable to grow back. He quickly tries to share this information with Brawled only to realize that he has gone berserk, relentlessly attacking without any thought about their effectiveness. Jasmine, on the other hand, has also figured out how to attack the vines and has been effectively dealing with damage. So Art decides to help Brawled out. Due to his ineffective strategy, the vines keep growing and he eventually gets caught. Art quickly rescues him by cutting the vines. He lectures him about his recklessness and tells him to fight smarter as the group still needs him. Eager to join the fight, Lucas drinks a potion to regenerate his mana. Then he fires off another spell. However, he also seems to have learned from his previous encounter. Instead of using the most powerful spell he knows, like he usually would, he uses a more flammable spell that spreads on contact. Elijah also uses his earth magic to collapse the group beneath the vines. With the ground sunk in and the liquid fire, it should be much more difficult for the vines to regenerate. Senatha also uses a spell called Aqua Siphon to suck out all the moisture from the vines, leaving them dry and brittle. Just as things start looking better for the group, the vines start absorbing the fog to revitalize themselves with moisture. As the fog clears up, everyone is left completely horrified at what they witnessed. The party finds themselves confronted by the Elderwood Guardian, a legendary and incredibly powerful monster rarely witnessed in real life, known only through the pages of books. The sheer magnitude of the S-class mana beast shakes their confidence, and doubts begin to creep into their minds realizing the daunting challenge they face. 
Amidst the chaos, Reginald's keen eyes catch sight of something within the monster's core, a glimpse of Creole. As he approaches, discovering his dying friend, a surge of anger propels Reginald, and he readies his magic, preparing to confront the creature. Despite Art's attempts to intervene, it becomes apparent that time is running out as Reginald's body gradually transforms into a resilient stone armor. The Elderwood Guardian launches its assault, but Elegis swiftly employs his earth magic to shield Reginald from harm. In an unexpected twist, Jasmine grasps Art's hand, urging him to abandon the group and flee, invoking her promise to protect him as she once swore to his parents. While she tries to convince Art of this course of action, the relentless onslaught of the Guardian engulfs the rest of the party. Resolute, Art counters, asserting that he cannot abandon his comrades. Meanwhile, Reginald's stone armor enables him to engage the Guardian directly. Sensing the urgency, Art commands a retreat, with Elijah using his earth magic to safeguard their escape. Amidst the escalating peril, the group witnesses Reginald being ensnared by the Guardian. Acting swiftly, Art instructs Lucas to incinerate the encircling vines, facilitating Reginald's liberation. Yet before Art can finish his sentence, Lucas is engulfed by a powerful spell, and he launches a devastating attack at point-blank range, targeting Art himself. A few minutes ago before Lucas attacked Art, he had been struggling as he was getting blasted around by the Guardian. With the exit just in sight, he thought of ways he can escape. His growing pride becomes a hindrance, and he gets consumed by the notion that his survival must be prioritized, for he is from the mighty Wyke family, the very house that led to Sapin's resounding victory against Eleanor. He's willing to do anything, even betray his comrades. With this mindset, he uses a powerful spell on Art that sends him flying. Seeing this, Jasmine becomes horrified and runs to help him. However, Lucas continues his betrayal and uses a powerful spell on Jasmine, nearly killing her. Elijah is quick to react and saves her using his earth magic. So Lucas turns on him as well, Right now, the only thing on his mind is his survival. He tells Elijah that they should be honored as they will go down in history as heroes who delayed the beast long enough for him to escape. He fires off another spell to the roof. This causes the entire structure to start caving in. While being distracted by Lucas, Elijah gets attacked by the Guardian. He is unable to react in time and incurs heavy damage. Just as it seems like he's about to get killed, he is saved by Brawled. He is still mentally unstable, but he cares about his comrades. He attacks the Elderwood Guardian head-on with his fire magic. Despite successfully landing a powerful blow that slices the Guardian in half, his triumph is short-lived as the formidable creature swiftly regenerates. This leaves Brawl terrified as he realizes how hopeless it is to fight against this mighty opponent. On the other hand, a barely alive Art slowly regains consciousness. He looks around to see all of his comrades injured or unconscious from Lucas's attacks. He realizes that there is only one thing that can be done. However, he's unsure if he can survive the recoil. Suddenly, strange glowing marks start appearing all over his arm and his eyes turn purple. This is the phase two of his dragon awakening. During his training in Eleanor, he had breakthroughs that left Virian constantly baffled. His first improvement was unlocking the first phase of his beast will, the acquire phase. This allowed him to tap into Sylvia's innate skills. He could temporarily separate himself from time and space. However, this phase was limited in a lot of ways due to how much strain it put on his mana core and his physical body. The second breakthrough was something that even Art did not expect. What had taken Virian decades to achieve, he managed to achieve the same feat in just two and a half years, the integrate phase. Art's hair suddenly starts turning white. A purple aura starts surrounding his body as he delves deeper into the second phase. Elsewhere, even Sylvie notices the change in Art's body through their telepathic connection. She has grown a lot bigger due to her training for the past two years. Sensing something's wrong, she quickly rushes over to Art's location. However, Art assures her that he's fine and tells her to stay away for now. He instructs her to go back to Helstie's house if anything goes wrong. Now in the integrate phase, Art gets ready to attack the Elderwood Guardian. He forms a powerful white flame on his left hand and leaps toward the Guardian. He continues with his attacks, hoping that he can survive the backlash. It causes Elderwood Guardian great damage. The flames quickly destroy all vines and turn them into ice. Even though he can utilize all this ambient mana in this form, his body still can't handle the spell. He quickly starts to feel the backlash from using the integrate phase, but he shows no signs of wavering in his assault. The fight quickly intensifies as both of them start unleashing powerful attacks. Art uses his spell to continue freezing the vines. 
However, the backlash finally sets in as his hand becomes brittle and starts to crumble away. However, before the damage becomes even greater, he manages to freeze the Elderwood Guardian completely. With his other hand, he forms a massive attack. He combines the fire, water, and electricity element into one and punches the frozen Elderwood Guardian. This causes him to shatter and finally die. As the severe strain of extended integrate phase usage takes its toll, Art starts bleeding and quickly collapses. Meanwhile, in Exire City, Alice and Ray are taking care of Eleanor. The two parents are happily looking after their daughter when suddenly they're left horrified as Alice's rings start glowing, indicating that Art's life is in danger. With a flicker of consciousness, Art slowly opens his eyes. He finds himself greeted by the comforting presence of Elijah by his side. Elijah is relieved to see that Art has finally awakened. Using whatever few words he can muster, Art instructs him to take one of the healing constructs from his glove and break it. He follows Art's instructions and breaks one of the crystals. This causes the healing spell sealed within to get released and he gets healed along with his left hand. The first thing Art does is ask about Jasmine's whereabouts. Elijah points in her direction, showing him that she's also safe. However, her condition is really bad. She was hit a lot harder by Lucas's spell than him because her body wasn't fortified with mena. Although Elijah used a medical kit to treat her burns, she still has internal damage. Art asks him to take another crystal from his glove and use it on her. After doing so, Jasmine's injuries become a lot better. Her breathing starts looking better as well. Elijah assures Art that she's going to be fine after a few hours of rest. With that, he can finally breathe a sigh of relief. His current condition reminds him of when he was four years old, the time when he fell from the cliff. We see Sylvie continues making her way toward Art. Lucas, on the other hand, managed to escape from the dungeon. Art once again reassures Sylvie that he's out of danger now and instructs her to focus on her training. As Art rests, he begins to feel a sense of relief as his condition improves. Likewise, now that they are out of harm's way, Elijah also starts to unwind and relax. He now knows the true identity of the legendary masked swordsman and is surprised that he's someone that he tested together with and someone his age. With that, Art suddenly remembers that he has lost his mask. Elijah apologizes to him, telling him that it fell off during the fight and he couldn't get it. However, the most important to Art is his sword. Elijah assures him that his weapon is safe and within reach, understanding its significance to Art. Even though he didn't know if it was valuable or not, he decided to keep it just in case. Art extends heartfelt thanks to him for his remarkable actions in saving both him and Jasmine, as well as safeguarding his valued belongings. In reply, he humbly states that he couldn't fathom leaving them in a half-dead condition, for such a decision would have placed him on the same level as Lucas. Elijah becomes curious as to why Art decided to stay when Jasmine was trying to get him to leave. Art jokingly tells him that a king never betrays his people, however, the real reason is because of his promise to Sully to become a better person. He realizes that they're going to be stuck there for a while until Jasmine recovers, so he decides to use this time to get to know more about Elijah. Art initiates the conversation by extending a polite introduction to him, establishing a respectful and courteous tone from the start. He notices that the metal shelter around them doesn't seem to be naturally made. He asks Elijah if he is the one who made it. He tells him that he conjured it when the cavern caved in. This was to protect them from the debris. The Elderwood Guardian's body was the one supporting the entire cave, and when they defeated it, the entire structure started to collapse. Art realizes that Elijah is a deviant, as it is only possible to manipulate metal, not create or conjure it. However, that is only attainable by a dwarf. He agrees to share the details but with one condition. He asks Art to disclose what he did during his encounter with the Elderwood Guardian. He wants to know about Art's transformation. Art agrees to the proposition and Elijah starts telling him about his past. He was raised in the Kingdom of Darv, but he's not sure where he originally came from. Elder Radias was the one who had taken care of him from the time when he was a child. However, the elder always avoided the question whenever he would ask about his parents. The only memories of his childhood would come as confusing and painful flashes. Elijah had lived a fairly normal life until he broke into the dark orange stage. After that, he experienced a weird surge of energy and blacked out. When he regained consciousness, he was surrounded by these strange black spikes of metal. After that, the elder told him that it was time for him to leave and explore the rest of the kingdom without even telling him why. Since then, he always had this strange feeling. Although he can't tell what it is, he's sure that it has something to do with his power and where he came from. Now it's Art's turn to fulfill his end of the deal. 
Just the first sentence leaves Elijah completely shocked. Art tells him that he's a quadra-elemental augmenter with two deviances, ice and lightning. Elijah always thought he was the weird one, but now he's finally met a bigger freak than himself. However, he still wants to know about those markings and the color change that Art experienced during his fight with the Elderwood Guardian. Art reveals that he's a beast tamer and what Elijah saw back there was him unleashing his beast will. He is really surprised and asks how old Art is. When Art reveals that he's 11 years old, Elijah is further surprised to realize that he's one year older than him. However, he knows that this is not something he should be proud of. The two boys cannot help but randomly laugh at this silly fact. They have slowly started to bond over their shared trauma. Art suddenly experiences a bout of pain from his injuries. He has to use the last healing crystal from his glove to heal his injuries. As he's doing this, Jasmine also wakes up and quickly hugs him. She breaks down into tears and apologizes to Art for being unable to protect him. Seeing Art's injuries, she quickly tells Elijah to take out their bags from his dimension ring. She uses the emergency med kit in her bag to treat both of their injuries. Art is grateful to both of them, and with that, they start to make their way out of the dungeon. The trio exits the metal shelter. Before they leave, Art wants to search for any survivors. Elijah tells him that both Reginald and Brawl were consumed by the Elderwood Guardian before Art started fighting so they are most likely dead. As for Samantha, he did manage to conjure a metal shelter around her before the structure caved in. However, she was in pretty bad shape, so he's unsure if she survived. It would be extremely difficult to find her in all this rubble. Even the Elderwood Guardian's beast core is probably lost. Elijah uses a spell called Earth's Pulse to try and search for her underground. He quickly finds her buried under the rubble with her heart still beating. Art is left surprised by Elijah's spell as it is normally only possible to search the surface of the ground using Earth's pulse. Elijah quickly uses his proficiency in Earth magic to bring the metal shelter to the ground. He opens the metal charger to find Samantha still alive, although heavily injured and burning with fever but she is out of danger now. Jasmine picks up Samantha and they continue on their way back. Art understands that it would be impossible to find the Guardian's beast core in this mess. This means that a priceless treasure would be lost. They suddenly hear rumbling from the ground. Elijah becomes fearful, but Art calms him down, telling him it's fine. A beast emerges from the ground, and it's none other than Sildi. Even Art is surprised to see how much Sildi has grown in the past two years. Elijah is left stunned by the presence of a dragon as they were believed to be extinct. Hence, Art asks him to keep her existence a secret. Elijah recognizes him as someone who defies conventional expectations. He is an 11-year-old who is a quadra-elemental with deviances in two elements and a dragon bond. Mounted on Sildi's back, the group embarks on their journey back to the exit. They don't even have to worry about fighting any monsters, because Sildi's presence is enough to scare them away. Sam the finally starts to regain consciousness, so they lay her down to make her feel comfortable. The group is shocked when she reveals that she has the Elderwood Guardian's beast core as well as Art's mask. She managed to save them before they were lost forever. Art takes his mask and tells the group that they will sell the beast core and divide the profit equally among themselves. Nonetheless, Jasmine swiftly informs him that she doesn't desire it. She believes Art is the one who deserves it since he's the one who took down the Elderwood Guardian. Elijah also feels the same way. Samantha also tells him that she's only alive because of him, so it's more than fair that he gets to keep the beast core. Art thanks everyone and decides to keep it. Seeing the extent of Samantha's injuries, Art tells Jasmine and Elijah to go to the guild hall to bring help while he and Sylvie stay with her to keep her safe. They agreed to Art's suggestion and quickly leave to get help. In the meantime, Art decides to use the scroll he got from the Twin Horns as his birthday gift two years ago to inform his parents that he is safe. Art's attention once again turns to Sylvie. She has gotten very big in the last two years by hunting mana beasts and eating their cores. Art asks her if she can still transform. Rather than telling him, she decides to show him by transforming herself into a much smaller figure similar to how she used to be. Art still feels pain from his injuries. He decides to use the mana from the beast's core to heal them. Now that everyone's safe and out of danger, his mind goes back to Lucas's betrayal. Because of what he did, Brawl died and so many of them got hurt. Art makes up his mind that no matter how long it takes, he's going to get his revenge on Lucas. The emergency team from the Adventurers Guild arrives and helps Samantha and the rest of the group. Samantha gets the necessary medical help. While Brawl's family has to face the devastating loss of his death, 
Jasmine and Elijah deliver a thorough account of their experiences within the dungeon to Caspian, the guild master, leaving no detail unmentioned. The guild organizes a hearing for Lucas's betrayal. While they are waiting, Lucas arrives in the guild with his guard. He comes in with his usual arrogant self. Both Jasmine and Elijah gets angry ready to attack him. Yet Art stops them from doing so. Lucas feigns ignorance about their survival and subtly shifts the blame on them for sacrificing their teammate. Despite Caspian trying to de-escalate the situation, Lucas goes on and on and starts blaming the group for sacrificing Brawled. Suddenly, a sword comes flying in his direction, nearly missing his head. Lucas's equilibrium shatters at the sight of blood as the password meningitis is whispered, sending him into a state of uncontrollable panic and distress. The sword was thrown by none other than Hart. Upon realizing this, the guards quickly get into a protective stance to stop him. However, the intense aura coming off of Art is enough to send shivers down their spine. Their bodies start to feel heavy, and they begin trembling with fear. Following Lucas's order, the guards start moving to attack Art. However, they are no match for him as he easily defeats them using only one hand. Slowly but surely, Art continues defeating all the guards and moves toward Lucas. As he is about to attack him, he stops himself and retreats his sword. He apologizes to Caspian, telling him that his sword slipped, and he wanted it back. Lucas's fearful nature shows itself when faced with Art's terrifying power. As Lucas leaves the room, Art requests Jasmine and Elijah to leave as well because he wants to talk to Caspian alone. Caspian tells him that while he understands the situation, he shouldn't provoke Lucas. This suggestion angers Art. He tells Caspian that he's strong enough to erase Lucas from existence, and his identity will remain a secret. He gets right into Caspian's face, to address the suggestion, which he thinks to be a threat towards him. The blood loss emanating from Art is enough to scare even a double-A adventure like him. He calms himself down and clarifies. He assures Art that what he said was with his best interest in mind. He reminds Art that even if he does manage to kill Lucas, the Wyke's house won't sit idly by even if his identity is a secret. They will go after the people close to him, like Jasmine and all the people she's affiliated with. This includes the Twin Horns, both current and former members. Until Art can hold enough power and authority to protect not only himself, but the people he cares about, Caspian advises against taking any extreme measures. He reveals some new information to Art that he didn't know before. Even if he does manage to take down the entire Wyke's house, he will still have to deal with Lucas's half-brother. Putting that aside, Art gets on to the main reason why he wanted to talk to him alone. Art knows his value in this world and realizes that Caspian would need him in the future. So he asks him for a favor. As long as it is within his power, Caspian is more than happy to accommodate. The hearing officially commences. Both Art and Lucas stand awaiting their sentences. First, it's Lucas's turn. For sabotaging and endangering his party members during the dungeon raid, he is stripped of his A-class ranking. Although instead of being devastated, he lets out a smirk, suggesting that this is exactly what he wanted. Furthermore, he also gets banned from re-enlisting as an adventurer. Art is not satisfied with this sentence, but this is something he expected. An offense that would normally land someone in prison only got Lucas a slap on the wrist because of his powerful background. As for Art, he is being sentenced because of his aggression towards Lucas. For his sentence, he's banned from entering Exiris City for the duration of Lucas's attendance at the Exiris Academy. A faint smirk also graces Art's face, a silent acknowledgement that the unfolding of the hearing aligns precisely with the carefully crafted plan he and Caspian had meticulously devised. He puts on an act and pretends to object to the punishment to make it more believable. This manages to fool Lucas, evident from his smirking at Art. He is given permission to continue his career as an adventurer. However, he cannot be caught near Lucas. To Lucas's surprise, the sentencing ends right there. He wants to know the masked swordsman's real identity. He makes the case that he could just take off his mask and easily slip into the city. However, the guild assures him that his identity is being kept secret only to uphold the peace. Selected guild hall matches will keep tabs on Art's whereabouts. With that, the sentencing ends and both Lucas and Art are allowed to leave. Before leaving, Lucas tries to threaten Art, but that is not enough to scare him and he fires back with a threat of his own. After this, Art meets the head of the committee. The whole sentence was planned by Caspian and Art to alleviate Lucas's suspicions and to protect his identity. With a promise to remember this favor, Art leaves the Adventurer's Guild. As soon as he exits the building, he's greeted by Sylvie, Elijah, and Jasmine. Sylvie is very excited to see him. 
Together, the trio sought to head home. Before they part ways, Art suggests to Elijah that they should go to school together. However, this is not something he has ever thought about. Art remembers that the reason Elijah is trying so hard to climb up the ranks is to make a name for himself as an adventurer. If that's the case, Art suggests he go to Exiris Academy, but Elijah is still not sure. Despite all of his qualifications, you need money and connections to get into Exiris Academy. Nonetheless, Art assures him not to worry about that kind of stuff. Art requests Jasmine to take him home as he has something to take care of first. After thanking Art for everything he has done, Elijah leaves with Jasmine. The real reason Art wanted Jasmine and Elijah to leave was that he sensed Caspian's presence near him. He wanted the chance to talk to him alone. He thanks him for playing along with his little plan. Caspian tells him that he wanted to send him off with a parting gift. He throws him a bag of gold and tells him it's for extra precaution. Although Lucas has seen his real sword, Don's ballad, it won't be a problem as long as Art doesn't take it out. The real problem might be that Lucas has seen Sylvie. Yet, before he can even finish his sentence, that problem is also solved. Listening to his thoughts, Sylvie instantly transforms into a new form. Now, even Lucas cannot recognize her. With everything resolved, Art heads back to Exire City. He takes off his mask and makes a quick stop at a local shop. Using the money he got from Caspian, he buys a dimension ring. Despite knowing how expensive they are, he is still left shocked. He had to spend most of his gold on a dimension ring that can barely fit a sword in Beast's core. With this preparation for school, life is complete. Art sets on a carriage and starts heading to Helstie's mansion. On the way, he enjoys the beautiful scenery and wonders what it would be like to be a normal student. Art finally reaches his home at nightfall. He is greeted by his sister, Eleanor, who quickly hugs him and welcomes him back. Art realizes how speedily his sister has grown. With that comes the same concern that every loving brother has, that one day his sister might find someone, get married, and leave. However, he puts that fear aside for the moment to greet his parents. Their interaction goes like their usual greetings, Rhea holds his immaturity while Art playfully mocks his father's unruly beard. As always, the worried mother hugs his son and tells him that she's glad that he's back in one piece. Art hugs her back and apologizes for always making her worry. Vincent, Tabitha, and Elijah also show up. Vincent, also being his usual self, interrupts the family's moment. After the initial greetings are done and family gets together to talk, Art realizes that Jasmine is nowhere to be seen. Elijah informs him that she already left to do a mission with the twin horns and had left a letter for him. From the goofy way the letter was written, Art could tell that it was written by Jasmine. Apart from her, there is one more face that's missing. Before Art could even ask, Vincent excitedly tells him that Lilia is currently at Exiris Academy. Tabitha thanks Art for his help in her awakening and tells him that the Helsty family will forever be in this debt. Vincent reaffirms it and tells him that it has been generations since a mage came out from the Helsty house. He tells him that he is not sure about the debt, but he does have a few favors in mind. That favor involves getting Elijah into the Exiris Academy. But before Art could tell him that, Ray suddenly gets up and asks about his dungeon raid. Art and Elijah explain the entire story of the Elderwood Guardian. The family is shocked that Art actually encountered an Elderwood Guardian, a mana beast that parents use to scare their kids into behaving. On the topic of monsters and magic, Art asks Ray what stage he is at. He tells him that he has been stuck at the bottleneck of the dark orange stage. No matter how hard he tries, he just can't seem to break through. Art hands him the Elderwood Guardian's Beast Core. Using the mana from the Beast Core, he should be able to break through. Ray initially refuses to accept it, telling Art that this is something he risked his life for, and so he cannot take it. However, Art taunts him by telling him that he will need it if he wants to catch up to him. Ray gets frustrated and excited as Art reveals that he has reached the light orange stage, which is two stages ahead of him. After thinking about it for a while, Ray accepts the gift and promises to leave him behind the next time they duel. For the time being, Elijah is living in Helstie's mansion along with Art. They have to share a room, resulting in them having a few awkward moments from time to time. While looking at his mask, Art realizes how much has happened in the past two years. He has met so many people and made so many new friends. Even Sylvie has grown up and has become much stronger than she was. Art tells Elijah that he has talked to Vincent about sponsoring him so he can attend Exiris Academy. He gets excited and asks Art about Vincent's response. However, instead of replying, Art decides to tease him and leaves. Later that night, while trying to sleep, Elijah cannot stop thinking about going to Exiris Academy. He wonders what kind of things he'll learn there. 
Hart tells him that it will probably be boring because their skill set is already way above the level of a normal first-year student. However, Elijah is still excited about the possibility of meeting a lot of people from diverse backgrounds and learning from them. Even Art acknowledges that learning about lightning and ice attribute magic might be useful. Lightning magic still takes too much mana for him to use, and despite using his beast's will, it's hard for him to control ice magic. Elijah asks him what he's going to do about Lucas. Art tells him that since Lucas has no idea who he is, he's going to keep training until he's sure that he can take on his entire family. While Elijah wonders if he'll be able to find a girlfriend at Exiris Academy, Art assures him that he will be fine and tells him to go to sleep. The next morning after getting up, Hart runs into Vincent in the hallway. During their meeting today, he was curious about talking with an inventor, so Vincent decided to go ahead and contact one for him. His name is Gideon. He is not only a famous researcher, but also one of the most accomplished inventors and artificers in Sapin. He arrives in Exshire City in three days, so Vincent tells Art that they can meet up with him before joining everyone else in downtown Exshire's. On the same day, the royal families of Sapin, Eleanor, and Darv will make an important announcement in Ediston, which will be broadcasted in the downtown square. Art thanks him for setting up the meeting and for the explanation. Vincent is still curious about why he wants to meet Gideon. Art replies vaguely by telling him that he wants to discuss something. The real reason is that he believes it's finally time to use the knowledge from his past life. Their conversation is interrupted by Ray. He reminds Vincent that he had a meeting with someone this morning. With that, he takes off running, leaving the father-son pair behind. Art asks Ray about his training, and he replies by telling him that he has officially broken into the solid orange stage. This was made possible because of the beast core that Art gave him. However, for some reason, it didn't crumble away even after he finished absorbing all the mana from the beast core. Yet instead of thinking about it too much, Ray decides to give the core back to Art to let him examine it. Ray once again thanks him for giving him the beast core and leaves to continue his training. Art finds it strange and begins wondering why the beast's core didn't crumble. When he inspects the core using his mana, he is shocked by what he discovers. The core contains a beast will inside it. Beast wills are a coveted force that grants users very powerful magic, obtainable only when a powerful mana beast passes on its will, or taken from within a beast core. Art wonders what would happen if he were to integrate with two beasts. With that in mind, he begins his experiment to try and integrate the Elderwood Guardian's beast will with his body. As he begins to concentrate, his dragon's will begins to overpower the Elderwood Guardian. Eventually, it tries to consume the Elderwood Guardian completely. Nonetheless, Art manages to stop the integration process before the Guardian gets completely destroyed. Now he knows one thing for sure, he cannot have two beast wills. Yet he still wonders why his father couldn't absorb the beast's will. He suddenly remembered something that Virian told him during training. The mana beast's element and the mage's elemental attribute must be compatible for them to integrate. This is something that Virian told him, but he forgot. Without any doubt, Art has determined that the ideal candidate to receive this extraordinary beast core is none other than Tessia. The next few days flew by quickly. While Art trains every day to get stronger, he also makes sure to have enough time to hang out with his family, spending the days as any normal boy would. The day of the announcement by the Three Kingdoms has finally come. As always, Ellie comes to wake him up in the morning. When he refuses to wake up, she even delivers a big grand slam. Following his painful awakening, Art gets ready to meet Gideon. Art, Elijah, and Vincent arrive in the town square. Elijah decides to head off on his own to do a little shopping with the money he saved up from their dungeon raid. Art tells Sylvie to go with Elijah while he visits Gideon. Art and Vincent both head to Gideon's house. They are greeted by a creepy man who is Gideon's servant. He initially tries to get them to go away, but when he realizes that it's Vincent, he politely welcomes them in. Upon entering the house, Art is greeted by a horrible stench. It soon becomes apparent that it's because of the horrible mess the house is in. Suddenly, Gideon emerges from under a pile of clothes. His appearance resembles that of a ghost or perhaps a zombie. He is not particularly fond of meeting new people. This is because he is fed up with the constant messages he has been getting from royal families in the past year. They all want him to come up with a way to travel long distances across the ocean. Art becomes intrigued to hear this. Gideon asks Vincent who is this little boy he has brought with him. Art decides to take the initiative and introduce himself. Gideon still wonders why Vincent has brought him over. But this question is something Vincent himself wants to know the answer to. Art came here with something in mind 
but after hearing that Gideon wants to find a way to travel across the ocean, he decides to do something different. He grabs a blue piece of paper and starts drawing something. Initially, Gideon thinks of it as nothing more than an overconfident kid with some silly idea. However, when he looks at what Art has come up with, he is left shocked. It's a design for a modern engine powered by steam rather than mana. Gideon is left completely amazed, though he notices that some parts of the design don't add up. He quickly realizes that something is missing. Art interrupts his chain of thought and tells him that he intentionally left out some key details. He tells Gideon that he will only reveal the rest of the details once the negotiations are over. Gideon wrongfully assumes that Art wants money in return, so he orders his servant to bring out one of his many priceless artifacts. The servant brings an ironized diamond capable of storing five times its size and mana. Yet it doesn't interest Art. Gideon is not the one to give up so easily, so he orders his servant to bring out all his most priceless artifacts. He offers Art one treasure after another, but he refuses every one of them. Despite trying his hardest, he fails to interest Art with any of his artifacts. Left with no other choice, he orders his servant to bring out his most valuable possession. Even the servant is left surprised when he orders him to do so. It's a set of two beautiful-looking pendants. He had a world-class designer work on their aesthetics because they were being prepared for the royal family. With one look, Art realizes what he's holding. These pendants were made from a phoenix worm. They are a race of S-class mana beasts, about as rare as dragons themselves. They are known for their unique ability to preserve their life. Gideon managed to store this ability in the pendants, just like a phoenix worm is able to protect itself from danger. The user will be protected using a protective shell that will be conjured around the wearer. If the protective shell were to break, the user will be automatically transferred to a safe location away from danger. Art asks how many times one can use these effects. Although it's hard to tell, Gideon hypothesizes that they can be used two more times. Even though these were meant for the royal family, that's not important to him. What he's more curious about is how Art managed to come up with this design and why he's revealing it right now. To everyone's surprise, Art reveals that he's just trying to get a good birthday gift for his little sister. The first thought that comes to both Vincent and Gideon's minds is that he must be lying. Surely, no one would reveal such important knowledge for such a trivial reason. But Art makes it clear that he does not plan on revealing the rest of the details until Gideon tells him how he's going to use it. But this does not mean that Art is willing to let go of the pendants. Gideon gets annoyed, but Vincent assures him that Art is a man of his word. Desperate to know the rest of the details about the steam engine, Gideon agrees to the proposition. He reveals that last year they found evidence suggesting that there is another continent beyond the Cathan. Vincent had already heard rumors about this, but he didn't know if they were true. An employee of the Royal Academy let it slip and made him promise not to tell anyone. Gideon's confirmation made it all too real for Vincent as well. Anyway, Art still wonders how they can be sure that there is another continent. Gideon replies by telling him that a few years ago, they found an artifact that had never been seen in Decathan. It was attached to a bird-like mana beast. This mana beast had the ability to camouflage itself completely against its surroundings. This instantly raises a question in Vincent's mind. If the mana beast had the ability to fly as well as camouflage itself, then how were they able to capture it? The answer is simple, by sheer dumb luck. An amateur hunter missed his shot while trying to catch squirrels and accidentally shot down the bird. The artifact that the bird was carrying was so complex that it took years to figure it out. Only last year was Gideon able to figure out how it worked, and it finally confirmed everything. Hart asks another question. What did the artifact do? Gideon tells him that only the royal family has the necessary clearance for this information. Hart once again reminds him that if he wants the designs for the blueprint, he will have to continue telling him everything he knows. Gideon reluctantly reveals the information. The artifact can record and store moving images, but Art is still not convinced that this is evidence for a new continent. He thinks that it is possible that the artifact was made by some unknown artificer in Decathan. Vincent tells Art that Gideon is not just simply an accomplished inventor. He is the greatest artificer in the history of Decathan. Gideon also confirms that if Art were to present any artificer from Decathan before him, they would immediately bow down before him. Art finally realizes that the technology behind the artifact was so complex that even the best artificer in Decathan was unable to figure it out. Hence, the royal family assumed that the artifact must not be from Decathan. Gideon tells him that the artifact also had detailed images of all three kingdoms. Art nonchalantly takes this information in without acting surprised. 
Gideon gets annoyed and tells him that they are talking about a continent filled with not only highly advanced artifacts, but also even stronger mages. This is the reason Gideon wants to build a steam engine ship so they can sail the ocean and find this new continent. As per their agreement, Art gives him the rest of the details. After the meeting, they head out to the town square for the announcement. On their way there, they are reunited with Elijah. He tells the group that he heard from Elder Radias that the three kingdoms have been in talks of unifying. Art wonders if this is because of the discovery of the new continent. As they continue making their way to the town square, the group comes across a bunch of nobles picking on a student from Darv. They are beating him up because of his dwarven lineage. Unable to just stand by and watch, Elijah quickly jumps in to save the student. This only serves to further increase the bully's anger. When Elijah tries to stand up to him and the bully slaps him, knocking away his glasses, this angers Vincent and he threatens to follow the guards, but he is stopped by Art. Although Elijah could easily take them down using magic, he realizes that doing so might get Art and Vincent into trouble, so he tells himself to remain calm and not lose control. The bullies recognize the symbol on his shirt. It's the symbol of the Kingdom of Darv. Seeing this, the bullies get even more aggressive. They grab Elijah by the hair. Just as the bully is about to hit him with the metal pipe in his hand, he hears a sound. It's none other than Art who has brought a weapon of his own. Meanwhile, Prince Curtis and Princess Cathal are also going to the announcement. They are forced to use a single small carriage for discretion. This is not to the satisfaction of Prince. He would rather be as classy as possible. He went telling everyone that he planned on riding on top of his bond grotter. His bond is the same world lion he got from the auction at Helsey's auction house a few years ago. His bond has grown up to be the size of a carriage, yet he is still not trained properly. This comes as a concern to their bodyguard. But Prince assures everyone that he's getting a lot better. While going to the announcement, Princess Cathal notices Art in the street. On the other hand, Art is furious with the bullies. Vincent becomes really concerned as he has never seen this look on Art before. He is concerned that Art might actually end up killing them and tries to stop him. He tells him that they should prioritize Elijah's safety instead of anything else. However, due to a misinterpretation, the bully mistakenly perceives Vincent's actions as an attempt to save Art. There is a terrifying look on his face. He tells Vincent to step aside, which is enough to send shivers down his spine. Realizing it's too late, he politely steps aside. Underestimating Art's strength, one of the bullies confidently steps forward, telling everyone that he will handle it. The bully steps forward to hit hard with his metal pipe. But before he can even approach Art, he already gets a hit and is knocked down. The bullies still don't realize how strong Art really is. Another one of them steps forward, thinking he can bring Art down with his special technique. It's the technique passed down through generations within his family, and it's called Thousand Step Strike. In a futile display, the bully aimlessly circles around Art before finally launching an attack. As expected, Art is easily able to dodge this attack, and he knocks him down as well. In doing so, Art's twig breaks so he decides to finish the rest of the fight using his bare hands. The main culprit, Jamiel, is also very confident in his abilities, like the bullies before him. He throws away his metal pipe, determined to finish his fight with a single punch and show the peasant his place in the world. Before he can even strike, he feels the terrifying presence emanating from Art. This is something that he has not even felt from his own father, who is the head of House Trident. Nevertheless, he leaps forward to attack Art, but he is knocked down instead. Even though he's barely conscious, his anger gets the best of him. He decides to use his water magic to attack, which is blocked by a wall of ice, and the mage is none other than Princess Cathalon herself. When they first met at the auction house, Princess regarded Art as merely another boy, similar to her own immature older brother and his companions. Despite this, for some reason, she just couldn't take her eyes off of him. And this is how she found out that Art wasn't like the immature boys that she had grown to dislike. In the present, Prince Curtis arrives on the scene and demands an explanation for what's going on. All the bullies quickly bow down to him and tell the prince that they were minding their own business when the barbaric peasant suddenly started beating them up for no reason. The princess quickly figures out that it's a lie. Their story does not explain the injuries of the dwarf boy, despite the prince failing to realize this and demands an explanation from Art. He is still overcome with anger and dismisses the prince's words, calling them a joke. This angers their guard, and he goes to confront Art. He too quickly comes to realize that Art is no ordinary boy. Before the situation get out of hand, Vincent quickly intervenes. He apologizes on the Art's behalf and explains to the prince that the boys are lying. 
He explains the entire situation from earlier about how the boys were beating up the poor dwarf. Prince finally realizes the truth of the situation and demands to know the boy's name. The boy introduces himself as Jamiel, the firstborn of House Trident. They are a major donor to the royal family as well as the Exiris Academy. Despite knowing who's guilty, the prince decides to dismiss the situation to avoid any complications. This only feeds into Jamiel's ego as he knows that even the royal family cannot touch him because of all the gold that his father gives to the kingdom. As always, Art is not one to back down. He uses a two-way communication scroll to call Cynthia Goodski. Everyone is left surprised by the sudden change in tone as soon as she hears Art's voice. He straight up tells Cynthia that he wants Jamiel Trident to be expelled along with his friends for racial bullying and the use of lethal magic in the city. Cynthia doesn't hesitate to do as Art asks of her, and tells the bullies that they have been expelled. Now that the situation has been resolved, Prince Curtis apologizes to Art for being swayed so easily by Jamiel's words. Art also apologizes for his rudeness. With that, both Princess Cathalyn and Prince Curtis head back to their carriage to head to the announcement. Because of this event, Princess finds herself completely captivated by Art. Unable to hold herself back, she invites him for tea. Art also finds himself mesmerized by her beauty and agrees to meet her at school. At last, the group arrives at the town square. They reunite with the rest of the family. There are thousands of people here, and they're about to find out that there is another continent out there. Art wonders how they will react to the news, but what's really bothering him is the fact that the other continent has been spying on Decathan. He realizes that the mana beast with the ability to camouflage and use it for recording artifacts cannot just be a coincidence. Despite this, they would only be doing so if they feared the people of Decathan or if they had malicious intent. Art wonders if he made the right choice by expediting Decathan's ability to reach this new continent. Perhaps it could be for the best. If they are hostile, then this allows Decathan to launch a preemptive attack. Alice notices that Art seems more distracted than usual. She becomes worried about him and asks him if everything is alright. She tells him that although she will always worry about him, she will never stop him from doing what he wants. More than anything, Art wishes that he could promise her that she has nothing to worry about. Still, he does not want to lie to her like that. So instead, he replies to her with a heartfelt thank you. As the ceremony begins, two mages walk up to the front and launch four magical crystals into the air. These crystal balls start displaying a projection of all the kings. The ceremony is commenced by the King of Sapin, Blaine Glader. He addresses the audience not as the King of Sapin, but as the King of Humanity and the representative of the continent of Decathan. The crowd quickly gets on their knees and bows down to the king. The king acknowledges their relationship with other species. For a long time there has been an animosity between the humans and the elves and the dwarves have only been business partners. The king tells everyone that this is not how they wish to continue their relationship. In these past few years, there have been efforts to reunite the races. Two years ago, they all agreed to allow members of all three races to become adventurers. Last year marked another milestone. The Exiris Academy, the best magical school on the continent, allowed students from the Kingdom of Eleanor and the Kingdom of Darv. The king urges the crowd to put aside their animosity and work together for a brighter future. With the opening speech done, the King of the Elves steps forward to address the crowd. He makes the big announcement, which is also the main topic of today's ceremony. He announces to everyone that they have found evidence of another continent. This sends everyone into a state of shock. Whispers start echoing throughout the crowd. Everyone has their questions. Are they enemies or are they friends? Slowly the surprise among the crowd started turning into panic. The king calms the crowd and continues his speech. He tells the crowd that they don't know much yet. Although they do know that there's another continent out there full of mysteries, adventures, and possible dangers. There is also evidence that they have tried to make contact with Decathan. Before the king could continue talking, he is interrupted by the king of the dwarves. He urges the crowd to stand together in this time of uncertainty and do what's best for the people and the continent. Although their appearance may be different and their cultures may sometimes clash, the king reminds everyone that they were all born on the same continent. He tells everyone that he's proud of this fact and hopes that future generations will feel the same way. This resonates with the crowd and they all give him a big round of applause. The process of bringing these races together will take time and effort, but today they will be appointing six individuals. These six individuals have been selected by the royal families and are believed to be the most courageous, tactful, intelligent, and powerful individuals in their respective nations. 
They represent the three races on a continental scale. Their primary goal is to defend and maintain the well-being of Decathan. From henceforth, they will be known as the Six Lances. They will each be given a special ring. One by one, each of the members step forward, and they are given rings by their respective kings and queens. The first one is Elie Triskin, followed by Vere Ore, Alfred Warrand, Aya Griffin, Mecca Earthborn, and finally Baron Wykes. Both Elijah and Art are shocked to hear the last name. The King of Sapin ends the announcement by urging all the aspiring mages to strive to become one of the six lances in the future. Art finally met his enemy face to face. The day of the announcement had been a cold reality check for Art. Because of Lucas's insubordination and betrayal, most of their party ended up dying. He used his family's power and connection to walk free from all his atrocities. Art had been warned by everyone that seeking revenge against Lucas would be suicide. This is because he has the backing of his older brother, who is not only a powerful mage, but one of the six members of the Lances as well. Yet Art decides to put that aside for now because he has more important matters to attend to, his sister's birthday party. He gets ready and wears a fancy suit for the party and tells Sylvie to stay in his room for the night. This is because Vincent told him that there might be some guests attending Ellie's party as a pretense to watch him, so he does not want to take any chances and risk exposing himself although he does promise Sylvie to bring her back a lot of food as a way to cheer her up. As the party begins, the guests start arriving. It doesn't take long for Art to impress everyone with his charm. It's a much different story for Elijah, though. He tries to impress the girls, but instead, he drives them away because of his lack of elegance. The birthday girl finally arrives. She's blindfolded by Alice as she walks down the steps. As soon as she opens her eyes, she is surprised to see the amazing party. The party continues and everyone has an amazing time. The party is stopped as Ray gets up on stage to make an announcement. He thanks everyone for coming and tells them that he's blessed to have such an amazing daughter and son in his life. Much to the embarrassment of Ellie, but what comes next leads her horrified. Her father announces that his son and daughter will partake in the first dance. The horror is that this was never planned, so Ellie and Art never practiced. Surely they would make a fool of themselves if they were to do as Ray suggested. This even incurs Alice's wrath, though Art is not about to let this ruin the party. He boldly takes Ellie's hand and makes his way to the dance floor. What happens next leaves both Alice and Ellie surprised. Art dances most elegantly as if he's a professional dancer. He even launches Ellie into the air using his air magic and slowly brings her down while making sure to make her look as beautiful as possible. The crowd is left amazed and they start applauding. Even Gideon is impressed by their performance. He tells Art that he would like to have a word with him. Art doesn't want to be bothered on this special occasion just to discuss some ideas, but Gideon tells him that he just wanted to let him know that the council has approved the designs that he got from him, and the construction is underway. The council consists of all the kings and queens from the three kingdoms. Art congratulates him and tells him that he must have been rewarded handsomely. In fact, money, fame, and power are not something that Gideon is interested in. Before he can continue, they are interrupted by a bunch of fans. While Gideon is distracted, Art seizes his chance to get away. The guests have begun leaving. He is met with an unexpected guest. It's Lilia. She apologizes to Art for not greeting him sooner. He tells her that it's fine and they spend time together chatting about their lives. Art realizes that Lilia has become quite popular with the boys. She gets embarrassed and tells him that she doesn't even have a boyfriend. This may be because she has developed a crush on Art. Their conversation is interrupted by Gideon. He politely asks Lilia if he can borrow Art for a moment. After saying goodbye to Art, she leaves him by themselves. Gideon, realizing Lilia's feelings, tells Art that she has a crush on him. Still to his surprise, Art tells him that he already knows that. He goes on to explain that her feelings towards him are not love, but more akin to gratitude. This is because he changed her life in a major way by helping her in her awakening. He tells Gideon that although she doesn't know it yet, in the future she will be able to distinguish. Putting that aside, Gideon gets back to the conversation they were having before they were interrupted. He doesn't care about money, fame, and power, but instead he wants something that even the consul cannot offer him, Art's knowledge. Art tells him that he is already having second thoughts about giving him the blueprints for this steam engine. He does not want to change the world any more than he already has. He believes that the continent is doing just fine without any more of his ideas. Even so, Gideon just hears what he wants to hear and realizes that Art has more ideas for world-changing inventions. 
Art makes it clear that he does not want to indulge in Gideon's selfish curiosities. So Gideon offers him a different deal. He tells Art that he does not want any world-changing inventions, but maybe he can let him pick his brain from time to time. In return, he will become Art's personal benefactor for any invention or good he needs. After thinking about it for a minute, Art agrees to the proposition. Back home, Ellie has started unpacking her gifts. He arrives just as Ellie is unbagging Tessia's gift. It's a beautiful ribbon with an elvish design. Next, it's time for Art's gift. He takes out the two pendants that he got from Gideon and presents them to Ellie and Alice. Ellie is taken aback by the beautiful necklace. Art once again wishes her happy birthday while putting the necklace on her. Four months have passed since Ellie's birthday. Gideon has brought Art over to the construction facility. No one is allowed inside this facility other than their employees and the council members. For the past few months, Art has been getting constant calls from Gideon for every little step of the project. Art's birthday passed not too long ago, but instead of having an extravagant party like Ellie, he decided to have a small party with just his family. Gideon decides to give him a late birthday present. It's a bracelet that Art requested Gideon to make for him. It will allow him to hide two of his elemental attributes. Gideon asks Art and why he wouldn't want a bracelet that would hide two elemental attributes instead of one. He jokingly suggests he is a quarter elemental and is left completely shocked when Art confirms that he actually is a quadra elemental mage. Getting back to the topic of the ship, Art is really impressed by how fast the ship is getting built. Gideon boldly declares that the Decathius will set sail on the day Art joins the Osiris Academy. On his way back home, Art can't stop thinking about how fast the ship is being built. He tells himself that if the new continent really is hostile that he cannot afford to slack off on his training. He plans to use this new artifact that he got to work on his wind and earth magic and bring them to the same level as his fire and water magic. While lost in thought, he bumps into a man. Even though Art apologizes instantly, the man is angry and threatens to discipline him. He boldly declares that he is a professor at the Exarus Academy and it is his job to discipline brats like him. He puts his hand on Art's head and tries to force him down to kneel, but he realizes how strong Art is when he can't even get him to budge. Art informs him that he's willing to let this slide because of his intoxication, but he better gets his hand off of him. The man cannot help but feel scared and he instinctively backs off. Although he still tells Art that if he's a student at the academy, then he better watch out. But instead, Art tells him that he looks forward to it while throwing the pendant toward him. The man realizes that Art managed to get his pendant off of him without him even realizing, indicating the clear difference in their strength. Art finally arrives home. He is greeted by Eleanor and Sylvie. She tells him that a package has arrived for him and Elijah from the Osiris Academy. It's their uniforms. Art can't help but think about his journey to this point. From an orphan to a king, to a baby, then an adventurer. And now, finally, he has become a student. As Art begins this new chapter in his life, he wonders how much more this world will teach him. The much-awaited day has arrived as Art finally joins the Osiris Academy. Elijah comes to wake him up but doesn't realize that Sylvie is there as well. He makes a grave mistake, unintentionally disturbing Sylvie's peaceful slumber. In her rage, she targets the only person around which happens to be Elijah. Art wakes up and calms her down, but not before she scratches up Elijah's face. Art quickly gets ready for their first day and puts on his uniform. There are two types of students at Exiris Academy, Battle Mages and Scholar Mages. Art will be attending the school as the Scholar Mage, while Elijah will be attending as a Battle Mage. As the name suggests, Scholar mages learn about magic theories instead of practicing how to use magic in real combat. This comes as a surprise to Elijah, and he tells Art that he should have taken electives instead of centering his education on theories. However, fighting kids his age doesn't really interest Art. Although scholar mages get looked down upon at the school, that doesn't bother him. Rather than being concerned about Art, Elijah is more worried about the students who will get sent to the medical ward because they look down upon Art but he shrugs off his worries and promises to be on his best behavior. The two boys come down to have breakfast with the rest of the family. Elijah gets his face healed off the scratch marks, while Alice and Ray argue about who did a better job of raising their son. So all in all, a pretty typical family breakfast. After breakfast, they head out to get on the carriage to go to school. Art says goodbye to Alice while promising to visit as often as he can. He reminds Ellie and Alice to keep the pendants on them at all times. He also tells Ray not to burn down the house while practicing. After a short ride on the carriage, they arrived at Xyrus Academy. 
It's a beautiful, luxurious building, no different from a palace. Art witnesses many students arriving on their bonds. Perhaps he could do the same with Sylvie, but that would be a shock to everyone, to say the least. The students are instructed to form a single file line in front of the white building. This is for the entrance ceremony, which is mandatory for all students. All the students walk in a single line and register themselves at the front desk. This is done by using a magical crystal ball. Art registers himself as a scholar mage candidate with an affinity for earth and wind magic. For some reason, the lady at the front desk is left shocked after hearing Art's magical affinities. This comes as a surprise to him, as he wonders why it is so shocking. She quickly apologizes to him and tells him to go on ahead. Art arrives at the huge auditorium for the entrance ceremony. Despite this fact, it's completely full. Not long after Elijah and Art find their seats, the ceremony begins. Cynthia Goodsky uses her wind magic to suddenly appear out of nowhere. Next, she proceeds to use her sound magic throughout the auditorium. As usual, the use of magic quickly catches Art's interest. Cynthia tells everyone that she doesn't like to speak up, especially in her old age, so she likes to use this little trick. She begins the ceremony by welcoming all the students to their humble academy. She proudly announces that this year they have had the most elf and dwarf students since the founding of the academy. Instead of giving a long and boring speech, she decides to bring out the student council, since they are the very students that will be leading and giving a voice to all the new students. One by one, all the members of the student council come out on the stage. This includes Lilia, and the last person to step out is the student council president herself, who is none other than Tessia Ehrlich. She begins her speech with a welcome note for all the new students. Although she is a first-year student, like all of them, she has had the opportunity of being in the academy a year longer. She decides to address the discrimination that scholar mages face in the academy. If mere differences in uniform can divide them, then she worries about where the differences in race will lead them. She tells everyone to cast aside their prejudice that breeds hostility among races. Just like the royal families have come together to form the council, she tells everyone that they should do the same for the future of the continent. She ends her speech with a round of applause from the audience. Sylvie's excitement to see Tessia again catches Elijah's attention. He wonders how Art knows about the changes she has undergone and why it seems to matter to him so much. All Art can do is ignore this weirdo. After the entrance ceremony, Elijah and Art decided to take a walk around the campus. Art continues to ignore Elijah, much to his annoyance. While walking, they come across two students arguing with each other. It's a typical student fight between a noble and a dwarf. The noble named Nicholas Drail challenges the dwarf named Brosnian Boar to a duel. The dwarf is quick to agree and initiates the duel using the badge on his uniform. Nicholas accepts the challenge by doing the same gesture with his own badge. As soon as the duel starts, a barrier is formed around each student. These badges are actually artifacts that the school distributes among the students. They form barriers during sanctioned duels within the school. Both students use their magic to summon their weapons. Nicholas summons dual swords while Brosnian summons a huge axe. Elijah is good to cheer on the home team. Art decides to use his own magic to assess both students. Nicholas has a dark red core while Brosnian is a black core augmenter. Braz starts the attack by lunging at Nick using his axe. Nick counterattacks by forming two huge slashes using his earth magic. Art is impressed by his abilities since he was able to conjure earth like that while being an augmenter and having a red core. Braz destroys the earth slashes and continues charging towards Nick. He swings the heavy weapon at Nick. However, with quick reflexes, Nick evades the attack and swiftly moves behind his opponent, launching a counterattack with his dual swords. They seem to be equally matched. Braz once again charges towards Nick to close the distance. Nicholas realizes that this is his opportunity. He stabs the ground with one of his swords and flings the dirt toward his opponent. This momentarily blinds him, giving Nick the perfect opportunity to use his earth magic. He uses a spell called Earth Pillar, which lands and breaks Brosnian's barrier. Breaking your opponent's barrier means that the fight has been won. Braz points out the cowardly way that Nicholas fought, but it doesn't matter since a win is a win. The duel should be over since the barrier is broken, but that's not what Nicholas plans to do. He tries to continue his attack and threatens to break Brosnian's arm. Elijah realizes that this might be his chance to become a hero and boldly steps forward. However, his plans are quickly foiled. When Art pretends to spot the student council president, causing Nicholas to become alert and halt his actions. When Nick realizes that was just a prank, he becomes angry and comes over to attack Art. Art tries to de-escalate the situation, 
telling him that it's not cool to discriminate. This further angers him. He leaves, but not before threatening. This doesn't go over well with Sylvia. She doesn't like anyone threatening her papa. So she decides to get a small revenge by spitting on Nicholas's neck as he walks away. Nicholas becomes furious as he feels insulted by this prank. As he is about to conjure his weapon to attack Art, the fight is stopped by the arrival of the student council. Three members arrive on the scene, including Lilia, Tessia, and the student council's vice president. A few minutes earlier, these three members were walking around the campus and discussing their agenda for the day. However, the only thing on Tessia's mind is how she couldn't find Art during her speech. She starts to wonder if he skipped the ceremony, but that couldn't be because she was informed by Cynthia that he was at the school. She starts imagining different scenarios of how they will meet. She wonders if she should play it cool or perhaps be more friendly. Or maybe he will find her instead. All her thoughts are interrupted by the vice president. As they're walking around, Tessia's sight catches the starting moment of the argument between Nicholas and Art. The vice president quickly recognizes Nicholas from House Drail. He is one of the most promising students that came in last year. Although the vice president doesn't recognize Art from any of the noble houses, so he assumes that he is a commoner. As the argument starts turning into a fight, both Lilia and Tessia quickly get into action. They both realize at once that if they start fighting, Nicholas might end up dead. Tessia quickly steps forward to stop the fight. Nicholas defends himself by telling her that it's all a misunderstanding. He blames Art by telling her that he interrupted the duel. Before Art could start talking, he is interrupted by Lilia as she steps forward to ask him what happened. This comes as a surprise to Tessia, as she didn't know that they already knew each other. Lilia tells her that their fathers work together, and they are old friends. Art further adds that they have been living together for a while. Although it is a bit misleading, the thick-headed Art doesn't realize it. The vice president steps forward and demands an explanation from Nicholas. Even if he was interrupted, that doesn't give him the right to pull out his weapon on a student. He defends himself by stating that he just wanted to scare Art and that he would never have harmed him. The vice president decides to be a little lenient and is about to let Nicholas off the hook. However, Tessa is not so forgiving. She points out that threatening someone with a weapon outside a sanctioned deal is a violation of the student ground rules. She dares him to do the same to her while pointing out that the minimum penalty for such an action is a suspension. If he were to touch a single hair on her head, the minimum penalty would be expulsion. Nicholas is left speechless. She once again asks him if he dares to do it. Just by looking at the expression on her face, Nicholas is left terrified. He quickly bowed down to Art and apologizes for his actions. After everyone leaves, she finally gets the opportunity to talk to Art. She asks him why he's getting into a fight on the first day of school. Although she asks this out of concern, it doesn't go over well with Art. He got annoyed at her for making this assumption after just watching the first five seconds of the situation. However, she tells him that it doesn't matter who is in the wrong. If the situation had escalated, then he would have had to face repercussions. Art continues the argument while pointing out that he did it to protect a student from harm. Elijah interrupts him and tells him to let it go. However, this further annoys him, and he begins to walk away. He is stopped by the vice president named Clive. Tessia tries to stop him, but he tells her that it's unacceptable for someone of Art's stature to talk to her like that. He even goes as far as to say that his lack of manners is because of his poor upbringing. This is the final straw for him. Art uses his wind magic to launch him into the air. Clive lands on his back, but manages to avoid any significant injuries. The annoyed Art leaves, finally ending this awkward situation. Back at the dormitory, Tessia is angry with herself for screwing everything up. She had been looking forward to meeting Art all this time, and now he is angry at her. She grabbed her pillow and screams into it out of frustration. She doesn't seem to be able to make up her mind about who was wrong. Conflicting thoughts fill her mind. On one hand, she convinces herself that she was merely looking out for Art's well-being. Considering his tendency to get into trouble, she fears he might lose access to the library and training facilities. On the other hand, a sense of guilt creeps in, making her wonder if she had been too harsh with him, questioning the fairness of her actions. After all, he was the one who got threatened with a weapon. Putting all that aside, the real reason for her anger is that she just found out about Lilia. She even starts to blame Cynthia for making her the student council president. If she wasn't in the student council, their encounter could have gone differently. While she continues sulking, Clive comes up to check up on her. He asks her if she knew Art since he talked so casually to her. He even asks her if he should go to the director about this matter. However, she claims that the matter is settled so it's fine.
However, in reality, she knows it's far from okay. Elsewhere, Art and Elijah also began to settle into their rooms. Even Elijah is surprised by Art's reaction earlier. It's not like him to get so worked up. Normally, he would ignore such things and walk off. Yet Art himself doesn't know the answer to this. He wonders if the reason is because it was Tess who said it. As they are unpacking their stuff, they are visited by an unexpected guest. Much to Elijah's shock, this unexpected guest is none other than Cynthia. He quickly bows down and politely welcomes her. Sensing the tension between Art and Cynthia, he excuses himself by telling them that he's going to get drinks. It doesn't take long for her to notice how Sildi has changed, but that's not the only thing she notices. She is only able to sense Art's wind and earth attributes. She comes to the conclusion that he must be using a seal. This disappoints Cynthia, as she had hoped to flaunt her quadra elemental protege. Although she is glad that Art opted for scholar mage instead of battle mage. Art was planning on telling her this when he got the chance to meet her, but he chose not to. This is because he did not want to draw any attention to himself because of Lucas. He didn't want his new enemy to become suspicious of him. Cynthia finds this funny in a way, referring to the brother of Alliance and one of the most influential military houses as a mere enemy. With that being the case, she wonders what kind of monsters his real enemies will be. Putting that aside, Art tells her that he does want her help with something related to his school life. He wants to be able to take the higher level monotheory classes, especially those related to deviants. This wouldn't be a difficult task for the Academy's director. Cynthia is still surprised as she was under the impression that Art wanted to fit in with everyone else. Art realizes his mistake but remains calm and continues the conversation. Cynthia agrees to do this for him and even offers to give him a pass in the upper class mage's mock battles. This way he can observe magic being used in real combat. Art is intrigued by this offer, but he soon realizes that there must be a catch. This is around the same time that Elijah arrives with their drinks. He starts yelling at Art for being rude to the director. He is made to feel silly when Cynthia confesses to having an ulterior motive. She explains that the student councils are like the shield of this school. This year she has decided to make a disciplinary committee, the swords that she wants Art to join. The academy is full of young hormonal mages filled with pride. This often leads to problems. The disciplinary committee will be the one responsible for upholding the peace and enforcing the rules on the school grounds. Art wonders if he is fit to join this committee. He is a first-year student and he's not even a battle mage. Cynthia gives a short and satisfying answer. It's her school and therefore her rules. Art decides that it would be too much trouble to join the disciplinary committee and refuses the offer. He tells her that he doesn't need the theory classes and he will just teach himself from the books in the library. Nonetheless, Cynthia came prepared for such a response. She tells him that those books are inaccessible for underclassmen, and even if he was an upperclassman, he would have to reveal that he's a deviant to use those books. This is something that Art does not want to do. Elijah is surprised by the unusual relationship, which does not resemble the relationship between a director and a student at all. Cynthia decides to sweeten the pot. She offers to give Art access to a private training facility. There is one concern that he has, and that's whether Lucas has a spot on the disciplinary committee or not. She assures him that despite House Wyke's insistence on giving Lucas a spot, she declined. This is because she had hoped to give this spot to him. After hearing this, Art finally agrees to become part of the committee. She wastes no time and gives him his new uniform, which he will have to wear as a part of the disciplinary committee. It is revealed that Cynthia had predicted their entire conversation as she tells Art that she already had a uniform tailored for him. This pisses him off as he doesn't like to be so predictable. Before leaving, Cynthia advised Art to make up with Tessia, as it is not a good thing to be mad at your childhood friend. Elijah is left completely amazed as he realizes that Art is friends with Princess Aerolith. While on a walk around the campus, Art apologizes to Elijah for not telling him sooner. Elijah does have a childhood friend of his own in a way, however he decides to skip out on details, which in my opinion is for the best. Despite Art's apology, Elijah just cannot move on from the fact that Art knows so many beautiful girls, Lilia, then Princess Cathinon, and now even Princess Tessia. Next, he might as well be flirting with the gods. Art tells him that he didn't flirt with anyone which makes it even worse. He seems to be getting all the girls without even trying unlike Elijah, who has been trying a bit too hard. He hypothesizes that maybe Art just oozes out attractive pheromones. As they go to the cafeteria for dinner, Art starts attracting the attention of everyone there. It seems that the rumors about his encounter with Nicholas have already started spreading. 
he pays them no attention as he is already used to this kind of treatment by now. Long after they start eating, they are approached by a group of students. They approach Elijah and tell him that he's wasting his time with someone beneath him. The leader introduces himself as Charles Ravenpoop II from the famous House Ravenpoop. He is feeling rather magnanimous today and offers to let Elijah join his group. Instead of taking him seriously, the two boys burst out laughing after hearing the name of his house. They cannot believe that a noble family would be named after bird feces. Angered by their insult, he throws away Elijah's food, so he fires back by telling him that he would never go with someone who blatantly looks down on his best friend. Instead of looking down on scholar mages, they should treat everyone equally, like the student council president said. Charles reminds him that it's something the student council says because it's politically correct and it's for appearances. In reality, there is a huge difference between scholar mages and battle mages. This would normally be true, but that's not the case when it comes to art. Charles tries to prove his point by attacking art, but art easily brushes his attack off using his wind magic. Charles is not ready to accept it and tells himself that it must be a fluke. He goes in for another attack. This time, Elijah steps in front of Art to protect him. Although Art could easily get away with magic, he doesn't want to lead his friend to get attacked. To everyone's surprise, the attack is stopped by a couple of vines. These vines wrap themselves around his body and quickly restrain him. Any normal student would not be capable of using such powerful deviant magic, though Art realizes that it could only be one person. This is confirmed when he sees Tessia leaving the room. Now the question remains what to do with him. If they were to use magic, then they would surely get into trouble. So Art comes up with the perfect plan. Charles starts throwing out his threat, telling them that they will not get away with this when his mother finds out. As he senses pressure coming off from Art, the terror leaves him speechless, and even Elijah becomes concerned. Art starts gathering mana on his right hand. Clearly he's about to attack him. Yet what unfolds next leaves everyone utterly astonished. With one swing of his hand, Art pulls his pant right down to his ankles, leaving him exposed for everyone to witness. This might even be more cruel than physical injury. Art decides to take his leave after putting Charles' dignity right into the ground. When he goes out of the building, he sees Tessia sitting on a bench. This is exactly what he had hoped for, a chance to talk to her alone. Art thanks her for her help with Charles. Having met after so long, both of them don't know what to say. He tries to break the awkward silence by apologizing for his behavior earlier. Though his apologies met with the headboard, just like the good old times, as Tessia tries to apologize herself, she cannot help but start crying a little bit. But she makes up the excuse that it's because her head's hurting. She leans her head on his shoulder and Art comforts her by patting her. She was worried that Art hated her. He assures her that no matter how many times he gets mad at her, he can never hate her. He once again apologizes for what happened earlier. He knew she was looking out for her, so he shouldn't have lashed out. Their moment is interrupted by Elijah's arrival. He came here to tell them that Ravenpoop has finally managed to get out of the vines. When he witnesses them all snuggled up, the look on his face is enough to tell everyone what he's thinking. He quickly only excuses himself to not interrupt their romantic moment. At least that's what he thinks. Art asks her if she would like to go on a walk with him so they can talk more. He tells her all about his adventures for the past two years. Art is surprised to learn that Virian is so close to Cynthia. Tessia reveals that this was the reason why she was able to become Cynthia's disciple. Art assures her that her skills had more to do with it. Now that she has finally gotten to spend some time with him, she begins to notice how much Art has changed in these past couple of years. The way he moves and talks, there's so much purpose behind it. Not to mention, he has become much more good-looking as well. She starts to feel jealous of Jasmine for getting to spend two years with him. It starts to get late, so Art suggests going back to their dorms before they get into trouble. Before they leave, Art has a little gift for Tessia. It's the Elderwood Guardian's Beast Corps that he had saved up. Although she had heard about it from Cynthia, she is still surprised. She couldn't be happier to receive such a precious gift from him. When he finally gets back to his room, he's greeted by Elijah's ghost. This ghost was formed probably after he died of jealousy. He immediately wants an explanation for what he witnessed earlier. Even after Art explains everything, Elijah is still in disbelief that Art is friends with the Lunar Goddess. This is the nickname that the students have bestowed upon her. Her beauty and radiance are like the moon, but Art got to touch the moon and snuggle with the moon. This is the reason for Elijah's anger. Art quickly knocks him out with his pillow and goes to sleep.
The long-awaited day has finally dawned as it's his first official day as a student at Osiris Academy and as a member of the disciplinary committee. Art puts on his new uniform and walks to the club room. This sure catches the attention of all the nearby students who are still unaware of the disciplinary committee. It's finally time for Art to meet the so-called strongest students of Exiris Academy. As soon as he opens the door, a huge lion jumps in front of him and roars with all his might. Sylvie holds on for her dear life to not get blown away. Despite the powerful roar, it fails to get a reaction out of Art. All it manages to do is piss Sylvie off and cover him with drool. This was supposed to be an elaborate welcome prank by one of the senior members of the committee, but it obviously failed. This guy is a fourth year named Kai Crestless. Art returns the polite greeting and introduces himself as well as Sylvie, who is busy taking down the mighty lion. Even Kai is surprised to see this and wonders what sort of a beast she is for her to be able to render Grotter so submissive. Their conversation is interrupted by another member of the committee. She's a tough-looking grawny first year. One look at her and Art is reminded of Helgarth, Elijah's childhood friend. However, thankfully, that's not the case. She introduces herself as Deridria Oregard. She extends a polite hand while introducing herself, but he just slaps it away, clearly showing his macho and tough guy personality. The three of them head off to meet the rest of the DC officers who are waiting in the next room. The first person Art notices upon entering the room is Prince Curtis. It's no surprise that a member of the royal family would be part of the committee. Even he is surprised to see his bond grotter acting so scared. It seems he fell to the mighty Sylvie, who now uses the lion as a personal carriage. Upon seeing Curtis, Art instantly realizes that this world lion is the same one that he purchased at Helstie's auction house. They greet each other like old friends. Curtis is not the only member of the royal family to be on the disciplinary committee. It seems Princess Catherine is a member as well, which is hardly a surprise. However, the next member is indeed a very big surprise. It's Ferith Evsar, the same elf that Art met during his time in the Elven Kingdom. Art calls him by his nickname Feifei. This pisses him off, but at the same time gets a laugh out of all the other members of the disciplinary committee. Although Ferith is a first year just like Art, he is still a few years older than him. So Art should treat him with respect, but knowing Art's personality, that's not going to happen. The last two members also arrive to introduce themselves. Firstly, it's Claire Bladeheart. Being a sixth-year student, she's the most senior member of the committee and also their leader. Art instantly recognizes the name Bladeheart. It's the same last name as Caspian. She confirms that Caspian is her uncle. She asks Art if he knows him. He decides to keep his connection to Caspian a secret and instead tells her that he has heard a lot of great things about him. The last member of the disciplinary committee is Theo. Unlike everyone else, he is not so welcoming. He is not satisfied with the weak and scrawny-looking Art, so he decides to give him a test. As they shake hands, he unleashes his gravity magic on him. Being as strong as he is, even Art has to use his own magic to counter the full force of Theo's gravity magic. If it wasn't for his assimilation with Sylvie's beast will, even Art wouldn't have been able to withstand it. Theo, as well as all the other members of the disciplinary committee, are impressed that Art is able to withstand gravity magic. This is something that Feifei failed miserably. He tries to defend himself by telling everyone that he is a conjurer and Theo is an augmenter. Before this could go any further, Claire puts an end to their argument. She tells them to stop fighting and put their game face on for the club's announcement. This will be the very first time the DC officers will show their faces to the rest of the students. This is something that Art wasn't aware of, but Curtis tells him that there's nothing to worry about. The student council will be the one making the announcement and they just have to come onto the stage and look tough. With an A-class mana beast on their side, this task shouldn't be very difficult. The announcement starts with Tessia's speech. She tells everyone about the disciplinary committee stating that these are hand-picked students by the director herself to resolve and prevent disputes among students. They will enforce punishment on the troublemakers for the sake of upholding peace. With a round of applause, the disciplinary committee members all walk onto the stage as a group. Art's student life has started in full swing. It's time for his first class as a student. Because of the club rush announcement, Art has become the subject of all the gossip. As expected, he is not very happy about this. The fact that he's one of the only eight students wearing a black uniform doesn't really help his cause. The class begins as the professor walks in. Judging from the wand hanging by his waist, he is a conjurer. After putting his books down on the table, he introduces himself to the rest of the class. His name is Professor Avius, 
and he'll be teaching the class known as the Fundamentals of Monotheory. The professor is well aware that this class is not very popular among the students. It's obviously because it's all about boring theory without any practical magic use. Before they start covering the syllabus, the teacher decides to address the conjurers are better than augmenter stigma. In the olden days when achieving an orange core was considered a huge achievement, conjurers had a big advantage over augmenters. Conjurers typically have much more developed mana veins, which are responsible for absorbing mana and transporting it to the core. Meanwhile, augmenters have much more developed mana channels. These are responsible for the distribution of mana from the core to the rest of the body. Since conjurers are more efficient at absorbing mana, it is easier for them to ascend to the next level. This was the reason for their advantage. However, as both types of mages ascend, the differences become less pronounced. Conjurers become more efficient at distributing mana throughout their body, while augmenters gain better remote mana manipulation. The teacher raises a question for the whole class. If two mages, one conjurer and one augmenter both reach the silver core stage, who would have the advantage? The answer is simple. The mage who has both great mana distribution and manipulation will be the winner. The rest of the lecture continued with some of the conjurer students arguing with the professor's claims. The debate used hypotheticals and previously recorded duels between high-ranking mages. However, in the end, the discussion did seem to lead the students with an open mind. So all in all, one could say the professor achieved what he had hoped to do. As soon as this class ends, Art immediately heads out for his next class. He says goodbye to Elijah while telling him to save him a seat at lunch. This lecture hall is designed more like the training field at the Adventures Guild. It's quite obvious that this lecture will be a practical one. Art is quite enjoying his life as a student. He gets to relax and sit around, unlike when he was an adventurer. His peaceful time is interrupted by Princess Catherine. She wants to sit next to him. Being polite, he tells her to go right ahead, yet in reality, he would rather be left alone. It seems that a peaceful time is just not in the cards for Art as Eden Ferrith wants to sit next to him. The lecture finally begins as the teacher makes his way. As expected, the practical lecture is quite crowded, unlike the previous theory class. It doesn't take long for Art to realize that his new teacher is the same drunk that he met before joining the academy. The class is known as practical mana manipulation and what better way to learn this other than engaging in physical combat. Keeping in line with his nature, the teacher quickly starts scouting the students for cute girls. When his eyes meet Art, he is instantly able to recognize him as the student who humiliated him. He starts laughing inwardly as he has finally gotten his opportunity to get revenge. He tells the class that it's an honor to teach the newly formed disciplinary committee. Since everyone is wondering what the new DC officers are made of, he gives them an opportunity to volunteer and show their strength. This is an obvious move to humiliate the DC officers in front of everyone. No idiot would fall for this. No idiot except one, I guess. Hearing the teacher's words, Ferrith instantly raises his hand and volunteers. He boasts about how they are handpicked students by the director herself. It's made all too easy for the teacher, who was looking for just this opportunity. Ferrith walks down to the field and introduces himself to the teacher. Judging from the fact that he cannot sense the teacher's mana core level, he realizes that the teacher is much stronger than him. The teacher even decides to give him a handicap. Even though he's an augmenter, he will only use long-range attacks. This also gives him an excuse in case he loses. Both of them activated the barriers using their badges and starts the duel. Ferrith begins with a spell called Flood Domain. This is a high-tier spell that adjusts the territory to be more advantageous to the caster. Art is impressed that Ferrith can use such a spell. He follows it up with a spell called Water Serpent. It summons a huge snake that charges towards his opponent. The teacher finds the level of the spell too easy to counter effortlessly summoning blue flames on his right hand in preparation for an attack. It becomes evident that the drunk wasn't all talk. The blue flames effortlessly obliterate the serpent and now head directly towards Ferrith. At the last moment, the teacher redirects the spell and it attacks Ferrith's leg. With just one attack, he manages to destroy the barrier and emerge victorious. This is an obvious attempt to boost his ego by purposefully humiliating Ferrith. Ferrith makes his way back to his chair. Art tries to uplift his spirit by telling him that he did a good job. The teacher, on the other hand, is not done humiliating him. He tells the class that Mr. Ivsar should have been able to protect himself against his spell, but clearly he wasn't strong enough. To everyone's surprise, the next one to volunteer is Princess Catherine. She is an ice magic user. She volunteers despite knowing that she would be at a disadvantage against a teacher who is a fire magic user. 
both Ferith and Art become concerned. It would be a big deal if the princess gets injured. As she makes her way down to the training field, the teacher introduces himself and tells her not to hold it against him. With a simple nod, she agrees. She summons her wand and the battle begins. She starts the battle by firing icicle lances. The teacher easily defends himself. He uses his fire magic to melt all the ice lances. She continues her barrage of ice lances. He counterattacks by throwing fireballs toward her. Art instantly recognizes this spell as the same one that Lucas used during the rank examination. Princess Kathleen counters the fireballs by blocking them using her ice lances. This breaks the huge ice lances into smaller pieces that could be used as missiles. The teacher once again uses the same spell to throw more fireballs at her. This is where the princess makes a grave error. Instead of defending herself, she goes all out on the attack and uses ice tornado. This leads her completely defenseless against the incoming attack. Ferith, being a conjurer himself, instantly recognizes the mistake. With no way to stop the spell, the teacher realizes the horrible situation he has created. As the spell makes contact, a huge blast erupts, leaving all the students in utter shock. After the smoke clears, everyone is relieved to see that the princess is safe. It seems that Art managed to get her away from the blast just in time. Instead of admitting to his mistake, he tells Art that his help was unnecessary. He lies and tells everyone that he had complete control of his spell. The lie seemed to have fooled all the less experienced students in the class. He further explains that he was about to cancel the spell just before it made contact. But Art knows that to be a lie, having witnessed the same spell being used by Lucas, he knows there is no way to cancel the spell after it has been used. Since he has no proof of the teacher's wrongdoing for now, he is unable to do anything. So, the only logical thing is to find proof. He comes up with a plan to force the teacher to screw up against him. If he gets hurt, then he will have clear evidence of the teacher's mistake. To put his plan into action, he decides to switch places with Cathon. Art summons his sword and prepares to face the teacher. Unlike the previous two battles, this time both of the participants are augmenters, so the teacher asks Art what method he would prefer for their fight. Art knows that he is stronger than him, so he tells him that it doesn't matter. Upon the teacher's continued insistence, Art tells him that he should use the method that he's most confident in. Hence, the teacher finally decides to bring out his weapon. It's a sword enhanced by his blue flames. Although the teacher tells him that he would go easy on him, it soon becomes apparent that he has no intention of doing so. He charges at Art with full force. Their epic battle starts as both of their weapons clash. The teacher continues his barrage of attacks without giving Art any chance to rest. However, instead of firing back, Art enhances his body with his mana and continues dodging every one of his attacks. This comes as an annoyance for the teacher as he realizes that Art is looking down on him. He becomes more aggressive and starts attacking more furiously. Art takes another jab at him by pointing out the fact that he's unable to land a single hit on a first-year student. This increases the teacher's frustration even more. Unable to control his anger any longer, he goes all out and uses his most powerful spell. Yet Art continues to calmly dodge all his attacks. The students begin to realize that this is no longer a practice battle. Ferith even considers calling the student council. After dodging his attacks for long enough, Art finally decides to counterattack. With just one lunge, he nearly decapitates the teacher, forcing him to jump back in order to dodge. The teacher finally realizes the trouble he is in. Art uses his powerful attacks as well as his wind magic. Both Ferith and the princess are shocked by what they're witnessing. Art decides to finally end the battle. He uses his wind magic to create powerful gusts of wind and forces the teacher into a corner. His barrage of wind attacks finally starts to crack the teacher's barrier. He is left helpless, unable to defend himself. The barrage of wind attacks finally manages to break the barrier, resulting in an absolute victory for Art. His victory is met with a round of applause from all the students. Art notices Princess Cathan leaving the class, so he decides to follow her along with Ferith. Before he can approach her, he is stopped by Ferith, who congratulates him on his victory. He admits that Art was quite impressive, which is to be expected from his rival. He returns the praise by telling Ferith that he did quite well himself. If he had known the type of spell that Professor Jice would use, then he would have prepared accordingly. This way he would have surely won. Hearing this, the princess decides to come back to get an assessment of her own performance. Art decides to be blunt and points out her mistake of ignoring her defense to finish the last spell. An awkward silence ensues as both the boys worry about what her reaction would be. She gives him a simple nod and walks away, much to their relief. 
Without wasting much time, Art decides to head off for his next class. Despite his victory, he doesn't seem very happy. This fact is noticed by Sylvie. The reason for Art's dissatisfaction is that he couldn't finish off the professor quickly using just his wind attribute. This has made him realize that he has to work a lot harder to get better. He finally reaches his next classroom. This lecture will be about the basics of artificing. The classroom is a huge laboratory filled with different kinds of equipment. This might be the first challenging class he has had all day. This is because he didn't study this in his previous life. Art is approached by a nerdy looking girl. She wants to know if the seat next to him is taken or not. Art politely welcomes her to take the seat. Just like a true nerd, she seems to be an introvert too shy to even introduce herself properly. She does, however, manage to get a few words out and tells him her name, which is Emily Watskin. The awkwardness continues as she struggles to communicate properly. Art takes the conversational pressure off of her and introduces himself. As they shake hands, Art realizes how rough her hands are. This is an obvious indicator that she's a hard-working student. She quickly apologizes to Art, telling him that her hands must feel gross. Art tells her that it's quite all right since his own hands are the same way. Emily loves artificing and ends up fiddling around with gadgets all day long. This is the reason her hands have become so rough. Art admires this fact about her. In fact, he can't help but feel a little jealous that she has something that she is so passionate about. With fighting, all he is able to do is destroy and kill. But with artificing, Emily has the chance to create new things. She is quite moved by his deep sentiments. It has been quite a while since anyone said anything like this to her. Not since she created the projection display artifact. It's the same artifact that was used during the announcement of the new continent. Art is left surprised by how much of a genius Emily is. She also seems to know everything about Art, from the fact that he defeated a professor as well as his fight with Caspian. It is a school after all, where news travels fast and gossip travels even faster. The class finally starts as the professor makes his way in. The professor is none other than Gideon. He goes on and on about all his different inventions. Instead of teaching, it seems like he intends to use this lecture to brag about himself. As the lecture goes on, a mysterious man of beast suddenly starts flying towards the classroom. It enters the class and lands on Art's shoulder. Sylvie instantly puts her guard up, telling Art that this man of beast is dangerous. However, her worries seem to be all for naught. This man of beast is Cynthia's bond. The man of beast landing on Art's shoulder means that the director is calling him. He excuses himself from the class and makes his way to Cynthia's office. As he reaches the office, he sees Princess Kathleen coming out. She slams the door behind her in anger as she leaves. This is obviously a bad sign. Art enters the office and waits nervously to find out what this is all about. He is worried that perhaps he is going to be punished because of his fight with Professor Geist. But since the director tells him that she did not call him in regards to that, instead she has an offer for him. She asks him if he would like to be an interim professor for the practical mana manipulation class. Art is left completely stunned. He cannot believe that he's being offered to be a professor. He even checks behind him to make sure that she's talking to him. He wonders what exactly Kathleen told her for things to come to this. At this point, it's hardly a surprise that Art is on a first-name basis with the Princess of Sapin. He might end up causing a civil war if he steals the heart of not one but two princesses from different kingdoms. Yet he quickly brushes that thought aside to talk about more serious matters. He is a first-year student who hasn't even finished his first day of school. He questions whether it would even be possible for someone like him to become a professor. Cynthia calms him down and tells him that it's quite simple. As long as the director allows it, it's possible. In fact, there have been cases where highly qualified upperclassmen started teaching basic courses. So contrary to what he might think, this is not that special. But if Hart would start teaching the class, what would happen to Professor Geist? Cynthia quickly answers this question by telling him that he has been dismissed from the academy. This does come as a surprise to Art. She also tells him that shortly after she heard what happened in the class, she had an investigation launched against him. With Kathleen's help, he had no room to defend himself. She even mentions that she has never seen Kathleen so angry before. But something like that would be hard for Art to notice. After all, he is not the emotional type. In any case, Art starts wondering why Cynthia is doing this. What ulterior motives does she have this time? She assures him that it's just a simple coincidence. A spot opened up and she just wants him to fill it. She doesn't have any hidden intentions this time. This would be a good opportunity for him to build his reputation and Cynthia wouldn't have to worry about Art going around conquering her professors. 
Although this will put him into the spotlight to some extent, she reassures him that it would be well-placed to defend him if necessary. Parents are bound to complain, but it is still better than canceling the clause altogether. Cynthia leaves the choice up to Art. She still urges him to accept the offer as it would be a better use of his time than sitting through a class, which he's clearly overqualified for. Since his plan to keep a low profile has already been ruined, he decides to accept the offer. With that, Art leaves for his classes. Cynthia discusses their meeting with her bond. There is something about Art that always keeps her on her toes. Even negotiating with the royal families isn't as nerve-wracking for her as it is when she's dealing with Art. She asks her bond, Avier, for his opinion on the matter. He tells Cynthia that Art is different. Whether it's his mental acuity or emotional maturity, there is much more to him than the eye meets. He says this because of Sylvie. After just one meeting with her, Avier has realized that Sylvie is actually a dragon. This revelation leaves Cynthia speechless. Avier even states that in time his strength will become incomparable to Sylvie's. He warns her not to make an enemy out of Art. If treated right, he could become her greatest ally. But on the other hand, if he's betrayed, then he may be the cause of Decathan's demise. Art makes his way to the cafeteria. There he meets up with Elijah, who is busy talking to a girl. This is quite unusual. Normally, girls tend to avoid him. Nevertheless, Art takes a seat beside him. Elijah introduces her as Charlotte. While talking about their classes, Elijah mentions that he especially liked the chain casting and nana utilization classes. And that's also where he met Charlotte. She is his classmate from the chain casting class. Elijah inquires about how Art's classes are going. He had already heard that Art beat up a professor, but he doesn't know anything more than that. When Art reveals that he's going to be teaching that same class, Elijah spits out his food from shock. While wiping his face, he once again states that he ended up replacing the teacher who taught that class, so he shouldn't be going around spitting his food on a professor. Elijah becomes intrigued and even mentions that he might end up ditching his class to see him in action. On the topic of ditching classes, he tells that he and Charlotte are going shopping. He invites Art to join them. For some reason, this gets her really excited. Art politely declines the offer, telling him that he has three more classes to attend. Hearing this, the girl also makes up the excuse that she has a plan for today, and maybe they can go shopping some other time. Now it finally starts to make sense why a girl would be hanging out with Elijah. She probably just wanted to become friends with Art, so she was using Elijah to get to him. However, his dim-witted friend doesn't realize it. He goes on and on about how she's so nice and pretty, and even asks Art if he has a shot with her. Not wanting to hurt his feelings, he tells him that he can do a lot better. Art makes his way to his next class. It's an upper division class, so it would be quite unusual for a first year to get there. Hence, the murmurs quickly start as he makes his way there. He finds Claire and Curtis standing there as well, so he decides to join them. Not long after, Tessia and Clive also made their way there. While he's standing there waiting for the class to begin, he finally meets his enemy at the Exaris Academy. Arrogant, deceitful, and treacherous are the qualities that define the person that Lucas Wykes is. Not long after their by-chance encounter, the whole class hears a screeching noise. It seems that their teacher has finally arrived. She certainly knows how to make an entrance as she arrives riding on a giant eagle. Upon landing, she welcomes the students, followed by an introduction. Her name is Professor Glory, and she'll be their instructor for the Teen Fighting Mechanics 1 course. Her bond is a flare hawk named Torch. Art uses his magic to see how strong the professor it is, but his attempt fails and he finds it quite weird. Why would she feel the need to hide her level and her elemental attributes among a bunch of students? As usual, Art quickly catches the teacher's eye. She walks up to him to meet her newest colleague. It seems she intends to put the spotlight on Art. The rest of the class becomes curious and asks the professor if it's really true. She makes no effort to hide the fact that Art is not only a freshman DC officer, but will also be teaching the mana manipulation class as a professor. Anger and jealousy fill all the upperclassmen. They cannot believe that this scrawny freshman will be teaching a class, an opportunity that not even some of the best upperclassmen get. Professor Glory seems to have succeeded in her attempt to put a target on Art's back. Now she tries to calm everyone by telling them that they should believe in the director's decision. She states that Art has proven himself by defeating a professor. Yet this has the opposite effect as the students get even more riled up. They believe that anyone can beat an underclassman professor, especially one that was some thug adventurer. Seeing the students all fired up, she comes up with an idea. She offers them a chance to test the new professor of the practical mana manipulation class. 
Their intentions become clear as they stare at art with bloodthirsty eyes. It's as if they're wolves stalking their prey. Art tries to politely decline the offer, but his answer is not acceptable to the professor. She states that he only needs to prove himself through a demonstration, which is only fair for all the students. It seems that it's too late to do anything about it, and Art's only option is to go through with it. The demonstration will be in the form of a game that she likes to play at the start of every semester. But her idea of a game seems to be a bit too extreme. So instead, Curtis makes a suggestion. He suggests a team mock battle with the three disciplinary committee officers on one team. This way they can test not only art, but also the disciplinary committee. Clive makes a proposition of his own. He suggests he and Tessia be on the other team. Things have started to get more interesting as it has now become a battle between the disciplinary committee and the student council. Regardless as of now, the student council only has two members, while the disciplinary committee has three, so it would be unfair. This problem is solved as Lucas volunteers to be on the student council's team. He is the other genius freshman that is attending an upper division class. With everything set, the students get ready to start their battle. Everyone puts on their uniform and their fighting gear. Before starting their match, Professor Glory explains the rules to everyone. The match will have a time limit of 30 minutes, after which they will have a short discussion and analysis session. Since Curtis and Claire have had more classical training than the two first years on the student council team, the DC team is given a handicap. Art is made the king of the team. This means that if the opponent team can knock him out, then the entire team loses. The gear that they are using are artifacts designed to measure the amount of damage dealt. If the damage crosses a certain limit, the gear will make a shrill noise indicating that they are out. Anyone who decides to ignore this warning and continue fighting will be immediately banned from this class and might even face expulsion. She makes it clear that their equipment is not designed to protect them. They should be able to protect themselves with mana. With all the explanations done, Professor gives the signal to commence the battle. Everyone quickly leaps into action. Claire goes after Clive, while Curtis and Grotter go against Tessia. Though Curtis probably won't be able to beat Tessia, he should be able to hold her off long enough. As Art scans the battlefield, he sees Lucas arrogantly walking toward him. Art was under the wrong impression that Lucas might have become more humble after coming to Exiris Academy. But that's not the case. As expected of Lucas, he started making sarcastic comments about how Art is scared of losing to him and destroying his reputation. Professor Glory is closely observing their battle from above while riding on torch. As usual, shortly after Art releases his mana, everyone on the battlefield can sense his immense strength. He uses his wind magic to launch himself and dashes toward Lucas at great speed. In response, Lucas uses his domain spell called Inferno's Cage. As the name suggests it covers an area with a wall of fire, Art manages to save himself from the flames by using his earth magic. Next, Lucas uses the same fireball spell he used during a rank examination. The spell is much stronger than it was back then. He creates hundreds of fireballs floating on top of them. And since they are still trapped in the Inferno's cage, Art cannot run away. With Lucas's command, the fireballs start falling toward Art. As soon as they hit the ground, they start exploding. Art barely manages to dodge them. But at this rate, it's only a matter of time before one of them hits him. Lucas couldn't be happier seeing Art struggle because of his spell. Sylvie gets concerned and contacts Art telepathically. Despite his current situation, he assures her that he's fine and asks her how the others are doing. As expected, Tessia is winning against Curtis, while Claire is against Clive. Slowly, the fireballs get more and more intense. There seems to be no end to them. This is because, with Lucas's growing strength, his mana pool has also increased greatly. Art tries to attack him directly yet he finds his path blocked by more fireballs. Without his fire and water attributes, he seems to be struggling against the heat. On top of that, he knows that his mana pool is not as great as Lucas's, so if it comes down to a battle of stamina, he's sure to lose. Lucas starts making fun of Art saying that he's glad he's not on the disciplinary committee because he could never be on the same team as someone as incompetent as him. Art ignores the insult to focus on defense. He continues to use his earth magic to defend himself against the fireballs. He is also unable to counterattack because of his inefficiency with the wind attribute. As expected, he slowly starts to take damage. He is even forced to pull out his sword, but he can still only hope to guard himself. He needs to come up with a plan quickly to counter Lucas, otherwise he will certainly lose. Simply put, wind magic is pushing and pulling. It's about manipulating the air to achieve the desired effect. 
But what if Art were to manipulate the air particles themselves? This way he could get rid of the very thing that keeps a fire burning, oxygen. Nevertheless, this would require intense concentration. And with Art being forced to protect himself from the constant attacks, will he be able to manipulate the particles fast enough to extinguish the fire? If he's unable to do so, then he would leave himself defenseless against Lucas's attack. Art finds this funny in a way. Normally, he wouldn't be thinking so much. So he tells himself to stop thinking and just do it. The professor becomes impressed with Lucas's performance. He's much better than she had heard. Inferno's cage is one of the tougher flame attribute domain spells, and yet he's able to use it so proficiently, and at such a young age. On top of that, his mana reserves rival that of a silver core mage. On the other hand, Art is no less impressive. She notes that he lacks variation in his spells, but makes up for it with his fluid movement and tight control. The lack of variation is a result of his lack of experience with these two elements, but the professor is unaware of that. She was only mildly curious about the kid who was able to defeat a veteran adventurer, but the pressure she felt when Art released his man was something she had never expected. She wonders what kind of life he has lived to be capable of that at such a young age. On the battlefield, Art decides to put his plan into action. He takes a deep breath because after he starts using the magic, he might not be able to breathe. Unable to defend himself while concentrating, Art starts taking damage from the fireballs. He ignores the pain and continues moving toward Lucas. Slowly but surely, his plan starts to work. Even Professor Glory is left amazed. She flies in closer to get a better look as she is unable to believe what she's witnessing. Unlike wind magic, trying to manipulate air itself requires much more insight and a higher level of concentration. This is why mages are unable to suck the air out of their opponent's lungs. It would take hours of concentration to manipulate the air inside a moving target. Hence, many just use their bodies as a source or a pre-designated unmovable location. Art keeps the area of effect as close to his body as possible. Even then, to be able to do what he's doing is nothing short of amazing. He creates a thin layer of vacuum around his body. Because of this, he's able to walk through the fire as if it were nothing. Regardless, it's not perfect, and he continues to take damage little by little. At this rate, will his uniform be able to hold out before he reaches Lucas? With his spells being continuously blocked, Lucas is getting nervous as Art approaches him. He decides to use an all-out spell to finish it in one blow. He uses the Flame Guardian spell to summon a fire elemental. This brings a smile to Art's face as he realizes that Lucas is at his limit. Just as Art is about to counter the Flame Guardian, he suddenly feels a surge of mana. This is followed by a message from Sylvie telling him that Tessia is in danger. With him being distracted, the Flame Guardian attacks him and nearly takes him out. Due to the constant attacks from the Flame Guardian, Art is unable to do anything. He finds himself backed up into a corner and is forced to use his trump card. He uses the Static Void to freeze time for everyone. Because of his fight with Lucas, Art doesn't have much mana left, so he has to work fast. He finally realizes what is happening. The surge of mana that he felt earlier was Curtis realizing his beast will. He seems to have launched a powerful spell toward Tessia. And for some reason, she isn't defending herself. If this spell had made contact, Tessia would surely have been in a lot of danger. Art starts to feel the pain from using Static Void. Despite the pain, he crawls to Tessia to protect her. But he soon comes to a chilling realization. He doesn't have enough mana to block the powerful attack. There is only one thing he can do now. As the static void runs out, he hugs Tessia to be a human shield for her. Both of them become completely enveloped in a beam of light. A few minutes ago, Tessia had been engaged in a battle with Curtis. Due to her training with Virian, she is much stronger than Curtis and had no problem blocking his attacks. Prince had to give his all just to keep up with her. As he went in for another attack, she easily dodges it and prepares to counterattack. Just when it seems like it's all over for him, Tessia suddenly feels a throbbing pain in her mana core. Due to being distracted by the pain, the power of her attack is reduced. Even though Curtis is hit by the attack and is sent flying, he comes out of it relatively unscathed. Tessia is confused about what is happening to her, but still chooses to power through it and continue fighting. Since Curtis's attacks have not been working, he decides to use his beast will. He starts gathering a large amount of mana to fire a powerful spell. Tessia realizes this and decides to use a protective spell. Her body becomes covered with vines. These vines also attack Curtis and Grotter to disrupt their concentration. They skillfully dodge the vines while getting closer and closer to her. 
With the pain getting increasingly intense, the princess begins to lose her strength. She realizes that this is probably because of the Elderwood Guardian's beast will that she got from Art. She always has the option to forfeit, but her pride would not allow that. After all, she is the student council president, so she cannot have anyone thinking that she's weak, much less a coward. After having gathered enough mana, Curtis launches a powerful spell called the World's Howl. The pain from her mana core becomes so intense that Tessia starts to faint, leaving her completely defenseless to the incoming attack. Just as she's about to lose consciousness, she sees Art suddenly appear in front of her. A huge blast occurs as the attack makes contact. Professor finally arrives, but she is too late. Both Art and Tessia lie unconscious on the ground. The professor is surprised to see Art there since no one saw him moving in. Curtis becomes worried and starts apologizing to Professor Glory, telling her that he did not mean for this to happen. But right now the most important thing is to get unconscious students to the medical ward. She quickly orders the standby team to start the damage assessment. Some time has passed and Art wakes up in a hospital. He's covered in bandages with Sylvie standing on top of him. She's angry with him for always putting himself in near-death situations. Art pats her head and apologizes for always making her worry. He gets visited by Cynthia. She has come to see how he is doing. He asks her about Tessia's condition. Because he protected her, her injuries are not as bad as his. Yet there is another problem. As Art has already realized the problem, it is the beast's will that he gave her. As always, he starts blaming himself for their condition. But Cynthia tells him that it's her fault for keeping her beast will a secret. If she had at least told the professor, this situation could have been avoided. She thanked him for saving her disciple. Before leaving, Cynthia tells him that she has contacted both his and Tessia's family, so they should be here soon. As she leaves the room, she finds Tessia standing outside the door. She wants to go in and meet Art, but she can't seem to find the courage to do so. Cynthia tries to cheer her up by joking about eating desserts that were brought in for them. Nonetheless, Tessia can't stop thinking about Art. After some time, Art's family finally arrives. As always, Alice is very worried about him. Art apologizes to everyone for always worrying them. Ellie, on the other hand, tries to hide her worry behind a snarky comment. This is confirmed when Ray reveals that she had been crying even more than his mom. Alice asks him how he got hurt so badly on his first day of school. When Ray suggests that he must have gotten into a fight, Art decides to play along and jokingly suggests that the other guy got the worst of it. They all see the humor in it other than Alice. Knowing his strength, she feels that he might have obliterated some poor child. The conversation is interrupted as the royal family arrives to visit Art. Both Ray and Alice are left shocked. They quickly bow down to greet the King of Eleanor. The King tells them that it's not necessary. They have been eager to meet the parents of the child who saved their daughter not once, but twice. Ray also greets Virian, and they finally get to meet Tessia. She introduces herself as a friend of Art. Yet judging from the cheeky smiles on their faces, they seem to have misunderstood. They had heard so much about Tessia from Art, but this is their first time meeting her. Alice jokingly suggests that they're going to be together in the future, leaving Tessia completely embarrassed. Even Virian decides to play along. Now that all the greetings are done, Art decides to address the issue that got him into this situation. He asks Virian if he has had the chance to look at Tessia's mana core. The good news is that her body is more compatible with her beast will than Art's body was with his own. But the question on Virian's mind is how Art managed to obtain an Elderwood Guardian's beast core in the first place. Art nonchalantly tells him that he got it by killing one, but it only raises more questions than it answers. Cynthia comes to Art's rescue by telling them that their visiting time is over. Tessia needs to be monitored and besides, there seems to be many more visitors waiting for their chance to meet Art. After his family left, he continued to get visitors throughout the day. Some came seeking answers for what happened, while others came out of concern. This included Gideon as well, who came to bring Art a new medicine he had created. Before leaving, Gideon tells him that he should stop by his training room after he has recovered. Cynthia asked him to build some training artifacts, and now that they're complete, he wants Art to try them out. He is surprised that he will be getting this for free. Regardless, it doesn't take long for Gideon to show his true intentions. Now that everyone has left, Art can finally relax. That's what he thought. Not two minutes go by and Art gets another visitor. This time, it's Tessia. It seems she has finally gathered the courage to meet him. Art starts asking her all sorts of questions about her mana core and the pain she experienced. Tessia finds this funny, that Art can still worry about her when he almost died himself. It was the same when they were kids. 
When he rescued her from the bandits, Art tries to move, but he still hasn't fully recovered. She becomes concerned about him. Art assures her that he is going to be fine so she can stop worrying about him. She once again apologizes to Art. He assumes that she's apologizing because he had to save her again. But that's not the case. She is making an apology for taking advantage of him. Just as she says this, she moves in and kisses him. She quickly runs out of the room from sheer embarrassment. She did it in the heat of the moment, but now she cannot be more uneasy thinking about it. All sorts of questions fill her mind. Like maybe she came on too strong and what he's going to think about her now. She even thinks about going back to the room and playing it off as a joke. But she can't be thinking like that. If she had left everything up to Art, then things would have never progressed. He still treats her like a child every time they are together, and she wanted to change that. Hence, her reason for doing what she did. She tells herself that it would be his loss if he doesn't like her back. This is an obvious attempt to cheer herself up. Nevertheless, it doesn't seem to have worked. Art, on the other hand, is left completely shocked by what just happened. One can say his concerns are a little different from Tessia's. He cannot believe that he kissed a 13-year-old girl. Does that make him a criminal now? He tries to calm himself down by telling himself that he's in the body of a 12-year-old boy, so it must be fine. As a matter of fact, in this world, children around their age get married, and besides, she was the one who kissed him. Despite all this, his teenage body seems to have been having a different reaction. Two days go by, while Art is recovering, the man in manipulation class has been suspended. Rumors have already begun flying around about the first year who's going to be the new professor of this class. Art has recovered enough to be moving around on his own, though he still needs a cane. Accompanied by Cynthia and Gideon, Art makes his way to his new training room. Tomorrow is also going to be his first day as the professor. The director asks him if he had time to prepare some material. Considering that Art got discharged from the hospital just the day before, the answer is an obvious no. He asks Cynthia about Tessia's assimilation. Because of everything that happened between them, things have gotten a little awkward. So Art cannot ask her himself. Cynthia tells him that it's been going smoothly. But soon Virian will have to go back to Eleanor. With that being the case, Art wonders who is going to take over his job now. But before he can finish the question, they are interrupted by Gideon as they have finally arrived at the training room. Gideon seems to be most excited, even though he was complaining before about how it was a waste of his time. Cynthia had only asked him to build some sturdy artifacts so Art can train, but he seems to have done a lot more than that. As soon as they enter, Art can feel the abundant mana flowing within the room. This comes as an annoyance to Gideon, who wants Art to appreciate his hard work instead of admiring the room. Gideon has built a sparing robot for Art to fight against. From the way he talks about it, one can tell how proud he is of his work. Gideon claims that this robot is the greatest addition of his training operator and blast inductor, or Toby for short. Toby is currently set to level 5, which roughly translates to a dark orange core, mana beast, or a yellow core human. But unlike a human, Toby has a solid palagonite iron body. This means that although his attacks will be on the same level as a yellow core human, his durability will be even higher. Before Gideon continues boasting about his creation, his happiness is cut short. Art steps forward and punches Toby using his magic. Despite Gideon's talk about how great Toby is, one punch from Art is all it takes for it to be destroyed. It seems Gideon didn't know how strong Art was. Elsewhere outside the Exiris city, a party of adventurers is clearing out a cave. This is a party sent by the King of Sepin. This party also includes Lucas's brother, Baron. They are investigating the monsters who have appeared in this cave. It's strange as they don't usually get this big. On top of that, the entrance to this cave is sealed so no one could have entered. However, Baron realizes the seriousness of this issue when he finds a piece of cloth with the symbol of one of the nations. Back at the Exiris Academy, Art has begun his training. He's engaged in a battle with the 7th edition of Toby. They go back and forth, exchanging blows. Nonetheless, as expected, Toby is still no match for Art. Despite Art's injuries, he is still making a mockery out of Gideon's greatest creation. Despite his annoyance, he still asks for Art's feedback so he can make more improvements. Firstly, Toby's joints seem to be a very big weak spot, so it needs more reinforcement. Secondly, it cannot use any elemental spells, so that's a very big offensive weakness. However, this was a design choice that Gideon made on purpose. He had assumed that Toby was going to be fighting an Augmenter, not the Devil Incarnate. Art decides to add one more thing to the list. Although it's a bit of a nuance, he wants Toby to have better mana reinforcement. This leaves both Cynthia and Gideon confused. 
Toby creates a layer of protective mana around his body like any normal human mage. Although it's the easiest and the fastest way a mage can protect himself, it also has a huge weakness. If the attacks are targeted at the same spot, this shield can be broken through very easily. Hence, Art makes a different suggestion. Although it's a bit more complicated and extensive, it would be better if Toby could conjure an array of individual mana plates that are interconnected with each other. This way, if the barrier is broken through, it can be repaired very easily. So instead of wasting mana conjuring up a completely new barrier, one can focus on repairing only the damaged part. Art doesn't realize how revolutionary his idea is. Everyone present is left completely stunned. Cynthia quickly rushes off to relay this to the Mage's Guild to see what they have to say. Today is also Art's first day as a professor. After all his training with Toadie, he can barely walk. If he were to enter the class like this, it would surely not leave a good impression. Luckily for him, he comes across Princess Cathelm. Before he can apologize for nearly bumping into her, she takes his arm and puts it around her shoulder. She wants to help him walk to his class. Back in the class, everyone is talking about their new professor. They are all looking forward to making a fool out of the first year. Others even seem disappointed that the school is hiring first years as teachers. They are all left stunned as Art enters the class with his arm wrapped around Princess Cathelm. Even Ferith is impressed. After Princess Cathelm takes her seat, Art finally starts the lecture. He starts by introducing himself, Arthur Lewin, a member of the disciplinary committee, the son of two wonderful mages, a doting brother, and the new professor of the mana manipulation class. As expected, this is met by loud and angry boos from everyone. One student even jumps down onto the field and challenges Art to a fight. He claims that if Art can become a teacher by beating the old professor, then he can do the same. This action has the full backing of all the students. All his energy quickly dissipates as soon as Art releases his mana. The student cannot help but feel terrified. Art once again addresses the class. He tells them that whether they like it or not, the fact is that he is their new professor. He even tells them that they are free to leave if they want. In fact, he will allow them to take another class instead of this one. Regardless if they are curious about how a little boy with a limp can become a professor of the most prestigious magical academy, then he encourages them to stay. About the student who jumped onto the field, Art gives him two options. Either he can leave the class or go back to his seat. He seems to have found his manners after witnessing Art's strength. Without arguing, he quickly makes his way back to his seat. Art begins the lecture with a practical question. What is the best way to utilize mana from the surrounding atmosphere? No one seems to know the answer other than one student. She replies that the best way to utilize mana from the surrounding is to absorb it in one's mana core and use it to conjure spells. The main difference between augmenters and conjurers lies in the fact that augmenters mostly use their mana channels. Conjurers, on the other hand, use mana directly from their surroundings via their mana veins. Considering this fact, Art raises another question for the students. Why do both types of mages have to meditate and absorb mana? if only the augmenters primarily utilize it and absorb it into their core. Once again, no one knows the answer except for the same girl. Although conjurers don't form physical attacks, they still need to use their mana to manipulate the one in the surroundings to form a spell. Judging from her behavior, it's obvious that this girl is a know-it-all. Art follows up her answer with another question. Since conjurers use less mana in their attacks than augmenters do then is the color of one's mana core a truly accurate way of measuring one's strength. This question leaves everyone wondering. While they keep this question in mind, Art requests six volunteers for a demonstration. He requires three augmenters and three conjurers. The two conjurers also include Ferith and Cathelm. With everyone lined up, Art begins the demonstration. He instructs everyone to use the most basic spell of their affinity. Following the instructions, everyone quickly forms the spell on their hands. What comes next shocks the six volunteers. Art instructs the augmenters to launch the spell and conjurers to absorb the spell back into their hands. Everyone finds this absurd, as normally it's the opposite of what conjurers and augmenters are good at. Nevertheless, each volunteer tries to do as they are instructed, but they fail miserably. The only one who finds a bit of success is Cathelm. As expected, it doesn't take long for the students to get annoyed. They began to call this whole exercise stupid and question why it was even necessary. Instead of answering their question with words, Art decides to give them a practical demonstration. He fires a wind spell at the wall, but nothing special happens. No one is impressed as they don't see the point. Art fires off another spell, but this time it's much stronger. 
This time, everyone is left stunned to see an Augmenter launch such a powerful spell. Although he cannot accurately demonstrate what happens when a conjurer absorbs their spell, he can only ask them to trust him. With this demonstration out of the way, Art encourages the whole class to come down onto the field and try this out. As the class ends, everyone is left wondering about Art's strength. They seem more invested than they were before the class. So all in all, one can call Art's first lecture as a professor a success. After the class, he is visited by Princess Cathal. From her body language, one can tell that she has something on her mind. After a while of small talk, she finally builds up the courage to speak up. Art begins to worry if Cathal is also going to profess her love for him. Luckily for him, that's not the case. She wants to apologize on behalf of her family. This is about what happened with Sebastian at the auction house all those years ago. She wants to apologize for her father's behavior as well as her brother's blunder in the alleyway. Art is surprised that she's still bothered by things that happened over four years ago. She tells him that although she looks up to her father, he disappointed her on that day. Art assures her that what happened was in the past, and she doesn't need to apologize for them. Nonetheless, she felt it was necessary, seeing how they had become friends. But her definition of a friend seems to be a little misplaced. She had grown up blaming her lineage, her magical prowess, as well as their physical appearance for robbing her freedom. So when she looks at art, she wonders how a boy so talented, sought after, investigated, and judged, be so bright. Art's behavior gets a chuckle out of her. This is indeed a big moment, as this is the first time the literal ice princess has laughed. Embarrassed by this, Cathan quickly changes the topic. She asks Art why the outcome of the two wind bullets turned out to be so different. Art's answer is enough to cheer her up. He tells her that it would be unfair if he gave his brightest student an even bigger advantage. After his classes are over, he heads to the training room to help Tessia with her assimilation. As always, Sylvie is very excited to meet her. Things seem to be finally getting back to normal between the two of them. Assimilation with any beast takes a lot of effort, and most of the time it cannot be done alone. Oftentimes a mage with the same elemental affinity as the beast is needed to take some of the burden off the host. Being a quadra elemental mage, Art is able to use an even balance of all forms of all four elements. This not only helps Tessia with her beast will, but also strengthens her body and helps her fight against the Elderwood Guardian trying to establish control over her mana core. At the end of their session, both of them are left exhausted. Tessia finally addresses what happened between the two of them. She asks Art if he's mad at her for kissing him. He tells her that he was just surprised, but he is not mad. She follows it up with another question and asks him why he's been avoiding her then. But this is something Art cannot answer truthfully. So instead, he plays it off as a joke, telling her that they cannot get married since she's royalty, and he's a commoner. Nevertheless, this only upsets Tessia. She knows it was wrong of her to take advantage of him, but she just wanted things to progress between them. Art once again decides to joke about it since that's all he can do. This time, she gets mad. Although she didn't expect an answer from him yet, she at least wanted him to take her feelings seriously. She tells him that there are so many things he's good at, like magic, fighting, and wits but there are also things he's not good at. She reveals that the people around him do notice when he puts on a mask and pretends that he's happy and unaffected by everything that happens. She even reveals that she knows that he rejected Lilio, which comes as a surprise to Art. With that, she storms out of the room, leaving him to wonder how she even knew about it. Art is left frustrated as there is nothing he can do in this situation, as he cannot tell her about his past and how old he actually is. While Art continues his training with the 8th edition of Toby, Tessia's words still linger in his mind. He takes his frustration out on Toby. Even with the enhanced barrier, Toby is barely able to keep up with Art. Eventually, its mana reserves start to run low, causing it to initiate a shutdown. This gives Art the perfect opportunity to finish the combat, yet he decides to stop just before making contact and spares this version. He is left completely exhausted. Even Sylvie begins to get worried that he might be pushing himself too hard. But he assures Sylvie that he is fine. Art gets visited by Professor Glory. She wanted to check up on him since both he and Tessia had been skipping out on her classes lately. She also wanted to make sure that the two teenagers weren't up to something mischievous. She is shocked to see the state of the training room. Art tells her it's because of his training. But that only raises more questions in her mind. Not only does he have such a large training room all to himself, but for it to be in such a state. She's curious about what kind of training he does there. The more she finds out about him, the more mysterious he seems to get. Art has once again become the talking point for everyone. 
This time it's because of his recent injuries. The professor greets him as he returns to the class. Seeing Art lost in thought, he attempts to recapture his focus by posing a question. He asks Art about spell formations. Spell formation is about combining or altering a spell to make it produce a different effect than it normally would. Professor Maynard is impressed with Art's answer and decides to continue the discussion. He tells the class to imagine a world where everyone could read each other's minds. In this hypothetical world, everyone's thoughts would be laid bare for others to read. This would make even the kindest person seem cruel as everyone would be able to tell what's actually inside their mind. He believes that such a world would produce the best mages ever known. With a promise to explain this later, he raises a question for the whole class. Why do some mages chant spells while others don't? Normally lower level mages chant their spells, while higher level mages who have mastered a spell can forego this practice. A better way of putting this would be that mages employ chants in spellcasting because words hold the power to shape one's thoughts. They fill the caster's mind with the correct visualization so the mana can be molded to achieve the desired effects. Professor tries to explain this with a humorous example. If he were to say I love you to a girl, then one can be sure there will be some sort of reaction from her. This would take the form of either her cringing in disgust or slapping him. The first part can be thought of as the incantation while the reaction is the spell. Art's mind immediately goes to the argument he had with Tessia, so it seems that Professor Maynard was right on the mark when he talked about visualization. One's thoughts can influence the spell. If one has a higher level of focus and visualization, one can omit the chant altogether. Coming back to his previous example, he explains that in a world where everyone can read each other's minds, people would have absolute control over their thoughts. Hence, they would be able to produce more powerful spells. Art couldn't help being distracted throughout the class. He just can't stop thinking about his fight with Tessia. Even he is surprised by how much he is bothered by her words. There are plenty of people who hated him when he was an adventurer, but it never slowed him down. But this time it's different. While he is thinking about this, three students have started following him. Although he may be distracted, it's hard to miss something so obvious. It doesn't take long for him to realize that he is being followed by Lucas, along with two other students. The two students are Charles Ravenpoor and a boy named Marcois. They have all come seeking revenge for everything Art has done to them in the past. For Lucas, it's about their duel during Professor Glory's class. He wants to know how Art managed to escape his Inferno Cage spell and arrived on the other side of the field. It is inhuman for someone to accomplish this so quickly. However, Art refuses to answer him. Lucas starts accusing Art of using an artifact. He tells Art that he probably got it from Tessia. Art starts to get pissed off but he controls his anger as he is already aware of Lucas's antics. They are interrupted by Marcois. For some reason, he seems angrier and more out of control. He suggests that he must have received it from Princess Kathleen after he seduced her. Little by little, his anger grows stronger. Eventually, he becomes so furious that he starts leaking mana. Charles tries to stop him, but he has been completely consumed by his rage. Art also tries to calm him down, but it falls on deaf ears. It is revealed that Marcois is a stalker, and he is completely infatuated with Princess Cathon. Even Lucas realizes that the boy has gone crazy. Being true to his nature, he isn't bothered. In fact, he is happy that Art is in trouble. Both Sylvie and Art notice something strange. The amount of mana that Marcois is leaking isn't normal. Any ordinary person would pass out. Consumed by rage, he starts behaving like a rabid beast. He uses his earth magic and charges towards Art intending to kill him. Because of his unusual strength, all Art can do is deflect the attack. He is left stunned after witnessing the power behind the assault. Even Charles becomes concerned. Yet Lucas is the exact opposite. He makes his intention clear when he starts pretending to be a helpless bystander. He says all this with a cheeky grin on his face. Unlike Charles, he isn't worried even though Marcois might be in serious danger. On the contrary, he brings up the topic of how Charles was worried about losing to Marcois in their upcoming duel in a class. If things continue the way they are now, Marcois will either get himself seriously hurt or he will injure Art and get expelled, unlike Charles, who seems to have some humanity left, while Lucas doesn't. The two of them make their exit, leaving Art to deal with the boy on his own. The situation seems to be getting worse and worse as Marcois continues to morph into something akin to a monster. Art is barely holding on, Luck finally strikes for Art when Sylvie decides to unveil her true form. In her dragon state, she is easily able to beat Marcois with a single stomp and knocks him unconscious. Just as the fight ends, Claire also arrives. 
She came after detecting a large amount of mana. After Art explains the situation, she decides to examine Markoi's. Both of them are left shocked when they discover strange symbols on his spine. However, Claire is already familiar with them as this is not the first time that she has encountered this on campus. While Markoi's recovers in the hospital, she explains the situation to Art. While Art was recovering from his injuries, there was another case similar to this. He is filled with questions, but she tells him that she will discuss this in their next meeting. Before doing anything else, they decide to report this to Cynthia to bring her up to speed. When Art enters the director's office, he is surprised to see the unexpected guests. It's two of the Lances, including Baron. Claire has a different reaction compared to Art. She's completely starstruck upon seeing Lance Baron and Lance Aaliyah in the flesh. She respectfully introduces herself to the two Lances and expresses her dream of becoming one herself someday. Regardless, Baron ignores her and continues his conversation with Cynthia. After they are done talking, they begin to leave. As they walk past him, Art notices their mana level. Both Sylvie and Art can tell how unbelievably strong both of them are. Now that's out of the way, they focus on the purpose of their visit to the director's office. But before they can start, Art has a query for Cynthia. He inquires about the reason why the two lances are here. Surely such important people wouldn't just come down for a simple chat. Cynthia tells Art that he doesn't need to be concerned. She does, however, tell him that she wishes that they came bearing better news, indicating that it was something bad. Art tells her about the events from the other night, starting with Lucas, Charles, and Marcois following him, he places special emphasis on Marcois' odd behavior and his mana fluctuation. Cynthia is intrigued. Even though she doesn't say anything, Art can tell from her body language that she knows more than she's letting on. She tells him that neither the medics nor the artificers know what exactly this is. The school has reached out to the Mage Guild to send some researchers, so hopefully they'll find out soon. Art still can't help but feel that there's something weird about all this. Cynthia instructs Claire to continue the patrols. She even offers to provide more staff during nighttime. Art and Claire leave for their classes after the meeting. Art was right about his suspicion that Cynthia knows more. Adir asks her if it is wise to involve the students. She replies by telling him that some sacrifices might be necessary since they'd come so far. Her stress is visible on her face as she wonders why they are moving already. Art parts ways with Claire to go back to his dorm. On his way back, he sees Baron and Lucas having a conversation down the corridor. He quickly hides behind a wall, but he is much too far to hear what they are saying. He can see that even the arrogant Lucas has to hold his head down in front of his brother. With his brother backing him, Art knows that he can't do anything to Lucas. At least not yet. Suddenly, Art is under attack. He finds himself at the sharp end of the sword. It's Lancelia. She came after sensing Art's intense bloodlust for Lucas. Although Art did manage to pull out his sword, he was too late. If she was an enemy, he would have been dead. He clears up the misunderstanding by telling her that he doesn't harbor any anger toward Lance Baron. Despite Art's attempt to hide his presence, she consents to him. Nevertheless, even she couldn't tell that Art is a quadra elemental mage, and instead mistakes him for a dual elemental. This only goes to show how great Gideon's artifact is. Aaliyah also warns Art about fighting Lance Baron. She describes him as frighteningly strong. Art also asks her about her strength. She tries to joke about it by gesturing with her hand, but her joke falls flat. The disappointment is clear on her face as she tells him that she's the weakest among the lances. She adds that there is a huge margin between them. Baron is definitely one of the strongest, but she asserts that even he can't match her level of perception. It starts to make sense how she was able to notice Art's presence. As Baron finishes talking with Lucas, she says goodbye to Art. He reminds her of her little brother. From the way she talks about him, it suggests that he's probably gone. After thanking Art for the conversation, both the lances leave. The next day, Art heads to his meeting with the rest of the DC officers. As expected, the rumors about Marcois have started spreading like wildfire. Upon arriving, he is surprised to see a gloomy expression on all of the DC officers. He wonders what is going on. It's made evident when Claire gives him the news that Marcois died last night. Art is left shocked. He asks Claire about how Marcois died. Curtis tells him that the medics couldn't stop his mana leakage. This is quite unusual as the leakage should have stopped after he lost consciousness. It obviously had something to do with the symbols on his back. The medics weren't able to find out much about them. However, whatever small details they discovered, they're not disclosing. Even the parents refuse to tell them anything. Theo gets really annoyed and slams the table. He is angry at the fact that they're not being told anything. 
even though they're the ones trying to stop this from happening. Regardless, the only thing they can do is strengthen their patrol schedule and hope to stop more students from getting affected. Art is scheduled to patrol with Theo. Barith wonders if he'll be all right since the two of them didn't get off to a great start, but Art isn't worried. In fact, the schedule works out great for him since he'll be able to take his classes as well as do the patrol. The only thing that surprises him is the duration of the patrol. Meanwhile, Ferith is more surprised by the communication devices. They are disguised as daggers, so he didn't know that they were supposed to be used for communication. Even Art didn't know that. He thought they were just a symbolic gesture. Among all this, the most surprising thing is how Kai volunteered to be on patrol by himself. In fact, his patrol schedule puts him at a large portion of the campus. He is not the diligent type. On the contrary, he is notorious for avoiding work. Yet Art brushes that thought aside and tells them that he's probably just tired of patrolling with Theo. He says goodbye to both of them as he heads off to teach his class. He starts the lecture off by asking his students if they had the chance to think about the question that he posed yesterday. Is the color of a mage's mana core a truly accurate way of measuring their level? No one knows the answer. Only Ferith raises his hand to answer the question. He answers by telling Art that it is an excellent way of accurately measuring the power. He believes that it not only correlates with the effort and time that a mage invests, but also strongly indicates their potential. Before he can continue, Art interrupts him by telling him that he is wrong. Using the color of one's mana core discounts other factors that make up a mage. Things like reaction speed, battle sense, knowledge of spells, etc. These are not taken into account when measuring one's mana core. Art believes that it's similar to judging a warrior's combatability by the size of their muscles. One can say that the warrior with the bigger muscles is strong. Nevertheless, it doesn't tell how good of a fighter they are. But this raises the question that if one cannot tell the strength of a mage from their mana core, then what exactly is the best way to gauge your opponent's strength? The answer is quite simple. There is no way to know. The students are left confused. Art tells them that the best thing to do is to always assume that your opponent is stronger than you. Hypothetically speaking, even if one could accurately tell a mage's strength from the color of their mana core, they would still fight whether their opponent was stronger or weaker. He asserts that assuming that you are weaker than your opponent will always keep you on your guard. This way they won't get careless. With the explanation done, he moves on to the practical exercise. After yesterday's embarrassment, all the students are ready to prove themselves. He ends up falling asleep while the rest of the students practice. He rushes to his next class and manages to get there just in time. He apologizes to Professor Glory and tells her that he will get dressed right away for their exercise. However, she tells him that he is not going to be participating in any physical activities until he has fully recovered. She instead tells him to go sit in the stands. When he gets there, he sees Tessia already sitting there. She probably got the same treatment from the professor. The awkwardness ensues as they both sit together. Before he can even start speaking, she stops him right in his tracks and apologizes for lashing out. She also said things that she wished she hadn't. Nonetheless, Art admits that the things she said were true. He admits that he knew how she felt about him, but he was too afraid to face it. Emotions are a lot more complicated for him since he can't just simply get better at them with training. He apologizes for their earlier fight, but he tells her that he cannot have a relationship with her. Tessia is filled with disappointment and sadness, but her expression quickly changes as he adds that this is for the time being. She's left confused by what he means. He clarifies by telling her that maybe something can happen when they're older. Tessia decides to get her revenge by teasing him. Art is left in a frenzy as he tries to explain himself. This gets a chuckle out of Tessia and Sildi. He doesn't want to keep her waiting for him, so he decides to do something to buy himself a little time. He gets up and gently kisses her on the forehead, leaving her completely speechless. He has a similar reaction to what Tessia had after she did the same. It is not helped by the fact that Sylvie keeps reminding him whenever she has the chance. He cannot even focus on his class. This is another advanced class that Art decided to take to learn deviant magic theory. But it turned out to be a dissatisfaction. Even after a week of studying, they're only covering the basics that he already knows. The only thing on his mind is how Tessia is feeling after their talk. Similar to Art, the only thing on her mind is the fact that Art kissed her. She is left completely embarrassed while thinking about it. Even though it was just a forehead, it was still a very big deal for her. She starts getting completely ahead of herself and starts thinking about how their kids would look like. It's nighttime and the DC officers have begun their patrol. As always, the hooligans are out causing nothing but trouble. Art catches a pair of them while they're doing graffiti. 
The boy manages to escape, but the girl gets cornered. With no other choice, she decides to use her magic to try and get away and tries to attack him with water magic, but he is able to easily dodge it and trip her. He releases his wind magic, which leaves the girl terrified. He gives her two options. Either she can come willingly, or he'll have to force her. After a few minutes pass, Theo returns with the boy. It seems he didn't manage to escape after all, but neither of them has any symbols on their back, so it seems that they're not involved. Theo volunteers to take both of them to the admin's office while Art continues his patrol. The rest of the night turns out to be a long, boring walk. It's just about time for him to finish. While patrolling, Art accidentally stumbles near Kai's patrol route. Suddenly, he spots something and quickly hides behind a pillar. It's a guy running with a black hood covering his face. His shirt shifts a bit and Art is able to see the same symbol on his back as Marcoe's. He decides to quietly follow behind him. This way he can find out the location of their hideout. Suddenly, someone comes up behind him while loudly calling his name. This alerts the guy in the black hoodie and he quickly disappears. The person calling his name was none other than Kai. Art gets angry at him for letting the guy get away. He could have found out where they were hiding if only Kai was a little careful. But there is nothing to be done now. He asks Art about Theo's location. Art tells him about how they caught a couple of students doing graffiti and Theo is escorting them to the admin's office. However, Kai wonders why it's taking him so long to do this. Their conversation is interrupted when their communication devices suddenly start glowing. They glow yellow, which means Theo has activated his dagger. Since it's his area, Kai volunteers to find the person that Art was tailing. This way he can go and help his partner. Before leaving, he describes the person to Kai. However, it's evident that there's something fishy going on. Upon arriving at Theo's location, Art sees that the other two DC officers are already there. Dordry tells him that someone attacked Theo and knocked him out. Hence, the two students that he was escorting also got away. Yet, knowing Theo's strength, it's obvious that a normal strike couldn't have knocked him out. He insists that it had to be a powerful augmenter. Curtis tells him that it was an ambush. By the time he and Dordria got there, the two students were already gone. Art wonders if one of the student's friends helped them. Theo insists that it wasn't them. A normal student wouldn't have been able to knock him out. It had to be someone older or someone like Marcois. He reveals that he managed to graze one of them before he blacked out. But he couldn't get a visual. This makes Art think back to his conversation with Kai. He noticed an injury on Kai's arm, an injury he did not have before. Theo asks him what he was doing in Kai's area. Art decides that telling them about the hooded guy wouldn't do any good right now, so he decides to tell them nothing. Knowing Art, they instantly know that he was up to something. They arrive at the wrong conclusion that he doesn't trust Kai, so he was covering his area just to make sure. Theo assures Art that Kai is trustworthy and he can carry his own weight. Even Dorodria seems to think so. They are unaware of the actual situation unfolding. The next morning, Art continues with his regular lectures. He once again finds himself distracted. Yesterday it was about Tessia, today it's about what happened last night. What's bothering him is that Kai called out his name so loudly. Maybe he was trying to warn someone. On the other hand, maybe he is just overthinking it. All this time, Gideon has been standing behind him, wondering what he's doing. He looks at the mess that Art has created. He wonders if he has once again created something groundbreaking. Much to his disappointment, the mess is just a mess. Two other classes go by in the blink of an eye. He just can't get himself to focus. Professor Glory's class is in full swing as well. Once again, all Art can do is sit on the sidelines and watch. Yet this allows him to reflect on the encounter with Marcois. He cannot believe that after everything that happened, all Lucas got was a few days of suspension. Professor Glory comes and sits beside Art with a disappointed look on her face. She tells him that the council has banned all excursions to a dungeon that she likes to take her class to. Due to an unknown incident, the Lances are investigating it. Art wonders if this means that their semester trip has been canceled. She tells him that there still might be a trip, but it would probably be to a lower level dungeon compared to the ones that she usually takes her students to. After the class has ended, Art goes to his training room to have the usual assimilation session with Tessia. After their session, they decide to take a break and cool off in the pond. Art asks her about any rejection symptoms that she might be having from her beast will. Luckily for her, there has been none ever since the incident at Professor Glory's class. At this rate, Tessia's assimilation should be complete in a few weeks. Her mana core may even become a few levels higher. 
His chain of thought is interrupted as she playfully splashes water on him. This eventually turns into a full-on water fight between the two of them. Their fun time is interrupted by Cynthia. She arrives at the training room with bruises and cuts all over her body. Both of them are shocked by this. Tessia is especially worried about her master's health. However, Cynthia assures them that she is fine. She wanted to stretch out her old bones, so she decided to have a sparring session at the Mage's Guild. Art still wonders what she was doing there since she was supposed to have a meeting with the council. Cynthia tells him that she just took a quick detour to relieve some stress. It's time for her private lecture with Tessia. She requests Art's permission to use his private training room for their lesson. He tells them that it's no problem and leaves so he doesn't interrupt them. Although he didn't say anything before, it's obvious that Cynthia is hiding something. Nevertheless, Art knows that it's not his place to pry. He continues with his normal lectures. He has been sleepy these past few days. This is all because of the late night patrols that he has to do. It's not just him though. Elijah has been coming back late as well. This is because of his club activities. He has joined the Chain Casting Research Club. This is another attempt by him at finding a girlfriend. In the heat of the moment, Elijah forgets that he is in the middle of a class and makes a complete fool of himself. The teacher decides to address the incident with Marcoes. He explains that it was a most tragic event and in light of it, he wants to teach the class about the dangers of wielding this power that many take for granted. Although the medics are still trying to find out what really happened, they do know that Marcoes had used magic that was far too strong for his body to handle. Much like any other muscle in the body, overexerting one's mana core can have devastating, sometimes permanent effects. In extreme cases, it could even be fatal. One student raises a question that has been on everyone's mind. Why didn't Marcoes survive after he was given a mana recovery elixir? The professor explains that there are always exceptions. External aid to forcefully boost mana reserves always has side effects, one of which is excessive mana leakage, yet this still doesn't explain his rabid behavior and the symbols on his back. Once again, it's time for Art's lecture. It has been several days since he demonstrated the skill, but none of the students have been able to duplicate it. Hence, he decides to give them a hint. He calls Lester to the field. While explaining, he rips a piece of paper into two. He turns the first piece of paper into a paper ball. This ball represents a normal spell that everyone is used to seeing. Art blows on it, and it slowly falls to the ground without reaching Lester. With the other piece of paper, he tries to demonstrate the stronger spell that he used. He rolls a piece of paper into a paper pipe and uses it to launch the paper ball much further. He describes this as a big hint for all the augmenters. Regardless, unlike him, they are not magical geniuses, so it completely flies over their heads. Elsewhere, Baron and Alia are waiting in the meeting room. They have both been summoned by Lance Ferrey. The only thing Baron knows is that it has something to do with what he found in the dungeon. Lance Ferrey finally arrives, and their meeting begins. The reason that they have been called here is because they have discovered strange signs in the deepest levels of some dungeons. These signs tell of mages that are not from Decathan. Aaliyah is left completely shocked. It hasn't been long since they discovered the existence of another continent, and now they have even discovered the existence of foreign mages among them. The troubling thing is that they don't know how long these mages have been here. The piece of cloth that Baron found had beast fibers that either haven't been discovered or they are indigenous to Decathan. Baron also discovered mana imbued into the fibers, and he questions whether the council has received any information on that. However, whatever spell form was wounded into the cloth dissipated as soon as it was torn. Nevertheless, Aaliyah has been brought here for another reason. There is a new mission for her. There have been unusual sightings of titanic blood worms. They are common mana beasts, so she wonders what's so unusual about their sightings. At first, it all seemed normal. Yet, upon more investigation, it was found that they had been deviating heavily from their usual tunneling patterns. It's all probably related to rabid mana beast sightings. Aaliyah is being sent to investigate these mana beasts. With her sensory magic, she would be able to cover a large range. Viray tells her that she can wait for Lance Mika to finish her mission in Darv, and they can go together. However, that would be too late, so she volunteers to go alone. Back at the Exiris Academy, Art continues his school life. He walks in and on Curtis and Kathleen's training session. They're supposed to be fighting together against Theo, but from the looks of things, one can easily mistake it as them fighting against each other. Theo attacks them from above using his gravity magic. Against this intense pressure, Curtis is barely able to stand. He drops his weapon, leaving him defenseless. However, he is not about to give up and uses a powerful spell that knocks Theo back. 
He is really impressed by Curtis's performance and gets excited for their next round, but their fun is interrupted by Kai. He stops their fight using thin metal threads. This is his deviant magic. Art is surprised by this. It's metal attribute magic with no sound. He couldn't even sense it. On top of that, he wonders how he's controlling the strings. Claire hurries everyone up to start their meeting as they have classes afterward. Professor Glory is going to take her class on a trip to the Beast Glades. This means that Art, Curtis, and Claire will be off campus for a while. They will have to reorganize their patrol routes, and someone will have to volunteer for more patrol hours. Kai is the first one to volunteer as he has no friends. Ferith is not one to be left behind, so he too volunteers, proudly claiming that he also has no friends. Kai tricks Dordria into volunteering as well. Now that they have their volunteers, they are all set for the coming weeks. This concludes their meeting, so Art heads out for his classes. On his way, he is stopped by Ferith. It seems he wanted to boast to Art about his time on the Beast Glades. He even offers to give him advice. Little does he know that Art is an A-class adventurer. While Ferith is busy talking to Kathleen, he decides to quickly make his way out before he gets caught up in more awkward conversations. While leaving, he sees Kai talking to Dordria. The same question pops up in his mind, so he asks Claire about what sort of magic Kai uses. However, even Claire doesn't know about it since he is very secretive. Kai overhears their conversation and comes over to talk. Art asks him directly. Nevertheless, Kai tells him that if he reveals this information, he will have to kill Art. He probably implied it as a joke, but his mannerisms make it sound like a threat. Sensing that a conversation is brewing into a fight, Claire quickly steps up to put out the ember before it turns into a fire. Back at Art's private training room, Elijah has also started training with Toby. Nonetheless, he is not as strong as Art. Elijah makes up the excuse that it's not as cool as using magic. That's why he's not as good of an augmenter. Hence, Art decides to train him. Even though he is a conjurer, he should learn the basics of melee combat. This will help him in real fights as well as impress girls. Elijah instantly finds his energy upon hearing the last bit. He charges straight at Art, but he is obviously not as good as him. Still, Art is very impressed. His swings have little wasted movement, and he has stable footwork. But with some training, Elijah could become a strong swordsman. Paired with his unique earth magic, he can become very strong. This doesn't stop him from making a fool of himself while fighting. As their fight ends, Elijah has a strange vision similar to the one he had when he was a kid. He gets a glimpse of Art's past as the king. This is followed by immense pain in his head. Art instantly comes over to help him, but he refuses the help. He says that he just has a bad headache and he's going to be fine. With that, he leaves, wondering what all of that was about. It's spring season in Akshire City. The next few weeks passed by in a sturdy rhythm. Nothing much happened and Art used this time to relax and study. Even with his midterms approaching, it was hard for him to stay enthusiastic about all his classes. Some of them passed by in the blink of an eye, while others he enjoyed. He continued growing his skills while training with Toby. Despite all this, he never forgot the real reason he decided to attend school. The small moments with the people he cherished became the thing he looked forward to every day. Ever since Elijah had that vision, he has been daydreaming a lot. It always seems like he's lost in thought. He continues to hide it from Art and tells him that he's just worried about exams. He wishes good luck Art for his excursion to the Beast Glades tomorrow and leaves. Despite Elijah's attempt to hide his feelings, Art has noticed that he seems angry at him for some reason. For now, he cannot do anything about it. He continues his assimilation sessions with Tessia. After many weeks of assimilation, her mana core has become a lot more stable. She is excited about the upcoming excursion to the Beast Glades. Regardless, Art reminds her that she's only at half her usual strength, so she needs to be careful. She tells him that he doesn't need to baby her all the time. She reminds him that she's still a year older than him. Art responds to that by teasing her about her fear of monsters when they were kids. She gets angry and jumps at him. However, just then, Virian arrives and misunderstands the situation. He believes that he might have walked in on the two of them. Tessia is left completely embarrassed. Art is surprised to see him as he was supposed to be having a meeting with the council. Virian reveals that he escaped to take a breather and check up on his granddaughter. He was worried about their dungeon excursion tomorrow. He wanted to ask Cynthia to keep an eye on her in case her core flares up. But she's busy. So he asks Art instead. Normally it wouldn't be a problem, but he's already promised his family to spend the night with them. Virian comes up with the idea that he can take Tessia with him. This way he can also introduce her properly to his parents. Regardless, he straight up refuses this. 
This is because he knows how his parents will act when they see Tessia. Despite all his attempts to refuse, he finds himself standing outside his house with Tessia. The whole family comes out to welcome the two of them. They had even prepared gifts for Tessia. They already had a suspicion that Art would be bringing her along. They all spend the rest of the night bonding as a family. Watching this brings a smile to Art's face. Elsewhere, Aaliyah has finally arrived at the dungeon. As she goes deeper and deeper, she comes across a split in the trail. It seems that their information was right about the titanic blood worms. After seeing the trail, she has realized that there is no way that they are moving on their own accord. Based on the patterns, they seem to be all gathering at one spot and heading east toward the Grand Mountains. She continues following the trail and goes deeper into the dungeon. Eventually, she comes across a cliff. At the bottom of the cliff, there is a Hades serpent waiting for a chance to strike. Once again, this monster is different from the normal ones. It has horns and the coloring is also different. For a species that doesn't even care about its offspring, it doesn't make sense for it to be guarding something like a tunnel. Instead of continuing alone, she decides to call for backup. She uses a communication device to call Lance Veray. She reports the sighting of the strange Hades serpent to her. Lance Veray informs her that she has 50 battle mages ready to be teleported to the nearest gate and tells her to wait for further instructions. Back at Helstia's mansion, Art is enjoying the night with his family. It's getting late and everyone is getting ready to go to sleep. Even Ellie falls asleep on the couch. Ray gives her to Art, telling him that a big brother should take responsibility and put her to bed. He also mentions that she asks about him every day when he's not here. He should say goodbye to her before leaving in the morning. Meanwhile, Tessia is also having a good time with Alice. They enjoy the weather while drinking tea. Tessia asks Alice if she's worried about Art going into the dungeon. The answer to this question is an obvious yes. No matter how strong someone gets, a mother is always worried for her child. Tessia assures her that she doesn't have to worry. She promises to look after Art, even if it means putting herself in danger. To her surprise, Alice suggests that she shouldn't do so. After all, she's a precious daughter to her parents as well, and they would be devastated if anything happens to her. Most of all, she trusts her son to take care of himself. With the winter approaching, it has started to get cold. Alice suggests they should get inside. Regardless, Tessia wants to spend a little more time outside. So Alice leaves to give her some alone time. Back in the house, Art has fulfilled his duty of putting his sister to bed. Yet she wakes up and asks Art when he's leaving. She's a bit saddened to know that he will be leaving in the morning. He promises to come back to meet her after he comes back from his dungeon field trip. At least still wants to spend more time with Art, so she asks him to tell her a story. Despite his initial hesitation, he decides to do it. Art sits next to Ellie and asks her what story she would like to hear. She wants to know about the story of how he became a professor. He continues the story while making himself to be the hero, saving the helpless princess. Ellie makes sure to use her opportunity to tease Art whenever she gets it. Art finishes the story after telling her how he got access to the restricted part of the library as well as his own private training room with mana crystals. Nonetheless, Ellie keeps asking questions and Art has no choice but to answer them. This goes on for a while. Just like that, it's morning. Ray and Alice couldn't find Art in his room, so they go looking for him. They decide to check into Ellie's room. They are pleasantly surprised when they find Art sitting next to her while sleeping. This is similar to when he first rescued Tessia and they had to spend the night in a tent. Winter has finally arrived and it's time for the students to head out for their excursion. Professor Glory starts gathering everyone and tells them to get with their teams. Art tells Sylvie that she should use this time to do more hunting. This way she can get even stronger. He tells her that he will be fine on his own since it's a low-level dungeon. On top of that, Professor will be with them the entire time. Satisfied with this, she heads off on her own. Unfortunately for Art, he has been grouped with Lucas. Yet after his last dungeon raid with Lucas, this time he is prepared for anything he might do. Before they leave, they have to decide on a group leader. Lucas tries to claim this title for himself. However, it fails as everyone instantly votes for Tessia. She tries to make the case that it should be Art since he's stronger. But they insist as she has had more experience as a leader due to her being the student council president. On top of that, she's a mid-range conjurer so she can keep an eye on everyone. Now that everything has been decided, the entire class finally enters the dungeon. The long-anticipated dungeon raid has begun for the students of Exiris Academy. Professor Glory makes sure to remind everyone to stay safe at every step. Her number one priority is the safety of her students. As they go deeper, the cave starts to get colder. 
so she instructs everyone to augment themselves for protection against the environment. However, this doesn't apply to Art. Even without using mana, his body remains unaffected. This is because of his assimilation with Sylvia's dragon will. Now that they have gotten deep enough to be in danger of getting attacked by monsters, the professor once again guides the class. The dungeon that they are in is a D-class dungeon called the Widow's Crypt. They will only be exploring the first two floors of this dungeon, so the only mana beasts that they should expect are snarlers. They are low-level beasts, but they still might be trouble for beginners. This is because they have thick fur, which makes them harder to kill. As they move further into the dungeon, the students start to notice that something is off. Snarlers are pretty easy to spot on the first floor, so it's a bit weird that they still haven't encountered any so far. Herta starts to wonder that maybe an adventurer team came in earlier and eliminated all of them. Contrary to that assumption, since Professor Glory had the Adventurer's Guild restrict access to this dungeon before they came in, even she starts to get worried. She tells the students to keep their guard up. One of the students asks her about their plan if they don't encounter any beasts on the first two floors. She makes it clear that even if they don't find any mana beasts, they will still be heading back and reporting their findings without going any deeper. The professor's worst fear comes true as they suddenly get attacked by a horde of snarlers. She instantly orders all the students to back off and prepares to counter the incoming attack. Despite the huge number of them, they are still weak mana beasts, so it only takes one strike for her to kill many of them. Despite this, her worries still don't subside. Although these snarlers are not stronger than the average ones, they still shouldn't be attacking in hordes. Keeping their strange behavior in mind, she errs on the side of caution and calls an end to the excursion. Before she can tell everyone to head back, a powerful fire blast goes right past her and explodes on the snarlers behind her. As expected, it was none other than Lucas. He doesn't want to leave when things have finally started to get interesting. Despite his arrogant behavior, many of the other students hold the same opinion as him. This also includes Curtis and Art. Although she knows it's not the wisest decision, she starts to be influenced by the students' enthusiasm. After all, Snarlers are only E-class beasts, and as long as she's there, everything should be fine, right? Hence, she agrees to let them fight. She orders everyone to split into their teams and take different parts of the floor. Following her orders, the students quickly rush to take their positions. However, before Lucas can leave, she makes it clear to him that if he pulls the same stunt again, there will be severe consequences. He gives her a quick nod and leaves to join the rest of the team. Being the team leader, Tessia, begins to assign everyone their roles. She puts Art as the vanguard, since he's best at close-range combat. Next, she orders the other two members of the team, Clive and Roland, to take supportive positions behind Art. Lastly, she orders Lucas to stay in the middle. Once more, Lucas's pride prevents him from accepting instructions from anyone else. He instead heads off to do his own thing. The team doesn't have time to worry about his antics, since the Snarlers have already begun attacking. Roland pulls out an artifact, but before he can use it, they're already under attack. Thankfully, Art is not as distracted as the rest of the team. The entire horde finally arrives. Due to their excellent team chemistry, they are able to work together to fend them off. Professor Glory is relieved to see that her students are doing well, but she still can't shake off the feeling that something bad is about to happen. The students are not used to prolonged battles. On top of that, the number of snarlers doesn't seem to be decreasing. Keeping this in mind, she orders all the team leaders to slowly start backing off. Everyone follows her orders and starts running back. However, Roland finds himself in big trouble when he falls down while a big horde of snarlers are right on their tail. As always, Art can't allow himself to leave a comrade behind. He decides to use a single powerful strike to blow all the snarlers away. This way he can rescue Roland while making sure that he remains uninjured in the process. Using his sword, Art launches a powerful wind strike which blows all the mana beasts away. However, it comes at a cost. The powerful strike dislocates his shoulder, leaving one of his arms useless in the battle. On top of this, the situation gets even worse. A new horde of snarlers appears, but this time they have wings. These two new mana beasts are called Queen Snarlers. They are B-class mana beasts, much stronger than the regular snarlers. However, they are not supposed to leave the bottom floor, which makes the professor curious about their intent for being here. They instantly attack the students without giving them much time to think. The only one who can protect them now is Professor Glory. She takes out both of her weapons and prepares to counter the incoming attack. Their sudden appearance is not the only unusual thing about this situation. 
These two mana beasts are also much stronger than the regular Queen Snarlers. The professor has to give it her all just to hold them back. She quickly orders the students to get out of the dungeon as soon as possible. Art instantly leaps into action to clear the exit, so everyone can escape. The emergence of Queen Snarlers created a hole in the ground and also blocked the exit. To escape the dungeon, everyone will have to clear the chasm and get through the blockage. Art gets an idea of how to accomplish this when he witnesses one of his classmates fighting with her earth magic. Her name is Delphine. Art tells her to come with him, while the rest of the squad volunteers to provide cover for them. When they get to the chasm, Art tells her to patch the hole using her earth magic while he protects her from the constant attacks by the Snarlers. Her proficiency in earth magic allows her to complete this task fairly quickly. Now all that's left is to clear the rubble so everyone can escape. Despite his injured shoulder, Art tries to clear the blockage with a powerful punch. As expected, it doesn't work. The situation only gets worse as he notices that the entire dungeon is being filled with smoke. Because of this, everyone has trouble breathing. Art realizes that this is because of the constant fire magic being used. Since the Snarler's corpses are blocking the only airway, the smoke has nowhere to go. He tells everyone, including Claire and Curtis, to stop using fire magic. This is only a temporary measure though, they need to clear the blockage, otherwise they're going to suffocate to death. Art comes to the conclusion that they should use a big blast to clear the wall at once. There is no use in being careful if they cannot even breathe. He suddenly has an epiphany when he remembers Curtis using his beast will against Tessia. The same attack that he used against her can also clear the wall. He calls Curtis over and asks him if his World Howl spell is enough to clear the blockage. Curtis informs him that although it would be enough, he cannot gather enough mana without Grotter. However, Art has a solution to this. He tells Curtis to turn around and focus on going into his first phase. Art is going to attempt to do something that hasn't been done in decades. Mana transference has been studied for years, but it was declared a lost cause. Even if someone specialized in the same element as another mage, the mana inside their body is not exclusive to that particular element. However, since Art can use all four elements, theoretically he should be able to control the ratio between each element. It's still a huge risk since he has not mastered it fully and has never even tried it before. As he tries to do this, Art becomes aware of his own carelessness. He was so confident about going into the dungeon that he didn't consider the possibility of anything going wrong. His overconfidence led him to believe that even if something did go wrong, he would be able to handle it and protect everyone. He realizes that if he wants to reach the white core stage, it will take much more time and effort. Meanwhile, his plan works as Curtis is successfully able to reach the first phase of his beast will. He unleashes the powerful attack, which clears the pathway for everyone. Professor Glory, on the other hand, is still fighting the two Queen Snarlers. Despite using her deviant glass magic, she's still being pushed back. More bad luck strikes as everyone quickly rushes to exit the dungeon. Tessia's mana core flares up again, and she's unable to walk due to the pain. While Art helps her to the exit, another thought enters his mind. Normally a nest only has one queen, so why are there two queen snarlers attacking them? It seems that his bad luck has no end today. Another snarler appears from the ground. This one is much bigger and stronger than all the monsters they have faced so far. It has multiple wings and is surrounded by a dark aura. It would seem that the real Queen Snarler has finally made its appearance. The power of this one is quite evident. With a single swipe from its claws, it nearly takes Professor Glory's eye out. It turns its attention towards the students and tries to attack them. However, the professor is not about to let that happen. She uses her glass magic to distract it and make sure that its attention is on her. Art is aware that this creature is far too powerful for Professor Glory to manage by herself. It's only a matter of time before she loses. Claire tells him to escape with them and let the professor deal with the monster. However, as we have seen before, Art is not the one to leave an ally behind no matter what. Both Claire and Curtis tried to stop him, but he has already made up his mind. Realizing that there is no other option, he finally unleashes his fire magic. Both of them are left stunned upon witnessing this. Art arrives just in time to rescue Professor Glory. He attacks the monster head-on with his fire magic. The professor has a similar reaction upon witnessing Art's fire magic. Despite his powerful attack, the monster is undeterred. They keep attacking the duo aggressively. Upon making sure that all the students have escaped the dungeon, both of them decide to unleash their most powerful magic. Defeating it is out of the question, so all they can hope to do is weaken it enough so they can escape as well. However, this is going to be much harder than they realize.
Art tells Professor Glory to keep it busy for 10 seconds while he prepares an attack. Following his instructions, she attacks the beast with all her might. Art, on the other hand, prepares a powerful attack with his most potent element, lightning. He gathers all his energy into his sword and unleashes a powerful slash. This attack is called Burst Blade Storm. He manages to land it successfully and for the first time, they are able to do some real damage to the beast. However, the backlash from this attack dislocates another bone in his right arm. Angered by Art's attack, the beast attacks him with his claw. The professor manages to get him away just in time. His blade is left in the beast's stomach. The two of them quickly try to make their way out of the dungeon. Just as they are about to escape, the beast appears once again. It attacks them with its claws and manages to stab Art in the leg. Before she can come to his rescue, the beast unleashes a powerful magical attack. Because of this, the ground beneath them gives way, leaving Art to fall into the hole along with the monster. All that the professor can do is watch as Art falls into the chasm. He tries to quickly use his wind magic, but as luck would have it, Art is hit in the head by the falling rubble and is knocked unconscious. When he wakes up, he is still falling. He quickly uses his wind magic to propel himself to the wall. He tries to grab onto it, but the speed at which he is falling is too great. Furthermore, he realizes that all he can do is try to survive the fall. He once again uses the same spell to push himself towards the wall. This way he can try to slow himself down. With his remaining mana, he uses a spell called Wind Torrent just as he is about to hit the ground. Because of this, Art is able to slow himself down just enough to survive. Even so, the fall still causes him severe injuries. He is unable to breathe, let alone walk. Even in death, Sylvia once again comes to his rescue. The regenerative abilities that he gained from her beast will start healing him. After a few minutes of lying down, Art is finally able to get up. He quickly goes over to the monster's corpse and retrieves his blade. Now he has to figure out how to get out. Even at full strength, it would be difficult to climb all the way back up, so his only option is to find a different path. After a long series of bad luck, he is finally able to catch a break. He hears running water and quickly looks around to investigate. After a few minutes of looking around, he finds an exit from the cave. As he walks towards it, the sound of running water gets louder and louder. When he finally reaches the sound, he finds a running waterfall. It would seem that there is a larger cave behind it. When he makes his way to the other side, he is left horrified upon witnessing the gnarly scene. There are many mages lying dead on the ground, having been impaled with spikes. Art hears a faint cough and quickly takes out his blade. It seems there's one mage alive within the carnage. This voice calls for help. He quickly gets down and starts looking for this person. He's barely able to hold himself together upon witnessing the gruesome way these mages were killed. He continues to follow the voice and finally arrives at the source. Art is left shocked to his core upon learning the identity of this person. It's none other than Lance Aaliyah. She is not only a white core mage, she's also a Lance. Even so, her injuries are more severe compared to all the other mages here. He cannot even find the energy to stand and is forced to get on his knees. She is missing her right arm and both of her legs. Both of her eyes were clawed out. Not only this, but there is also a spike impaling her abdomen. He quickly uses his magic to try and heal her. Without her eyes, she is unable to tell who this person is. Art informs her that he is the boy she met at Xyrus Academy. The boy who reminded her of her little brother. She is finally able to recognize Art as the boy who was spying on Lance Baron. Before he can continue healing her, she grabs his hand with the little energy she has left and stops him. This is because she knows as well as Art that she is beyond saving. Unable to do anything, all he can do is apologize. She tells him that he has nothing to apologize for. In fact, him being here has made her feel much better, and she thanks him for that reason. Art asks her if there's anything he can do for her. Sadly, he can't do anything but stay by her side in her last moments. In his frustration, he asks her who did this to her and how did this happen. Her reply sends chills down his spine. It is revealed that she is alive this long because the person who did this was trying to get revenge. This was his way of torturing her for laying a hand on him. She hands him a purple shard which is surrounded by a dark aura. Aaliyah reveals that even with her shattered core, she can show Art what happened because of the mana he imbued into her earlier. She grabs his head and places his forehead right next to her own. Suddenly, Art is able to see everything that happened from her perspective. After the backup arrived, Aaliyah along with the 50 mages attacked the Hades Serpent. They were able to defeat it easily without any casualties. However, it's what happened next that resulted in the carnage that Art witnessed. 
a new enemy appeared and instantly killed most of the battle mages. He tells them about a war brewing. Even calling him a mage would be a stretch. Its devilish appearance made it seem like a monster from your worst nightmares. His power was on a whole different level. He gave Aaliyah two options. Either she can fight and die, or she can double-cross her teammates and kill every last one of them. If she chooses the second option, he will allow her to live. However, without a second thought, she orders all the remaining men to attack him at once. Same as before, all of them are instantly killed. While he's busy killing the rest of her men, Aaliyah is able to find an opening and lands a hit on him with her plant magic. This only proceeds to piss him off. He was going to give her a quick death, but now he promises to make her suffer. With one attack, he completely rips her arm off and sends her flying towards the wall. Next, he impales her with his deviant magic. To torture her even more, he rips both of her legs off, but he wasn't done yet. He wanted to make the rest of her senses even stronger so she could hear the screams of her allies. To do this, he decides to claw her eyes out. Even the battle-hardened art is unable to bear this any longer, and he ends up vomiting. Aaliyah apologizes for making him witness something like this. However, he tells her that this needs to be passed on, so everyone can know what truly happened down here. He thanks her for her service. Even a professional soldier like Lance Aaliyah finally breaks down. She starts sobbing uncontrollably like a baby and tells him that she doesn't want to die. Art can do nothing to ease her pain. All he can do is cry with her. He hugs her to provide her with some comfort in her last moments. As the last bit of energy leaves her body, it finally happens. She passes away from her injuries. One can call this a big mercy as she is finally relieved of all her suffering. Just before passing away, she recalls a happy memory of spending time with her brother. Art decides to bury her body, as well as the bodies of all the fifty battle mages. He told himself that her death wasn't in vain, but even I'm not sure if he truly believes that. One by one, he buries all the bodies using his earth magic. Through Elia's memories, he was able to find out that there was more than one Blackhorn demon. Although uncertain about their exact numbers, they are definitely after something. These demons are the same ones he encountered all those years back in Sylvia's cave. Irrespective of whether they want Sylvie or Decathan as a whole, it doesn't alter what Art has to do. Despite being a Quadra Elemental Mage, he knows that he doesn't stand a chance against them as of right now. If what the demon said about the war was true, then he can't afford to become complacent. To protect his loved ones in this world, he must strive to become stronger. After he's done burying the bodies of the battle mages, Art uses his ice magic to encase Aaliyah's body in a pillar of ice. He promises her that she won't be alone for long. He tells her that he will make sure to send people to come back for her. Not just for her, but for all the soldiers who died down here. Sylvie finally arrives in her dragon form to get him out of the dungeon. She makes sure not to interrupt him while he's grieving. He thanks her for waiting for him, and they both leave the dungeon. Art rides on her back, and the two of them arrive at the gate of Xyra's city. They are stopped by the guards who demand some sort of identification. Art informs them that he's one of the students that went on the class trip to Widow's Crypt. The guard immediately orders another soldier to notify the Adventurer's Guild as well as the Xyra's Academy at his return. This is because the Guild was putting together a search and rescue for him. The guard also offers to get an emitter so they can heal his wounds. However, Art refuses this offer and respectfully tells the soldier that he just wants to go home. Being the soldier himself, he understands the need to see his family, so he agrees. After a long carriage ride, Art finally arrives home at nighttime. It's a stunning night as the aurora lights are shining brightly in the sky. Perhaps he would have been able to enjoy it if he hadn't gone through everything that he just did. He stops himself just before entering the house. He hesitates to go in as he knows that everyone is very worried about him but if he goes in, it will ask him what happened. This is something he just doesn't want to deal with right now. Art sits down on the stairs with Aaliyah's dying words still lingering in his mind. He takes out her necklace while thinking about her. He hopes that she will get another chance at life, the same as he did. His alone time is interrupted by Ray. It seems that his father can relate to how he is feeling, more than Art gave him credit for. Before he can start apologizing for not coming in, Ray stops him and tells him that he doesn't need to say anything. He informs Art that Alice's healing magic can only heal minor wounds. Even though Art hadn't realized, she has her own scars that she hides from everyone. Ray once again reassures his son that he doesn't have to force himself. He understands that everyone has their own battles that they need to fight. He'll always be there for him, waiting for him to come out victorious. Life isn't a single battle. Experiencing defeat at times is all right. 
The only thing that he can do is learn from it and get stronger, so he can win the war. Hearing these heartfelt words, Art can't help but weep uncontrollably. The next day, he goes back to Exiris Academy to have a meeting with Cynthia. They meet on the balcony so they can enjoy the fresh air while engaging in their conversation. She informs Art that she has already heard everything about their class trip from Professor Glory. She asks him if he has any plans about what to do next. For now, his only plan is to go shopping with his mother and sister. After everything he's been through, he has realized that he should cherish every moment with the people he loves. Cynthia asks him what happened after he fell down the chasm. She already knows about the anomaly with the Queen Snarlers, but she wants to know if he knows anything more. Without saying a word, Art hands her Aaliyah's necklace. Cynthia is left horrified as she knows that this could only mean one thing. She still confirms it, just to be sure. He informs her that Aaliyah and her team's bodies are still on the bottom floor of the widow's crypt. Cynthia realizes that if one of the lances has died, then it means that they're already here. She tries to gather as much information as possible and inquires Art if he saw what caused this. For some reason, he decides to keep silent about everything and conveys to her that he didn't witness anything. Cynthia instantly leaves to inform the council about this. Before leaving, she tells him not to get himself involved in all of this and warns him that this matter is beyond him. Art goes on his planned shopping trip with Alice, Tabitha, and Ellie. He tries to enjoy the family time, but there's still some lingering trauma from everything he has experienced. As always, it doesn't take long for Alice to realize that there is something wrong. However, she can't bring herself to talk to him about it. They enter a clothing store and Ellie instantly starts looking for clothes for Art. Although he is not in the mood, he still tries to be nice and goes along with it. Trying to excuse himself, he asks Tabitha if there are any stores around here that sells training material. She lets him know that there's a quite famous store located right around the corner. He can buy all sorts of elixirs and medicine from there. Alice tries to offer to go with him, but Art leaves before she has a chance to do so. Despite his best efforts to move on, he keeps remembering those horrible events. After walking for a while, he finally arrives at the store. It seems Tabitha's description was a little off. This store is a run-down old shack that looks like it houses all the diseases and poisons in the world. Still, he decides to check it out since he has already come this far. On his way to enter the store, Art gets startled by a voice. He is shocked to see that it's an old man. It's surprising that Art wasn't able to sense him at all. He seems to be a homeless man and asks Art if he can spare some change. As soon as the boy reaches his hand out to give him a coin, the man instantly snatches it from his hand. Art realizes his mistake when he sees that he accidentally gave the old man a silver coin. He tries to politely ask to get it back, but the old man has already disappeared. Disappointed at being conned, he tries to forget about it and heads toward the store. Upon entering, he is surprised to see that the owner is the same old man that he just gave money to. He gets angry and demands to get his coin back. The man defends himself by telling Art that it was his fault for judging him based on his appearance. The man still offers to make up for it and offers to let him take any one item from his shop as compensation. However, from the condition of this store, it's hard to believe that there will be anything here worth a silver coin. He still tries to control his anger and tells himself that he must respect the elderly. Art walks around the store hoping to find something worth his money. He fails to find anything but dust and spiderwebs. While continuing his search, he comes across a strange-looking black cat. He ignores it and keeps up the search. However, all he manages to find is a ring that squirts water, a skeleton in a chest, some old worn-out books, and a lot of dust. He is somewhat relieved when Sylvie finally finds him. Even though she is angry at him for leaving her behind at the clothing store, he is still happy to see her. The elderly is shocked upon seeing Sylvie. Could it be that he has realized her true nature? Perhaps there is more to him than meets the eye. He apologizes to Art for his weird behavior. Nevertheless, Art conveys to him that he didn't discover anything of value in his store, so he asks for his coin back. The man feels a bit insulted, so he decides to pick something for Art himself. He pulls out a strange-looking marble from a dusty corner and throws it to Art. Before he can even inquire about what it is, the man kicks him out of the store. The only thing he tells him is that he will need it. Upon leaving the store, he once again runs into the same strange-looking cat. He once again ignores it and goes back to his family. Alice asks him if he found what he was looking for. The disappointed look on his face is enough to tell them everything they want to know. Tabitha is surprised at the fact that Art couldn't find anything from their variety of elixirs and medicine. 
he is shocked to hear her say that as there is no way there was anything of value in that shabby place. Tabitha decides to take him there herself. Things start to make more sense when he sees the store himself. This store is a well-maintained, high-class building. From this, it's obvious that he took a wrong turn while he was lost in thought. A little way outside Cyrus Academy, Lucas finds himself in a cave with Charles. He seems to be taking him to a secret location to meet someone. Upon entering a door at the end of the tunnel, Lucas finds himself surrounded by mages covered in black hoods. It looks like a cult. Their leader welcomes him to their meeting. The leader is a weird-looking man having orange hair and wearing a creepy white mask. He expresses his appreciation that Lucas has decided to join their little crusade. Lucas, however, is not one to be swayed so easily. He tells them that he was expecting something a little more impressive. One of the members gets furious and shouts at him that he should be grateful that they are letting a mutt like him to join them. He gets angry upon being insulted. However, the leader stopped the fight before it gets worse. He uses a powerful spell to burn the member alive. Despite the constant begging, the leader doesn't stop until the man finally dies. Even Lucas is taken back, although he admits that he would have done the same. However, his inability to sense the leader's mana indicates an extraordinary level of strength. Lucas decides to inquire more about this group before he agrees to join. He asks the leader many questions. What are they trying to accomplish? Why do they need him? And are they the ones who have been drugging the students at the academy? The leader replies by telling him that he has big plans for this academy. However, certain circumstances prevent him from acting right now. So he needs capable mages to execute his plans while he waits, and Lucas happens to be one of them. He explains that everyone in this group is a dissatisfied human noble who once took pride that Exerus was built for the purest of lineages. He questions Lucas if he is also not upset by what is happening. Lucas informs him that he doesn't waste his time in dealing with pests that he can crush at any time. To him, all the students at the Exerus Academy are no better than low-class adventurers flailing around with their weapons. He also doesn't give a crap about those pampered nobles. He tells the leader that he has no reason to lower himself to their level and begins to leave. However, the leader isn't done with him yet. He decides to strike at Lucas's weak spot. He raises the subject of how Art managed to defeat him. Even though he claims to despise weak mages, he becomes absolutely furious upon hearing this. It seems like he's ready to attack the leader. He even sarcastically mentions that all of Lucas's strength is because of the elixirs that he was given after his awakening. Lucas's rage continues to increase. The leader even reveals that the saddest thing about his defeat was that Art wasn't even trying. This is a truth that Lucas himself is fully aware of. Despite his anger, he can't deny what he is hearing. This is because he witnessed it with his own eyes when Art unleashed his fire magic against the monster in the widow's crypt. Lucas questions who the hell is he and how does he know all this. The man gets up and bows down like a proper noble. He tells Lucas that he is only a mere benefactor who came here for the betterment of this land. He once again implores him to join them and tells him that it would be of mutual benefit. This time Lucas is intrigued. He explains that he will soon strike, and when he does, the frail bond between the three races will shatter. At the moment he has both the council and Cynthia occupied, so the stage is set for Lucas. He wants Lucas to take care of the loose ends, which means Arthur Lewin. Lucas has finally come to accept that he's not as strong as Art, so he knows he won't be able to kill him on his own, and he doesn't want to take the same drug that was given to Marcois. The leader reassures him by telling him that Marcois was weak. For someone as strong as Lucas, it shouldn't be a problem to control the power. And the power that he will get will be on a completely different level. From their conversation, Lucas is able to deduce that the leader must have some sort of plan to get Art to fight him at full strength. And he's not wrong. The leader knows that Arthur places great importance on his friends and family, but he has one particular person in mind. It's none other than Tessia. He questions everyone whether it's okay that an elf is the leader of the students at the Exiris Academy. The entire room becomes filled with angry shouts agreeing with him. Lucas also gets very excited and agrees to go along with the plan. Elsewhere at the student dorm, Elijah is sitting alone in his room. He gets up after hearing a knock at the door. He is pleasantly surprised to see that it is Art. He quickly rushes out and hugs him. After settling down, he reveals that he was informed by Cynthia that Art was okay, but after hearing Claire's recount, it was hard to believe. Art asks him if everyone is fine. Claire and Curtis are fine and checked out of the infirmary just this morning. However, for some reason, Elijah hesitates to talk about Tessia. He tells Art that she is with Virian right now in one of the training rooms. 
He also suggests that Art should visit everyone so they can see for themselves that he is fine. But he doesn't want to deal with everyone's questions right now, so he instead requests Elijah to let everyone know in the morning. He agrees to do it. After saying goodbye to Elijah, Art leaves to visit Tessia. He finds it strange that Virian is here since he wouldn't miss a council meeting unless it was something important. His thoughts are interrupted as Sylvie informs him that she is sensing strange mana coming from Tessia. He quickly runs to the room. As soon as he opens the door, he hears a loud boom, followed by smoke. When the smoke clears up, Art is shocked by what he sees. It's Virian sitting behind Tessia while she is completely covered in vines. Art quickly goes over to Virian to ask him about what's going on. Virian informs him that she has been like this ever since she returned from the dungeon. It seems that her beast will is flaring up again and causing problems with her assimilation. He comes to the conclusion that the Elderwood Guardian that Art fought must have been different in some way. Even after assimilating with Tessia for so long, there's still a lingering sense of unease. It's like the beast will is mutating the fight against Tessia. Art comes to the realization that he might be at fault as he was the one who provided her with the beast core. As soon as he touches the vine, his ring starts to glow brightly. The vine suddenly starts attacking him, but he manages to dodge it just in time. If it wasn't for his quick reflexes, he could have died. The vines continue to attack him for some reason and Art continues dodging them. The attacks continue to become more and more intense. He tries to stay close to Virian while at the same time, he's careful not to hurt Tessia. The source of the bright light is finally revealed. It's the marble that Art got from that old man at the store. It gets away from his hand and starts flying on its own. It flies straight toward the center of the vines, indicating that it's heading for Tessia. Suddenly, all the vines are blown away in a huge blast. The marble gets absorbed into Tessia's body. As soon as this happens, all the vines disappear and she starts going back to normal. Art quickly catches her unconscious body and wraps her in a piece of cloth. Virian also rushes over to examine her. He thanks Art for saving his granddaughter once again. After a few minutes passed, Tessia finally regains consciousness. She quickly starts running over to the two of them for a hug. Unfortunately, this hug is not for Virian. Tessia is glad to see that Art is alive. Virian and Art take her to the infirmary for checkup. Art is still confused about everything that happened. Why did that mysterious orb fly into Tessia? It seemed to have calmed her down, but the question still remains, what did it actually do to her? Art decides that he will have to go to the shop again to do some investigating. The doctor finally comes back with the results after the checkup. To their delight, he reveals that her vitals are stable and the mana circulation throughout her body isn't impeded. However, there is one thing that doesn't make sense. Tessia is supposed to be at the light orange stage, while the doctor is at the dark yellow core stage, so he should be able to sense her mana. However, that's not the case. Virian becomes completely shocked at what he is hearing and goes over to Tessia to check for himself. He is left completely dumbfounded after checking her mana core. It has jumped all the way up to the initial silver stage. This means that she is at the same stage as Virian. The two of them leave the infirmary to discuss this further. Art wonders if they should leave her alone. But Virian assures him that she is just exhausted and she will be fine. After breaking through three stages all at once, her body needs rest. With that out of the way, Art asks him something that has been on his mind for a while. He wants to know more about the lances. He wants to know how strong they actually are. It takes about 20 yellow core mages to hold off a single silver core mage. This makes Art wonder how exponential the increase in power is from silver to white core. He further asks about how a white core mage gets as strong as they are. Some of the lances are so young, so how did they get so strong in such little time? This even raises the question of what is stopping them from taking over the kingdom with their amazing strength. Virian discloses that the lances attained their current level of strength only after receiving knighthood. This also has to do with how the royal families have stayed in power for so long. Before continuing, Virian makes it clear that what he is about to reveal to him is something only the royal families know. This is a highly guarded secret, so no one can know about it. During the Beast Era, the time when no one knew how to use magic, the three races lived nomadic lives. They traveled with their own kind and only met the other races for the purpose of trade. They had differences in culture and beliefs, but they were still on good terms. There was peace, but it didn't last long. This was because of the mana beasts that roamed free and hunted the three races for food. Over the years, the population of each race started to dwindle. Until one day, a miracle happened. 
a deity descended from the sky and gifted the people with tools to defend themselves. This deity appeared before three people who were the forefathers of what are now the three royal families, the Glader, the Grey Sunders, and the Aerolith families. They were bestowed with six artifacts. These artifacts were to be shared among the three of them, so they could become kings of their race. However, the artifacts weren't meant to be used by the kings themselves. Instead, they were supposed to be passed down to the two most powerful subjects under each king. These two individuals became the first lances. These artifacts gave them the power to use the energy that existed in their surroundings that came to be known as mana. The three kings then commanded the six artifact users to spread their newfound knowledge among the people, giving rise to the first generation of magic users. The three races then rallied together to fight against the mana beasts and managed to push them deep into the trenches of what is now known as the Beast Glades. Thus, a time of true peace finally descended upon the land, ending the era of beasts and marking the beginning of a new era. The three races diverged peacefully and naturally. They each sought a place to call home, a place that would best fit their lifestyle and culture. The human king led his subjects to the west, where the lands were flat and rich in soil. The elven king took his people to the north, towards the forest. Here they could live peacefully with the magical forest and the living beings that inhabited it. Finally, there was the dwarven king. He took his subjects to the south, where the earth was abundant in ores of metals and precious gems. With the three kings and the lances watching over their people, they lived in times of peace and prosperity. However, there is something amiss with the story according to art. What about the war that took place between the humans and the elves, and where did the lances go? Virian angrily pinches Art's cheek as he tells him that he was about to get to that part when Art interrupted him. After a few generations of peace, the people started forgetting about the alliance that their ancestors shared, and as it always does, their greed started taking over. As for the lances, they never went away. They existed in each generation and were nurtured closely to the royal families. They were secretly raised to wield the artifacts. It was only because of the discovery of the new continent that the three royal families decided to unify and made the lances known to the public. It finally starts to make sense why this was all a secret. Even if the lances are soul bound to their kings, if the word got out that there are artifacts capable of producing white core mages, one can only imagine the catastrophe that would befall Decathan. They wouldn't have to worry about the other continent as Decathan would fall from within, long before others could attack. Art thanks Virian for trusting him with this knowledge. Virian reveals that the reason he told him was because he plays a part in all of this as well. Art's bond is no mere mana beast. Sylvie is a deity. Art just can't bring himself to believe that the small fox-like monster sleeping with a drooling face and a bubble popping up from her nose is an actual god. Virian explains that deities aren't how religious books make them out to be. Simply put, they are beings that have successfully transcended from their mortal bodies and have become one with mana. He believes that it was no mere coincidence that Art bonded with Sylvie. Although there is no telling what part Art has to play in all this, Virian still tells him to be ready. After his conversation with Virian, Art decides to head back to the elixir store to meet the old man. Upon arriving, he is surprised to see that the entire store has disappeared. Where a store once stood, there now lies a mere dead end. He walks over to investigate. To his surprise, he finds a similar-looking marble to the one he got earlier. It is placed in the small gap between the two walls with a note tapped onto it. After reading the note, he makes his way back to his house. That morning while having breakfast with his family, Alice notices that Art seems distracted. By now, she knows her son well enough to realize that there is something on his mind that he feels compelled to accomplish. She also realizes that this would require him to go away for a while. Before he can even start speaking, she tells him that all they want is for him to come home safely. Art thanks his family for their love and understanding. He heads out of the house with the note in his hand. We finally find out what the note says. The note tells him that if he wants to know the whole story, then he must come to the West Teleportation Gate at noon. Art gets a flashback from his previous life. It is a memory from the time when the council was putting pressure on him to kill a girl as a punishment. Even though King Grey wanted to spare her. Thankfully for Art, it was just a nightmare. He wakes up from his nap while on his way to the West Teleportation Gate. Sylvie becomes concerned, but Art assures her that he is fine. However, he can't help but wonder why this memory came up at a time like this. There is a bigger question that needs to be answered. The identity of the note's sender. If it's from the old man, then one has to wonder how he heard the conversation between Virian and Art. This note claims to know something that even Virian doesn't know. 
Does this mean that Virian purposefully left something out? Art trusts him enough to believe that he must have told him everything he knows. But then who could it be? Hopefully, all these inquiries will be resolved as Art finally arrives at the gate. The Elven Guard asks for verification. However, Art didn't know something like that was required. The Guard further clarifies that this is the teleportation gate to Eleanor, and to enter one has to present some verification. Art wonders why the note is asking him to go to Eleanor. He presents the compass that he got from Virian all those years ago. The guard is surprised to see this seemingly insignificant child carrying the seal of the royal family. He quickly bows down to him and lets him pass. Upon entering the gate, he instantly feels something weird. Instead of being teleported, he is grabbed with colorful strands of mana. He is brought to a black void of nothingness. Sildi starts to get scared. This is the first time in her life that she has expressed fear. This is enough indication that the person is something extremely powerful. Art suddenly senses a strong presence nearby. The power is so great that he cannot even get himself to stand. The person finally reveals himself. It is the same cat that he met at the elixir store. However, that was just a camouflage. The area suddenly gets lit up. Now Art is able to see clearly as the cat transforms into a man wearing a black suit. He introduces himself as Wisdom. To the lower life forms, such as Art, he would be known as a deity. Back in Ixshire City, Cynthia is on a mission after her meeting with the council. The meeting became quite heated after everyone found out that one of the lances died. The Dwarven Queen demands that the student who found Aaliyah's body should be presented in front of them so that he can be interrogated. The Human Queen asserts that there is no need for that since Cynthia has already confirmed all the facts. The council decides to send their best tracking mages to see if they can find any traces that the enemy may have left behind. The Elven King asks Cynthia to join them in this mission. However, she politely refuses with the excuse that she has other matters to attend to. In the present, Avier begins to wonder why Cynthia is so distracted. She is thinking about whether she did the right thing when she hid the fact that it was Arthur who found Aaliyah's body. Avier assures her that she did the right thing. Art is a mystery to them as it is, and they don't want the council to needlessly become suspicious of him. While they are discussing this, Cynthia suddenly finds herself under attack by a group of mages. She gets hit in the back with a lightning attack. These mages all have the same markings on their backs as Marcoes. They attack her with everything they have, however, they are unable to match her strength. She quickly takes all of them out with her sound magic. She keeps one of them alive to interrogate him. She promises to give him a quick death if he reveals what he knows. However, this mage is undeterred and instead accuses her of being a traitor. He reveals that they are slowly regaining their former strength. They have spies in every corner of this continent and in a few short years, the war will begin. Before he can continue, she ends his life. Avier's true form is revealed as a giant dinosaur-like creature. He helps Cynthia clean up the mess by feeding on the dead mages. Before continuing on with the mission, she uses a healing potion for the injury on her back. The attack torn some of her clothes and it's revealed that she has the same markings on her back as the mages that attacked her. Art finds himself dumbfounded in the presence of a deity. After all, the person before him is someone even more powerful than a white core mage. He tries to compose himself before speaking. Before they get to the main reason for their meeting, Art tells Winsome that he would like to confirm a few things first. He wants to know why he was told to enter the teleportation gate leading to Eleanor. He is worried that it might have something to do with Tessia and Virian. However, Winsome reveals that it was his way of tricking him to ensure that he would enter the teleportation gate. To alleviate Art's worries, he uses his magic to conjure a projection of Tessia and Virian. This way Art is able to see with his own eyes that they are perfectly fine and healthy. Winsome adds that Tessia is better than before because of the elixir pearl that Art gave her. This kept her monocor from exploding. He is left completely shocked upon learning that her monocor would have blown up had it not been for the orb that he gave her. With that out of the way, Winsome gets down to the reason why he called him here. Art is a citizen of Decathan, but it's no longer a secret that there are more continents on this planet. This new continent is called Alacria. Both Decathan and Alacria have always been governed by the deities. They reside in the land of Ethiotis. Though the lesser races have regarded them as deities, they have always called themselves of Suras. They are the same beings that passed down the artifacts that allowed the three races to learn magic. Winsome reveals that although Art is informed about the artifacts through Varian, the truth about the Ushuras is something that no one knows. The Ushuras have always been governed by what Winsome refers to as a noblesse oblige. 
They were never to interfere with any matter regarding the people unless the peace or balance was threatened. However, this imperative rule has now been broken. Hathiotis was once divided into three factions made of multiple clans of different races. Each faction had a ruling clan with its own priorities. However, no one ever broke the rule about not interfering with the lesser races. However, this all changed when Agrona became the new leader of the Virtur clan. He broke this rule in an attempt to advance his people. Winsome is already aware that Art has crossed paths with some of their members. The Virtur clan is an anomaly even among the Usturas. He refers to them as scientists as they are constantly studying and furthering their insights into the workings of mana. When Agrona came into power, the Vrucher's strength grew exponentially. However, it was later discovered that they had been experimenting on the bodies of the lesser races in Alacria, all in an effort to enhance their own abilities. One thing that Art still doesn't understand is how it's all related to him. Winsome uses his magic to forcefully revert Sylvie into her dragon form. He reveals that they had been searching for Sylvia for many years. However, when they finally found traces of her mana, they were shocked to see a little boy carrying a deity in his arms. He's shocked to his core when Winsome reveals that Art is now bonded with the child of his master's only daughter and the grandmother of the most powerful being on all three continents in the world. He still can't fathom the reality of the situation and sneaks a glance towards Sylvie. Winsome continues by telling him that most deities have three forms. He deduces that Sylvie is in her miniature beast form to converse energy, even though most Asuras tend to use their humanoid form for that purpose. Art is surprised to learn that Sylvie has a humanoid form. However, the deity informs him that if she still hasn't transformed into this form, then it's most likely that she isn't able to do so. This is probably because Sylvie's mana core is still underdeveloped, and this is very bad news for them. Since they have already found signs of Agronis spies in Decathan, he points out something that Art already knows by now, that there's soon going to be a war. Although the upper echelons of Ephiotis will never admit it out of pride, his connection to Sylvia will play a huge role in the upcoming war. Winsome reveals that he must become their ally, otherwise he will be separated from Sylvie. Art becomes infuriated upon hearing this, but he controls his anger. Since this war will involve Art's family and friends, they will be allies either way. But Art realizes that what Winsome is actually asking him is whether he will become their pawn or not. The deity is surprised at the depth of insight by this seemly young boy. He's also astonished by how well Art's mana core is developed. He adds that once they arrive in Ephiotis for further training, both he and Sylvie will become much stronger. Art is shocked to hear this. Winsome also informs Art that Sylvia's power that he carries within him is something that even the Asuras would kill for. But he has barely tapped into it. Ephiotis is the only place where he will be able to properly learn to harness it, and this is the only way Decathan will stand a chance against the mages of Alacria. Back at the Exiris Academy, the disciplinary committee is having a meeting. It has only been two days since Claire and Curtis have returned from the dungeon expedition, but they can't catch a second of rest because of all the hate crimes that have recently been going on on the campus. Kathleen has also been worried about her brother, who has been troubled since his return from the widow's crypt. The DC officers are on their own since the professors refuse to help until they get solid proof. Kai reveals that he has been able to catch a few people but nothing incriminating. Theo becomes extremely frustrated with their current circumstances. It seems their only option is to wait for Cynthia to return. This is all happening because a certain group is unhappy with how the school is progressing. Silence befalls the room as no one can find the words to say it. Kathleen's boiling anger finally comes to arise. It's revealed that the group has been using the excuse of Arthur being a professor despite his humble background. Ferith tries to calm her down and tells her that they all feel the same way. Their meeting is interrupted by Elijah. He intends to share something about art, but before he can begin speaking, they all hear a loud bang. The entire disciplinary committee rushes out to see what it is. While running, Kathleen is reminded of her mother. Equality was very important to the queen. Being young and naive, she refused to play with kids she deemed lower than her. However, it was her mother that taught her the importance of treating everyone equally. She taught her that before being a princess, she is a person. Everyone is different and special in their own way, but a person is a person. So she should never hate someone for things they can't change. The queen had fought hard for a building on campus to serve both as a museum and a monument to the alliance between the three races. This building was the Triunion Hall. Kathleen is shocked to see that the source of the sound is the hall. Many students and professors quickly gather to help rescue the students inside. 
The earth magic users among them form a stone wall to prevent the fire from spreading. Professor Glory also arrives soon after. She lets Torch carry the injured students to the hospital wing, while she stays behind to help with the rescue. A few professors form a team and use their water magic to try and put out the fire. They attempt to gather the flames to one side so they can be extinguished more easily. They succeed but not before the building gets completely destroyed. Charles is among the students standing in the crowd. This is personal to Kathleen so when she sees Charles, she becomes furious. In her anger, she loses control and goes to attack him. However, Theo manages to grab him before she can do so. He uses his gravity magic to pin him to the ground. The DC offices try to detain him. However, Charles starts playing the victim and begins screaming for help. Hearing his cries for help, one of the professors comes to see what's going on. The professor accuses the disciplinary committee of harassing students. Charles starts piling on and starts screaming about how he was just an innocent bystander when the DC officers suddenly attacked him out of nowhere. Theo gets very angry when Charles calls himself innocent. This is because he has already been seen multiple times with the radical group and now, he is also on the crime scene with his friends. The professor points out that it's only circumstantial evidence. Before the argument gets more heated, Professor Glory quickly steps in to stop them. Also, she sympathizes with Theo, informing him that he can't take in a student without evidence. Due to all this, the reputation of the disciplinary committee seems to have taken a hit, as the students start whispering about how the DC officers were about to attack an innocent student. Despite their frustration, they are forced to leave without doing much. While being carried away by his friends, Charles returns a cheeky grin towards the DC officers, confirming that it was probably him who started the attack on the Tri-Union Hall. Back at Art's private training room, Elijah is practicing his earth magic, however he seems to be struggling. Despite his affinity to earth magic, his magic control is still weak. He still has a long way to go before he can become truly strong. He starts to become frustrated as he thinks about Art. After all, Art is a solid yellow quadra elemental mage with a dragon's will. However, that's not all. Despite all his strength, he has good friends who genuinely care for him. When Elijah told the disciplinary committee members that Art had safely returned from the widow's crypt, they were all truly happy and relieved. He wonders if they would have still been worried if they knew about his real strength. However, Elijah soon realizes that their concern doesn't stem from his abilities, but rather from their genuine friendship. He had initially thought that Art's popularity was solely due to his skill and power, but now he can't help but be a little jealous that Art has so many people who care for him. All sorts of questions start popping up in his mind as he thinks about how things could have been different if he hadn't been born among the dwarves. His mind becomes filled with hatred for Art as he thinks about the vision he had before. However, he manages to snap himself out of it and reminds himself that Art is his friend. He goes back to his training, he wants to get stronger so he can one day stand beside Art as his equal. On the other hand, Art seems to have finished his meeting with Winsome and is now waiting in line for the teleportation gate to Eleanor. However, he is not alone as many other merchants and traders have also been waiting for a while. Due to having the insignia of the royal family, he gets to cut in front of the line. One of the adventurers is not too pleased by this. He quickly runs forward and grabs Art by the shoulder. He gets frustrated and tells him to wait in line like everyone else. The maid escorting him informs the adventurer that Art is a guest of Eleanor and has urgent business to attend to. However, even before she can finish speaking, the adventurer shoves her aside and attacks the boy with his fire magic, threatening to burn him. In response, Art releases his own fire magic, which produces blue flames. The adventurer instantly realizes how outmatched he is and has no choice but to back off. After that little fiasco, Art continues heading to the teleportation gate along with the maid. He thinks back to his meeting with Winsome. He wanted to know why it took the Usuris so long to find him. Winsome highlights that it was because Art had concealed his insignia by using Sylvia's feather. This completely hid the presence of her signature. Now that they have finally found him, Winsome once again demands that he come to Ephiotis with him. In the present he has finally arrived at the royal palace. Once again, he is stopped by the royal guard as they demand some identification. He presents the compass once again and as expected their tone instantly changes upon seeing it. Just when he is about to head in, they hear a loud boom. The royal guard quickly gets in front of Art to protect him, not knowing how strong he truly is. From this, he realizes that the royal guards aren't bad people, they're just a bit annoying. Virian emerges from the blast. Art is surprised to see him and wonders if he's fighting an intruder. 
However, Virian accurately observes that he wouldn't be having this much trouble if it was just another intruder. Before he could continue explaining, the source of the problem reveals itself. It seems to be Tessia who's having trouble controlling her new abilities. Virian reveals that she is already fully integrated with the Elderwood Guardian's beast will. Art is shocked to hear this as there is no way a normal person could integrate with an S-class beast in such a short time. But he soon discerns that it is related to the marble he received from Winsome. Even though she's awake and aware, Tessia can't control the vines, and they just keep multiplying every time Virian cuts one of them. So he tells Art to give it a shot. He agrees to do so and gets ready to attack. He dashes forward and quickly starts climbing the vines trying to reach Tessia. However, it soon becomes evident that it will be more difficult than he realized. He also can't use his fire magic among all these plants. It can cause the fire to spread and cause more damage than he intends to. Having no option, he decides to activate his beast will. He uses a move called Thunderclap Impulse. This allows him to greatly enhance his speed and quickly move between the vines. As he is about to reach her, he calls out and instructs her to prevent the vines from closing in. She uses all her willpower and manages to keep the vines from closing just long enough. Art is able to use this small window and manages to reach her just in time. As soon as he gets her away from the vines, they start to wither away. His beast will also runs out but not before he saves her. Tessia becomes frustrated at herself for always needing Art to come and rescue her. He tries to reassure her by telling her that it's not her fault. He blames himself for giving her the beast core in the first place. But Tessia is done being coddled. She lets him know that what he gave her was an opportunity to grow, and she intends to make sure of it to grow strong enough to stand by his side. He's happy to see her positive attitude. He gives her a fist bump and lets her know that he will be waiting. Unbeknownst to them, they are being watched by Winsome. He concludes that it's too soon to tell him everything. But one day he will have to learn everything about Sylvie, especially the truth about her lineage. Art and Tessia's little moment is interrupted by Virian. He lets them know that they should think about the people who will have to clear this mess and head out. Art wonders where they are going but Virian decides not to reveal it for dramatic purposes and instead gives him a vague answer. Three of them, along with Sylvie, find themselves moving through the forest in a carriage. Virian blames himself for what happened earlier, since he was the one who encouraged Tessia to release the first phase of her beast will, since both of them thought that she could control it. At the very least, Virian believed that he would be able to handle it even if something did happen. Art realizes that since the integration phase was accelerated because of the marble, Tessia skipped the training phase and she never got the chance to test her control. Even now, he can feel that her beast will is different from his own. Even though it's fully integrated, it's still fighting back against her mana. He lectures Virian about how Tessia needs to be more careful. If this happens again, it would be dangerous not only for her but for everyone around her as well. Virian gets frustrated and lets him have it, telling him that he was just a grandfather who got a little excited and proud over his granddaughter's progress. Getting back to the topic, he suggests that they could get a seal to suppress her mana until she learns better control. However, this would leave her completely defenseless if something were to happen and she couldn't remove the seal in time. So instead, he suggests that they get a protective artifact for her. Art agrees with this approach. He also teases Virian about how he can stay by his precious granddaughter's side if it makes him feel better. However, he is undeterred and suggests he can do that all he wants. Now that they have started talking about it, there is something Virian wants to know. He gets unexpectedly serious while asking Art about it. Putting all the teasing aside, he wants to know how Art truly feels about his granddaughter. He wants to know if he has ever thought about marrying her one day. Art is taken aback by this unexpected question. He lets Virian know that he does like Tessia, but right now, he can't say for certain that he knows what love actually means. He wants to improve himself before he can even think about asking for Tessia's hand in marriage. Virian is impressed by the boy's answer, and he's happy to see that his head is in the right place. Unbeknownst to the two of them, Tessia is actually awake and has been listening in on their conversation the whole time. She can barely contain herself after hearing that Art likes her and struggles to keep up the act. He is aware that the affection he feels for her is distinct from his feelings toward others. But right now, the best thing he can do is protect her. Having a protective artifact would be good for her. After all, he's definitely reassured knowing that his mother and Ellie have the Phoenix Pendant with them. Talking about all of this got him concerned about his family as well. He gets an idea that he should get Ellie a bond. This notion brings him a deep sense of satisfaction. It can safeguard her while also dissuading any potential admirers, the trio finally arrives at their destination. 
Art is surprised to see the king and queen here. They are delighted to meet him again and thank him for always protecting their daughter. They came here after they received the news that their manor is under construction, and they would like to know why that is. The king jokingly suggests that they must have finally destroyed it during one of their training sessions. However, they are left horrified to realize that that's actually what happened. Virian decides not to worry them with the truth and instead tells them that he was training with Tessia when he got a little excited and accidentally destroyed a part of the manor. He tells them that it will be fixed in no time, but they don't seem too reassured. He finally discloses the reason for their presence. They have come to meet Rinia. That reminds Tessia that they haven't met her in such a long time and wonders if she's all right. Virian tells her that she has been a little occupied. Rinia had told him a few times how interested she was in Art's future, and hence the reason for their visit. He grows curious about the reasons behind her interest. While moving through the forest, he starts to notice how much things have changed. The queen lets him know that none of them have met her ever since she moved. She chose to isolate herself from the kingdom for unknown reasons. Virian tried to visit her, but he ended up almost dying because of her traps. This is a concerning thing as this means that she has come to know about dangers lurking within the kingdom. The royal family, as well as Art, slowly make their way through the forest. Along the way, a few creatures make the mistake of running into Sylvie. One such creature is a mouse-like mana beast. Unfortunately for the little guy, he is too weak to escape Sylvie. She makes quick work of him by frying him up with her magic. As they walk, the king initiates a conversation with Art and realizes that he has never properly expressed his gratitude for the many times he and Sylvie have saved Tessia from dangerous situations. Art tells him that it's no big deal. In fact, she has helped him a lot as well. He informs the king that Tessia has kept him sane throughout all these difficult times. The king is surprised as he didn't expect a 13-year-old to be saying this. This would be more befitting coming from an old man. Then again, for some reason, the king has always felt that Art was more like an adult rather than a child. Art thanks him for his kind words. However, he clarifies that he didn't necessarily mean it as a compliment. Being a father himself, he realizes that no parent wants to see their child grow up too fast. They especially don't want them to bear the burdens that only an adult should bear. Although he is unaware of this, Art had already lost his youth long ago. He also tells the boy that it was because of him that the council was formed. Art begins to wonder what he means by this. The king explains that he didn't have a good impression of humans after the war. He even lost his mother because of them. He never found it in himself to forgive them. On top of that, his daughter was kidnapped by a bunch of human slave traders who trespassed into the elven forest. However, his perception changed when a human child brought his daughter back home safely. He had the courage to not only face the slave traders head-on, but also to chastise the elven king himself. Being lectured by a human child was the wake-up call that he needed. He wants to let Art know that he isn't opposed to bringing him into the family. Their conversation is heard by the whole group. Tessia couldn't be more embarrassed, while the queen uses this opportunity to tease her husband. Suddenly, their walk through the forest is halted as Durian feels a strange presence among them. The whole group quickly puts their guard up, ready to face any incoming attack. Art takes out his sword as well. Abruptly, a ghostly figure emerges from behind the bushes. This scares the pants off of Art and he jumps forward to attack it without even realizing that it's Rinia. Virian manages to stop him just in time before he kills her. Rinia understandably gets very angry after having been nearly killed, despite coming all this way to ensure that they didn't get lost. Tessia becomes really happy to see her and quickly goes over to give her a big hug. This immediately changes Rinia's mood. Now joined by her, the group continues their journey to her house. She is happy to see Art after all this time and is even surprised by how handsome he has gotten. She even remarks that if she was a hundred years younger, she would have snatched him up for herself. However, he's unsure how he feels about that when he nearly peed himself after seeing her as a ghost. She lets him know how stunning she was as a young girl. Virian doesn't seem to think so and remarks that she was average at best. Rinia knows that he would say that as he only had eyes for one girl. She quickly realizes that she has stepped over the line with that comment and quickly apologizes to him. The rest of the royal family also seem to know what she is talking about, but Art and Tessia remain clueless. Virian apologizes, saying that he should be the one who was sorry since was aware of her feelings too. Putting aside that awkward conversation, Rinia signals everyone to continue moving forward. Art attempts to inquire about what they were discussing, but the queen interrupts him before he can begin speaking. After a long walk, the group finally arrives at a waterfall. 
This is where Rinia's home is. She presses a secret button on a boulder. This opens up a cave behind the waterfall. Before entering, she asks everyone not to conjure any light, and they will have to make their way through in the dark. After making their way through the darkened cave, they finally arrive at her house. They all enjoy a nice cup of tea while sitting beside the fireplace. Rinia's deviant magic allows her to make her house bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, much like what you see in Harry Potter. Art wonders what kind of magic allows her to do that. Something strange starts to happen as the group continues to sip down on the delicious tea. They slowly start to become woozy and eventually fall asleep. This happens to everyone except Art. However, he doesn't let it bother him and continues drinking his tea. Rinia becomes surprised that Art isn't more alarmed by this. He reveals that he has been in this situation a few times already so it's hard to be surprised anymore. It's obvious to him that she wants to tell him something that only he can know. He is right, but before she informs him that, she wants to clarify her powers as a diviner. He is surprised by this as he has never heard of such a magic user. Even the book at the Exiris Academy barely mentions such a form of deviant magic since it's so rare. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for him to learn about divination magic. Rinia begins the explanation by telling him about deviant magic. Deviants other than those who make use of the higher forms of basic elements have to find sources other than their mana core to fuel their magic. This is different from normal mages who use the mana particles in the surrounding environment. Alice is an example of a deviant magic user who doesn't use the higher form of basic elements. Her healing magic can't be categorized into the basic elements. Rinia has met many deviants in her lifetime, each with their unique deviant magic. One thing they all have in common is their own pool of mana. They draw upon it to power their magic. This is different from a normal deviant magic user such as Art. For diviners such as Rinia, their powers develop differently. They can awaken at any point in their lives and most of the time come in erratic bursts. They receive blurred images of the future in flashes. However, most of the time, they are too vague to make any accurate predictions. These flashes don't use their mana pool and happen randomly. It's not a very useful power if one can't control it. Art wonders about the spell she used to help him communicate with his parents all those years ago. She replies by telling him that it was one of her spells as a diviner that allowed her to project an image. True divination is about reading the future, knowing what and when something will happen before it takes place. Art becomes confused by all this. He wants to know how she is able to power her magic if she doesn't make use of her mana core. In a startling revelation, she discloses that she utilizes her lifespan. Every time she glimpses into the future, it reduces her own life expectancy. That is the true power of a diviner. She also decides to inform him about something that he has been longing to know. She tells him about Varian's wife and the previous queen of Eleanor. Her name was Lania. She was also a diviner, but her powers surpassed Rinia's by far. Her divinations and prophecies were significantly more extensive and detailed. They were also more frequent. This combined with her radiant beauty made her the most sought after in the entire kingdom. She held the envy and admiration of every female elf. Lania was the pride of the kingdom, and the citizens idolized her. After her encounter with Varian, the two quickly fell in love and got married in a beautiful ceremony. Everything seemed to be perfect for the two lovers. However, fate had other plans. The war between the humans and the elves was nearing its end. There was even talk about a peace treaty. However, tensions were still strong. The elves suspected that the humans wanted to make a show of their strength one last time, and they were right. The king of Sapin at the time wanted to carry out one final act of hostility against the future heir to the elven throne. This resulted in Virian being the target of an assassination. Lania was tormented by the vision of her husband's impending death. However, her prophecies didn't tell her how he was going to die. She tried everything to change the future. However, whenever she tried to intervene, she would only succeed in changing the cause of death. Virian could see the toll of his taking on his wife and begged her to stop. However, she couldn't leave her beloved to die, and so she continued to use her powers behind his back. Even just using her powers once, Rinia can feel the days, weeks, or even months that drain out of her body. But Lania used her powers daily, all to protect the one she loved. In the end, she was able to keep Virian alive long enough for the current king Glader to carry out a revolt against his father. He killed his father and managed to put an end to the war. Lania had finally succeeded, but she burned up most of her lifespan in the process. Hence, she died in Virian's arms only a few weeks after the war ended. Rinia hated Virian for a long time because of this. She also hated her sister for leaving her alone in this world, 
revealing that Lenia was her sister. After hearing all this, Art is left shocked. Virian is so cheerful and loves joking around, so he never expected that he had such a tragic past. Sylvie is the first one to wake up and starts listening in on their conversation. Rinia makes it clear that she didn't tell him all this to garner sympathy. She told him this because she has used the same powers her sister used to look into Art's future. He's surprised by this revelation. He wonders why she specifically chose to use her powers on him. She reveals that she was getting glimpses of Art's future even before they met. Naturally, it's not very common to have so many visions of a specific person in a row. She warns him that Decathan is entering a new era. Things are quickly changing, and he seems to be at the center of all of this. Art's mind is filled with questions. He wonders why it's him. Rinia hesitates to tell him more, even though she knows the answer because of her powers of divination. Telling him too much can affect the outcomes that Art wants. At the same time, telling him too little would defeat the purpose of searching for a better outcome, which is the whole purpose of this meeting. Art becomes concerned that she is using up her lifespan while using her powers. He asks her if Virian knows this. She informs him that there is no need for him to know. She has lived long enough, and now she wants to help the future even if it comes at the cost of her lifespan. However, while trying to look into the future, it seems she has made some troublesome enemies. These enemies don't want her to help Art. This is also the reason why she decided to move to this remote hideout. Art becomes concerned for her, but she reassures him that it was her choice. She comes bearing bad news, but for now, all she can tell him is that he will face many hardships. This fact will remain constant no matter what path he chooses. He'll have to face many enemies and obstacles in his journey. Even though she can't tell him much, she decides to give him a small hint. She tells him that he needs an end goal. He needs to find out what he wants to accomplish in his life. This will determine his path. Before ending their conversation, she decides to give him two pieces of advice. Firstly, people do bad things with good intentions, so he shouldn't take everything at face value. And second, the most dangerous isn't necessarily the one who sits on the throne. Sometimes it's the abandoned soldier who has nothing to lose. She apologizes as she cannot disclose anything more without risking the future. Art becomes worried about whether he will be able to make the right choice or not. Rinia offers him solace and explains that sometimes the best choice may not necessarily be the right one. With this vague advice, they end their conversation and prepare to go to sleep for the night. Elsewhere in a jungle outside Xyrus Academy, Lucas along with three other members of the cult is carrying out a mission. Lucas has been given the same potion that was given to Marcois. Charles informs him that Marcois took it willingly, but his body couldn't handle it. In typical Lucas fashion, he makes fun of Charles and the other two members for not getting selected to take the potion. Lucas knows the reason behind this. It's because their mana core is weaker than his. If they were to take the potion, they would die the moment it entered their bodies. Charles gets angry at Lucas for wasting time and asks him to hurry up. As always, he doesn't take kindly to anyone telling him what to do. He instantly attacks Charles with his fire magic. He reminds him to stay in his place as he is only a messenger boy. Lucas finally decides to take the potion and gulps it down in one go. He instantly starts feeling the effects. He feels intense pain and is forced to get on his knees. The three members take delight in his suffering and start making fun of him for being weak. Thinking he is about to die, Charles even goes as far as to step on his face. This is a mistake he will soon come to regret. Shortly after, Lucas recovers from his pain and grabs Charles' leg. He uses a powerful fire magic to completely burn him. He finishes his attack by sending him flying through the air towards a tree. He is dumbfounded upon seeing his new powers. At this moment, he is reminded of the conversation he had with his brother in the hallway. His brother harshly lectured him about relying on their parents' money to grow stronger while not making any effort himself. Now that he has this power, he can show them all how strong he is. These are the thoughts that enter his mind as he transforms into something akin to a monster. Realizing the danger they are in, one of the members tries to make a run for it. His attempt fails horribly as Lucas is easily able to attack him from behind with his fire magic. The member is roasted alive, to the point where only his ashes remain. Seeing this, the other member becomes furious and tries to attack Lucas with her water magic. However, her magic doesn't even compare to the level where Lucas is at. Her water bullets instantly evaporate due to the intense heat that he's producing. He lunges at her, seizes her by the throat, and using his momentum, smashes her against the ground. The intense heat starts to burn her alive. With her completely burnt throat, she can't even find the words to beg for her life. 
Lucas finishes her off as well and proceeds to the last remaining member. Seeing how brutally the others were killed, Charles can do nothing but cower beside the tree. He can do nothing as Lucas slowly reaches his hand out towards him, intending to kill him. We can only imagine the horrible way he met his end as well. It's the next day and the Elden family has finally awoken from their peaceful slumber. They seem refreshed after a nice long nap. This was long overdue for the overworked family. Rinia apologizes for putting the calming herbs in their tea. She makes up the excuse that she didn't think that it would knock them out. Alduin tells her that it's alright since they needed it anyway. Virian, on the other hand, isn't too happy about it. His long nap made him miss all the urgent business he needed to take care of. Rinia tries to tease him by telling him that his only urgent business is dealing with the mess he made of the royal palace. However, Virian quickly shuts her up with a broccoli. Putting that aside, Rinia brings out a gift she had prepared for Tessia. She already knew that Tessia needed something to help her with her beast will, so she prepared something in advance. It's an artifact that concealed the user's mana. This is exactly what Art and Virian were talking about. Art is surprised that she already knew. However, this is something very normal for the royal family by now, after having known Rinia for so long. Alduin thanks Rinia for always looking out for his daughter. She assures him that it's no big deal and suggests that they should enjoy the evening, as Art and Tessia will be leaving for Xara City soon. After having a wonderful time at Rinia's house, it's finally time to leave. She takes everyone to a teleportation gate, not far from her house. Teleportation gates have been around since ancient times and are under tight regulation by the kingdom. But I guess one can get away with a lot of things when they are friends with the royal family. Tessia hugs her parents goodbye. She also gives a long hug to Rinia. After the goodbyes are over, they make their way through the teleportation gate and arrive in Exire City. Tessia is surprised to see the lack of guards. However, Art tells her that it's probably because of the Aurora Constellate. She's also mesmerized by the beautiful night sky. No matter how many times she sees it, she still can't help but be amazed. The two of them arrive at Helstie's mansion to visit Art's family. Upon their arrival, Art is pleasantly surprised by the unexpected guests. It's none other than Jasmine and the rest of the Twin Orn members. Despite all this time, they are still as goofy as always. I guess some things never change, but Art couldn't be happier seeing them like this. Speaking of things not changing, he gets the same greeting from Angela as he did when he was a kid. Tessia also gets some of her love. Ray, Alice, and Ellie also come out to meet their son. Now that everyone is here, they decide to go in to celebrate. However, before they could head in, Tessia lets everyone know that she needs to get going. She only came to say hello, and besides she needs to catch up on her work as the student council president and meet Cynthia as well. Art worries that there might be something wrong, but she reassures him that she just simply wants Cynthia's help to adjust her new artifact. Art realizes that he shouldn't leave her alone since she can't use most of her magic right now. However, she insists that she will be fine, so he agrees to let her go. After bidding farewell to everyone, she sets off for Xyrus Academy. Back at the house, the adults start drinking and celebrating. However, soon things take a turn for the worse. But it is to be expected when a bunch of adults start drinking with no regard for restraint. Helen asks him if he would like to head out for some fresh air. Art quickly jumps at the opportunity to escape this weirdness. She tells him that he is meant for bigger things. All he needs to do is stay anchored and find what he is fighting for. He instantly realizes that these are the same words that Rinia told him. Considering her divination abilities, it can't be a coincidence. Art decides not to bring that up and continues the conversation. After a wholesome chat, Helen decides to head back in. He can't help but think about what she told him. Although he doesn't know why he was brought into this world, he refuses to believe that it was only to be a pawn in someone else's game. Protecting the smiles and laughter of the people he cherishes, that's the fate he wants to make. Back at the underground cave, the cult members are preparing for their attack on the Exiris Academy. Using a teleportation portal, the leader summons a massive army of abnormal mana beasts. The DC members are busy preparing a barrier. They are already aware that the cultists could launch an all-out attack at any time. Hence, they are preparing by putting up a protective barrier. Kai is the one setting up the barrier while everyone else warms up. Dordri seems to be the only one missing. The training freak arrives soon after with a bunch of mana resistance bands. However, she takes a nasty tumble as soon as she enters the room. Curtis suggests that they shouldn't be wasting their mana just before the start of a potential battle. However, Claire reminds him that she means well. Now that they are all here, Theo tells Kai to activate the barrier. The barrier gets activated with everyone inside except for Kai. 
They soon realize that there is something wrong as the barrier is red. On top of that, they are unable to leave and seem to be trapped. Curtis tells Kai to turn the barrier off, not realizing that they have been betrayed. Even Farrah thinks that it's all a joke, however, they don't get any response from him. They still don't want to consider that possibility and think that maybe he can't hear them because of the barrier. Theo tries to smash through the barrier, but it obviously doesn't work. Kathleen tells everyone to stop wasting mana and reminds them that there is an emergency kill switch that they can use to deactivate the barrier from the inside. It shouldn't be much of a shock as the kill switch has already been broken. The DC officers finally realize the gravity of the situation. The situation takes a turn for the worse as they find themselves facing an all-out attack by the cultists. The DC officers quickly get into formation and prepare themselves to counter the incoming assault. They prove their worth as DC officers by slowly taking out the cultists. Surprisingly, they still haven't caught on to Kai's betrayal as Claire orders everyone to slowly start moving forward so they can help Kai. However, their momentum comes to a screeching halt with the arrival of Lucas. He finally breaks the news about how it was Kai who trapped them inside in the first place. Even when faced with reality, they are unable to accept it due to their blind trust in their friend. Lucas, on the other hand, doesn't care what they want to believe and starts his attack on the DC officers. He dashes in and launches a powerful attack, sending everyone flying. Claire tries to attack him from behind but is nearly taken out by Lucas's spell. She is saved just in time by Dordria. In a stroke of luck, Claire spots one of the mana resistance bands that Dordria brought in earlier. It seems to have interfered with the barrier formation, creating an opening through which they can escape. Claire relays this to Dordria. If they can gather everyone at that spot, they can escape before Lucas has a chance to stop them. However, this is easier said than done as Lucas's magic is on a completely different level right now. Despite Theo using his best magic against him, he remains unfazed and grabs him by the throat. Just when it seems like the worst is about to happen to Theo, he is saved by another stroke of luck. As Lucas gets an alert on his communication device, it informs him of Tessia's arrival. Excited by this, he leaves to grab Tessio while the rest of the cultists deal with the DC officers. Now that Lucas is gone, the DC officers have the perfect opportunity to escape. Realizing this, Claire orders everyone to use defensive spells so they can get out. Following her order, everyone launches their most powerful defensive spells to hold back the cultists. It works and they are able to create an opening big enough for them to escape. However, the cultists don't back down and try to chase after them. Realizing this, Dordria decides to stay back to ensure that her comrades make it out safely. However, she finds herself outmatched by the enemy. Just as she is about to be taken out, she is saved by Ferrith. It seems he didn't want to leave a friend behind, so he decided to stay as well. Now the two of them find themselves against an entire army. The rest of the DC officers manage to escape and try to quickly make their way out of the building. They hope to find a professor so they can help their friends. However, upon exiting the building, they are left completely horrified. The entire campus is under attack by the abnormal mana beasts. Elsewhere, Tessia is making her way to the Exiris Academy in her carriage. She didn't want to worry Art, but she feels like her body is out of sync right now. Her mana core is completely exhausted. She is going to the Academy with the hope that Cynthia can help her figure this out. However, her chain of thought is interrupted by a sudden stop. They have arrived at the Academy, but it seems to be completely sealed off because of the barrier. Before she could try and head back, her carriage along with the driver get blown away by a powerful fire attack. Only one person can produce such powerful fire magic, and as expected it's none other than Lucas. Tessia is shocked to see him. He, on the other hand, couldn't be happier to see her all alone and defenseless. It's finally time for him to get his revenge. Lucas begins to burn the driver alive, even in her weakened state. Tessia tries to put out the flames in order to rescue him. However, her efforts are in vain as Lucas finishes him off with a powerful fire attack. He tells her to worry about herself instead of a lowly commoner. This gets her enraged, and she begins attacking him. Due to her strength, her attacks seem to be somewhat effective. However, because of the ceiling bracelet, she's unable to use all her strength. Lucas realizes this and boldly walks forward while Tessia is barely able to stay focused. Although Rinia's bracelet is keeping her beast will in check, it is also limiting her use of magic. Lucas grabs her and lifts her off the ground. He remarks that maybe she will like him better than Art. However, from this Tessia is instantly able to deduce what Lucas's plan is. She realizes that the fact that he is not killing her means that she is not the intended target. 
Using the same drug as Marcois, tracking her down, she realizes that all this could mean one thing, that he is after Art. Lucas gets angry and smashes her into the ground. However, Tessia is undeterred. She goes on about how he has an inferiority complex. However, she only succeeds in growing Lucas's rage, and he continues attacking her. He warns her against using her snarky comments, telling her that keeping her alive doesn't necessarily mean that she will be in one piece. She is once again unfazed. She has realized how hopeless her situation is and hence decides to take extreme measures. She takes off Rinia's bracelet and lets her beast will go wild. Lucas is caught off guard and she manages to grab hold of him using her vines. She doesn't want to get Art in trouble, so she wants to hold on as long as possible without being captured. However, her desperate effort fails to work against Lucas's powerful magic. He's able to burn all the vines with one burst of his fire magic. This also knocks her unconscious. Lucas grabs the bracelet and puts it back on her. This way he can be sure that she won't use the same crazy magic again. He grabs the nearly conscious Tessia by the hair and begins dragging her into the barrier. She is unable to move her body and can only watch helplessly as the mana beasts rip apart the students right in front of her. Elijah is also among the students trapped within the barrier. He uses his earth magic to protect the students whenever he can. However, there is only so much one person can do by themselves. The cultists announce to all the human students to surrender themselves and swear their allegiance. If they do so, then they ensure that they will not be attacked by the mana beasts. Elves and dwarves are not given this privilege. All they can do is quietly stand aside while their mana core is completely destroyed. All Elijah can do is sneak around and try to find help. However, luck is not on his side as even some of the professors are part of the cult. He can do little against someone as strong as a professor. He is rescued just in time by Grotter. Seeing Elijah and Curtis fighting together, the professor has no option but to flee. Curtis quickly instructs the student to make her way to the training facility. There are still some good professors who can help them. Elijah asks him about the rest of the DC officers. He is particularly concerned about Art and Tessia. He is relieved when Curtis informs him that they are not on campus. Little do they know the reality of the situation. Their conversation is interrupted by a screeching noise. It's the same static you hear from a microphone. The leader of the cultist has finally arrived. He makes his way to the center of the academy while carrying a bloody bag with him. With one look it's obvious what the bag contains. He tells everyone to pay attention as this is not something they would want to miss. All the concerned parents arrive on the scene, worried about their kids since they can't seem to be able to contact them. Nevertheless, their path is obstructed by members of the Mages Guild. They are working together with the Artificers Guild relentlessly to try and break the barrier. However, despite all their efforts, they don't find any success. The Artificers are unable to break through the barrier with the artifacts they have currently available. They have tried to contact the Artificers Guild branch in Ediston, but they seem to be preoccupied with their own problems. An Artificer proposes that the Mages Guild should contact one of the Lances for backup as they should be able to break the barrier easily with their strength. Unfortunately, all the Lances are currently preoccupied with other incidents happening throughout the continent. The Artificer accurately deduces that this points to a coordinated attack. However, the mage quickly quiets him down to avoid causing panic among the parents. Putting that aside, the Artificer's Guild is currently trying to find a weak spot on the barrier. In the meantime, all they can do is continue their efforts and pray that they are not too late. Meanwhile, inside the barrier, the cultists have trapped all the students. The Professor is providing first aid to the injured ones, and everyone else can only wait for their uncertain fate. This is when the leader of the cultists finally makes his appearance while carrying a bloody bag in his hand. The students try desperately to attack him. However, their efforts are in vain as they are too weak to even put a dent in the barrier. The leader cannot help but laugh at their feeble attempts. He mocks them for still not understanding how helpless their situation is. To drive this point home, he puts out the contents of the bloody bag and tosses it towards the students. All of them are left shocked to see that it's a decapitated head. However, what's truly horrifying is that it's none other than Dordria. Elijah is unable to stomach what he is witnessing and ends up throwing up. Theo becomes furious and quickly makes his way over. He is unable to hold back his tears upon seeing his lifeless friend. Outraged by this, he challenges the leader to a fight, calling him a coward for hiding behind his mana barrier. He is deeply offended by being labeled a coward. He finally takes off his mask and also reveals his name to be Drenny. He walks over to the edge of the barrier where Theo is standing and pulls him inside as a way of accepting his challenge. Theo is flung into the air, 
but he quickly regains his footing using his gravity magic. With his rage reaching a boiling point, he charges directly towards Draenei intending to kill him. He jumps into the air in an attempt to land a powerful axe kick. There is a loud boom as the attack makes contact. The entire area becomes filled with dust, so no one is able to make out what really happened. However, all the students confidently cheer Theo on, as they believe that not even a professor could have survived such a powerful attack. Their hopes are dashed as the dust finally clears, and they are able to see that it is Theo who is on the ground, writhing in pain with a broken leg. Drenev steps on his face and mocks him for daring to challenge him. However, he is not done yet. With a snap of his finger, he starts burning Theo alive with his fire magic. However, he makes sure that Theo is alive to ensure maximum pain. The student council, including Lilia, is left horrified by the gut-wrenching sight. Having dealt with this minor inconvenience, he announces the commencement of the main event. Right on cue, the cultists bring out students from different races. This includes Ferrith, who is heavily injured. Elijah is shocked to his core as Lucas finally makes his appearance. This is because he is dragging Tessia behind him. Just like Theo, Curtis finds it impossible to restrain himself as he watches his friends being killed. Claire is compelled to hold him back because she understands that he isn't strong enough to confront Draenei and will likely end up injured, much like their friend. However, Claire's words only get him angrier as he doesn't want to see Theo and Ferrith end up the same way as Doradria. Out of nowhere, Kathleen steps in and slaps him across the face to bring some sense into him. Although she is just as heartbroken as Curtis at seeing her friends get hurt, she points out that they need a solid plan to rescue everyone. If they charge in recklessly, then they will only get themselves killed which will help no one. His sister's words finally bring him back to his senses, and he is able to calm down. Inside the barrier, the cultists force all the captured students to get on their knees, similar to the way when someone is about to be executed. Elijah is most concerned about Tessia. He wonders why she's here when she wasn't even supposed to be in the school. Now that Draenid has everyone's attention, he finally begins his speech by introducing himself to everyone. He tells them that he has come to rescue them. After taking a seat on a throne he conjures with his fire magic, he elaborates that he has come from a faraway land, one that is cruel to the weak. The students of the Exarius Academy are considered the most elite in Decathan. But in Alacria, they would all be trash. He finally reveals the reason for this attack. He has come to select worthy students. When the ruler of Alacria finally takes over Decathan as its new ruler, these chosen few will have a place in his kingdom. He tries to entice them with a promise of an unparalleled power that they have never experienced before. As a demonstration he calls forth Lucas who steps forward and takes off his hoodie, revealing his monstrous self to all the students. Elijah becomes completely enraged at seeing Lucas betraying them once again. Seeing Elijah so angry, he can't help but smile. To mock him even further, he gets closer to Tessia. Elijah becomes so aggravated that he is unable to contain his killing intent towards Lucas. His body becomes surrounded by a dark aura. Even Draenei is shocked to see this. The dark aura continues to grow even stronger with his growing rage. Elijah is unable to control it, and he unintentionally starts attacking the students around him. His eyes start to glow red, and the dark aura takes the shape of a purple flame all over his body. He effortlessly breaks through the barrier with his newfound power and starts walking towards Lucas. Seeing this, all the mana beasts in the area charge toward him in an attempt to stop him. However, the tables have now turned as Elijah is easily able to kill all of them with just a simple gesture with his hands. Despite the pain, fear welling up inside, and the uncertainty of the situation, the only thing on his mind at this moment is killing Lucas. However, whatever this is, it starts taking its toll on his body. He falls to his knees and starts bleeding from his eyes and nose. He is still undeterred and attacks Lucas with his strange new magic. Due to his weakened state, the attack lands on Lucas's shoulder and it turns out to be non-fatal. Due to the strain on his body, Elijah starts falling unconscious as the magic begins to wear out. However, before he can fall to the ground, he is caught by none other than Drenny. It seems like he has found his first chosen student. Humility, loyalty, resoluteness, and courage were the words that Claire was taught even before she was old enough to speak. They represent the four qualities every blade heart needs to have. All her life, she truly believed that she would follow this sacred doctrine, no matter what happened. However, faced with this horror, she finds herself unable to follow through on these morals. With the barrier finally broken, this is the perfect opportunity to attack the cultist and rescue Theo and Ferrith. 
However, after witnessing Draineve's terrifying power, she is unable to move her body due to fear. Before she can take any action, one of the professors beats her to it. Despite his wounds, Professor Grenner bravely steps forward to attack the cultists while they have this chance. Seeing his determination, Professor Glory also volunteers to help him. Watching the professors boldly walk into the barrier, the only thought that enters Claire's mind is that they are fools walking to their deaths. The disciplinary committee and the student council assemble, awaiting instructions on whether they should accompany the professors or not. However, Claire still hasn't shaken off the fear that has struck her mind. She hesitates to give them any orders as she doesn't want to throw away her life and would rather just let the professors deal with it. However, at that moment, she opts to cast a glance back at the battlefield where Theo and Doradria are lying flat on the ground. Her gaze then shifts to the professors as they continue to advance. Professor Glory notices this and returns a kind, gentle smile full of hope. Watching this, Claire is reminded of everything she has been taught. Finally, she gives everyone their new orders. Those who are injured or scared can stay behind. The rest will fight for Xyrus. She uses her fire magic to conjure a blade, while at the same time, lighting a new burning flame inside her heart as well. Drenev informs Lucas that there has been a change of plans. He has decided to retreat and orders Lucas to follow behind him after taking out all of the professors. The cultists follow their leader's orders and start gathering the captured students to take them back. Lucas gets frustrated when he sees Drenev carrying Elijah with him. He tries to question him about it. However, he unleashes his terrifying power to assert his leadership over Lucas, solidifying that Lucas is merely a tool beneath him. With that demonstration, Draineve makes his exit while reminding Lucas not to disappoint him. The professors finally arrive and begin their attack on the cultists. They try to attack Draineve as well, to stop him from leaving. However, their attacks are intercepted by Lucas. He is easily able to stop their attack and prepares his counterattack. Professor Glory joins the battle as well and uses her bond to stop the flames. After watching her students and fellow comrades being killed, she is ready to take her revenge. The rest of the cultists mount an attack of their own. They all gather and try to ambush Professor Glory. Despite her burning desire for revenge, even she won't be able to handle so many enemies on her own. Just as they are about to strike, they are all taken out by a barrage of blows. The source of this assault is the disciplinary committee and the student council. They too have come to join the fight. Professor Glory tells them to get away and save themselves. However, with a new fire burning inside her, Claire refuses to do so. Sensing this, the professor accepts their help but still reminds them to be careful. In the chaos of the battle, Claire notices something with the uniform of the disciplinary committee. She instantly realizes that it is none other than Kai. In her rage, she ignores everyone else and heads straight for him. The other cultists try to stop her with their earth magic, but she continues dodging them and charges towards him. Seeing this, Kai finally decides to take action. He uses his strings and easily manages to immobilize her. Even in this state, her rage doesn't cool down and she yells at him about how he can do this to Theo and Doradria. Her screaming stops as she is suddenly struck in the back by something. She doesn't realize what is going on. All she can think about is how they can't allow Draneve to escape. A few moments later, she can see Curtis and Kathleen rushing toward her with horrified expressions. She tries to tell them to go after Kai, but she is unable to speak and instead coughs up blood. When she looks down, she finally realizes what has happened. She has been pierced clean through with a spike. Curtis arrives and reassures her that he will get her help. He is interrupted by a powerful roar from a powerful mana beast. Everyone's eyes turn towards its direction. They all know that it can only be one person. He has finally arrived, along with Sylvie. Having two horns as sharp as swords with crystalline scales, and eyes beaming with power that would make even a veteran adventurer freeze in place. This is how awe-inspiring the dragon was. However, what was even more terrifying was the boy walking in front of her. With every step, there was an unshakable confidence and a fierce blatant rage. At that moment, Claire's only regret was not being able to see Lucas's terrified and defeated expression. With Drani's elixir, he has achieved something that was considered beyond the capabilities of a normal mage. He has heightened cognitive processing and reflexes for higher levels of spell casting. On top of that, he has an unlimited pool of mana to draw from. However, despite all this, he cannot shake the feeling of fear when facing Art. It's as if there is an icy claw that is gripping him from the inside. Trying to hide these feelings, he puts on a brave face, telling Art that there is no way he can beat him when not even the esteemed professors of the Osiris Academy can do so. 
Art ignores him completely and walks past him. He goes to check up on Tessia, who is lying behind him. Lucas becomes enraged at being ignored. The other cultists cannot believe their eyes as they witness a dragon in the flesh. After checking her, Art is relieved to realize that Tessia is just unconscious because of some drug that she has been given. Other than a few cuts and bruises, she is completely fine. Now the only thing left to do is deal with the blabbering fool standing behind him. Lucas continues to taunt him, threatening to make him watch as he cripples her right before his eyes. Sylvie gets angry upon hearing this and lets out a powerful roar. However, Art is unshaken and continues to ignore him. Lucas feels insulted upon being ignored by someone he considers nothing more than a mere peasant. Becoming enraged, he starts walking towards Art. Once again, he gets the same feeling he got before. It's like there is an invisible demon holding him down. This presence instills more fear in him than the esteemed professors of the Exiris Academy, even more so than his brother. Art finally starts to speak. He lets Lucas know that he always thought of him as a wasp that he deemed unnecessary to kill. However, when that wasp pulls out its stinger, even the holiest saint would swat it down without a second thought. Seeing the expression on Art's face, Lucas is left terror-struck. The invisible hands grow bigger as they hold him down with even more force. He starts to seethe with anger at his own weakness and conjures a massive fire attack. He launches a powerful attack called Hell's Rain directly toward his enemy. Art unleashes his dragon's will in preparation to counter the incoming attack. Using his ice magic, he is able to effortlessly nullify the fire attack. Lucas is left shocked as Art slowly makes his way towards him. He is surprised to see that Art can use ice magic as well. Lucas once again attacks him, this time forming a trident with his fire magic and launching it toward him. Art responds by conjuring two attacks, one in each hand. On his right hand, he forms black lightning while on his left hand, he forms an ice attack. He catches the trident using his left hand. This way the ice magic instantly nullifies the fire magic. With his other hand, he launches a powerful lightning spell toward Lucas. This attack is too fast for him to react to and it ends up slicing his left arm completely off. He can do nothing but scream in pain as Art continues walking towards him. After finally reaching him, Art lifts him off the ground while grabbing him with his left hand. Because of this, Lucas's right arm gets completely frozen by ice and eventually breaks off. He can't do anything but scream and cry because of the pain. Even after taking both of his arms, Art is not finished. He places his foot on his leg and employs a gravity spell called Downforce to completely crush it. Despite all this, Lucas continues to mock Art, telling him that Dreneve took the fool that he calls his best friend. However, Art doesn't care about what he says and proceeds to take the final leg as well. With all his limbs gone, Art places his leg on his groin. He wants to make sure that Lucas's filth doesn't spread. Upon realizing that he is about to die, he starts baiting for his life. However, Art has no sympathy for him. He wishes him to suffer in his next life as well before finally using his downforce spell once again. The looks that Art gets from others are something that he has experienced in his previous life. It's the look that everyone has in the face of domineering strength, the look of fear, shock, and awe. Art had forgotten how lonely it was to be at the top. With his beast will finally wearing off, he starts to feel the usual backlash. Unfortunately for him, his situation gets much worse as the lances finally arrive. This also includes Lucas's brother, Baron. Upon seeing the state of his dead brother, he is unable to control his anger. He launches a powerful lightning spell towards Art and Sylvie. Unable to defend himself due to his weakened state, all Art can do is tell Sylvie to get out of the way. His warning works as Sylvie manages to dodge it just in time. However, Art is not so lucky and gets hit by the spell. Angered by this, Sylvie charges straight towards Baron. Art tries to tell her not to attack because he knows that they are not strong enough to beat the lances. However, Sylvie's anger blinds her to any reasoning and she continues her attack anyway. As expected, she is easily immobilized by Lance Verre as she uses her ice magic. Lance Alfred, on the other hand, uses his magma magic to form golems to assist with the rescue. However, Art is not out of the woods yet. He lies injured on the ground after being hit by the attack. Baron walks over, prepared to finish him off with his next attack. Just as he is about to fire his spell, he is stopped by Lance Alfred. He orders Baron not to lay a hand on him. Blinded by rage, Baron shoves his hand away, telling him that Art killed his brother so he must suffer. He even goes as far as to threaten Lance Alfred if he continues to go against him. Alfred doesn't take kindly to his threat and reminds him that Art saved everyone here from Lucas. 
Baron refuses to believe it and goes ahead to finish Art all the same. Alfred is forced to take extreme measures and uses two of his magma golems to pin him down. This only succeeds in increasing Baron's rage, and he launches a powerful attack that blows the two golems away. It seems like there is nothing that can save Art at this point. Just as he fires the spell, a huge wall of ice suddenly erects between Art and Baron. It stops the spell, saving Art from certain death. This is followed by ice swords that completely pin Baron to the ground. The mage responsible for this is none other than Lance Veray, the leader of the Lances. She reminds Baron that it's the Council's job to determine what will happen to Art and Sylvie. Unlike Alfred, Baron doesn't dare defy her orders and instantly agrees to step down. After a while, the rescue teams finally arrive, and the mages begin healing all the injured students. Some parents are relieved to see that their kids are safe, while others have to deal with the devastating loss of their family. This also includes Dordria's parents. Art also receives medical attention for his injuries. Afterward, he is visited by Lance Veray, who informs him that he will need to be handcuffed. Having no other choice, he complies and puts on the cuffs without any resistance. Just to make sure he doesn't escape, Lance Ferre seals away Art's monochord to prevent him from using magic. He requests that she do the same for Sylvie so she can be more comfortable. Ferre is shocked to learn that Art's bond is a dragon. Nevertheless, she agrees to Art's request and releases Sylvie from her ice magic. Sylvie is still angry at the lances, but he once again reminds her that they can't win as they are right now. This time she agrees to do as Art says and turns back to her fox form. She is worried about what will happen to them, but this is something that even Art doesn't know the answer to. However, he assures her that they will be fine. Art is taken in chains along with Sylvie. He is being taken to the Mage Guild's camp while they wait for the Council's decision. Rumors have already begun flying around about how Art killed a student from one of the most influential families in all of Decathlon. Even though everyone knows that Lucas was part of the terrorist group, they still question the brutal way that he met his end. Art's family also arrives at the Exiris Academy, he asks for permission from Lance Ferrey to go see them. This is much to the annoyance of Baron, who is still angry at Art for killing his brother. Lance Alfred tries to calm him down by pointing out the fact that what Art did was necessary to protect the students. Alice has a lot of questions for Art, like what happened at the school and why he is in handcuffs. In return, he gives her a warm smile and tells her that he will only be gone for a while. Despite this, Alice can't help but break down in tears seeing her son like this. A few minutes pass and Lance Veray's ring starts glowing, indicating that the council has finally made its decision. Art is brought to the center of the crowd and Lance Veray starts reading out the decision from a scroll. The council has decreed that, due to displaying excessive violence and the inconclusive circumstances involved, Art's monochord is to be restrained and his title as a mage to be stripped. He will also be imprisoned until further judgment. Art is very disappointed to hear this more for the worries that he has provided his family than the actual punishment he has to face. The whispers start once again. As expected, Alice is completely distraught upon hearing that her son is being sent to jail. The same goes for Ray. The surviving students have mixed reactions, with some believing that he is a hero who saved everyone while others believe that he got what he deserved. Kathleen is furious upon hearing this and walks up to Lance Ferre to confront her directly. She threatens to tell her parents, the king and queen, and make sure to have it rescinded. However, she is stopped in her tracks when Vare shows her the scroll, revealing that king and queen Glader voted in favor of this judgment. The king and queen of the dwarves also agreed to it. Kathleen is in total disbelief. Curtis consoles her and lets her know that there is nothing they can do right now. Art also realizes that there is no use trying to reason with the lances if two kingdoms voted in favor of this decision. He also realizes that everyone must have the wrong impression of him. Perhaps they think it was him who was behind the attack. Before they leave, Art requests Lance Verre to allow him to see his family one last time. She agrees to it, and he walks over to the gate of the school to see his parents. Even though he doesn't believe it himself, he lets them know not to worry and assures them that it's just a misunderstanding that will be cleared up soon. However, once again, Alice is able to see right through his deception. The next one to speak up is Ellie. She is worried about her brother as well, but can't seem to find the words to express it. Art pats her on the head. He wishes that he had spent more time with her. Same as before, he assures her that he will only be gone for a little bit. He assures everyone that he will certainly return, and with that, he starts heading back. Before he can leave, Ray calls out to him. He lets him know that no matter what happens, his family will always be on his side. 
He is brought to tears by his father's words, but he continues walking all the same. The lances are busy coming up with a strategy on how to proceed. As soon as Art arrives, they stop their meeting and proceed with whatever plan they come up with. Baron starts walking toward his brother's body. As he passes by Art, he gives him a scornful look. He picks up Lucas's body and flies away using his lightning magic. Lance Ferret and Alfred proceed with their own plan to escort Art. Alfred conjures up a stingray using his magma magic. The golems help Art as he tries to get on. After everything is ready, all of them fly off to the location where Art is going to be kept. Baron, on the other hand, arrives at the Wyke's mansion. He is greeted by all the servants upon landing. He kicks through the front gate, startling everyone. The maids are surprised at seeing what Baron is carrying in his arms. With an angry expression, he orders the maids to call his father at once. After waiting for a while, he finally gets to meet his father. He explains everything that happened. However, instead of being sad at the news of his son's passing, Baron's father is angry and screams out in frustration about how Lucas is an embarrassment to the family. He is more concerned about the reputation of his family name and all the investment he put into making Lucas as strong as he was. He goes as far as to get furious at Baron for bringing this worthless fool back to his house. To have a failure such as Lucas in his house is the same as defilement to him. He tries to slap Baron for this offense, but he stops him from doing so. He reminds his father that he is a lance now, so this sort of behavior is unacceptable. However, his father is quick to remind him that he is a lance only because of the Wyke's family name. Baron continues the story about how Lucas terrorized the school alongside a cult led by a man named Draneve. He also mentioned how he was brutally killed, but that is of no interest to this man. After hearing everything, he quickly comes up with a plan. He calls his assistant, Adeline, to the room. She quickly responds and promptly enters. He orders her to write a letter to the council. The content of the message goes something like this. Regarding the regrettable attack on Exiris, my dear son, under the influence of Draneve, undoubtedly had no choice but to obey his commands or lose his life. How a boy so young would be forced to make such a decision, it hurts my heart to imagine. Yet my son died an excessive, brutal death at the hands of a lawless blackguard unfit to continue living in our society. He says all this with a pitifully sad expression on his face. He continues the letter, no other form of repentance than death would be appropriate. After he's done with the letter, he even pressures Baron to agree with what he is saying. Not daring to refuse his father, he nods and agrees with everything. Adeline offers her condolences and leaves the room to deliver the letter. Baron asks his father about what sort of funeral they will have for Lucas. However, he couldn't care less and tells him to have Adeline take care of it. Baron gives him a respectful bow and leaves. Elsewhere, Art continues his journey with the lances. He is riding with Lance Alfred on his stingray. Art tells him that the handcuffs are unnecessary because he isn't stupid enough to try and run away from two lances. Alfred reveals that the cuffs are because they are flying over the beast glades. There are other ways he can cause trouble for them. He is a bit surprised to hear this. He wonders what sort of mana beasts exist in the beast glades that not even a lance can handle. Alfred reminds him that although the lances are powerful, they are still mortal. Beast glades hold many mysteries, and with all the strange things that have been occurring, they don't want to take any risks. There is something that Alfred is curious about as well. He wonders how Art has become such a capable mage at his age. Art inquires about how Alfred has reached that conclusion even though he has never seen him fight. Alfred reveals that he heard many great things about Baron's little brother. Art asks him about what things he specifically heard given the fact that he is still escorting him to prison. Alfred agrees with Art. He probably believes that he is innocent, but it's not up to him. A short while after their conversation ends, they finally arrive at their destination. It's the floating castle of the council. Upon landing on the island, Alfred creates a bridge for them to enter. He uses some dirt that he always carries around with him. He lets Art know that dwarves usually carry a bit of dirt with them. This way he doesn't have to worry about destroying the castle to use his magic. Since no magic can be used inside the castle, Lance Ferret informs Art that they will have to use the stairs. After a long walk, they finally arrive at the inside of the castle. He is reminded of his past life as he walks down these long, empty corridors. Despite their beauty, they exude a sense of loneliness. Art is taken to the council meeting room where the kings and queens of each of the three kingdoms are waiting for them. The feelings about Art are clear on their faces. The king and queen Glader aren't really affected by this since they remain neutral in all this. The dwarven king and queen are visibly angry. It's obvious that they hate him the most, 
While the elven king and queen seem to be nervous, they care for Art and want the best for him. The two lances offer a bow to the council. Art follows their lead and does the same. However, it's not good enough for the dwarven king, Dossid. He wants Art to kneel down since he is a commoner, unlike the lances. Art apologizes and expresses that he is uneducated. But his words are clearly sarcastic, which angers Dossid even further. Before this could get out of hand, King Glader quickly puts a stop to this so they could get started. Lance Viray uncuffs him, and the judgment finally begins. King Alduin starts the proceeding with his speech. Before getting to the official matter, he once again thanks Art not just as a king, but as a father. He is interrupted as the dwarven king angrily slams his fist on the table. The queen also shares her husband's sentiments and lets everyone know that Art violently mutilated a student and shouldn't be thanked in any way. To drive this point home, Dossid brings out the report again and starts reading out the gruesome details of Lucas's death. Alduin stops him before he continues any further. Muriel emphasizes to everyone that Art took the actions he did to save the students of the Osiris Academy. But Dossid isn't convinced. He accuses Art of using the incident as a cover to get revenge on his rival. The exchange between the Dwarven King and the Elven King continues to get heated. Alduin counters this claim by correctly pointing out that these are just speculations without any evidence. Since they don't have evidence for either case, the Dwarven Queen, Glaudera, suggests spearing Art's life, but instead crippling him as a mage by sealing away his monocore. The heated argument continues between the two kings. Muriel decides to involve the king and Queen Glader, hoping that they can also see the sense in letting Art go. However, the queen points out that although she is also thankful to Art as a parent, as rulers they have to consider the Greysender's point of view as well. Alduin can't understand their way of thinking at all. After all, they want to cripple a boy on the off chance that he might turn against them in the future. As the argument continues to intensify, it slowly starts to get personal. Art finally decides to speak up to let his thoughts be known as well, but Dossett is quick to shut him up. Art points out that the whole reason for him being here is so he can defend himself. Glaudera is not one to listen, though, and she orders Alfred to lock him up in the dungeon. However, Alduin lets them know that the council is not for them to run. In his anger, he orders his lance, Aya, to step forward. After losing Alia, the elves only have one lance at their disposal, which is a big disadvantage. Dossid is well aware of this fact. Alduin too is aware, and so despite his anger, he is forced to retake his order. Following Glaudera's order, Art is escorted out of the hall by Alfred's golems. After witnessing everything, he has become well aware of the situation. He now knows that the Dwarven King and Queen are against him. The Gladers are neutral at best. This means he can only depend on Alduin and Muriel to get him out. However, one has to wonder if that would be enough. After locking him in the dungeon cell, Alfred leaves to resume his duties. After a short while, Art hears a voice calling out his name. This is a voice he is much too familiar with. It's none other than Cynthia. She has been imprisoned here for the last seven days. Even the news of the attack in the school was kept from her. Art decides to tell her everything that happened. After all, it is her school. However, one thing that he still didn't understand was why she was locked up here in the first place. Cynthia is grateful to him for letting her know everything. She also apologizes that he had to deal with it on his own. She asks him to let her know more about how Lucas appeared when they were fighting. Art tells her that he was on the same drug that had been going around the school. However, he was different from the rest. Lucas was more powerful, but he wasn't out of control like everyone else. He knew what he was doing. Cynthia also asked him about the leader. The leader had left before Art arrived, so he never got the chance to see his face. She asked this because she wanted to confirm a few things. However, she now understands everything. It was bound to happen, but she didn't expect it to happen this soon. Art becomes curious about her choice of words. He asks her what she meant when she said it was bound to happen. However, she chooses to remain silent. Based on this, he starts to form a conclusion, one that he hopes is wrong. He suspects that Cynthia might be involved in all of this. However, she lets him know that the council has made her the scapegoat for the incident. She has realized that the council intends to shift the blame onto her for the incident to divert attention from the actual problem. She is very careful not to mention the details. She reveals that she is bound by her curse to stay silent. The more she talks about it, the more painful it gets. Even now, she can feel the curse slowly activating. Art gets angry by this. However, there's nothing he can do. He simply expresses his gratitude for whatever information she did provide. After the meeting, King Glader is sitting in his room drinking wine. 
he's visited by Dossid, who's furious about how things proceeded during the judgment. It is revealed that the two kings had an agreement. Through this agreement, they have agreed to work together to make sure that Art's monocor gets restrained. As they continue their conversation, a much darker truth is revealed. It seems that both the human king and the dwarven king are working together with the enemy to ensure their own survival. They have agreed to bring Art to Alacria in exchange for handsome rewards. Unlike the dwarven king, the human king seems to have some sense of guilt because he realizes that this means they would be betraying the entire population. Dawsid, on the other hand, believes that the whole continent is doomed to total annihilation. He believes that there will be no one left to betray, so they might as well salvage what's important to them. This is obviously an excuse he has made up to justify betraying Dickathan. Dawsid is completely captivated by the idea of having infinite wealth, strength, and immortality. That's his reason for backstabbing his people. King Glader, on the other hand, claims that he's doing this for the sake of his family. His wife's love for their children outweighs her concerns for the entire human kingdom. He also feels the same way as he believes that his only duty is to preserve the Glader bloodline. They were promised luxuries by the ruler of Alacria, but that doesn't matter to Blaine. The only thing he ever wanted in his life was to become the strongest mage in Decathan. Also, he can make his ancestors proud. However, his talent as a mage was subpar at best. Even with the countless elixirs and aids, he was only able to break into the red stage. He caught himself envious of his wife and even his own children. Even so, he had seen how his father was blinded by power, so he promised himself that he would never lose sight of why he wanted to be strong in the first place. It's also he can maintain peace and protect his family and his people. But even now, having the control of two lances, his feeling of inferiority has not subsided. Even he is doubtful whether he's making this decision to protect his family or whether he wants power like Dossid. Blaine throws away the wine glass in anger and lies down on the floor. He's reminded of his first meeting with Art. He believes that perhaps the only thing greater than Art's strength is his bad luck at being involved in this conspiracy. Blaine tries to convince himself that it's for the greater good. Indeed, this is the case. However, it's not for the benefit of the continent as a whole, but rather for the selfish interests of the human king. Art has a nightmare about being stuck in a creepy jungle. He makes his way to a castle in the middle of the forest. However, upon reaching the gate, he finds that it's locked and sees a bunch of crows and they seem to be eating something. He follows them to find out what it is. After climbing the castle wall, he finally reaches the top. He is horrified to see his family's decapitated heads on spikes. Art becomes terrified and wakes up from his sleep, trembling. He is visited by Lance Aya. She communicates with him telepathically and instructs him not to say anything. She does this while handing him a letter. Art follows her instructions and takes the letter from her hand without saying a word. The letter is from Alduin. He reveals something truly horrifying. He mentions that the scale of this incident is much deeper and more sinister than he had thought. He doesn't have the time to explain it in detail. So he jumps directly to the main point. He reveals that the council will declare him and Cynthia the perpetrators of this attack. He knows this because he overheard the conversation between Dossid and Blaine. The two of them are planning to hand Art over to someone alive. Alduin has sent Virion to take Art's family to a secret hideout to keep them safe. He apologizes as this is all he can do for him right now. As soon as he finishes reading the letter, it disappears into thin air. It seems this was a security measure, so no one else would find out. After a short while, Baron comes to escort him to his sentencing. While the two of them are waiting outside the door to the hall, Baron lets him know that he's looking forward to the trial. He wants to see Art in chains, and afterward he even promises to treat his family with the same care that he showed his brother. But now that Art knows his family is safe, he doesn't care at all. He shames the Lance for trying to pick a fight with a 13-year-old. Baron gets angry and grabs him by the collar. However, Art remains unaffected. He points out how the mighty Lance Baron has fallen so low as to threaten innocent families and take vengeance for his lunatic, murderous brother. He has no words to reply and tosses Art aside. The door to the hall finally opens slightly and Art is able to catch the final moments of Cynthia's sentencing, where she is sentenced to a public execution. He is horrified to hear this. Cynthia is escorted out of the hall by armored guards. Now it's finally Art's turn. Dawsid pulls out a scroll and starts reading the sentence. The council has agreed that Art's actions were for the greater good. Considering this fact, he's given the following punishment. His title as a mage will be stripped and with that, he will no longer be able to enjoy the benefits that come with it. Art is also to be imprisoned until further notice. 
This was all expected because of Alduin's letter. Blaine clarifies that they will be monitoring the victims. As soon as the events have dissipated from everyone's minds, Art will be released. He realizes that this is all a cover-up to keep him alive long enough so they can deliver him alive to the Alacrian ruler. Art inquires about what will happen to Sylvie. Laudera gets infuriated and calls him ungrateful for having his life spared. Alduin clarifies that since Art will be stripped of his title as a mage, he will no longer be able to keep his bond. He gets angry but there is nothing he can do in this situation. After the sentencing is over, he is taken back to his cell by Baron. It's obvious that the Greysenders are more than happy to be helping the Vritra. Upon reaching his cell, Art is visited by an expected guest. This visitor is none other than Winsome. In another part of the castle, the Greysenders are celebrating their success. The king couldn't be happier believing that his people had been chosen to lead this continent into a new era. Growing curious, Glaudera asks her husband about the ruler of Alacria. Dazid responds by telling her that he is an incredibly powerful being. He has faced many mana beasts in his time. Those encounters have brought him close to death many times. However, he never felt as scared as he was in the presence of his mysterious ruler. He even goes as far as to describe him as a god. While they are talking, they hear a loud bang which interrupts their little chat. The source of the sound is a mysterious man who has entered the room. He lets them know that he has been sent here to eliminate them. While saying this, he forms a powerful attack with his third eye and launches it towards the couple. The attack makes contact making it seem like the Greysenders have been vaporized. However, in reality, the attack was blocked by Ulfred who has come to rescue the king and queen. The mysterious man warns him that he doesn't want to create needless bloodshed, but Alfred refuses to back down. He attacks the man by forming golems all around him. These golems try to restrain the man, however, they fail miserably. All the golems are instantly vaporized by a simple swing of the hand. Once again, Alfred refuses to step down and forms a suit of armor around himself so he can continue fighting. The Greysenders get excited after seeing this, believing that the lance will win. Their hopes shatter as Alfred attempts to attack the man, but the man effortlessly blocks the attack using his barrier without breaking a sweat. He counters by releasing a huge burst of mana, which sends the man flying backward. The man casually walks up to him and fires a small purple orb from his finger. This creates a huge blast that knocks Alfred out instantly. With that done, he once again proceeds toward the Greysenders to eliminate them. However, he's interrupted. This time it's Mika. She attacks the man with her gravity magic. She attacks using a giant weapon. However, she is unable to do anything as well. Although she uses her gravity magic to make the man weigh more than four tons, he is still able to easily walk around. This alone is sufficient to demonstrate how much stronger he is. However, she refuses to give up and continues her attack and is knocked out in a similar way as Alfred. With one powerful beam from the tip of his fingers, the man is able to create a huge attack that knocks her unconscious in one go. Now that both the lances have been knocked unconscious, the Greysenders are left defenseless. Having no other choice, they get down on their hands and knees and beg for their life. They beg for mercy, promising to do anything. The man responds to their pleas for forgiveness and tells them to release their lances from their oath. The king doesn't even think about it twice, even though he was always taught that the oath should never be released. He rips off the necklace around his neck, which releases the two lances from their oaths. However, despite doing all this, man still decides to kill them. With a powerful beam from his third eye, he is able to pierce the king's heart all the way through. He does the same thing to the queen as well. And with that, the rulers of the dwarven kingdom have met their end. Winsome comes to the cell while carrying Sylvie in his arms. Art is happy to see her and is grateful to him for this. Winsome, on the other hand, is a bit disappointed. He didn't expect Art would get caught so quickly. He admits that although his actions were admirable when he saved the academy, he tells him to prioritize his and Sylvie's well-being above all. But what's done is done. One thing that Winsome still doesn't understand is why did Dreneve take Elijah with him? This is something Art doesn't know either, but he intends to find out. The DoD is unhappy and reveals that through their investigation, they have discovered that Elijah has been taken to Alacria. He reminds Art that he cannot even escape a mere prison cell on his own so going to Alacria would be suicide. Despite this, he still wants to follow him to save his friend. However, he also knows that Winsome's advice is right, so he puts his plans aside and asks for guidance on what he should do. Winsome tells him that he is lucky that Dreneve left before he arrived. If he had found out about Sylvie, then even the Asuras would have had a hard time keeping him safe. This, however, doesn't answer Art's question. 
He can't conceal his family with the lances tracking his mana signature. Hiding in the beast glades is also not an option due to the unusual mana beasts, so he asks Winsome one more time about what he should do. Before they can continue talking, their conversation is interrupted by the sudden arrival of Baron. He is furious to see Winsome and asks if he is with the other intruder. Winsome doesn't feel a need to hide his identity and replies affirmatively. Baron doesn't waste a second and launches a powerful attack called Flash Ray. However, the powers of Asuraz are too great for them to be affected by a normal attack. With a single motion of his hand, Winsome completely neutralizes the attack. He is shocked to see this. However, he doesn't give up and tries to attack once more, but the result is the same. Before they can continue fighting, Lance Ferrey arrives on the scene and orders Baron to stop. This is because she has figured out the identity of the man standing before her. She bows down to the deity and apologizes for their actions in attacking him. She informs him that the kings and queens of the council want to meet him. In the meeting hall, everyone is waiting other than the Greysenders, of course. The other Asura introduces himself to everyone. His name is Alder. To put things simply, he and Winsome have been sent here to help the people of the Cathan, so they have a fighting chance against Alakria. Alduin is shocked to learn that their speculations about an upcoming war are true. Alder continues talking and informs everyone that he has already taken the first steps by eliminating the corrupted and releasing their lances. He turns his head to look at the gladers while mentioning that they have gracefully decided to look past any misguided decisions that may have been made. Blaine can feel his heart in his throat as he knows what Alder is talking about. He puts aside his fear and asks a question that everyone wants to know the answer to. He asks Alder if they can't just go to Alakria by themselves and defeat the Vritra. This way there won't be any need to involve what they refer to as the Lesser. However, Alder reveals that it's much more complicated than that. The Vritra clan has former Asuras who broke their law. An all-out battle against them would level the entire world, which defeats the purpose of trying to save everyone. The Asuras and the Vritra clan have agreed to a treaty. This means that no higher being can directly attack or interfere with any lesser beings. However, Art correctly points out that killing the Greysunders is a violation of this treaty that Alder just mentioned. Realizing his mistake, he has no words to form a reply. Winsome changes the topic, saving Alder from embarrassment. He explains that Alakria is being ruled by Agrona from the Vritra clan. He isn't stupid enough to break the treaty for them to be leveling the playing field. Art gets visibly frustrated and asks them about the Blackhorn demons that have been invading Decathan for years. These are the same ones that killed Elia. Cynthia brings out the purple fragment and asks Art if he is talking about the owner of this. Alder is surprised by how much Art knows. He tells everyone that these demons are not Asurez. They were once lesser beings like everyone else in this room. These monsters are limited and are Agrona's trump card in this war. Now that Agrona is aware that the Asuras are present in Decathan, he will not dispatch them so recklessly again. Alder lets the council know that they can think of him as a general in the upcoming war. Winsome and Art decide to leave the room as they have a few things to take care of. Winsome lets him know that they are going to visit his parents so he can say his goodbyes. The deity reveals that it's finally time for him and Sylvie to start their training in Ethiovis. Winsome teleports them at a distance from where his parents are staying. This is a precautionary measure. If he had teleported directly there, then the barrier protecting Art's family would have broken. Hence, they decide to walk there on foot. Winson informs him about the great eight that reside within Ethiotis. These are the eight races that live in the land of Asuras. Each race comprises of multiple clans, but only one clan from each race is considered one of the high eight. Vritra is part of the Basilisk race. The rest of the clans tried to assassinate Agrona, but they failed to do so. Winsome explains that Agrona is too dangerous to consider a treaty with. They had no idea about what he was doing in Alacria. All the clans came to a collective decision that it was best to eliminate Agrona while they still could. Before continuing, he reveals that what he is about to tell him is something only a few members of the Indrath clan know, so it must be kept a secret at all costs. At that time, Sylvia traveled down with the elite division to defeat Agrona. Art is surprised that they allowed her to go even though they knew nothing about Agrona at that time. However, the leader of the Indrath clan hadn't allowed her to do anything. Despite this, she concealed herself and snuck onto the team. She only revealed herself when it was too late for her to return. As for how she was captured and why she hid herself in that cave even after escaping, Winston is not sure either. As for the matter of what happened to the elite division, they were all wiped out. 
Agron had realized what the Ajuro were planning, and he was waiting for them with a large army, consisting not only of basilisks, but also of lesser races that had the same innate magical abilities as the Ashuras. The Vritra clan had been interbreeding with the lesser races on Alakriya. The Indraf clan found themselves completely outnumbered. All their members were either killed or captured. Agron appeared before the leader of the Indraf clan to personally deliver the news of Sylvia's death. Furious by this, the leader was ready to wage war, but the other clans pushed for a treaty. It prevented the Ashuras from acting directly because of the collateral damage it would cause. As they discuss this, they slowly close in on the hidden location. Art is able to deduce the real reason why the six artifacts were given to the people of Decathan. It was to create a more even battlefield between Alacria and Decathan. This is where Art comes in as well, a chess piece for the Ashura in this war. They finally arrive at the location of the hideout. Winsome asks him if he has considered how he will break the news of his departure to his family. Indeed he has. Art arrives at the location of Rinia's house where his family is enjoying a nice dinner while sitting around the campfire. Upon seeing Art, they forget all about it and quickly run towards him. All of them embrace him, happy that he has come back unharmed. Their happiness quickly turns into fear as they feel a powerful presence in the cave. However, they don't need to be alarmed as it's none other than Winsome. Art introduces him as the man who saved him as well as his prospective teacher. Rinia is aware of who he is and quickly bows down to welcome him. Both Ray and Alice are thankful to Winsome for saving their son, even though they're still fearful. Now joined by Art, they sit around the campfire to enjoy their dinner properly this time. They all have a wonderful time. However, all good things must come to an end. After finishing dinner, Art requests to talk to his parents privately. Both Alice and Ree accompany their son to the next room. The two parents begin to get worried about what is going on. Before he tells them about his departure, there is something that he would like to tell them first, something he has wanted to tell them for a long time. It's finally time that he reveals the truth about his previous life to his parents. Alice is confused about what he is talking about. Art clarifies that he wasn't simply born into this world, he was teleported here from another one. Ray is confused and tells Art to back up a bit. Alice is also horrified by what she hears. She begins to worry that maybe her son is not fine. She asks him if he heard this nonsense from that new teacher of his. However, Art clarifies that no one knows about this except the people in this room. He continues explaining that it was something akin to reincarnation. Alice still can't believe this and wonders if something happened to him while he was away. However, Ray seems to have started connecting the dots. He asks Alice to let Art continue his story. He describes his previous world, the role he played there, and the relationships he had. He describes all this in great detail, so there is no doubt about whether he is making it up or not. Throughout all this, both Ray and Alice kept silent. Ray had a few questions here and there while Alice silently stayed in her seat. The trembling of her hands grew more and more as the story went on. It seemed like hours had passed until finally, the story ended. Ray inquires about his fighting and his talent as a mage. Art explains that it was because the chi system in his previous world was quite similar to the mana system in this world. Alice can't believe what she is hearing and breaks out into a small chuckle, with tears rolling down her eyes. She tells Art that he is obviously joking. Her fondest hope is that this is all just a cruel joke. Art can't even bring himself to look her in the eyes while telling her that this is not a joke. Alice has a flashback of all the loving memories she has of her son. In just one moment, it all seemed like they weren't real. Ray embraces her and tries to comfort her. However, the shock of this news is much too great. Art decides to leave the room and let them digest this news. He goes back outside to spend some time with Ellie before his eventual departure. Ray finally comes out of the room and asks Ellie to look after her mother. Before leaving, she gives Art a big hug. He tells him to always come back no matter where or how long he will be gone. Ray and Art decide to head to the back of the cave so they can have some privacy. Art asks him about Alice. Ray replies by telling him that she is in quite a bit of shock. Next, Art questions whether he believes him or not. Ray believes him as he has no reason to lie. More importantly, it all finally makes sense. His early awakening and his brilliance as a mage, it all make a lot more sense. He seems disappointed as he hangs his head low. Art asks him if he is fine. This is when Ray finally starts letting out all the emotions that he has kept hidden because of Alice. He is obviously not fine, how can he be when he has been told something like this? He questions whether all the memories they have were just a facade. He wonders if Art just acted in a way he thought a perfect son would act. 
Ray doesn't even know how to act around him anymore. Technically, Art is even older than him. The worst part of all this is the torment it has caused Alice. She mothered a middle-aged man thinking he was her son. Ray takes out his frustration by punching a wall. His anger is evident by how much damage he caused. With blood dripping down his hands, Ray questions whether Art really is his son or did he take over the unborn baby that would have been their son had he not reincarnated. Art can't even call him dad anymore and address him as Reynold. He explains that he doesn't know it himself. He is not sure how the process of reincarnation works so it's possible that he did take over his unborn son. He wanted to tell them this for a long time, but he never had the courage to do so. Art finally lets him know that he will be leaving. Considering the circumstances, it might even be a good idea. He will be gone for at least a few years. Art starts walking away, but before he leaves, he wants to let him know something. Art tells him that he never had any memories of his family in his previous life. Growing up without being loved made him a greater fighter, but a crappy person at the same time. Ever since he came into this world, both Ray and Alice taught him something very special. Even though he may not be the strongest in this world, he is a much better person than he ever was in his previous life. He apologizes for all the hurt he has caused and thanks him for making him a better person. Hearing this, Ray is moved to tears. He also thanks him for loving him as his son. With that heartfelt thank you, Art leaves to meet Winsome. He goes back to the campfire where Rinia and Winsome are waiting. Art lets him know that he is ready to leave. However, Rinia tells him that he can't leave without saying goodbye to his family. Art feels there is no need for that. He thanks her for everything and tells her to take care of his parents. As he begins to walk away, she stops him. She lets him know that his expression is much too frightening for someone as kind-hearted as him. She understands the gravity of the upcoming war, but she still implores him not to fall back to his old ways, possibly hinting at the fact that she is also aware of Art's previous life. With everything taken care of, Winsome prepares the portal to Ephiotis. He places something on the floor, and as soon as he adds his blood to it, it starts glowing brightly. Art can't help but think about what Rinia said. He asks Winsome about his expression earlier. Winsome lets him know that his expression reminded him of the Pantheon Asuras of Ephiotis. They are a warrior race that has learned to close off their emotions. This increases their efficiency as fighters. With that said, the two are teleported to Ephiotis where Art can finally begin his training. Ray's mind continues to dwell on a conversation he had with Art. Presently, he hates himself for the way things unfolded. A fraction of him yearns that he had told Art that it was acceptable and that they were still family. Yet, a larger part of him longs for a reality where Art had never revealed anything. Deep down, a part of Ray had always sensed Art's uniqueness. However, his pride came in the way that made him believe that he had raised a genius that comes once in a millennium. The signs were always there, but he chose to ignore them. He makes his way back to Rinia's house. She lets him know that Art has already left, but he had already guessed that that would be the case. He is left shocked when she reveals that she already knows about Art's previous life. She explains that she sees many things, however, when it comes to Art, even she has to struggle to piece together what's in store for him. She can tell what Ray is going through, as her long life has given her an insight that only a few possess. She informs him that the heart is the brain's biggest enemy. Emotions make us do things that are illogical and inefficient. They make everyone weak as individuals but strong as a group. Ray deduces that Art must have been thinking with emotions when he told them, but Rinia admits that even she doesn't know what he was feeling. Despite this, she has known Art ever since he was a toddler. He has come a long way since then. Perhaps this was the biggest step he has taken to break out of his shell. After a long conversation, Rinia excuses herself to prepare food for Alice. Before leaving, she gives Ray a gift from Winsome. It is something wrapped in a blanket. When he removes the blanket, he is surprised to find a mana beast inside. It resembles a bear cub. As always, Ellie's cuteness radar picks up on it, and she appears behind Ray, asking him if she can keep it. He is about to tell her that it would be difficult for her to bond with it since she is still a kid with an undeveloped mana core. However, as soon as her eyes meet the mana beasts, they instantly turn yellow indicating that a bond has been formed between them. This ruins Ray's plan to have a mighty bond to ride into battle, but he reassures himself that it's for the best that his daughter has one to protect her. Ellie couldn't be happier with her cute bond and decided to name him Boo. After she is done playing with her new bond, she finally tells Ray that Alice has woken up. He makes his way inside the house where he finds his wife sitting on the couch with a blank expression. She asks him where Art is but a part of her already knows that he is gone. She still hasn't come to terms with Art's past. 
She asks Ray if she is horrible for calling him sick. She did this because she didn't want to accept the truth. Ray assures her that it's what any normal person would have done. Once again, she asks him if she is terrible for doubting whether Art is their son. He's left shocked. He wants to tell her that she isn't, but he can't bring himself to say it since he was thinking the same earlier. Even though he is having a hard time, he knows that this is much tougher for Alice than it is for him. She was the one who went through the pain of pregnancy for nine months. She was also the one who nursed him, fed him, and taught him the ways of this world. But now, all that seems like a lie. Alice offers an apology for her query, and he embraces her, reassuring her that it's all right. He explains that they simply need time to navigate their emotions. However, her next question sends shivers down Ray's spine. She begins to contemplate what their son might have been like if Art hadn't taken over. He hugs her even tighter while telling her that she shouldn't be thinking like that. However, these are the feelings that both of them share deep down. He tries to tell her that he is their son, but he can't bring himself to. They come to a chilling realization that they haven't referred to Art as their son ever since they started talking. Unable to say anything, Ray finally opens up about his feelings. He tells her that right now he can't call Art his son, but hopefully that'll change the next time they see him. However, this doesn't change the fact that they have been a family for 13 years. It's not the blood running through them that makes them a family. It's all that they have gone through that has brought them so close. He reminds Alice of the time when Art was willing to sacrifice his life to save her from the bandits. He finally answers her questions and lets her know that she is not a terrible person. Hearing this, Alice is finally able to stop her tears. She feels a bit embarrassed for looking disgusting. However, Ray kisses her on the forehead and reminds her that she looks beautiful. Their moment is interrupted by Ellie as she calls her mother to come and see her new bond. Both of them can't help but let out a chuckle. Perhaps this is the first step on their long road towards accepting their new reality. Elsewhere, Art finally reaches the land of the deities. They cross a beautiful looking bridge and arrive at a magnificent golden castle adorned with dragon statues. He begins to feel more nervous as they approach the castle. He is surprised by the lack of guards, but Winsome tells him that they have been watching ever since they crossed the bridge. Upon entering, Winsome heads directly to the throne room to have a meeting with Lord Indrath. This is the first time Art has seen Sylvia's home. He asks Winsome for any last tips before he meets Lord Indrath, Sylvia's grandfather. However, even he doesn't know what to expect since this is a rather particular situation. As they approach the throne room, they are greeted by two guards. This strength is evident from the number of scars on their face, which is a clear indication of their experience in the battle. They addressed Winsome as elder. One of them is even offended that their princess is being carried by someone they considered to be lesser. Winsome instructs them to let it go. Following his order, they ignore Art and open the gate to the room. He takes a big gulp as they finally enter the throne room. Lord Indrath is seated on a magnificent golden throne. Winsome quickly gets down on his knees to greet him. He's unable to sense his mana at all. This is a clear indication of the gap in their strength. Suddenly, he feels intense pain as the markings on his body start to glow. A few seconds later, Art experiences a sudden force pushing him down, compelling him to kneel on the ground. When it's all over, he realizes that Sylvie is no longer in his arms. He is left dumbfounded when he discovers that Lord Indrath has taken Sylvie. He belittles Art by telling him that he did not do a good job training Sylvie, since her mana levels are insultingly low. On top of that, she is hibernating, which means Art has strained her. Art gets angry upon hearing this, but he holds back his anger since he knows that he can't go up against him. Winsome apologizes for his lack of care for not training her while they were in Decathan. He offers to train her right now, but Lord Indrath tells him that there is no need since he will personally look after her. He taps her on her head, and as soon as he does so, she instantly wakes up. She is understandably a little scared upon seeing the mysterious figure in front of her. Seeing her like this, Art wishes he could embrace her, but he's helpless in this situation. She feels sleepy and asks him if she can go back to sleep. After a quick nod from Art, she goes back to her slumber. After gathering his courage, Art finally addresses the Lord. He asks him for the real reason he was brought here. After all, if training was the sole purpose, they could have done so in some remote dungeon in Decathan. It's because he was deemed a necessary piece to help them win the war against Agrona and his army. The Lord decides to assign several specialists to help Winsome in training art. He tells him to be grateful since this is an opportunity only the most talented of the Azuras get. Art questions about how much time they have left before the war begins. 
However, Lord decides not to answer that and instead advises him to focus on his training. When it's time for him to go home, he'll be notified. Upon seeing Sildi being taken away by servants, he questions what will happen to her. Lord Indrath informs him that she will stay with him until her training is over. However, this is not a satisfactory answer for him as he wants to know when he will get to see her again. But before he can get a response, Winsome pulls him away and they leave the castle. The two of them walk through a beautiful jungle. Art still has some questions about his meeting with Lord Indrath. For instance, he wants to know what the point of that meeting was. He doesn't like the fact that he has to stay away from Sildi. Winsome replies by informing him that the relationship between him and the Ajuras is that of tolerance. This is the reason why their meeting was held in a private setting. The fact that the Ajuras have to rely on a lesser being to help them win the war is a blow to their pride. Despite this fact, they realize that both Sildi and Art are very important. So Winsome assures him that they will not be mistreated. Their conversation abruptly ends as they have finally arrived at their desired location. Art is angry to see that they have walked for several hours only to have arrived at an ordinary-looking tree. Winston informs him to hold on tight, after which he suddenly shoves him forward. Logic dictates that he would collide with the tree and probably end up with a broken nose. However, he phases right through and arrives on the other side. Inside the tree, a magnificent cave awaits them. There, they are greeted by another Azura named Cordry, who appears to be the one tasked with training Art. Winsome introduces him to Art and informs him that Cordry belongs to the Thias clan of the Pantheon Azura. He asks Winsome if Lord Indrath has truly granted him the Aether Orb. To prove this, he takes out a mysterious blue orb. Same as the rest of us, Art is left completely confused. Cordry explains that they will be borrowing the Dragon Race's ability to influence Aether, a powerful element that flows through the entire universe. Once again, Art is bewildered. Before anyone has time to explain, the water on the ground suddenly begins to swirl in a vortex. Winsome explains that it's an aether-rich liquid that will help him train and heal his wounds. Just like that, Art's training in Ethiotis has finally begun. In his previous life, Art had experienced a similar training regimen at the institution. The routine consisted of eight hours of combat training, followed by ten hours of meditation to nurture their chi centers. However, the training was flawed. The only useful knowledge he gained was about the vital spots of the human body. The techniques taught were rough attempts to inflict as much damage as possible. Despite all this, he followed the training regimen and attended every lecture. Before his chi center had developed, he spent hours losing and failing against his classmates. These memories from his previous life resurface while he's training with Cordry in the Soul Realm. They fight on plain grasslands. Art can't do anything but hold his hands up as he gets beaten to a pulp. Even after he falls, Cordry shows no mercy and delivers a powerful punch straight at his head. Hart manages to move away just enough to avoid a fatal blow, but the punch lands at his shoulder, doing massive damage. He stumbles back on his feet, but it's no use since he's unable to fight. He is incapable of doing anything but watch as Cordry lands a fatal kick and ends the battle. Hart instantly wakes up in his physical body back in the cave. Despite a first-hand experience with death, he is undeterred and wants to go for another round. The Azura is impressed with his willpower. Winsome, who is still waiting in the cave, reveals that only five minutes have passed. This means that every hour spent in the Soul Realm is roughly equal to five minutes in the real world. Winsome correctly points out that the more art is forced out of the Soul Realm, the more time is wasted. If this continues, he won't be able to get ready in time for the war. Art blames Cordry for killing him so often. Cordry defends himself by letting him know that he is only doing as much as he can handle. Even young Ashuras who don't die as often have a hard time dealing with the stress. He once again compliments Ark for his ability to deal with the sensation of dying. However, this is something that he would rather not experience in the real world. After a few minutes of break, they get right back to it. One week has passed since Art started this torture. During this time, he has come to learn that this area is the exclusive training ground for Lord Indrath. When they began, Winsome had informed him that they would be fighting in their soul state. Because of the Aether Orb, the pain of dying has been greatly reduced. This makes him wonder how agonizing it would be to perish in real life. Counting all the time he has spent dying, Art has spent a few months training in the Soul Realm. The first time he entered the Soul Realm, he was killed with the first blow, unable to even react. Even after weeks, he was barely able to dodge. Now after all this time, Art finally has a breakthrough as he's able to evade a few of Cordry's attacks. He is impressed to see that Art has finally made some progress. 
he continues the constant attacks while dishing out some knowledge on how to fight. It soon becomes too much for Art to handle, and he takes a nasty elbow to the leg, followed by a kick to the face. He once again ends up on the ground with a broken leg and jaw. Despite this, he did manage to stay alive for the first time. Cordry compliments him, and Art responds with a kind gesture of his own. Now Art must rest until his soul state is healed. The Azura also informs him that they will be taking a break from combat training for a while. He gets worried that this is because he isn't learning fast enough. On the contrary, Cordry informs him that he is progressing at a much higher rate than the average person or Azura in this case. However, he's worried that he might break if they continue to train so intensely. Art assures him that the Aether Orb won't let him die, but he doesn't understand what Cordry meant. He's not talking about physical injury, he is worried about Art's psychological health. Ever since they began their training, he has been experiencing death over and over again. Death is now an antecedent for pain that even the Azuras find hard to endure. This trauma will get in the way of producing the kind of fighter that Cordry is training Art to become. He further explains that if the pain becomes too much, his body will instinctively try to save itself. On the other hand, just the right amount of pain can become reliable sword and shield. Art ignores all this and tells Cordry that he will be fine. However, even before he can finish his sentence, the Azura unleashes all his terrifying mana. He attacks Art with full force and punches a hole through his stomach. Just as he's about to die, Cordry pats his head and lets him know that he will make him an unparalleled warrior, not just among the lesser races, but among the Azuras as well. With that, he pulls out his fist. Just as he is about to die, Art's thoughts wander to his friend's back on Decathan. All of them are hard at work as well. Each of them is preparing in their own way to get strong and defend what they love in the upcoming war. Over a month has passed in the real world, which means Art has been training for a year in the Soul Realm. On this particular day, he is practicing with his sword, and as usual, he finds himself on the back foot after just a few minutes of fighting with Cordry. Unable to continue, Art's body starts trembling and he falls to the ground. Seeing this, the Azura stops releasing his mana, signaling the end of the fight. After the combat, even an Azura is forced to complement Art's mysterious sword. However, he lets him know that as a mage, hand-to-hand -hand combat is the best way of fighting. For the sake of the war, Cordry aims to train Art to be the knight who can protect Decathan. He lets him know that his fighting style is best suited for dueling a single opponent. Alacria possesses the descendants of Azuras in the form of mixed bloods. It will be the strongest force in the war. He advises Art that he should expect to be put in a situation where he will fight multiple mixed bloods. To succeed in such a situation, he will need precise mana usage. Physical combat augmented with precise mana usage will be the most efficient way of defeating the enemy. Cordry recalls everything they have learned so far. Art's first lesson was to learn to stay alive. He had to fight and dodge at high speeds. His second lesson was to fight under immense pressure. To do this, Cordry used his king's force, or killing intent, as it's referred to by the lesser. With this training, Art learned to strengthen his tolerance. Now it's time for his third lesson. In this phase of his training, he must learn to narrow his focus. Cordry goes on to attack once again. Art throws powerful punches, but Cordry manages to avoid each of them without any effort. He lets Art know that although his punches are very strong, they are a waste of stamina if they don't land. Proper conservation of mana is important. This concept also applies to the physical body. Art persists in his attempts to land an attack, but each one misses its mark. Cordry manages to grab hold of his hand. He goes behind him and prepares to launch a massive magical attack. He instructs Art to defend himself with mana. However, despite that, it's not enough and a powerful beam goes right through him. Once again, Art wakes up in the cave. This time they have an unexpected guest waiting for them. It's a young Hazura who resembles Cordry. He refers to him as a master. Cordry introduces him as Tachi. He will be Art's new training partner. Both the boys are left surprised and Tachi seems disappointed. He was told that he would be receiving private training. He lets the young Azura know that he will be training while sparring with Art. It's obvious from his attitude that he believes it to be beneath him to train with a human. Cordry scolds him for complaining even though he has been given the rare honor of training with the Aether Orb. Tachi clarified that he meant it was beneath the great Cordry to train a mere human. He's unable to reply and lets out a deep sigh. He ignores Tachi and begins the lesson. He tells Art that the Pantheon races all differ in their use of what is called Force-type mana. Tachi has been training in the special arts of the Thias clan. 
They are able to predict their opponent's movement by observing their distribution of weight and momentum. By doing this, they can match their attack to their opponent and take advantage of their strength. This way they're able to defend while conserving energy for their own attack. He showed Art a glimpse of what he was talking about when they were fighting earlier. Before going back to the Soul Realm, he instructs both of them on what they're allowed to do. He instructs Tachi to use his full strength while fighting the human. Art, on the other hand, is not allowed to use any offensive moves. He can only block and deflect. The only offensive maneuvers he's allowed to use are throws. Tachi's pride once again gets in the way. He complains that Art should be the one using his full strength while restrictions should be placed on him. This once again displays the pride that the Azuras have in their strength. Cordry once again scolds the young Azura for doubting him. With that out of the way, the three of them entered the Soul Realm. A few days have passed since Art began his training with Tachi. He has already grown used to Tachi's fighting style and is able to dodge all of his attacks. Cordry is impressed to see this. Even though Tachi is only seven years old, he has displayed immense talent from the beginning. Despite this fact, Art has been able to keep up with him only after a few days. That too with all the restrictions that were placed on him. His movement is slowly becoming sharper with little to no wasted move. Even Cordry is left to wonder how something like this is possible. In all his years as a mentor, he has nurtured many pupils. Some even went on to become leading figures in the Fiest clan. However, training Art has brought up sensations that he had never felt before. Emotions such as excitement, awe, and pride continued to well up inside him. These are emotions that he never even felt for himself, and now he experiences them for a seemingly insignificant boy. He wonders what kind of figure he would have been if Art had been born as an Azura. He would have been a prominent figure even among the highest echelons of power. Meanwhile, Art keeps engaging in the fight with Tachi, skillfully dodging his attacks, which slowly makes Tachi more and more furious. Eventually, Art is able to grab his hand and throw him to the ground, winning the fight. Slowly but surely, the number of opponents Art faces multiplies. First, there are two with the addition of a female Azura. Then, it becomes three. Eventually, it reaches four. Despite being outnumbered, he has become skilled enough to battle four Azuras simultaneously. His defense relies on precise movements, allowing him to fend off their attacks effectively. Four months go by in the real world, which is equivalent to about four years inside this soul realm. Art's physical body has barely aged at all. However, he has gained years of muscle memory and mana core levels. His 14th birthday recently passed, but he spent it like any other day, training and honing his body. Cordry has helped him redefine his mana to aid in combat. However, he didn't learn any new things conceptually. Art is not sure why this is the case. Perhaps it's because of the psychological difference between humans and Asuras, or maybe Cordry is not allowed to teach him anything because he's not a member of their clan. However, Art decides to place his trust in him and absorb whatever he is taught. After all this time, he has finally completed his training with Cordry. He thanks all the Asuras for helping him train. However, they don't share his sentiments and instead are frustrated that they lost to a mere human. This is especially true for Tachi. Art expresses his gratitude to Cordry for training him, acknowledging the impact it had on his skills. Winsome also takes a moment to thank Cordry sincerely for his invaluable assistance. Before they leave, Cordry decides to give Art a warning. He reminds him that the mages in Alacria have been guided by Azuras as well. Their mana are generations ahead of anything they have on Decathan. It is frustrating to him that they can't fight against Alacria. However, it is necessary as breaking the pact could mean destroying the entire world. This means that the future of Decathan lies in the hands of Art and his comrades. The mage finally exits the cave after a long time. As they head to the training area for Art's next phase of training, Winsome hands him a scroll containing information about their enemy. Art is left horrified after reading the information on the scroll. Alacria has four strong mages who have been nicknamed the Four Scythes. Each of the Scythes has a retainer. These retainers are each capable of dispatching a lance. The Scythes themselves are even stronger. Winsome reveals that the mage that killed Lance Aaliyah was a retainer. Art slowly begins to grasp the level of strength that his enemy possesses. Both continents will be sending millions of soldiers in the upcoming war. For now, Art's family is safe, but he can't help but wonder how long that will last. Instead of worrying himself, he decides to focus on his training for now. They finally arrive at the location of the next phase of his training. It's a cliff overlooking a thick jungle. He has to complete a task while only using the items in the bag that he is given. On top of that, he's not allowed to use any external mana arts. 
To complete the mission, he needs to obtain the pelt of a raptor squirrel, the beast core of a silver panther, and the claws of a titan bear. This is a test to see whether Art is ready to learn more about Sylvia's will. Before beginning, Winsome sets one more condition. Art must wear a bell at all times. Once he has collected all the items, he needs to break the bell to inform Winsome. With everything set, Art jumps down the cliff into the jungle below. The true challenge of the test becomes apparent shortly after it commences. Despite days of effort, Art struggles to catch a squirrel. During this period, he learns a crucial detail. It's not only the sound of the bell that alerts the squirrels, but they are also highly sensitive to mana. Since they are at the bottom of the food chain, they have developed their senses to make up for their lack of strength. Just hiding one's presence isn't enough to catch them. Art decides to hide all the mana in his body, leaving him defenseless in this jungle. However, even that wasn't enough. He realized that it was also necessary to clear his mind and hide his intent. But it was easier said than done. A few more days passed and he was able to learn more things. Firstly, leaking a small amount of mana didn't drag away the squirrels, but it did alarm them to the degree that made it impossible to catch them. Secondly, internalizing mana didn't alarm them. However, too much of it caused his intent to bleed out, causing them to run away. The final and most crucial lesson Art learns is that external mana flow doesn't alert the squirrels. In fact, they are even more observant of it. He begins to work on developing a new technique to aid him in catching the squirrels. He focuses on his mana channels, which carry purified mana from his mana core. These channels are more advanced than his mana veins, which transport the unpurified mana absorbed from the atmosphere. For this technique, he has to balance the output of purified mana and the input of the atmospheric mana. It has been many years since he learned this rotation technique from Sylvia. Now he is able to use it unconsciously, which would help with this new technique. With the perfect balance of input and output, Art would be able to use mana without anyone or anything being able to sense what he was doing. After concentrating for a while, he's successfully able to use this technique. The squirrels gather in front of him to eat the mushrooms without running away. Seeing this, Art is unable to hold his excitement and lets out a big shout. The problem remains that he's unable to move while using this technique. This makes it impossible to catch the squirrels. As night falls, he prepares to go to sleep. While lying down under the night sky, he wonders how his friends and family are doing. He pushes those thoughts aside to focus on his training. The next morning, he goes back to improving his technique. He needs to be able to move fast enough so that the squirrels are unable to react to the sound of the bell. He sets his target to reach a tree before the bell chimes. He has to do this while using the new technique. He starts his training but is met with many failures. He remembers how Cordry stressed Om controlling mana's flow and power while manipulating one's presence. Erasing your presence by balancing the input and output of mana while also instantly gaining speed to reach your opponent, he wonders if this is the skill that Winsome wanted to test with this mission. Some time passes and Art slowly starts to get better at it. Winsome has been watching him from a distance, wondering what he's doing. It has been two weeks and Art still hasn't been able to catch a squirrel. This leaves Winsome disappointed. Although the squirrel's tails are sensitive to mana fluctuations, they are simple-minded creatures. All Art had to do was hide his presence while staying motionless with some bait in his hand. Meanwhile, he prepares to use his new technique to try and finally catch the squirrel. Winsome is left in disbelief upon witnessing it. Art carries out the technique perfectly and is able to catch the squirrel before the bell chimes. Unbeknownst to Art, he has just completed the first step of the Mirage Walk. This is the essence of what makes the Thias clan so superior in physical combat. Winsome is left to wonder how much more Art will achieve in the future. Art's next target is a Silver Panther. Utilizing the Mirage Walk once again, he attempts to attack the creature. However, it swiftly dodges his strike and begins to run away. Art tries to chase after it, but it disappears before he has a chance to catch up. The night before, Winsome came and informed him of his achievement in learning the introductory step of the Mirage Walk. After that, Art spends three weeks walking through the forest he eventually encounters Claude, a silver panda he has marked as his target. He has become proficient enough at the burst step that he is able to clear almost ten yards. However, even that isn't enough to catch Claude. While washing his face by the river, Art sees a squirrel on top of a tree. This makes him hungry thinking about how long it has been since he last ate. Suddenly, he hears a bird approaching. It is trying to catch the squirrel for its next meal. With a swift motion, it easily catches the squirrel. Watching it hunt, Art realizes that the bird calculated the squirrel's movement and predicted where it would jump. This gives him an idea. 
He tries to catch the bird with mirage steps, but they are much faster than squirrels. He starts observing the birds every day for a week. They are much more stealthy and faster than squirrels. The birds were also smart. They knew that when they revealed themselves, the squirrel would try to run in a particular direction. They used this knowledge to manipulate the squirrel's movement. As an observer, Art could see the bird beforehand, however, the squirrel had no way of knowing. The panthers are another story altogether. Claude was smart. It knew that it could evade Art with its amazing speed. At the same time, he wasn't dumb enough to engage him in a fight. This is because he has realized that Art is stronger. Even though the mirage walk conceals the user from the opponent, Art still had to make that first, incredibly fast step. It gave Claude just enough time to run away. If he could get rid of that initial step, it would appear as if he teleported through space. Then he could finally defeat Claude. In his past life, Art had learned how the muscles in a human body work. They operate in pairs, each responsible for half the movement. For instance, the biceps flexes to curl the arm around the shoulder, and the triceps activate soon after when the arm is straightened out. This completes the motion of throwing a punch. The body's mechanism becomes more complex when the body is put into motion such as walking, running, or jumping. He intends to use this knowledge from his previous life to strengthen his technique even more. He has been working and combining precise techniques to artificially trigger a sequence in his body that mimics the use of a muscle even when standing still. If he succeeds, he will achieve something even Cordry cannot do, mastering the ability to use the mirage walk while in a standing position. But it is much more difficult than learning the first step. Art is met with countless failures, and he continues to grow more frustrated. While training, he notices something odd. The forest is unusually quiet. Upon looking around, he comes across a fight between two silver panthers. It's a territorial dispute. Art gets excited as this is a rare opportunity for him to observe Claude in action. The other panther jumps at Claude, but he swiftly dodges encounters with a slash of his own. However, the fight stops abruptly as Claude picks up on something. He quickly runs away, leaving both Art and the other panther confused. Art ignores that and realizes that this might be his opportunity to take down the other silver panther. He uses his mirage walk and jumps towards the panther. This catches the panther off guard and is able to grab onto it. After a small struggle, he manages to finally catch a silver panther. However, the panther is not about to give up and continues to attack Art with its claws. Desperate to get away, it jumps over the cliff into the chasm below. Having no other option, Art is forced to break the rule about not using mana and uses his wind magic to slow himself down. Art manages to land safely, but the silver panther isn't so lucky. It finally becomes apparent why Claude ran away as Art hears a loud rumble. The source of the sound is none other than a titan bear. However, contrary to its name, it looks more like a cub than an actual bear. What's more surprising is that it can even talk. Wanting to protect its meal, it decides to attack Art. It uses a powerful attack that sends him tumbling backward. Art decides to use his mirage walk to dodge the attacks. However, even with the increased speed, he is barely able to do so. As the fight continues, the bear can predict Art's movement and launches a powerful attack that nearly takes him out. He's put in a near-death situation. This isn't the Soul Realm, so if he dies, he will die for real. Realizing this, he readies himself to face his opponent once again. Whenever the bear slashes its claw, the resulting attack is also a sharp slash that moves through the air. On the other hand, when the bear punches, it produces a blunt force attack. Due to the damage to his legs, Art realizes that he needs to finish this quickly, otherwise his legs won't last. He uses the mirage walk to quickly appear behind the bear. It hears the sound of the bell and quickly slashes its claw at it. However, to its surprise, it was all a fiend. Art's body isn't there and the bear only manages to cut the bell. Art once again appears behind him and manages to land a strong punch. With one attack, Art has successfully taken out the most powerful target in this mission. Due to the overexertion, he collapses as his body gives in to all the injuries. Since the bell was destroyed, Winsome arrives at the location soon afterward. He wonders why Art had come all the way down here. He is shocked to see the aftermath of the fight between Art and the Titan Bear. Winsome quickly gets into the action and assesses Art's condition. He has three broken ribs and many deep gashes on his chest. Even his legs are in a bad condition, all this from a cub. Winsome is left surprised as even a fully grown bear standing at ten feet tall wouldn't have been able to cause this much devastation. Upon closer inspection, Winsome notices the strange markings on the bear's body. The dead bear suddenly stands up and a tentacle pops out from its chest. 
Winsome instantly realizes that it's a demon leech, an intelligent monster native only to Ethiotis. It has the ability to possess other animals and strengthen its host's core to an amazing degree. It would even be deadly to Menasura. Agrona himself experimented on them to create a strengthening serum. This is the same serum that Lucas used during the attack on the Exiris Academy. Winsome moves forward and takes out the tentacle to finish the monster off. He crushes the tentacle and obtains a blue orb. He becomes impressed that Art was able to take out such a monster. He tells Art that his difficulties have paid off while feeding him the blue orb. Art's body suddenly starts to glow. Some time passes and he wakes up injured in a bed, a situation he is much too familiar with at this point. He becomes concerned as he is unable to feel his legs. However, a strange figure reassures him that his legs are fine. The figure is a female Azura. Her name is Meyer, the person who saved Art from a lifetime of disability. It would have been faster to use healing arts, but that would have resulted in his legs taking a weird shape. Although it took two days, his legs are now healing properly. Art quickly jumps up upon hearing that he has been out for two whole days. She quickly tries to get him to lie down again. It took a lot of work to fix his legs. If he were to move around now, he would cause more damage. Art expresses his gratitude to her for the treatment and her hospitality. Before leaving, she mentions that she doesn't treat just anyone. She did this for Art because she wanted to meet the boy who is supposedly going to save the world. As soon as she leaves, he decides to continue his training. Since he can't move around much, he decides to meditate and try to heal faster. While meditating, he's shocked to realize that there is something different with his core. The color of his mana core has turned silver. Before he even realizes it, his beast will suddenly activate on its own. He becomes freaked out. After a while, he starts to see purple specks floating around in the air. He calms his breathing and manages to take control of his beast will. Meyer also comes back at this time. She is surprised to see that Art truly has inherited the realm heart. He becomes confused by what she is talking about. She explains that it is evident from the physical manifestation displayed when he taps into Sylvia's power. Realm heart or the realm heart physique is an ability that only the Indraft bloodline can possess. She inquires whether Art was able to see the colors that make up the physical realm. Thinking back to the purple specks, he replies affirmatively. She goes on to explain that the realm heart physique was named after the ancestors of the Indrath clan. In this state, the user's attunement to the physical realm is said to be unparalleled. Although it doesn't increase the user's strength, it offers knowledge and insight that no one without it can hope to acquire. Art asks her why he was able to see the purple specks. Even though he was only able to see four colors when he used the second phase of realm heart before, Perhaps this is one of those annoying times again when the Azures aren't allowed to reveal secrets to the lesser. Meyer breaks out into a chuckle and admits that most Azures are greedy and secretive, particularly the Indrath clan. However, she tells him that she has lived long enough and experienced enough to not care about such stupid things. She offers to take a stroll with him, promising to teach him a few things along the way. The two of them go to an indoor garden. Unable to walk, Meyer pushes him around in a wheelchair. This garden is home to many different mana beasts who feed on the raw mana in this part of Ethiotis. It isn't easy for anyone to manipulate raw mana. This is true for Azuras and mana beasts as well. Mages with certain affinities have an easier time absorbing mana that coincides with that element. She gives the example of a firebug that just landed on Art's finger. The firebug naturally took in the red mana particle as it has an affinity for the fire element. The same concept applies to mages. To some with Realm Heart, it would appear that the mage is absorbing only the red particles, but after refining the mana, it would appear white. Similarly, if this mage had a water affinity, after the refinement process, his body would have a large amount of water element, and if the mage were to execute a fireball spell, then he would have to concentrate a lot. However, if he were to use a water spell, he would have no trouble. Art is correctly able to deduce that it's because of the influence that absorbing a large amount of water element had on him during the refining process. Meyer explains that after being exposed to one particular element for so long, the mage would have gained better insight about that element. While walking they arrive at a tea table. Both of them sit around the table to have a cup of tea. She questions Art about what he knows about Aether. He replies by telling her that he doesn't know much apart from the fact that it has the ability to manipulate time. Meyer describes that Aether is different from mana. Some have speculated that Aether makes up the building blocks of the universe, while mana is what fills it with light. Simply put, it can be thought of as a cup while mana is the water inside. 
It is easy to manipulate the water, on the other hand, it's difficult to change the shape of the glass without breaking it. Even the Indraft clan can't seem to do so. What they can do is detect aether using the realm heart physique. The purple specks that Art saw earlier was aether. The greater the capability of the mage, the more water they can manipulate. By manipulating aether, one can gain control over the glass itself. There are three components that make up aether. The control over time, known as avum, the authority over space, known as spadium, and the influence over living components, known as vuvum. No matter how strong one is, they will only be able to master one path. Over time, the Azuras have discovered ways to discern where their aptitude lies. Art becomes intrigued and can't wait to know the answer. In a shocking turn of events, Meyer's body lights up with the same ruins that Art has, indicating that she is able to use Realm Heart as well. She informs that the aptitude of a mage is discerned by the ruins that appear on their body. Meyer is on the Vuvum path. This is why she was able to heal Art. She instructs him to activate his Realm Heart so they can determine his aptitude. Upon inspecting them closely, Meyer becomes fascinated by them. He starts using all four of his elements and soon after, he begins to see the purple specks again. He wonders why he didn't notice them before. She informs him that it would have been difficult because of his humanity. She continues speaking, telling him that Aether is fundamentally different from Mana. He will only face failure if he tries to manipulate it the same as he does with Mana. She brings up the example of glass and water once again. One can drink, gargle, and spit out water all they want. But can you imagine gargling glass? Aether is present all around but in the boundary that confines them, similar to how the glass confines the water. Vuvum is the power that Meyer used to heal Art's shattered legs. He's full of questions right now. After finding out her affinity, Meyer studied Vuvum for centuries, but even now she is not confident in her ability to explain it to Art. However, this is not a satisfactory answer for Art as he is desperate to learn it himself. She agrees to teach him a few things. The first thing he must know is that Aether can't be absorbed. You can only change its presence and influence on reality. An individual's core is what connects them to the physical realm. So, even though Aether can't be directly manipulated like Mana, the core is still the most crucial part. Art's affinity for Aether will be revealed in due time. For now, she tells him that after a certain point, his cultivation won't depend on his ability to control Mana, but on gathering insight and knowledge. Maya reveals that there is a reason why he has the ability to utilize Aether. After thinking about it for a bit, Art realizes that it's because he is a Quadra Elemental Mage. It was the insight of the four elements that allowed him to look past the water and see the glass. Meyer realizes that Art's body has started to tremble. She informs him that it's okay for him to release Realm Heart now. She even compliments his ability to use it for as long as he did. The first thing on his mind is whether Meyer was able to tell his Aether affinity. However, before revealing it, she decides to give him a warning. She is still unsure whether he can consciously control Aether, the same as the Asher is. Despite being able to use all four elements and having the Realm Heart and a Dragon's Will, the fact remains that he's a human. He becomes frustrated upon hearing this. However, Meyer has more to tell him. She reveals that he was never meant to go down the path of Avum, even though he was able to stop time using his Dragon Will. Like Sylvia, Art is meant to control the very fabric of the boundaries of the physical realm. In simple terms, he is on the Spadium path, meaning he has the ability to control space. However, as Meyer said earlier, despite this knowledge, there is a possibility that he might never be able to consciously control Aether. He pleads with her, practically begging her to guide him on how to learn to utilize Aether. It all comes down to the fact that his human self won't be able to handle the burden. Meyer pities the fact that Art's tremendous potential might be wasted because of something he can't control. However, she reminds him that knowledge is an immeasurable strength. He might one day find a way past the boundaries of his birth and find a path that even the Azuras don't know. She assures him that she wants the best for him and even though Realm Heart can't be fully utilized, it can still help him because of its sensory functions. With Realm Heart, his Quadra Element Magic, and his physical prowess, Art has many tools at his disposal. However, she reveals that the new technique that he has developed can't be one of them. She instructs him never to use it again. In one instant, Art feels like all his hard work and all his weeks of training have been for nothing. She asked him how Mirage Walk works, seemingly surprised that Art was able to teach himself. His fondest hope was that she would change her mind after learning about its mechanism. But it was clear that this move was too dangerous to use in combat. His breakthrough into the Silver Stage was a pleasant surprise. Combined with his training with Cordry, Art would easily be a double A-class adventurer. 
However, now he had nothing in terms of Mon Arts. The only thing he had managed to learn was Mirage Walk, and that too was taken away. On the other hand, actual Azuras are residing in Alacria. Their mana manipulation is way beyond anything he can imagine. Even a single retainer was able to wipe out an entire team led by Lance. Meyer told him that knowledge is power, however he's left to wonder how it'll help him win against Alacria. The next day, she comes to visit him to see the progress of his recovery. The pain is a lot but now he's at least able to walk. He is surprised when he looks up. He sees that she has activated her realm heart. She reveals that she has asked Winsome for some time with him, meaning that Art will get to train with Meyer and possibly learn to utilize Ether. She is here to share some of her knowledge with Art and nudge him in the right direction. However, she once again reminds him that he is a human. This means that despite all this, he might not be able to learn much due to his low level of insight on mana. With that out of the way, they finally begin their training. Meyer instructs him to attack her with all he has got. He can use any combination of spells he wants. Following her instructions, he starts preparing spells in both of his hands. What happens next leaves him astonished. In your right hand, you are preparing a water sphere, while with your left hand, you will shoot a gust of wind, Meyer tells him. He is left shocked to see that she was able to predict the exact spell he was going to use even before he employed it. He once again attempts to attack her. This time, he plans to use an earth spell. Once again, Meyer is able to tell what he's up to. She informs him to stop since she would prefer it if her garden doesn't get ruined. He is left completely confused. Meyer reveals that this is an ability that Art possesses as well. If he can learn to tap into the depths of his realm heart ability, this would be a piece of cake for him. With those words, they continued their training. Days soon turned a week since they started. Their training is similar to the training with Cordry. He would spend hours getting beat up, followed by a time of healing using Meyer's healing arts. She continues her lessons on how to interpret mana fluctuations while healing him. Art is astonished to see how well she is able to heal him. Wouldn't it have been easier to just cut my legs off and grow me new ones? He asks her, wondering why she went through all that trouble if her healing is so good. Meyer responds by telling him that using ether past a certain threshold comes at a cost. It would have been possible to heal his legs, but she would have had to extract mana from something or someone else. This would have resulted in their death. Art makes a light-hearted comment telling her to stop beating him up if that is the case. Meyer carries on the same energy telling him to stop falling for her feints if he doesn't want to get beat up. During their training, Art always tries to predict her next move, but he always comes up short. Meyer informs him that it is because he is getting ahead of himself by trying to counter her spell even before she manifests it. This is something that took her decades to get right, and even that was considered fast by an Azura's standard. Now that Art is all healed up, they start their training once again. Both of them manifest their realm heart and Meyer starts the fight with a wind bullet. After weeks of training, Art has started to somewhat get the hang of using realm heart. He is able to predict her attack and manages to block it. She immediately follows it up with an earth spell. Once again, Art predicts the incoming earth spike and jumps out of the way in time. While in the air, he notices red particles forming behind him. He comes to the conclusion that Meyer is about to use blast flare next. He instantly forms an ice spell and turns around to counter it. However, it turns out to be another feint. She uses a simple earth bullet to finish the fight. However, just as it is about to pierce him, a hand moves in to catch it. This hand belongs to Winsome, who has come to inform them that their time is up. Upon seeing Meyer, he quickly gets down on his knee to greet her. Art is a bit surprised to see this. By now he had also deduced that she must hold some level of influence in the Indrath clan since she was able to keep him with her for this long. But for Winsome to bow to her, he has to wonder just how much authority she truly holds. Winsome apologizes for his intrusion and explains that Lord Indrath has already arranged for Art's next instructor, and it's time for them to meet him. Meyer responds by telling him that she understands and also compliments Art for doing well in his training with Realmheart. She also remarks that she would like to pop by from time to time to keep an eye on the boy. Winsome is surprised to hear this, but he quickly responds, informing her that it's no issue. With that said, Winsome and Art depart to meet this new instructor. As they walk, Art notices that Winsome has been staring at him for quite some time. He asks him if something is wrong. It's just that he's amazed that Lady Meyer not only healed him, but also decided to train him personally. Who exactly is Meyer? Art asks him. Winsome sternly points out that it's Lady Meyer. In response to this question, he states that he's not in a position to confirm it unless she tells him directly. Art makes a snide comment implying to him that he thought Winsome must be some high-up figure when they first met. 
but that doesn't seem to be the case. He gets angry and replies harshly, Watch your tongue, human. Even if I were the lowest of the Azuras, I'd still be stronger than any of you less races. After walking for a while, they finally arrive at a portal. As soon as they reach the other side, they are greeted by a sound boom as a huge crater is formed. Winsome explains that so far Art has learned Mon interpretation with him and Lady Meyer, and he learned augmented melee combat with Cordry. In this phase he will learn to fit everything together into a cohesive style. Their conversation is interrupted by a voice, so this is him. Art notices a figure standing on top of a ledge. The voice continues speaking, this whelp is supposed to be the hero who leads to Cathan to victory. The figure which appears to be a man leaps from the ledge at great speed. He crashes into the ground, creating a cloud of dust. A huge hand suddenly emerges from the dust cloud and grabs Art, lifting him in the air. It seems that Art's new teacher is a man who can transform into a huge golem. He stares at him intently without doing much. It's as if he is observing Art. After some time, the golem releases him from his grip. Soon after, the golem begins to crumble away. From within its core, the man emerges once again. Winsome introduces him as Ren. He reveals that Art will be training with him for a while so they should get acquainted. Art respectfully bows to him, however. Ren pays him no attention and speaks to Winsome instead. What's the punishment for being tardy in human society? A severed finger or toe, perhaps? It must be more along the lines of imprisonment or social isolation. Art is taken aback by this weird man and his crazy talk. From the way he looks, it's obvious that he is planning to use the same punishment on Art. Fortunately for him, Winsome tells him that there is no punishment for being late. Ren is a bit surprised and annoyed at the same time. He finds it odd that a race with such a small lifespan doesn't place more importance on their time. He comes to the conclusion that humans must be a backward race. Art finds it weird coming from him when he is the one dressed like a crazy person. Ren quickly turns around, slapping Art in the face with his robe. After walking a short distance, he turns around and with a serious look on his face he says, Arthur, I want you to strip. He is left completely speechless, but judging from everything he has seen so far, it's hardly surprising. He takes off his clothes without questioning this ridiculous demand. Ren notices Sylvia's feather wrapped around Art's arm. He becomes intrigued and quickly snatches it away. He starts examining it and remarks that such a rare material is wasted as just an arm warmer. Art is confused, but Winsome explains that their feathers have unique properties about both mana and aether. From the day a dragon is born, they never shed their feathers, so for one to deliberately give their feather to someone signifies trust and affection. Art becomes happy upon hearing this as he recalls the time he spent with Sylvia. His thoughts are interrupted by Ren as he makes another ridiculous demand. Without any explanation, he tells Art to stand still with his arms spread out. He once again quietly does as he is told. Ren starts examining every part of his body with much intrigue. After he is done, he moves on to the next phase of his examination. He instructs Art to use a basic spell using each element while only using his right hand. He follows through with these instructions while Ren closely observes every single movement that he makes. It takes all day, but Ren finally completes his basic calculations. As the sun begins to go down, Art starts to feel cold. However, Ren is still not done with all his measurements. He moves on to the next phase yet again and instructs Art to use his mana arts in battle. Without giving him any time to think, Ren forms a giant golem, and it starts charging towards them. Art quickly fires a lightning spell, which destroys it. However, it reforms itself and continues charging. At the same time, another golem suddenly appears behind him. It swipes at his legs, making him fall down and fail the test. This makes him realize that Ren is one of those people. Frustrated by his weirdness, Art tells him that he would be more cooperative if he only knew what Ren was trying to figure out with all these measurements. He completely ignores him and continues on to the long-range mana manipulation analysis. Art suddenly hears a roar. This is followed by the appearance of hundreds of golems on top of the clip. They start climbing down to attack. Art is amazed upon witnessing this. Just how many golems can you conjure? He asks. Ren nonchalantly replies that it depends on the complexity, but for this type, he can conjure a few thousand or so. Art releases his realm heart in preparation to counter the incoming golems. He jumps high up in the air to cast his spells. As soon as he is close enough, he launches a powerful lightning attack, destroying many golems at the same time. He continues the aggression without any break. When the dust settles, Ren can see that Art has destroyed all the golems without breaking a sweat. 
He is impressed but quickly moves on to the next test. This time it's a physical test, so he asks Art to bring out his primary weapon. He takes out his sword and throws it to Ren, but for some reason he becomes really surprised upon seeing it. Soon after he breaks out into a laugh, Art assumes that he is laughing because he thinks Art is using a stick for a sword. He explains that it's not as simple as it seems and offers to show it to him. However, Ren quickly pulls it back saying, I know what it is, boy. He starts to pull it out. Art explains that he won't be able to unsheathe it as he is the only one who can do so. Before he can finish his sentence, he's left stunned as he witnesses Ren successfully pull out the sword. He begins to question how the instructor is able to pull out a sword that he has bonded with. In a surprising turn of events, Ren reveals that it was he who made this sword. Art is left shocked upon hearing this. His mind is filled with questions. Assuming that he did forge this sword, how did it end up in the Cathan? While swinging the blade, Ren reveals that Don's ballad was meant to be an experimental weapon. It was more or less a failure. While on an expedition to gather minerals, he tossed the weapon in the beast's glades, thinking that no one would be able to tell if it was anything more than a black cane, much less try to open it. But to think that it somehow ended up in Art's possession. He's surprised to hear him say that Don's ballad was a failure. He has never seen a finer blade in either of his lives. Ren feels a bit insulted that his weapon is being compared to the primitive weapons of the lesser races. However, he lets that slide and starts examining the sword. He explains that he made this sword as a one-size-fits-all kind of weapon, so it came out to be nothing more than a sharp tool. Winsome steps into the conversation and asks Ren what he will do now that he has met him. Art is left confused by what he means by this question. Winsome responds, telling him that he brought him here for two reasons. The first is as he mentioned earlier, for Ren to be his instructor and help him get stronger. Art is shocked upon hearing the second reason, which is for Ren to make him a weapon. He is startled upon hearing that he will forge him a sword. Ren angrily replies, I don't forge swords, brat. I create them. Unfortunately for Art, Ren reveals that he only agreed to train him because he owed a favor to Lord Indrath. However, this favor doesn't extend to him wasting his time making a sword for a lesser being. He decides to hold on to Don's ballad for now. In all honesty, Art is amazed that Ren is willing to give it back at all. He tells Art that the Don's Ballad might be a simple tool, but it still chose him to be its wielder. He may not be proud of this particular fact, but he is not just going to take it away. Despite all his weirdness, it seems he has great pride in his weapons. Ren holds out his left hand and the ground beneath it suddenly starts to move, as if it were boiling. A magnificent sword suddenly appears from the ground and into Ren's hand. He tosses this sword to Art and tells him that he can use this while training. This would be perfect for training as he created it to measure the movement of the user, as well as the force of the impact it receives. After swinging it around for a bit, Art is left stunned by its quality. Ren also asks Art to give him Sylvia's feather as well. He becomes a bit concerned but Ren tells him not to question everything he does and just give it to him. This feather is really important to Art as it was a gift from Sylvia. Although with some hesitation, he does as Ren asks of him and hands it to him. After getting the feather, he tells the boy to get some rest. Art doesn't like the idea that they will be spending the whole night in this barren crater. It only becomes worse as Ren reveals that they won't be spending the night here, he will just be him alone. As Winsome opens a portal for them, Ren remarks that he can just think of it as training, since there won't be any fluffy beds waiting for him in the war. With that, the two of them walk into the portal, leaving Art by himself in this huge crater. Some time passes and it's finally nighttime. Art makes a tent for himself using earth magic. Despite the situation, one cannot deny the beauty of the night sky. As he is sleeping peacefully, he is woken up by a rumbling sound. He makes his way out of the tent to investigate. Out of nowhere, a golem suddenly emerges from the ground carrying a giant axe and attacks him. He is barely able to dodge. Ren, standing on top of the cliff, shouts instructions to Art, revealing this to be a training simulation for the war. Once again, he instructs him to strip and begin fighting. Art does what he says and activates his realm heart in preparation for the incoming attack by the golems. His objective is to defeat the golem generals. They are marked with crowns on their heads. Art finds himself completely surrounded by them. Despite their numbers, they don't seem to be very strong, and he's able to hold them off using his magic and combat abilities. Having said that, numbers still matter as Art soon finds out. While he is distracted, one of them attacks him from behind, just when it seems like the attack would land, it is suddenly blocked by a shield. This shield is carried by a white golem. 
more of the white ones show up and help Art fend off the black golems. Since this is a simulation, Art has allies similar to the backers he will have in the real war. However, Art will still be the main player so it will be up to him to decide whether he wants to take the offensive and destroy his enemies or stay near his teammates and protect them. After a long battle, he eventually manages to kill the golem leader and ends the fight. Ren instantly comes down to inform him of the results. The total number of casualties on Art's side was 271, while the number of enemy casualties was 512. Although it was a victory, Ren doesn't consider it to be an impressive performance given the low level of the golems. Art lets too many of his allies die. He responds by telling him that he can't feel any empathy for them since they look like golems. This is why he didn't feel motivated to protect them even though they were on the same side. Ren makes a note of this and tells Art to go back to sleep, warning him that tomorrow isn't going to be any easier. Sleep deprived, he instantly falls asleep the moment his head touches the ground. The next morning, he is woken up by another sound. This time it's the scream of a girl. Art quickly gets up and prepares his sword. He is horrified to realize that his enemy this time is a demon, similar to the one that killed Lance Alia. What's more horrifying is the fact it's holding Tessia in his hand as a hostage. In an attempt to save her, Art unleashes his static void. As he rushes towards the demon, he is able to see all the different mana particles in the air. He charges at the demon with his sword and manages to cut his hand off. This frees Tessia from his grip and she falls to the ground. However, the threat is not over. Realizing this, he continues his attacks on the demon and quickly backs up to put some distance between them. He regenerates his hand and prepares a powerful counterattack. As soon as the demon unleashes it, Art is able to block most of the arrows using his own spell. However, one of the arrows escapes and heads straight towards the unconscious Tessia. Art uses Static Void to freeze time and is able to catch the arrow before it hits her. He throws the arrow back towards the demon. However, just then, his realm heart runs out, leaving him completely exhausted and without any mana. It hits the demon and creates a big blast. When the smoke clears, it is revealed that the demon is completely unharmed. Just as it's about to kill both of them, Art shouts, Ren, enough of this. The demon suddenly starts melting, revealing itself to be nothing more than a puppet created using earth magic. The same goes for Tessia. Ren appears from behind the cloud of dust. He is surprised that Art was able to catch on so quickly. However, it's hard not to catch on when the scenario is so obviously fake. Ren claims that he did what he did for Art's benefit. He blames Art for using most of his energy to try to save Tessia. This left him exhausted and defenseless. Art gives a stern reply telling him that there are things that are more important to him than anything else, including himself. However, Ren's cold and logical nature doesn't understand this. He tells Art that although familial bonds and mates are important, they can cost you your life in battle. However, he is interrupted as Art becomes embarrassed and rushes to clarify that Tessia isn't his mate. This leaves Ren confused. From what he was told by Winsome and judging by his reaction, he was sure that her importance went beyond mere infatuation. You two haven't yet engaged in carnal intimacy? Ren asks him, leaving Art totally embarrassed and at a loss for words. He quickly changes the topic to something less awkward. He asks him about his ability to create dummies. While creating a throne for himself using earth magic, he reveals that he can single-handedly create all sorts of scenarios. However, there are limitations to what he can do. For example, he cannot mimic the properties of water using earth. The big question lingering on Ren's mind is how Art was able to tell that the earlier scenario was fake. He reveals that he was able to see the yellow earthen mana particles all over the demon and Tessia. More importantly, it made no sense for a demon to bring Tessia to Epiotus. Similar to Ren, Art has a question lingering in his mind as well. He asks him if it's impossible for lesser beings to have the same level of insight about mana arts as the Asuras. Ren is a man of numbers and statistics, so it goes against his nature to deem it impossible, but at the same time, it is highly improbable. However, he remarks that art of all people shouldn't be worried about that. He is left confused by what he means. Ren explains that art is a collection of statistical improbabilities. He is a quadra elemental mage, which is the very thing that is needed to use Aether, which happens to be the very thing that the Princess of Dragons bestowed upon him. Everything about him is an outlier. Not even the Azuras have so much innate talent and luck. Art thanks him for pointing that out and asks him about what they have to do next. Before moving on to the next phase of their training, Ren asks him to put out his dominant hand. He takes a triangular purple rock and explains that it's a mineral called Achlorite. Although it's a rare mineral, it is useless on its own. 
However, with the right refining and synthesizing process, it can be turned into something amazing. He reminds Art of when he said that he doesn't forge swords, but he creates them. With this mineral and the right tools, he can essentially grow a weapon. Art gets confused and compares it to growing a tree. Ren becomes exasperated and remarks that he can think of it like that if that's what it takes for him to wrap his lesser mind around the process. He reveals that normally he spends years or even decades observing and analyzing the fighting style before he creates a weapon. By doing this, he ensures that it's perfectly suited to each wielder. However, in Art's case, that's not possible. He takes the triangular rock and out of nowhere, he suddenly stabs Art with it. While he is screaming in pain, Ren explains that he has synthesized the acolyte with Sylvia's feather, as well as a piece of her scale. Every moment, action, thought, and change in his body will factor into how the weapon will manifest. This means that even Ren can't predict how the weapon will turn out. Perhaps it won't be a sword at all, and will turn out to be something completely different. This makes Art question why they are doing it this way if the outcome is so unpredictable. On top of that, he thought Ren wasn't going to make him a weapon. He wonders what caused his intentions to change. Ren responds by telling him that he will need more than a stick to win against Vritra. More importantly, they are running out of time. Art becomes horrified to hear that last part as he was told by Winsome that they still had two more years before the war began. With a grim expression, Ren reveals that Winsome just received the latest update about Decathan. Before disclosing it, he makes it clear that he is telling him this against the wishes of Winsome and Lord Indrath. The reason he is doing it is because he wants Art to make a logical decision based on correct information. The Acolyte is unpredictable. There is no telling when it will manifest as a weapon. It could be a year or perhaps more. Art becomes increasingly anxious as he can tell that Ren is on edge, even more so than usual, as he finally reveals the information that they got. Although the main army hasn't arrived yet, the war between Alacria and Decathan has already begun. Art becomes horrified. He is angry that he was lied to by Winsome. Ren clarifies that the nature of war is unpredictable. Art immediately makes the decision to go back to Decathan. If the war has begun, then he needs to fight to protect his family and his loved ones. As he is walking away, he is suddenly forced to stop as his legs won't move. It's because of Ren's earth magic. He creates two giant golem hands to grab his leg to stop him from leaving. What will you do when you get back? Get yourself killed by a scythe. He questions Art angrily. He tries to make the case that he has been training with the Aether Orb all this time. Despite saying this, deep down he knows it himself that he is nowhere near strong enough. At his current level, he probably can't even defeat a retainer, let alone a scythe. In a surprising turn of events, Ren says one year. Give me one year and you'll actually have a fighting chance. Art grits his teeth. Unable to form words, he just nods. Back in Decathan, in the floating castle of the council, Virion is working hard for the war. Tessie requests permission to fight as well. However, Virion instantly turns her down, telling her that she is not strong enough. Alder agrees with his assessment. He points out that sending her out in the field is much too risky and quite unnecessary. Tessie grits her teeth in frustration and leaves the room in anger. Virion lets out a deep sigh of exhaustion. He questions Alder if this is really the best call. He reminds him that she means a lot to Arthur Lewin. If they were to let her join the battle, then it might impede Art's judgment and he might want to come back. Elsewhere in the castle, Tessia is still frustrated and makes her way to the portal. She is stopped by the guards protecting the gate. She orders them to open the door and let her pass. However, they tell her that they haven't received any information about this from Virion or Lord Alder. Suddenly, Lance Veray arrives and orders them to let her through. She covers up for her and tells them that she is running errands with her. Following her order, the two guards open the gate, revealing a huge portal behind it. Another soldier appears and greets both of them. He asks them about their destination. Tessia tells him that they are heading to a distant city. It was once the capital of Sapin. This city was built on the western coast of the continent. This made it out of reach of the dwarven and the elven countries. It also made it the furthest city from the beast glades in the human country. Now that the war has begun, it has become the furthest city from the battle, and the ideal defensive location has it is hard to access, with three of its sides bordered by the ocean. When the war was announced to the public a year ago, King Glader tore the city down and rebuilt it to be the last line of defense against the Alacrian army. The city is now completely different from what it was a year ago. There are armed soldiers walking through the streets at every corner. Tessia and Lance Veray arrive at the city. 
She tells Tessia to keep her sword ready at all times. This is because they are at war, and she should always be ready for the worst-case scenario. Tessia asks her how the Glader siblings are doing in their training. She asks this because she knows that the two lances representing the humans have been put in charge of training the human prince and princess. Vere answers by telling her that Curtis is determined and hardworking, but his progress has been slow. His comprehension of mana is average at best. This is despite the fact that he is a beast tamer. Princess Kathleen, on the other hand, is doing well. After all, she has always been more gifted than everyone else. Tessia reminds her that there is one person that surpasses even her dad. She needs no further explanation, as she instantly knows that Tessia is talking about art. She wonders what sort of a person he will be after he returns from his training with the Azuras. Looking at all the soldiers wandering around, she wonders if the Alacrian army can make it all the way here. The council found out from Cynthia that Alacria is to the west of Decathan. This means the Etistan is technically the closest city to Alacria. However, Cynthia also told them that they had no effective way of transporting their army across the ocean. This is why they have to use a more discreet method of using the teleportation gates hidden throughout the beast glades. Using this method, the Vrutra can bring in a huge army and keep it hidden in the dungeons until they are ready to strike. Tessie recalls how most of their information has come from Cynthia. She had a curse upon her that bound her from revealing any information about Alacria. Although Alder was able to partially lift this curse, she still ended up comatose after revealing what she knew. This war has caused a strain on her relationship with Virian. But at the same time, Tessia understands that she is not the only one who is frustrated. After the death of the Greysenders, the dwarves launched a rebellion. Virian and the council had to work hard to regain their allegiance while encouraging individual cities to prepare for military action. While she is lost in thought, a strange figure slowly makes its way towards her. Upon realizing this, she instantly pulls out her sword and pushes this person to the ground. However, she soon realizes that it's Emily. Upon seeing Tessia, she quickly gets up and gives her a big hug. She apologizes to her for knocking her to the ground. Emily assures her that it's fine. In fact, it was kind of fun for her, in a slightly terrifying way. Emily suddenly realizes that she doesn't have time to be dawdling around. She is on an important errand to deliver some papers to Gideon. He had even requested aid from a lance. Tessia instantly glances toward Lance Foray. With a bright smile, she requests Lance to let her come along. The three of them make their way to Gideon. While on their way, she notices that Emily seems to be down. To cheer her up, she gives her a light bump on her shoulder and asks cheerfully, So what are you and the professor working on nowadays? I haven't seen you around the castle lately. Emily lets out a deep sigh and tells her that calling that nut job of a professor is a bit of a stretch. She goes on about the countless times she had to pull him out of the rubble after he caused an explosion. She gives Tessia a similar bump and asks about her own life these days. She goes on her own little rant, telling her how suffocating it's to be inside the castle. Emily gives a sarcastic reply, Oh sure, the halls are so narrow, and the ceiling is practically right over your head inside a castle. Both girls start releasing their pent-up frustration. Emily talks about her weird master while Tessia complains about Alder and her overbearing grandfather. They both shudder while thinking about their situations. Despite this, Emily tells her not to be so hard on Commander Virian. Their concern about her is understandable after how she was taken by Lucas last year. Tessia understands what she means. The past year has been difficult for all of them. The only way she can reassure herself that she is getting stronger is by training constantly. However, with the latest attacks by Alacria, she wishes that she could be on the battlefield and be more useful. Next, Emily inquires about Arthur. There has only been one news about him since he left. They have heard it so many times by now that both of them are able to mimic Alder at the same time. They continue their chat as they walk towards Gideon's location. Eventually, Emily asks about Elijah. This is difficult for her as she sort of blames herself for his capture. She informs her that there has been no news of him. Even after all this time, they still don't know why he was taken alive. Their conversation is interrupted as Lance Ferre informs them that they have finally arrived. The location is a bunker. They make their way down and eventually come across a huge door. Emily presses the two buttons on it and starts saying something. It sounds like gibberish, but perhaps it's a secret password of some sort. After a few minutes, the gate opens and the trio enters. They are greeted by a horrible stench. However, Emily is used to this by now and isn't bothered in the slightest. They finally arrive at Gideon's office. Before they can enter, they are greeted by a servant. 
As they are speaking, Gideon quickly rushes over and starts going through all the papers that Emily is carrying. He starts throwing away all the unnecessary reports, trying to look for the one he wants. When he finds it, he quickly starts reading it while ignoring everyone around him. After going through it, he lets out a sigh as if something is wrong. He finally speaks up, telling Lance Ferret that he submitted a formal request to the council, but since she is already here, he would like her to accompany him. Lance inquires about where they will be going. Much to the shock of everyone, he reveals that they will be going to the heart of the battle, on the northern border of the Beast Glades. Some time passes and the party of five is now headed to an unknown location in the Beast Glades. Gideon tells everyone to be on high alert. After riding on their horses for a while, they finally arrive at their desired location. Tessia is shocked to see that they are standing on a cliff just over the Decathias. This is the same ship that Gideon was building all those years ago when he got the blueprints from Art. The party makes its way to the beach, and they start getting closer to the run-down ship. Upon closer inspection, Tessia realizes that it's not the Decathias, but Gideon remarks that it's something worse. They make their way inside the ship and he starts inspecting everything as if he is looking for something. Tessia is filled with questions right now. Who built this ship if not Master Gideon? When did it even set sail? Where are all the people who were on it? She notices Lance Verre going through some drawers. After examining everything, she reveals that everything on this ship has been destroyed. This was deliberately done by something to hide the clues of the ship's origin. Someone obviously wants to hide their identity. Emily begins to wonder if Gideon's blueprints got leaked. Maybe one of his competitors built this ship. Gideon quickly corrects her by revealing that this ship was submerged in the ocean until only a few weeks ago. It was just by chance that a few adventurers came across it just as the tide shifted. Emily asks, What about the crew members? Did they all drown? Gideon replies, telling her that there would have been some remains if that had been the case. Lance Verre starts connecting the dots. Gideon continues speaking telling them that after he read the report, he prayed that he was wrong about his conclusion, but it doesn't seem like he was. He held on to the hope that the original Decathius had somehow made it back in one piece. But after examining it, he is sure that this ship isn't the Decathius. Everyone's faces turn pale as they finally realize the bone-chilling truth. This ship was built in Alacria, which means that they have an arsenal capable of carrying whole battalions across the ocean to Decathan. Back at the castle, Virion sits alone in his office, fiddling with some sort of recording device. The burden on his shoulder has had an effect on his health. It's obvious from his face just how overworked he is. The scene shifts to the council room, where a frustrated King Glader angrily pounds his fist on the table. His frustration is the result of Gideon's report about the mysterious ship that they found. Gideon reminds the council that the part about the ship being from Alacria is just speculation. However, he's sure that the ship is not the Decathias, Queen Priscilla questions why he is so sure of this fact. Gideon explains that the Decathius was something he took a lot of pride in. He wanted everyone to know that it was him who built this ship. Hence, he left his marks all over the base of the ship. These marks were nowhere to be found on this new ship. In fact, its frame is constructed from an entirely different material. King Glader gets even more frustrated upon hearing this. After all, how can he remain calm after hearing that their enemy has an entire arsenal of battleships capable of transporting thousands of soldiers and mages across the ocean? Everyone's expressions turn gloomy as they can't deny what he's saying. Their situation was bad enough when they were having trouble sniffing out the enemy from the dungeons, but now they also have to worry about an attack from two ends. Alder stops the argument and calms everyone down. He calmly asks Vary about her thoughts on the matter. She agrees with Gideon. The lack of evidence was telling enough, but now it can't be denied. Queen Priscilla tells everyone that it could be a trap, a way to split their force and make them move further into the Beast Glades. However, Alder suggests that if it were a trap, then they would have left something on the western coast instead. Now the question is whether it's worth taking the risk and splitting their forces. They have no choice but to since the risk is too great. However, they are already short on troops and mages. This is because the dwarves still refuse to help. Virion realizes that they need the dwarves' help if they are going to win this war. Back in his office, he has finally found out about Tessia's trip to the Beast Glades. However, it's hardly startling. In fact, the most astonishing thing is that she waited this long to leave the castle. Virion summons her to his office to have a conversation with her. He wants to show her something. He brings out the recording device from earlier. It displays the projection of their most recent battle. Tessia is horrified upon seeing it. It's a battle that took place five days ago. 
The Cathans suffered major losses in this battle. Of the 400 soldiers sent down to the dungeons, only 180 made it back. Virion was the one who gave the order, and now he must live with this guilt. He tells her that it's his selfishness as her grandfather that makes him want to keep her safe, even though he knows that she can be an asset on the field. However, even if one has all the talent in the world, it only takes one small mistake on the battlefield. This is why Virion had forbidden her to take part until now. With a stern expression, he asks her if she wants to take part in the war even after all she has seen. Tessia gives an even more bold reply saying that she will. Virion throws her a sword and asks her to prove her resolve to him. The two of them make their way to an empty field. They are going to have a fight so Virion can judge whether she is ready for the real war or not. Both of them unleash their beast wills, ready to start their battle. Without a warning, Virion lunges towards her like an arrow. She manages to dodge this attack using the vines from her beast will, and tries to attack Virion using those same vines. However, he manages to dodge each of them using his incredible speed while slowly closing the gap between them. Tessia once again strikes him, this time she uses her sword. However, Virion is prepared for that and stops the assault using his own sword. Next, he grabs Tessia's arm and tries to smash her to the ground. She manages to save herself just in time by sprouting vines and catching herself with them. Virion is impressed to see that she has gained better control over her beast will. Their battle continues to intensify with neither of them giving an inch. Tessia knows that if this continues, she will lose because of her lack of experience. Hence, she decides to go all out and uses the next phase of her beast will. Virion becomes concerned that she has lost control again, but he is left astonished to realize that that's not the case. Despite tapping into the next phase, she is in complete control. Both of them release powerful strikes with their swords. They both realize that this will decide who will come out victorious. As they continue to exchange blows, she loses the battle of stamina as her beast will starts to run out. Virion makes perfect use of this opportunity and lands a powerful kick. He quickly pins her down to the ground, ending the fight with a victory. She is left disappointed as she couldn't land a single clean hit. To her surprise, Virion tells her that she cannot address him as grandpa, but she must address him as commander on the battlefield. Tessia becomes really happy upon hearing that she can finally take part in the war. She thanks him with a brimming smile on her face. However, Virion calms her down and lets her know that there will be a few conditions. She is so excited that she hardly pays attention and simply nods to everything he tells her. Before ending their conversation, he gives her a warning with a stern expression. He informs her not to get caught in a situation where she is forced to use her second phase. Even though she has gotten better at controlling it, she still hasn't fully mastered it yet. With a serious expression, she moves his hand away and tells him that she is already aware of that fact. Alder also told her that her beast will is different in a way, although he couldn't exactly point out how. Tessia begins to leave to find her parents, but Virion stops her. He reminds her that until this point, all his decisions were to protect her and keep her out of harm's way. However, since she is a soldier now, she will have to obey any order given to her. She must always keep in mind that the orders given are for the benefit of Decathan and not her personal safety. Tessia moves forward and gives her grandpa a big hug. Afterward, she salutes him as her new commander and lets him know that she will do whatever it takes to protect Decathan and its people. Virion salutes her back with a smile on his face. However, deep down he is scared as he knows that she meant every word she said. He walks alone through the castle. He arrives at an unknown room. Inside he is greeted by a maid. He inquires about the person she is taking care of. The maid lets him know that she is in perfect condition physically. However, try as they might, they can't seem to wake her up. The person they are talking about is none other than Cynthia. Virion sits next to her to talk and let out his frustration. He lets her know about how he found out about Alacria having battleships in their possession. The real reason he came to see her is because he wanted to let her know that he is finally letting Tessia go into battle. She would have been very surprised to hear this if she was awake. He laughs at himself remembering how he told her that he will treat her like a real soldier. But this is all just a front to hide his real feelings. But in reality, he is scared of losing her. He knows that she is stubborn and passionate about going into battle, so he decided to let her do it before she sneaks out anyway. At least this way he can keep an eye on her. He finally begins breaking down, releasing his pent-up frustration and confesses to her how hard it is to handle everything. He stepped down as the king so he wouldn't have to do all this. Ironically, he is now doing it on an even bigger scale. He is being trained by an Azurette to make sure that he is mentally, physically, and emotionally fit to be the leader. 
The only thing he wants is to spend his life peacefully while sitting in his garden and watching his granddaughter grow up. But now he has to send her to war from where she might never return. The four kings and queens do what they can to help, but in the end, they are answerable to him since he was chosen by Alder as the only one fit to lead their forces. Tears start forming in his eyes. He tells Cynthia that he has already outlived his wife. He doesn't want to outlive his granddaughter as well. He takes her hand and apologizes to her. He had a feeling that there was something wrong. Cynthia knew that the curse wasn't fully lifted. She understood that she might die, but she revealed the information anyway. He also feels sorry for letting her go through with it, even though he knew. Virian recalls the time he spent with her when they were young. He can't help but be brought to tears. Many people regard her as an Alacrian spy, however, Virian assures her that he never thought of her that way. He says goodbye to her and promises to find a way to wake her up once the war is over. Three months have passed, and Tessia is now in charge of her very own team of three. This team includes an arrogant and prideful frontline fighter named Darvis, a strong gauntlet-wielding fighter named Caria, a support mage named Stannard, and their team leader Tessia. Their team is on a scouting mission in the dungeons. The monsters they fight are weak, but great in number. Unable to fight them all off by themselves, Tessia orders Stannard to use one of his spells to create a distraction so they can escape. She uses her vines to hold the monsters in place so Stannard can go all out without the fear of missing. He uses a gun-like artifact to fire a strong spell. Upon making contact, the spell creates a huge blast, covering a massive area. Using the wall of fire as a cover, the team starts heading back. In celebration of their victory, they start laughing and goofing off. However, Tessie reminds them that the fire won't last forever, so they should save their banter for later. Darvis mentions that it's supper time. This ruins everyone's moods. This is because they have been reminded of the same old mush that is waiting for them. But this is the life of the soldier, I guess. The team arrives at their base camp. It is protected by giant steel doors that remain closed at all times. After making sure that they are not enemies, the guard opens the door and lets the team enter. The camp is full of tents. These tents are what the soldiers call home. Upon arriving, they head off to take showers and wipe away the stench of guts and blood. After taking a shower, Tessia arrives back at their tent where she finds everyone sitting by a campfire. However, Darvis seems to be struggling to start one. Watching this reminds her of when they first started out as a team. The difference is obvious to anyone watching. They have grown a lot closer through their shared struggle. Tessia gets an unexpected visitor. When she turns around to look, she is pleasantly surprised to see that it's Helen. She quickly runs over and gives her a big hug. However, she is not alone. She is accompanied by the rest of the members of Twinhorn. She introduces them to her team. True to his nature, Darvis quickly makes his way over to flirt with Angela. Tessia recalls that although Darvis is arrogant, he has a good reason for it. He is a talented prodigy who is proficient in mana control and has great reflexes to match. The next one to introduce herself is Curia. Unlike her brash and outspoken self, she seems to be somewhat shy around the twin horn. Helen is able to tell that she belongs to the Raid family. Just like Darvis's family, the Clarells are known for their axemanship. The Raid family is known for their gauntlet techniques. Darvis was kicked out of the house by his father and thrown into the battle. Curia was also exiled by her parents because they wanted a son. Due to this shared trauma, the two of them made quite a pair. Despite his crass personality, Darvis cared for two things flirting with women and watching out for his childhood friend, Curia. Curia Reedy is just as headstrong as Darvis, but she is also bright and optimistic. She is also the glue that holds the team together. Watching the two of them fight, Jasmine comments that they remind her of Tessia and Arthur. This leaves her embarrassed while everyone else can't help but laugh. Seeing Stannard with his gun, Durden walks over to ask about this strange weapon. He tells him that he had it made because of his deviant powers. Tessia explains that he can store spells in beast cores. All of the Twin Horn members are left impressed and intrigued. While Stannard demonstrates his powers, Tessia further explains that he left a distinct impression during his assessment and got the opportunity to meet Virian. He is a dark yellow core mage with fire and wind affinity. However, despite this, he has a deficiency in his mana core. This results in him having a low mana pool, but he still proved himself with his strange deviant powers. Tessia's team is the youngest group in this division. This made her very proud. They fought just as well as the other group and their division has been doing great. Because of this, Tessia is left to wonder why the Twin Horns are here. Helen reveals that they have just come back from the Wall. Although the situation there is much worse, they were sent here to help with scouting. 
she warns them to prepare themselves for what's about to come. Stannard becomes curious and asks her about what she saw at the wall. All the Twin Horn members go quiet, none daring to recall the terrible experience. Tessia wonders if they have been actually fighting against the Alacrian mages. Helen reveals that they have. They were there for about four months. The wall is a base while the actual fighting is occurring at the borders of the Beast Glades. The mages aren't the real problem. It's the mana beasts under their control. Angela reveals that this is the reason the higher-ups sent them here. They are here to look for a mutated S-class mana beast that is hiding in this cavern. The Alacrians have thousands of mana beasts under their control. This is the reason they are having a tough time against them. The Twin Horn has been given the mission to hunt down this mana beast before the enemy uses it to break down the wall. The mutant mana beasts are mainly beasts that control their own dungeons. By controlling the mutants, the Alacrians are able to control all the beasts under them as well. As long as these mutants are alive, other members of their species will follow them and fight for the Alacrians. There are many squads in the dungeons, trying to find the mutants and kill them before Alacria can gather a large army of them and advance towards the wall. The dungeon that Tessia's team has been assigned to happens to be the one housing an S-class mutant. Tessia inquires more about what is happening at the wall. However, this pisses Adam off. He becomes angry as she repeatedly makes them recall the deaths of many of their comrades. She clarifies that she is asking this because once they kill the mutant, her team will be sent to the wall next. She wants to be prepared for what they will have to face. Adam's anger rages on as he grits his teeth in frustration. Before the situation gets worse, Angela steps in to take Adam away with the excuse that it's about time for them to set up camp. Helen apologizes to Tessia on his behalf and tells her not to take his words to heart. She reveals that the Alacrian soldiers are much more monstrous than any beasts in these dungeons. The mana beasts fight on instincts to survive. However, the enemy soldiers fight to kill. The most bone-chilling fact is that being killed is the least of their worries. Stannard becomes curious and asks what she means by that. It's about information. Being taken prisoner and tortured by the enemy. This makes people wish for death. Fighting mana beasts is all black and white. The creatures are bad, and the humans are good. But when fighting other humans, things are not that simple. When faced with humans who can talk, scream in pain, and beg for their lives, things become gray. It becomes harder to distinguish the right from the wrong. Their conversation is suddenly interrupted by a scream for help. It's a soldier carrying his injured companion and yelling for a medic. Tessia can't help but watch, as she can't do anything to help. Tessia and Helen make their way to the infirmary. There they meet Drogo, the previous leader of Twin Horn. He asks them for the reason why they came here. It's because they want to know the latest updates that have been brought in by the injured soldier. Unfortunately for them, the soldier is too injured and unconscious. Drogo tells them that it may be a while before they get any answers out of him. It happened because of dehydration and malnutrition. From the state of his feet, the nurses are able to tell that he has been running nonstop for a while. But the question remains, what was he running from? The soldier suddenly wakes up as if he was having a horrible nightmare. The first thing he asks is how long he has been unconscious. The nurses bring him some water and tell him to rest. Drogo asks him what happened to him. They are all dead, he says in a dreadful voice. I was the only one to survive. He goes on to explain that he had an argument with his teammate, so he stayed behind. However, he felt guilty about letting his comrades go into battle alone, so he decided to follow them instead. However, when he finally caught up, he was horrified to see what had happened. His entire team had been killed by gnolls. They were ambushed by hundreds of them. They were far stronger than the normal ones and some even carried man-made weapons. However, he got lucky and managed to hide behind some rocks. He quietly hid there for days until he finally managed to set up a teleportation gate. However, he couldn't risk activating it and having the gnolls destroy it before he used it, so he ran all the way back. The soldier reveals that there was a huge door behind the army of gnolls. It's as if they were protecting something. It was the den of the S-class mana beast. A few minutes later, Drogo's voice echoed through this small cave as he told everyone about the soldier's message. Over a hundred of them quickly scurried around to listen. It's finally time that they kill the S-class mutant. Stanner becomes nervous. He has been doing this for three months, but this will be the first real battle that he will fight. Both Darvis and Karia also try to shake off their nerves. However, Tessia, even though she was the youngest, was the most composed. She ties her hair up to prepare for the battle. Stannard can't help but feel attracted to her. But he reminds himself that she is out of his lee and besides, 
she is already in love with some Arthur guy. Putting that aside, he can't seem to shake off his nervousness. Seeing him like this, Korea walks over and tries to calm him down. She tells him to stretch so he doesn't get cramped up. He finally manages to get over his nerves. All the soldiers gather near the spot where the Nash were spotted. Before entering the battle, Drogo cautions everyone to stay alert as they don't know the exact number of the monsters. Tessia tries to motivate her team by making a promise to make it out of this alive and having a delicious dinner afterward. Drogo finally gives the order to charge, and the entire army rushes into the cave. This is the first time Stannard has experienced a real battle. Fear quickly takes over him as he watches his comrade die in front of him. Darvis arrives to rescue her, but not before she succumbs to her injuries. Due to being distracted, Stannard is nearly killed when he gets attacked from behind. However, he manages to react in time and shoots the beast with his gun. He continues to provide support for his team using his long-range spells. Tessia also makes great use of her beast will to trap the beasts using her vines. She is able to take out many of them using this method. While Tessia keeps them immobilized using the vines, the earth magic users quickly form a wall around them to trap them inside a crater. After the few remaining beasts have been taken out, Drogo orders all the mages to fire their spells at the trapped beasts within the crater. They do great damage, taking out many of them. To finish it off, Stannard forms a huge ball of fire using his gun and launches it towards the crater. All the soldiers quickly jump out of the way from the fear of getting hit by it. As soon as the spell makes contact, a huge blast occurs, vaporizing all the mana beast inside in one go. All the soldiers cheer to mark their victory. Drogo raises his sword as well and honors the soldiers who gave their lives to make this victory happen. However, Stannard sees it in a different light. He feels empathy for the soldiers who lost their comrades. Victory doesn't mean anything if it comes at such a big cost. He wonders how many more will die when they fight the S-Class mutant waiting for them. While many others are celebrating their triumph, the same cannot be said for Tessia. Stannard notices that she doesn't seem too happy and asks her what's wrong. He is surprised to learn that she is upset for the same reason he was. She is sad because they lost ten soldiers despite coming out victorious. Darvis tries to tease her for being the ever-so-compassionate princess. Caria grabs her hand and tries to make her understand. They did their best, and they came out on top. That's all they can do, and the rest isn't in anyone's control. Stannard also joins in, letting her know that they all knew the risks before going into battle. He tells her that's impossible to save everyone. However, this seems to have the opposite effect as Tessia becomes more upset about her inability to save everyone. I'll never catch up to him at this rate, she says in a depressing tone. Caria asks her if she is talking about this Arthur guy again. Darvis gets a bit annoyed. He has had enough of hearing about art. Tessia describes him as if he is some all-powerful, godlike human being. He believes there is no way that she isn't biased in some way. Caria teases him saying that he must be jealous. While the two of them fight, Tessie recalls how she first met Art. He was a little scary when he came to rescue her. Looking back, she knows he probably had a hidden agenda back then. Darvis continues bad-mouthing Art. He tells everyone that he isn't that great of a guy since he ran away to train without even saying goodbye to Tessia. He suggests that Art was just afraid of dying in the war so he used the excuse of training to run away. Tessia gets angry upon hearing this and tells him that he is wrong. Art may be many things, but he isn't one to run away in fear. This is because of his desire to protect his loved ones. Darvis isn't impressed and sarcastically replies, Yeah, yeah, Arthur will be the hero to save us all. The whole army continues going deeper into the cave to the location of the mutant. Based on the reports, they will soon arrive at the location where there are hundreds of gnolls and orcs waiting for them. Drogo cautions everyone to be careful and tells them to prepare themselves. With that said, everyone rushes forward to battle. However, to their surprise, as soon as they arrive, they realize that all the monsters are already dead. They are left confused and wondering what happened here. Drogo orders everyone to stay calm and continue towards the door. There is another surprise waiting for them. They realize that the door isn't fully closed. Fear quickly swipes through Drogo. Countless possibilities come to his head. Maybe the mutant came out and killed his underlings. Regardless, he orders one of the soldiers to open the door. As soon as it opens, they are greeted by a literal mountain of corpses. Everyone instantly puts up their guard to confront any potential threat. Sitting on top of these remains is a figure, which appears to be a demon. To everyone's shock, it's none other than Art. The soldiers put up their shields thinking that he is an enemy. As usual, Sylvie jumps down to hug Tessia. Drogo quickly pulls out his sword, thinking that she is being attacked. With a frightened voice, he shouts out to Art, 
demanding to know his name. Art doesn't reply and jumps down to the ground. This startles everyone, including Darvis, Curia, and Stannard. He tells them to relax, assuring them that he is an ally. This is confirmed when Helen recognizes him and joyfully steps forward to hug him. However, Stannard notices that Tessia doesn't seem to be cheerful. In fact, one can tell that she is worried for some reason. Drogo interrupts their reunion and demands to know what happened here. He wasn't informed that they were getting reinforcements. Art replies telling him that he couldn't have been informed because he only arrived an hour ago. However, he didn't expect to land in the middle of a swarm, so he had to take them out. Drogo is shocked to learn that a kid could take out hundreds of mana beasts single-handedly, including the S-class mutant. Whispers start flying around among the soldiers. They are in disbelief that a boy can take out all the mana beasts alone, a task for which they brought a small army. Stannard inquires about what happened to the beast cores. Art informs him that Sylvie ate them all. However, this is another thing that Drogo has a hard time believing. How can such a small creature consume so many beast cores at the same time? Tessia finally speaks up, informing Drogo that she and the Twin Horns will vouch for Art and ensure that he is escorted to base camp without any trouble. With that said, the whole army starts heading back. On the surface, there is no doubt that this person is Tessia's childhood friend. However, for some reason, she feels a sense of unease. It had been years since they last saw each other, so she imagined their reunion going a bit differently. The rest of the soldiers were also restless because of Art's sudden appearance. Once they arrived, Art had a meeting with Drogo about what happened. However, Tessia could clearly tell that he was keeping secrets. He was only telling them what was necessary for them to know. Drogo was also angry because of this, but he had still gotten enough information to plan their next course of action. After the meeting, Jasmine left the tent to give Tessia and Art some time alone. Tessia's heart starts beating faster and faster. She doesn't know how to break the ice since it has been a long time. Art finally speaks up, telling her that he missed her. She is brought to tears and hugs him since she missed him as well. They finally start talking like they always have. Art asks her how she has been all this time. He tells her not to leave anything behind and tell him everything. Outside the tent, Darvis's frustration about Art grows even more. He believes that there is no way one person could defeat all those mana beasts. So in his mind, it's clear that Art is hiding something. Curia and Stannard continue to tease him, telling him that he is just jealous. Darvis makes up his mind. He picks up his axe and decides to challenge Art to a duel. This way he can prove to everyone that Art is just a fraud. After a while, both Tessia and Art come out of the tent. Darvis realizes that this is his opportunity to carry out his plan. He walks over to Art and formally challenges him to a duel. Everyone gathers around to watch the fight. They all want to watch the guy who supposedly defeated the S-class mutant all by himself. Art asks Darvis about his reasons for wanting to duel with him. However, he gives a vague reply telling him that it's because of his pride as a man. Drogo acts as the referee and announces the rules to both fighters. Firstly, they are only allowed to use mana to enhance their bodies, which means they can't conjure any spells. Secondly, the first one to yield or get knocked unconscious will lose. Even Drogo is very curious about how strong Art is. With a wave of his hand, he signals the start of the duel. Darvis wastes no time and instantly charges toward Art. He tries to use a feint and goes behind him instead. However, this is not enough to trick Art who gives him a cold, deathly glare. Darvis can feel a chill run down his spine as soon as he sees it. His body instinctively jumps back, as if he is the prey trying to avoid being hunted by the predator. The nearby soldiers start calling him a wimp for running away. Both Caria and Stannard are surprised as well. They have been a party for a while. Stannard has witnessed Darvis hacking away at A-class mana beasts without any fear. He has seen him challenge opponents twice his size, all with a smile on his face. This is why he is having trouble believing what is happening before his eyes. This is the first time he has seen the battle-hungry Darvis experience fear. With a loud roar, he once again charges forward to attack. Art dodges all his attacks with ease. As soon as Darvis overextends a little, he quickly jumps onto the opportunity and lands a powerful punch. He is not taken out of the fight just yet, but he is left in disbelief upon witnessing Art's insane reaction speed. Darvis uses his axe to launch a rock towards him. He easily crushes the rock into pieces with a single punch. However, he soon realizes that the rock is just a distraction as Darvis quickly appears behind him. He once again uses his terrifying speed to easily avoid the attack and turn the tables on Darvis. In the blink of an eye, he launches a flurry of punches at Darvis. He is so fast that his movements are invisible to the naked eye. 
To everyone else watching, it appears as if Darvis just fell to the floor on his own. However, Curia seemed to realize what happened. Art raptured Darvis's mana flow by targeting key points on his body. These points are supposed to be naturally protected. On top of that, they are supposed to be so small that it is almost impossible to target them in battle, let alone that fast. Stannard is left in awe of Art's amazing strength. Having his mana flow disturbed, Darvis lies helplessly on the ground, unable to move his body. To everyone's surprise, Virian appears out of nowhere to congratulate Art on his victory. They make their way to a tent to have a discussion. Virian is obviously very pleased to see his old student, evident from the fact that he nearly chokes him out while trying to hug him. Tessia has many questions for Art, like how he opened the door to the S-Class Mana Beast and how did he defeat it. Virian tells her to leave her queries for later. For now they have important things to discuss. He tells her that they will be going back to the castle. Much to her disappointment, Alder informs her that she has to stay here. Tessia tries to complain about it since she is seeing Art after such a long time. However, Gurian reminds her that she is a soldier now. She has to make preparations with her team. She can't just abandon her duties to spend time with a friend. Although she is a bit disappointed, she understands her duties and gives him a salute as her commander. As she is about to leave, Alder comments on how she has gotten stronger because of their training. Art is a bit amazed to learn that she has also received training from an Azura. Outside the tent, Tessie rejoins her team while the rest of them head to a portal meant to teleport them to the castle. As soon as Art steps through the portal, he sees a giant bear waiting for him on the other side. This bear has an intimidating aura. Sitting on top of it is none other than Ellie. She leaps off of it straight into his arms to give him a big hug. He hugs her back and thanks her for such a lovely welcome. However, it soon turns into a sibling fight where Art tries to teach her a lesson for jumping on him. The mood suddenly becomes serious as he sees his parents walking towards him. He doesn't know what to say in this situation. Although it's been a long time, they probably haven't forgotten everything. However, he is proven wrong as both Alice and Ray run over and embrace him. He is left confused, but Alice reminds him that she raised him for over a decade. This is more than enough reason for a hug. He cannot be happier to finally be able to embrace them again. Now that all the greetings are out of the way, it's finally time to address the bear in the room. Boo has been waiting eagerly to challenge Art. With a big swing, he lands his massive paw on Art's shoulder breaking the floor beneath him. To his shock, Art doesn't even flinch and is completely unharmed. Boo is left completely demoralized, so Ellie quickly goes over to cheer him up. She explains that Boo is very competitive and likes to check how much stronger he is than everyone else. Art is left stunned when Ellie reveals that Boo is her bond. Virian further explains that he was a gift from Winsome. He was a baby cub then, but he quickly grew up in these past two years. Putting all this aside, Alder reminds them that it's time for their meeting. He assures Art that he will get to see his family again since they are living in the castle as well. Satisfied with that, he says goodbye to his family and goes with Virian and Alder to the meeting room. He is surprised to find the room empty. He had expected the kings and queens to be here as well. At the very least, he thought Cynthia would be with them. With a gloomy expression, Virian reveals to him that Cynthia has been in a comatose state ever since he divulged the information about Alacria. Art is shocked and angry at the same time. He asks Varian to tell him everything that has happened in the last two years. According to him, the Gladers have been focusing their efforts on the Kingdom of Darv, all in the hope of getting back the Dwarves' alliance. Curtis and Kathleen have done the same thing as Tessia. They formed their own team and are fighting with the army to get real battle experience. Art's family has been moved to the castle for protection, however, the Helsty family has gone somewhere else to help with the war effort. Art questions if his mother or father has shown interest in joining the war. As expected, Ray wanted to join, but Virian told him to wait for his son's return. Now that he is caught up with the events of the past two years, they finally get to the point of this meeting. They obviously didn't bring him here just to reunite with his family. On top of that, it must be something serious if Virian is trying to keep his own granddaughter in the dark. The current situation of the war has been a concern for everyone. Even with the defensive line at the wall, the S-Class mana beasts combined with the soldiers coming through the teleportation gates make up a pretty dangerous Alacrian force. However, it's too suspicious. Despite all this, they have yet to break through the wall. This means that either the Decathan defense is too strong for them, or they are stalling for time. By the look on Virian's face, Art is easily able to guess that it's probably the latter. Virian reveals that they have found evidence that confirms this very fact. However, before revealing it, Alder tells him not to blame himself after seeing it. 
With that said, he puts out the blueprints for the Alacrian ships. Art is taken aback to realize that these are similar to the ones he came up with for the Decatheus. The Alacrians built their ships using Art's design as inspiration. Their meeting is interrupted as a scared soldier suddenly enters the room. All he can say is that they're approaching the western coast. He stutters as he completes his sentence. In a shocking turn of events, he reveals that the Alacrian army has arrived on their ships. Hart leaps out of his chair and quickly runs out of the room. He runs straight toward the teleportation gate without stopping for anything along the way. He tries to enter the teleportation gate, but he is stopped by the guards. He requests to be let through, but the guards remind him that he needs proper authorization to use the gate. He tells them that he is just coming from a meeting with Virian and he knows about it. However, the guard gives him a stern reply, telling him that no matter what, they will not let him through until they get approval from either Virian or Alder. Art slowly starts to lose his patience and unleashes his terrifying aura. Before the situation gets ugly, Alder steps in to stop him. He lets the guards know that Art is free to leave whenever he wants. But at the same time, he advises Art not to do anything foolish. With a quick nod, he hurries towards the teleportation gate to go to Itistan City. Elsewhere in the castle, two unknown figures stand over Cynthia's unconscious body. They are here to extract some kind of information from her. As long as they can do so, they don't care if she dies. Cynthia's eyes suddenly open and she recalls a memory from her past. She is in a beautiful garden with a younger version of Virian. They are talking about their future plans now that the war between the humans and the elves is over. Virian suggests that she would make an excellent mentor. He tells her that he can envision her being the head of a prestigious academy. Little did he know how accurate he was. Cynthia replies telling him that perhaps she will open up her own academy. She has taken a liking to Exiris City, so that would be the perfect location. She goes on about how the Exiris Academy will become the greatest institution for mages around the world. Virian tries to give her a fist bump to wish her luck for the success of the Academy. However, the scene suddenly starts to turn gloomy. Virian starts walking away. Try as she might, she is unable to move. Suddenly she starts bleeding from her stomach. In the present, Virian is suddenly woken up by a loud scream. He makes his way out of his office to see what's going on. A soldier informs him that the scream came from the room below them. To his horror, he realizes that the shout came from Cynthia's room. Elsewhere, Art finally arrives in Atistan City after going through the portal. Once again, he is stopped by the guards. They take him for some runaway noble brat throwing a tantrum, and hence refuse to open the gates. Frustrated by this, he chooses not to argue with them, and instead orders Sylvie to turn into her dragon form. While riding on her back, Art crashes through the roof. The two of them head straight to the western coast of the city to check out the situation. Back in the castle, Virian finally arrives at Cynthia's room. He is forced to drop to his knee upon seeing her. Her lifeless body is covered with spikes. Virian screams out with grief as he has just lost a dear friend. Meanwhile, Art finally arrives at the coast. He is left in disbelief upon seeing the sight before him. An entire fleet of Alacran ships have arrived at Decathan. The real war between Decathan and Alacrian has only begun. 